Dragon King's Collections, Book 2, Fire and Ice, Books 3 to 5. By Amelia Shaw. Narrated by Catherine Bilson. Chapter 1 Cass. I couldn't believe this was now my life. Stavrock and Lucy were out tonight, again, negotiating a new trade agreement near the border between our kingdom and the human world. They were always off doing important things. Things that would improve the lives of our people. And I was left here, holding the babies. Literally. I loved my nephew and his sisters more than anything in the world, but on days like this, I longed to be somewhere else. Anywhere else. The urge to explore new horizons was becoming almost overwhelming. I clenched my jaw and tightened my hands into fists as I strode along the corridor, a walk I could do with my eyes shut. I knew every inch of this palace back to front. The castle had been my home since I was a little girl. When my parents died, my cousin Stavrock had taken me in and raised me like his own. He'd been young then, barely a year on the throne, and yet he hadn't turned me away when I needed him. He'd always treated me like the little sister he never had, far more than simply a cousin. He was part big brother, part father to me. I was lucky to have Stavrock in my life, but lately the walls and ceilings of the castle had begun to press in on me from all sides. I felt like a prisoner in my own home. No matter how far I explored, or which paths I took, I always ended up exactly where I started. That was probably because I wasn't allowed outside the castle walls, had never been really. At first I'd been deemed too young to leave, but then Stavrock's rule had become even tighter since that fateful day three years ago when Lucy had been kidnapped and I'd been hurt in the process. Stavrock had really locked things down after that. I understood why he kept us close. He wanted to keep those he loved safe. But I was turning twenty-one tomorrow for crying out loud. I was a woman now. My own person, with my own destiny. I wanted more. I wanted adventure. I needed to know what was out there, beyond our green fields and sleepy village. Most of all, in the heart of my secret desires, I craved one thing. To go north. To visit the Kingdom of Winter. Since Stavrock had visited the north and helped Eric save the North Kingdom, I'd wanted to go myself. See the town that no one else had seen. Meet the people no one had known about, until now. I spent most days now tucked away in the castle library, trying to find out more about the town everyone had thought was just a myth. I read about ice storms and ravenous wolves, harsh winters that lasted for years on end, and huge, powerful dragons that breathed ice instead of fire. I wanted to see everything I read about in the books, for myself. I walked across the room to a large window and glared out. The view was beautiful, as always, but it was as familiar as the nose on my face. The snow-peaked mountains, the rolling hills, it seemed very tame in comparison to the harsh wilds I'd been reading about. An urge struck me to fling open the windows and release my dragon. I wanted to stretch my wings and soar. My dragon stirred inside me, and the call for adventure sang through my veins. I inhaled sharply, trying to push away the desire. Then I turned away from the view. Stavrock forbade me from leaving the castle without an armed guard. As a princess of his realm, I could be a valuable hostage. Journeying alone was risky. If somebody recognised me, I would make a worthy bride for any upstart warlord or ambitious noble who dared to challenge the king. I hated being stuck here, no more than a pawn in the games played by dragon kings and their lords. I wanted to carve out my own destiny. And yet, as Stavrock's cousin, I wasn't sure how I was ever going to do that. That evening, Stavrock and Lucy returned to the castle. 
I smiled with relief when they walked into the dining room, still shaking the last of the snow from their hair. The table was already laid with silver candlesticks, and the maids had decorated the white cloth with sweet floral arrangements. Platters of meat and warm, soft bread were waiting for them. I stood up from the chair where I rested by the fire and rushed toward them. Lucy greeted me with a hug. She was still cold from being outside, and I shivered in my light evening clothes, pressing my hands to her pink cheeks. You're so cold, I said, trying to warm her. As a human, Lucy wasn't as adaptable to our climate as dragon shifters. How were my little ones? Lucy clasped my hands, still shivering as she held my warm palms to her cheeks a moment longer. I laughed. They were good as gold. Well, the girls were. Stavrock let out a booming laugh as he took his seat at the head of the table. My son has a strong will, even now. He will make a fine dragon king one day. Lucy chuckled and moved from the fireplace to take a seat beside her husband. I did the same, and Lucy reached out to brush her hand over mine as we all sat down to dinner. Thanks for watching them, Cass. I know I can always count on you. You're an angel. I forced out a laugh. Any time, Lucy. What else did I have to do? I fiddled with my fork. You know I'll always be here. Always and forever. Until I die of old age in my library tower, surrounded by my books. Dreaming of adventures I never undertook. There were worse fates, and yet I couldn't help but want more. Some note of frustration must have come through in my voice, because when I looked up, Stavrok had set down the turkey leg he'd been gnawing on and was watching me with a contemplative expression. I tilted my head. What's up, cuz? A grin slid over his face, and his eyes twinkled. Cass. Dear Cass. Uh-oh. What have I done now? It's your twenty-first birthday tomorrow, Stavrok continued, and my stomach, which had lurched at his initial words, relaxed. A matching grin sparked over Lucy's face, and the two of them turned to me. My heart started to race. You're not the child I met any more, all those years ago. He reached out and took my hand. You've grown into a smart, strong and beautiful woman. I'm proud of you. My eyes widened in alarm. Don't go getting all emotional on me, Stavrok. Still, I couldn't help but be a tiny bit pleased. If Stavrok finally saw me as an adult, then that could mean... I think what my husband is trying to say, Lucy interjected, is that you deserve a treat. A birthday present that will let you spread your wings, so to speak. Spread my wings? Like, actually spread my wings? Excitement burst through me, but I tried to hold it in. What if I had misinterpreted what Lucy meant? What if... I'm taking you with me to the north, Stavrok said. I gasped, both hands lifting to cover my mouth. Stavrok grinned, obviously relishing the look of total shock on my face. To meet the dragon of winter himself. My hands dropped down and my mouth gaped open. The two of them sat there looking pleased as they watched me process the news. Oh, my God! I squealed, launching myself out of my chair and forward to throw my arms around my cousin's neck. As Stavrok spluttered, struggling to free himself from the embrace, Lucy sat back and laughed. Stavrok patted me a few too many times, and I dragged myself back to my seat, barely able to sit still. Finally, I was getting out of this kingdom. And not just going anywhere. He was going to take me to the one place I wanted to see most. I take it this means you're on board with your present, Lucy said, wiping tears of mirth from her eyes. Of course I am. I can't believe it. I leant back in my seat. A thousand questions sprang to mind. I didn't know where to begin. 
You're being serious, right? You wouldn't trick me with something like this. I glanced between my cousin and his wife, both of whom just laughed and shook their heads. I clapped, too excited to eat any more. When do we leave? What do I pack? Is it really as cold as they say? Will there be wolves? Will... Whoa! Stavrock reached out and put a cautionary hand on my shoulder, but his eyes expressed fondness. How about we finish this meal first? Then we can talk about the rest. Of course. Thank you, guys. This is seriously... I couldn't settle on the right word. Eventually, I just went with... Amazing. Stavrock and Lucy turned back to their meals. The conversation shifted to their three kids, so I drifted off. I ate mechanically without tasting another bite. I wanted to race off to the library at once and bury myself in the old books I had loved since I was little, the tales of the northern explorers battling against icy storms and fearsome beasts. I wanted to reacquaint myself with all the stories so I could prepare for actually going there in person. I'd never met Damon, the King of Winter, despite the few times he'd come to the castle for royal errands. Stavrock had always kept him and many of the other kings away from me for some reason I hadn't yet worked out. I'd only heard stories about Damon, and they were enough to pique my interest to a mountainous level. The servants passed rumours, and I'd gotten snatches of tales traded from person to person, third or fourth hand, from Stavrock's expeditions and hunting parties. Everyone knew that the North was a wild place, inhabited by unruly people. Things were different there. Survival was harsher. People fought tooth and nail for everything they had. Their king, according to the rumours, was the wildest one of all. He was said to be a ferocious fighter with piercing eyes and a cold, stoic demeanour. A lifetime spent in the frozen wilderness had rendered him more dragon than man. An image formed in my mind, a dark, shadowy figure at the centre of a snowstorm. I shivered, and not just from the imagined cold. When do we leave? I managed at last. Stavrock looked up from his plate of food. Tomorrow. We would leave tomorrow. On my actual birthday. I breathed deeply, trying to contain the excited squeal that wanted to rise. Best birthday present ever. My fate was in the north, that much I knew. The why? That was still a mystery. Chapter 2 Cass When I woke the next day, the day we were set to travel, sunlight was already filtering through the curtains and warming my face. I lay there, revelling in the joy and excitement that flooded through me. It had been so long since I'd travelled, and I didn't even care that Stavrock would be babysitting me the whole time. It was a clear, bright day. I was itching to set out on our journey. I bounced out of bed, flinging the windows wide open, and inhaled the cool springtime air. Someone's ready for their big day, a dry, amused voice said from behind me. Little Cass, twenty-one years old. You're making me feel my age, child. I turned around and grinned at Maddie. She was our head housekeeper, except she was so much more than that. She was part nanny, part adoptive mother. She'd raised me as much as Stavrock had. Probably more. She stood in the doorway, hands on her hips. She shook her head at me before moving over to sort out the bedsheets. I crossed the room and hugged her from behind, making her huff with disapproval at my lack of appropriateness. You don't look a day over twenty, Maddie. Flattery will get you nowhere, young lady. Maddie smacked my hands until I backed off, but her eyes were dancing. I was her favourite, and we both knew it. Now, a little birdie told me about your trip. I take it we've got some packing to do. I groaned. Packing and choosing clothes was the last thing I wanted to focus on right now. 
but Maddie merely tutted at me, opened my huge closet, and ran her hand along the rows of fabrics. She began pulling everything out and placing each item on the bed, shaking her head as she went. It soon became clear that I wasn't exactly prepared for a trip to the far north. My clothes aren't anyway. I was used to the warmth of the castle. If I ventured outside, it was never further than the edge of town. My wardrobe was made up mostly of silk gowns and soft slippers. I found a couple of sweaters tucked at the back, but that was all I had that would save me from freezing to death. I headed down to the Great Hall, only to find Stavrock already there, pacing up and down. Which was odd. He was obviously in a strange mood because, instead of wishing me a happy birthday, he gave me an unreadable look, like he was agitated about something. Ugh, forget about him. This is the day everything changes. Come this way, Stavrock said, and I let him drag me into the next room. Lucy and the babies were waiting for me there in the sunroom, along with a luscious birthday breakfast. I shoved aside whatever Stavrock's problem was because I would figure it out later. Lucy gave me a broad smile. I had a surprise for you, she said as she jiggled the toddler on her hip. But I'm afraid Ansel ate half of it already. On the low table, a stack of pancakes lay in the centre of a plate, surrounded by strawberries. I squinted at the writing on the top. It was clearly meant to read, Happy Birthday, Cass, but the top layer had chunks missing. It now read, Hap, Burr, A, Ka. I eyed Anselm with suspicion. He blinked back at me, his eyes wide and innocent. I love it. I smiled, then stuck out my tongue at him while Lucy was distracted by the other two. He giggled and blew a raspberry back at me. Happy birthday, Cass. Lucy set Anselm down on the floor, then leaned forward to give me a big hug. Anselm toddled over to where his sisters were stacking wooden bricks. Now that they were all walking, it was impossible to keep them in one place. Are you excited? Lucy asked. Finally, a chance to get out of here, I said, trying to sound like I meant it as a joke, but her eyes softened in understanding. You deserve it. I pulled her aside for a moment. Did something happen this morning? She looked puzzled. Nothing out of the ordinary. Why? I shook off the uncomfortable feeling about Stavrog's mood, pasting a smile back onto my face. I'm sure it's nothing. Ugh, forget about Stavrog. This was my birthday, and I was going to enjoy every second of it. Anything I can help you with? Lucy asked. Do you need to borrow a beanie or a muff or anything? I do, actually. I have nothing suitable for travelling to the north. I'm too used to being here in the cosy warmth of the castle. Lucy giggled. And I'm used to being cold all the time. My clothes might be a little big for you, but I'm sure we can get the seamstresses to take a few pieces in. Lucy and I were the same height, but she was much curvier than I was, especially since giving birth to the triplets. Sounds perfect. Thank you so much, Lucy. Lucy winked at me. Leave it to me. I'll go have a chat with the head seamstress now. Lucy headed off and I sat on the floor to play with the babies. Only yesterday I was lamenting never being able to leave. And now... I was going to miss them while I was gone. After breakfast, I went back to my room where three seamstresses came by with a dozen pieces from Lucy for me to try on. They were all heavy and warm, and I was sweating by the time they were done. We'll have these ready by the time you leave, princess, one of the women said, before she hurried from the room. Thank you, I called out to them, relieved beyond measure that Lucy cared enough to make sure I was comfortable and warm and still able to go on my dream visit. By the time we were ready to leave, Stavrock seemed to have gotten over whatever was bothering him earlier. He met me in the Great Hall with the easy smile that usually dominated his face these days, ever since he'd found Lucy. I've sent word to Damon. We will fly to an outpost half a day's journey from the castle, 
then take the rest of the journey on foot. Huh? Why not fly the whole way? I tilted my head, my confusion only growing when his laughter boomed through the hall. Several servants turned their heads. His laugh always attracted attention. It would be quicker, right? I asked him. I thought you would prefer to be properly dressed for our arrival, Cassie. Oh, right. Shifters didn't return to human form fully clothed. I pictured arriving in a strange land, in a strange throne room, naked in front of the fearsome, mysterious King of Winter. Heat spread across my cheeks. Stavrok's smile turned fond. I thought I would spare my favourite cousin the embarrassment of appearing nude on your first meeting with Damon. Favourite and only cousin? Irritation prickled over my skin as I realised that he was still trying to protect me. I didn't want to be sheltered anymore. I wasn't the helpless, vulnerable little girl that everyone around here thought I was. I was twenty-one and officially an adult. Still, I couldn't deny the fact I was kind of relieved he'd thought of such a thing. I certainly hadn't. I didn't want Stavrok to know that, so I just glared and punched him on the arm. It rebounded off his solid frame and he ruffled my hair. I've already sent your trunks ahead. The seamstresses worked for hours to alter the pieces for you. My men will be waiting for us at a checkpoint just beyond the mountains, he said. I hope you're ready to stretch your wings. I grinned. My dragon itched to unleash. Absolutely. We walked through the main hall and stepped onto the balcony. Stavrok stripped off most of his clothes, leaving only his underwear for modesty. I almost laughed. He only did that for me. Everyone else in the castle had seen him naked a hundred times. In fact, over the years I had seen him naked too, as he left and returned from his many flights, but I allowed him his moment of modesty right now. I followed his lead and stripped to my thin chemise and underwear, lamenting that I was wearing some of my favourite knickers. They'd be shredded soon. I really should have planned that better. I grabbed my cousin's hand, stepped up onto the balustrade next to him, and took a deep breath as I stared down at the town beneath us. Excitement whipped through my stomach in the same way the wind was messing with my hair. Crazy. Invigorating. You ready, Stavrok said. I nodded. I've been ready for this for years. He jumped, shifting midair and swooping low over the town. I let out a little excited squeal and, letting my shifter take hold of me, threw my human self into the wind. My dragon roared with excitement, rushing forward to take over. Taking to the skies again was like a dream. It had been so long since I'd flown further than the edge of town, and I glided over cloud banks and dipped low over the hilltops, spiralling through the air with the adrenaline of the shift and the freedom singing through my veins. Stavrok indulged my excitement, but eventually he steered me back on course. I followed him toward the mountains, and together we flew over the smoke-wreathed town in the foothills of the Black Castle. Eric and Marianne were somewhere below us, tending to their own kingdom. Part of me wanted to swoop down and say hello, but I was eager to push on. This was the furthest I'd ever flown from Stavrok's castle. The furthest I'd ever journeyed ever. I drank in the colours of the sky, enjoyed the wind rushing past my wings, and revelled in the sharp, icy chill of the air as we pushed onwards. Eventually, we started to spiral lower to land. I followed Stavrok until we touched down beside a small cabin in a sparse cluster of trees. A group of men rushed out to meet us, carrying thick robes. As I shifted, I found myself trembling the instant the cold touched my bare skin. As a dragon, the cold didn't touch me. As a human, it was very different. I'd never felt such cold temperatures before. I wrapped my arms around my bare breasts, my nipples pebbling into hard points from the frost. And we're not even in the far north yet. The man who passed me my robe averted his gaze out of respect, 
though I was sure the men had seen more than they should. I pulled on the robe, hugging the fabric tight around my body and trying not to show my embarrassment. It was hard to hide that, though, with my cheeks flushing with heat. No man had ever seen my naked body other than in this moment. And now that the day had finally come, a cold mountainside and a bunch of Stavrok's guards wasn't exactly the scenario I'd had in mind. Luckily, we were ushered into the cabin before the moment could get too awkward. Stavrok let out his trademark booming laugh. Don't worry, Cass. He clapped a heavy hand on my shoulder as he ducked through the doorway. If any of my men fancy themselves a peak, I'll put their eyes out myself. I looked away in horror, only half sure he was joking. Stavrok could get like that, particularly with Lucy. I chalked it up to his protective nature, but it was more than that with me. I was a royal dragon shifter, and the men around me sensed the power that came with that title. No one would dare lay a finger on me, but I'd caught their eyes on me more and more often over the past few years, as my body had changed into one of a breeding-aged woman. Still chilled to the bone, I scuttled closer to the roaring fire, focusing on warming my face to cover how flustered I was. I'm starving, Stavrok said, settling down beside me on the ground and stretching out his legs. As if on cue, a plate of hot soup and bread was presented to each of us by one of Stavrok's servants. My stomach lurched, and I put my hand to my belly. Damn, I was hungry too. Flying so far had really engaged my appetite. I ate with gusto, tearing into the bread and dipping it into the soup. See, Stavrok said with a note of pride. You're a little wild thing already. I made a face at him, but didn't slow down on eating. When the meal was over, we sat in comfortable silence and stared into the fire's glowing embers. I have another surprise for you, Stavrok said. Lucy and I took a trip to the seamstress last week. She had a hand in the design. Consider it an extra birthday present. He signalled to the man behind him, and the servant came forward carrying something over his arm. When he held it out for me, I gasped. Stavrok! He smiled as I held up the garment in the firelight. It was a long black coat lined with thick grey fur around the collar. The lining was soft and velvety, and when I slipped it on it fit me like a glove. I ran my hands over the delicate pattern stitched into the material, a warmth tingling in my chest. Something brand new and made just for me. It was such a thoughtful, useful gift. It's beautiful. I couldn't help rubbing my cheek over the soft collar. And so warm. Where we're going, dear one, Stavrok said in a soft voice. You'll need it. I was silent, pretending to examine the coat as I mulled over my words. Stavrok? Yes. What's he like? King Damon? I bit my lip, regretting my pointed question. I would never admit it in a thousand years, but a wave of nervous energy flooded through me every time I thought about the King of Winter. I was no stranger to meeting noble families and powerful men. But this felt different, and I wasn't quite sure why. It was my first time visiting his kingdom, and I wanted to know what to expect. What if I make a fool of myself? Stavrok gave me a strange look. He inherited a broken kingdom, Cass. A king needs to be extremely strong to overcome such a tragedy. But what's he like? I pressed. Tall? Short? Funny? Boring? I need details, Stavrok. Stavrok huffed, like I was being unreasonable. He's... He trailed off, staring into the fireplace. Tall. Are you satisfied, little one? Satisfied with tall? Hardly. Don't call me little one. I rolled my eyes. And don't avoid the question. He's a king like any other, Stavrok said eventually. We only met once and we were fighting a battle together. There wasn't much time for small talk, Cass. 
I released a long, drawn-out sigh. There was something he wasn't telling me, but Stavrock wasn't someone I could persuade information out of if he wasn't ready to share it. He'd tell me in his own time. Chapter 3 Cass Our carriages were waiting for us when we passed the tree line, with all the belongings we would need for the trip. Given that I hadn't been given any information about how long the trip would be, I'd packed practically everything I owned, plus everything Lucy had altered for me before we left. I grimaced with sympathy at the thought of the servants lugging all that heavy baggage over the mountains. The men bowed low to Stavrock and me as we stepped up into the carriage. Once inside, I realised we were on a true royal mission, one royal family visiting another. And I was part of that. My heart started to hammer. The anticipation gnawed at me. This was it, the trip I had been waiting for. The journey of a lifetime. When I looked up, Stavrock was watching me again, a frown on his face. Annoyance flashed through me. What? I huffed, crossing my arms. Are you ever going to tell me what's going on? You've been sulking about something since the morning of my birthday. He looked down, then stared out of the window at the landscape as we trundled on. I began to wonder if we'd spend the rest of the journey in silence. I received word from Queen Marianne, he said at last. I brightened up at that. Marianne came to visit Lucy and I whenever she could. She was a natural with the kids, using her magic to make pretty floating lights for them. They loved her as much as we did. But she had her own kingdom to run and a new husband to boot. It had been weeks since I'd heard from her. What's wrong? My heart clenched. Wait, is she okay? Yes, yes. He waved a hand. She and Derek are fine, better than fine. She had some news for me, is all. He paused. The silence weighed heavily between us. About you, he added. I stilled. Marianne's visions were well known throughout the realm, but this was the first time my name had ever been thrown into the mix. I didn't know what to think. What news? I twisted my hands in my lap. Was it bad? Did she see something? She must have, or Stavrock would never have brought it up. His mouth pressed together in a thin line. Whatever he was about to tell me, I could see that it troubled him. My stomach tightened beneath my new coat. How bad could the news be? She had a vision, he said. A vision of you. With King Damon. She believes that the two of you are connected. He glanced out the window. I could tell he really didn't want to be having this conversation. I shook my head, totally lost. I couldn't see what the big deal was. We were going to the north to see King Damon, weren't we? If Marianne saw the future, her vision made sense. But Stavrock looked angry. Is that what you've been so worked up about? I snorted. Some vision of me meeting the king. Hell, I could have predicted that, and I don't have the sight. We're heading there right now, remember? Stavrock twisted around to look at me, his eyes hard. Cass, you don't understand. Marianne's visions, they don't happen every day. She wouldn't have foreseen this if it wasn't important. She believes that the two of you are fated for one another. Shock flooded through me. That can't be true. I wanted to cancel this trip, I heard Stavrock say. I wasn't fully listening anymore, just staring into space, processing the words, hearing them echo in my mind. Fated for one another. But I knew how disappointed you would be. Cass, I'm not saying Marianne is right. Has she ever been wrong? I asked, my tone sharper than I intended. Stavrock's face could have been carved from granite. 
his huge features, usually so warm, were deadly serious. He was more than my cousin. For the first time, I saw him for the man he truly was, a powerful dragon king. All I'm saying is that you need to be prepared. Prepared for what? I wanted to call the carriage to a halt. I needed to ask a million questions. Truth be told, I was terrified. I knew about fated mates. I'd seen it play out right in front of me on the day Stavrok brought Lucy home to the castle. But it was rare for a dragon shifter to find their perfect match. Like, crazy rare. I'd never once imagined it might happen to me. To complicate matters further, I was a virgin. On the occasions I imagined the man I would marry, the idea was hazy and indistinct, but I'd always pictured something sweet, something romantic. Rose petals and soft music. Definitely not the crazed, lust fueled pursuit that came to mind when I pictured a mate's heat. Something must have shown on my face because Stavrok leaned forward. I looked up to meet his gaze. Cass, listen to me. I won't let anything happen to you. I swear. He straightened up, his bulk spanning almost the width of the carriage. I'm here as your guardian. I'll protect you like I always have. Outside, the scenery was changing. The trees were gone, the landscape consisted of miles of frozen ground as far as the eye could see. Inside the carriage we remained warm, but I shivered all the same. How much further? I mumbled. I forced the whole conversation out of my mind. I had come here to explore, to see the world, and I was going to do that no matter what. Stavrok pointed at a distant tower poking over the horizon out of the carriage window. We're almost there. As the carriage wheels turned and the horses picked up the pace, I barely heard the small talk from Stavrok. I couldn't hear anything beyond the rushing in my ears and my own thudding heart. It completely drowned out everything else. Why did it feel like I was about to meet my destiny head on? It was mid-afternoon by the time we arrived at the castle gates. The sky was pale grey and snow blustered in through the door when Stavrok opened it. A blast of icy air hit me and I turned up the collar of my coat as I stepped outside. My eyes widened as I took in the huge castle with its ancient drawbridge. A wide moat surrounded the fortress, laid out around it was what looked like a giant building site. King Damon's enemies raised the whole town to the ground, Stavrok said, as we walked along a winding makeshift path. Everywhere I looked, townsfolk were hard at work, bricklaying, sawing, and heaving huge blocks of stone over the frozen ground. They've been slow to rebuild. The conditions up here can be brutal. I craned my neck to watch the drawbridge as it lowered to let us over the moat. Everywhere I looked there were remnants of the battle, deep gouges in the stonework and burn marks over the battlements that could have only been caused by dragon fire. It's so... I trailed off, lost for words at the huge, imposing structure. Harsh was the word that finally came to mind. All the castles I had seen were square and smooth, made of sandstone. This castle was all dizzying turrets and spiky towers, edged with snowdrifts. So tall, I said eventually, trying to remain polite and letting out a nervous laugh at my lame description. Stavrok grinned, leading me up to the huge front doors. The guardsman stepped aside, bowing low to let us pass. Back home, the palace guards were friendly and open with me. I knew all their names. After all, most of them had watched me grow up. These guards were different. They were fearsome in their thick overcoats, and the broadswords hanging by their sides looked like they had seen their fair share of use. The hallway was as grand and stately as I expected from the imposing exterior, and even Stavrok looked impressed. He glanced up at a huge window as we passed underneath an elaborate stone archway, whistling. The last time I was here, this room was nothing but rubble, 
he said, catching my eye. I hardly even recognised the place. As Stavrok continued to admire the repair work, I trailed after him, my eyes wide. I tried to keep up, but in truth I was barely paying attention to the running commentary. Now that we were in the castle, it was impossible to forget about Marianne's vision. The man I was about to meet could very well be my intended mate. The one person who was designed for me, and me for him. Part of me wanted to run screaming from the place. The other part was so excited I could barely walk straight. I'd wanted a life and an adventure outside the safety of Stavrok's castle, and I'd gotten it. In spades. We were led deeper and deeper into the castle, down the cavernous hallways. Our guide, another stone-faced guard, made me nervous. I stuck close to Stavrok's side, my mind racing. My palms itched with anticipation and my dragon shifter stirred closer to the surface than usual. I tried to imagine this king, a total stranger, somewhere in the castle. Could he feel my presence? Was this nervous anticipation just normal level excitement at getting out and having an adventure, or was it more? What if what Marianne had foretold was true? I swallowed as Stavrok indicated I should move forward, and together we walked into a small antechamber. Two more guards waited on either side of a set of huge doors. They stared at us impassively as we approached and knocked once on the double doors. My heart stalled in my chest. It was too late to turn back now. Chapter 4 Damon Sire! The voice of my chief adviser echoing across the great hall startled me out of my thoughts. They're here! I straightened and stood up from my throne, stepping down from the dais and striding forward into the centre of the large space. It was customary to greet a fellow king on equal ground. I could not meet my guests from up high on my throne. The formal clothes I wore were stiff and uncomfortable. I much preferred my everyday attire, but my advisers had cautioned against it for this meeting. I found all the court rules and regulations stifling, especially when my mind and my focus were on the repair work I'd been carrying out with my men only this morning. Still, Stavrok had shown me great generosity during the battle by coming to our aid. Not to mention what he'd done for us since we started repairing. It was only fitting that I return that favour by allowing him and his cousin to visit and see the renovations. Plus, it gave me a chance to show another kingdom that we were slowly regaining our former strength. Hopefully, the word would spread. My ancient house, the family of ice dragons that had ruled the north for generations, had survived the raiders. The castle wasn't the only thing my father had driven to ruin. I needed to rebuild alliances and treaties. The best way to do that was to make peace with my fellow rulers. The corners of my mouth lifted into a polite, welcoming smile as the double doors opened. His Majesty, King Stavrok of the Bravdok clan, and his cousin, the Princess Cassandra. Stavrok strode into the room with all the brazen confidence I remembered. The years since the battle hadn't changed him that much, only a few more threads of silver in his hair indicated that time had passed. I greeted him with a nod, and he grinned back, charging over with his hand outstretched, ready to pull me into a friendly bear hug. He only managed to get halfway across to me, however, before I caught sight of the other newcomer standing behind him. My dragon instantly woke from its slumber, uncoiling inside my chest. I growled, trying to push him down. Something I'd never felt before pulsed through my veins, dark and hot, filling me with a single-minded purpose, a desire like I'd never known before. What the hell is this? Whatever it was, I had no power to stop it. The force rolled through me like a tidal wave. My vision began to change. Everything in the room faded out of focus. And nothing else mattered. 
not Stavrok, nor my kingdom, not my castle repairs, not the fact that I was a king. Only she remained. Her chestnut brown hair hung in loose curls, dusted with snowflakes from her journey. Her eyes were wide and fringed with dark lashes. Unlike most of the shifters I had met, who all had icy, pale blue eyes, hers were a deep, warm brown. I need her. The realisation hit me like an anvil. I didn't have time to consider what it meant. I strode forward, my gaze zeroed in on my prize. Stavrok stepped in front of her, blocking my path. He knocked away my hands that were already outstretched for her. I released a deep snarl, prepared to shift fully if I needed to fight the other man. My neighbouring king. The obstacle in the path of my need. Stavrok was on the brink of shifting as well. I caught sight of his dragon when his angry gaze flashed to meet mine. Hot rage curled within me and I lowered my stance. Stavrok would not keep her from me. She wasn't any woman. This one was mine. On some level, where my brain still operated rationally, I knew the difference. I'd had women before. I was a dragon king, and I had to satisfy my appetite for pleasure alongside everything else. The stresses of recent years meant I'd tamped down my desires. In the face of all I had to rebuild, a fumble with a maid or some woman in town felt like a waste of time. I had responsibilities, more important things to deal with than my sex drive. Not that plenty of women hadn't put themselves in my path. I was their king. More often than not, I'd rebuffed them. And this was why. She was why. All thought of polite pleasantries and formal introductions were long gone. We circled each other, Stavrok managing to keep himself between me and the girl as I snarled with impatience. We weren't two kings anymore, meeting for an official royal visit. This was deeper. Primal. We were dragon shifters, and the need to fight this invader, this intruder in my kingdom, coursed through me as strong as the ocean. For whatever reason, the mere sight of this girl inflamed my dragon like no other. Only one thing remained, the feral, frenzied, uncontrollable urge to take her and carry her out of here. Stavrok shouted something, but I was too far gone to hear it. I could only watch, burning with fury, as he grabbed the girl by the arm and practically dragged her out of the room. The moment the heavy doors thudded closed behind them, I was there, pounding against the wood. My shifter writhed in frustration. It was all I could do not to release my anger, shift, and burn down my own door to get to her. Stavrok, I bellowed, fists balled against the immovable oak door. Open the door, right now, before I burn the damn thing down. So, it is true. The voice came back, muffled, from the other side of the door. Marianne was right. I was losing patience. As every minute passed, shifting looked like a more and more appealing plan. What is true? You're my cousin's true match. Her fated mate, Stavrok yelled through the door. I forced myself to take deep, ragged breaths, fighting to regain control. It was easier now that the girl, Princess Cassandra, wasn't in the same room, but knowing exactly where she was, just out of reach, the feeling of it, the knowledge, it was pure torture. I groaned and again smashed my fist against the wood. The two of you are destined for each other, Stavrok added. I pressed my forehead against the door, growling. Then what are you waiting for? Let me through. You're not in control, Damon. I bared my teeth at him, even though he couldn't see it. Frustration pounded through me. She's young, Stavrok hissed. And still a virgin. Stavrok, another voice cut in. A sweet, light voice, admonishing him for revealing a truth that had my dragon slowly retreating. 
a virgin, then I would be her first, her only. Open the door, cousin, she said, and the sound washed over me like silk. She sounded perfect, right down to that thrum of desire I heard in her tone. Oh, yes. She had felt the lick of need, too, it seemed. But I needed to get myself under control so I could meet her properly. I straightened, crowding as close as possible up against the door and hoping she would speak again. Get yourself together, Stavrok said, as if he knew exactly how hard I was struggling. Perhaps he did. His wife Lucy was Stavrok's mate. Perhaps it had been like this for him. I'm warning you, Damon. If you can't control your dragon, I will leave and I'll take Cass with me. You'll never see her again. He sounded dangerous, deadly. If I were fully in my right mind, I might have been afraid. Stavrok was a fearsome warrior. I had no doubt that if anything happened to his beloved cousin, he would have my head for it. Literally. I focused on breathing, clearing the fog that had spread through my senses. Okay. I took a few steps back from the door. I'm ready. Slowly, the doors opened. Stavrok stood with his arms crossed half in front of Cassandra. She sidled out from around his body shield. Had my behaviour terrified her? One glance told me otherwise, from the lust burning in her gaze to the way a light flush spread over her cheeks. I forced down a shiver and turned my attention back to Stavrok. My apologies, I said through gritted teeth. Your cousin caught me by surprise. Stavrok's face was stony, and I could tell he was holding back for Cass's sake. He nodded, straightening up, his posture remaining protective. My dragon simmered with rage at the show of strength. I knew better than to challenge him, though, because when it came to the safety of his cousin, Stavrok was indeed doing the right thing. Even if my dragon couldn't see it yet. You could have cut the tension in the room with a blade. One wrong move, and the peace I'd built, this fragile alliance I wanted to strengthen between my kingdom and Stavrok's, could be reduced to ashes. We stood in silence, my head buzzing. Well, Stavrok said loudly, clapping his hands together. Do we get the grand tour? Of course, I replied, grateful for the suggestion. It would give us all something to concentrate on, other than my need to shift and fly away with my mate. Follow me. Chapter 5 Damon I led them through the castle, focusing my mind on anything but the woman walking with Stavrok. I pointed out all the changes I'd made and moved as if in a trance. The voices around me were muffled, like I was underwater. After a while, Stavrok stepped out in front and led the way, talking loudly and asking question after question. He seemed keen to put as much space between me and his cousin as possible. Cass herself was an enigma. I could barely keep my eyes off her. She flitted through the hallways, her gaze wide and excited at every detail, every new discovery. Occasionally she stole a glance at me, and I looked away the moment our eyes met, glaring down at the floor. I didn't trust my dragon not to grab her if he had half the chance. Her long dark hair tumbled around her shoulders in loose curls, and her eyes were warm and bright. Everything about her was a breath of fresh air in this cold, gloomy place. She reminded me of a butterfly, the way she darted from window to window. And yet, somehow, I knew that she was as aware of me as I was of her. Even though she seemed more able to throw it off and act normally, I sensed the desire simmering beneath the surface of her beautiful exterior. My dragon ached for her. More than anything, I wanted to grab her and haul her away somewhere, anywhere we could be alone. Then I could unleash all my passion and drive her into ecstasy. But a small part of me, the tiny shred of reason buried in the back of my mind, 
told me that Stavrock was right about not rushing this connection I felt for Cass. I couldn't risk offending Stavrock. And I couldn't risk her safety. Especially if she was as innocent and virginal as Stavrock said. Outside, the snowflakes tumbled thicker and faster as we reached the rear of the castle, where the high walls overlooked the small gardens below. Cass tapped on the windows. What's that down there? The hedge maze, I said. Her eyes lit up at the prospect of an adventure. My ancestors planted it centuries ago, I added, wanting to prolong the conversation with her, but still having trouble with my dragon staying under control. Stavrock's eyes narrowed. Cass, you're not going out there in this weather. There's going to be a blizzard before long. Cass tilted her chin up at him defiantly. It's my birthday, isn't it? We didn't come all this way so I could end up stuck inside another castle. No offence, she added, glancing at me. Heat gathered in my chest as her eyelashes swept across her cheeks. None taken, I murmured, pretending intense interest in the weather beyond the window as Stavrock and Cass debated beside me. Eventually, Cass won the argument, and, as I turned to look at them, Stavrock scowled at me. I wasn't going to be the ally he hoped for. In this state, I could hardly deny her request. My dragon wanted to give Cass everything. I'll protect her. As we headed down to the small gatehouse at the foot of the castle, emerging into the frosty air on the long, winding path that took us toward the gardens, Cass appeared suddenly, bobbing up beside my elbow. I shuddered with longing as she brushed against my arm. The pink that rose in her cheeks had nothing to do with the cold air and suggested she felt the same way as me. What's in the middle? she asked. I turned to stare at her, my eyes trailing downward. She was a petite little thing, only coming up to my shoulder. I didn't trust myself to speak, so I waited for her to clarify. Of the maze, she added, and then bit her lip. I groaned internally, imagining what it would be like to sink my teeth into her soft flesh, right where her teeth currently nibbled. Don't mazes usually have a prize in the middle? Her gaze lingered on mine. I couldn't help but wonder what kind of prize she was imagining. There were plenty of places for two people to get lost inside a maze. Perhaps that's what she's counting on. I shrugged, not trusting my voice. She would see soon enough what was at the centre of the maze. Stavrock was glowering by the time we reached the entrance. The tall hedges on either side were already covered in a fine bank of snow. A glance up to the sky didn't tell me much. The weather could turn, or it could hold. Behind Stavrock, Cass was admiring a frost-tipped rose. The colour matched her glowing cheeks. She was utterly bewitching. I would give her anything she wanted. The knowledge terrified me. I glowered, hoping that my fascination didn't show on my face. Are you sure you want to do this? Stavrock grumbled, flicking snow off the edge of his coat. Cass grinned up at him. He sighed, mumbling something about birthdays and annoying cousins, but followed her into the maze without a backward glance. I trailed after them. My dragon was still simmering inside me, barely contained, the urge to grab her thudded continuously in the back of my mind. If anything, it was growing stronger with each twist and turn of the maze. Cass led us deeper and deeper. Stavrock swore when he stumbled over an exposed tree root, grumbling to himself. The hedges closed around us. Cass practically ran around each bend in the hedgerows. It turned into a game of chase. My heart raced as I tracked her through the maze. My dragon was single-minded and greedy. It wanted her. She skipped ahead, throwing a cheeky smile back at me. I caught the edge of a skirt, a loose curl, before she slipped out of sight around the corner. I glanced behind me. Stavrock was nowhere to be seen. I was alone. 
there was nothing for it but to go on. The sky above was white with snowflakes, which were falling thicker and faster than ever. Cass, I shouted. Stavrok. I listened intently, but there was no answer, only the wind rustling through the leaves around me. I knew the maze better than most. When I was a child, I often played in it, or hid away where the servants couldn't find me when my father was on one of his temper fueled rampages. But as I got closer to the middle, my worry grew. I could make it out of here, but Cass and Stavrok. Get to Cass, my dragon growled. Find her. Protect her. Take her. I rounded the corner and got my bearings, realising I was close to the centre. My heart rate picked up when I heard a voice behind me, high and sweet. King Damon? I turned. Cass stood in the middle of the path. She had her arms wrapped around her body, tucked into herself, and she was trembling as gust after gust of cold air buffeted the hedgerows around us and sent her hair tumbling and flying within a cascade of snowflakes. This way, I said, not trusting myself to get too near her. I strode down the path, leading the way. Her footsteps trotted as she caught up with me. We need to get out of here. Her voice trembled. The snowstorm was building, and it wouldn't be long before we were trapped in it. Shouldn't we turn around? She was right. We needed to get under cover, and fast. There wasn't time to get back to the entrance and make our way back to the castle. I swallowed thickly as I realised that we only had one option. You wanted to know what was at the centre of the maze. I strode onwards. The path narrowed, and I knew what waited for us around the next corner. Didn't you? Well, yes, but... I turned and stared at her. Trust me. Our eyes met. Heat sparked through my veins. Her breathing grew ragged. The fur on her collar rose and fell with each exhale. She nodded. Together, we turned the final corner. We had reached the centre of the maze. Without Stavrok. In the middle of the clearing stood the entrance to the stone grotto that led to the caves. I ushered Cass toward the entrance. The snow was falling so thickly that I could barely make out the stony entrance. As Cass hurried into the grotto, I ducked back outside to take a final look around for Stavrok. He was nowhere to be seen. Cursing the weather, I ran back into the cave after her. Cass! My voice echoed off the rocky walls. I climbed down the steps cut into the rock. The sound of soft footsteps shuffled up ahead. My heart pounded with adrenaline. We were alone. I should never have agreed to show them the maze. I knew the weather would get worse. They aren't from around here. They don't know how harsh our winters are. They're used to rolling hills and mild snowdrifts. I admonished myself, but it was too late to change anything now. I could only blame my misjudgment on my foggy head and the overpowering lust that I couldn't shake. It was more potent than anything I'd felt before, and my body wouldn't let me forget that the source of my misery was a scant few feet away from me. Damon, Cass called again, nearer this time. I stepped into the cavern. Dim light flickered from a torch set into the stone wall, casting a golden glow over the stone. Cass had her back to me, staring into the pool that dominated the room, watching the steam rise from it and spiral upwards. It's a hot spring, I said, coming over to stand beside her. From this close I could feel the warmth from her body. People swim here sometimes. It's said that the water has healing properties. She glanced up at me. Can I? Once I realised what she was asking, I stiffened. We would be stuck here for some time until the storm lifted. She was cold and wanted to go in to warm up, and with her staring at me like that, I couldn't think of a good reason why not. The second I nodded, she began to unbutton her coat, 
sliding the fabric down and off her shoulders. A growl rose unbidden to my lips. I turned my back on her and strode over to the other side of the cave, facing the mouth of the tunnel. Where are you going? Her voice was light, teasing. She was taunting me. Nowhere, I forced out, as I stared down at a wooden chest by the entrance to the cave. It held clean clothes and towels, if I remembered correctly, but I couldn't make myself reach down to open the lid. My body was wound far too tightly. A soft rustle reached my ears, the sound of fabric dropping to the floor. I clenched my hands into fists when the gentle sounds of lapping water reached me. Then I heard her body slide beneath the surface. I swallowed, squeezing my eyes closed. It's so warm! Her tone was startled, as though she couldn't believe that up here in the freezing mountains, beneath the arid earth, were warm springs. But I heard the sweet undercurrent of pleasure in her words and began to imagine how she'd look floating in the water. I forced myself to relax and draw deep, even breaths. The mere thought of her naked body sliding beneath the water was maddening. I could hear the gentle splash as she moved around, but I didn't dare look. Aren't you joining me, my king? Her tone was teasing, and her words even more so. That was the last straw. I rounded on her. What game are you playing at? She was in the middle of the pool, submerged up to her bare shoulders. Curly tendrils of her dark hair lay on the water's surface. She looked like a nymph, or a siren, come to lead me to my doom. What do you mean? She sounded shocked. Her eyes, however, raked up and down my body. I had only deigned to remove my outer coat and I stood before her in my shirt and slacks. Strangely, I felt like I was the naked one. You want me to swim with you? Alone, in this cave? With? I gritted my teeth, waving a hand to indicate her bare form. Your cousin? My cousin, Cass interrupted, her eyes flashing with impatience. Is not here. Chapter 6 Damon Cass stilled and then looked up at me again. There was a new fire in her eyes, burning even brighter than before. I hadn't realised that she must have been kneeling until slowly she stood up in the pool and revealed herself to me. out of the water. Guilt hammered me, choking the life out of the afterglow that flowed through me. I was sated, satisfied, and utterly screwed. This beautiful, innocent girl, I'd taken her. Without a second thought about her innocence. My dragon had overruled my better judgment, and I'd done the one thing I swore I would not do until my kingdom was repaired. I had claimed my mate. My kingdom still lay in ruins around me. I spent all my days and many of my nights rebuilding the castle and the land surrounding it, shoring up our defences in preparation for winter. My world was one of ice and fire. The land was harsh and hostile, and only harsh things grew here. My people were tough. They had to be, in order to weather anything that the North threw at them. Cass was slender, beautiful, and delicate. She was a hothouse flower, a rare creature in such a cold climate. Such beauty surely couldn't survive the ice world in which I lived. I swallowed as she climbed out of the water behind me. Droplets cascaded down her body, making her look even more ethereal and delicate. After everything was said and done, I was no better than my father. The man had terrorised this country for so long. He'd been selfish and weak. He'd taken without a second thought. And now I'd done exactly the same to Cass. Damon? 
I half turned my head. Mercifully, she'd slipped on her dress. It clung to her damp body, and I looked away before my baser instincts could wreak further havoc. The snow should have eased off by now, I said. We need to return to the castle before nightfall, or your cousin might. I trailed off and we stared guiltily at each other. What would Stavrock do? That was the burning question. Okay. She sounded so despondent that I turned to look at her properly. A stab of remorse ran through me when I realised she was shivering. I strode over to the wooden chest near the entrance to the cave, rifling through it until I found a large, fluffy towel. Here. I returned to her, draping the towel around the exposed skin of her shoulders and wrapping it firmly around her. Use this as an extra layer. She gave me a wan smile and I picked up her coat, helping her into it. What about you? Her eyes flicked over my soaking form, and I remembered abruptly that I had been almost fully clothed when I rushed into the water. At the sight of her naked body, all of my common sense had gone out the window. I couldn't help the sheepish smile that crept over my face. I played it cool, shrugging. I'm from the north. We're cold-blooded up here. Her eyes glimmered, and the corners of her mouth twitched. Is that so? Well, you could have fooled me. She glanced at the hot pool behind her, as if to remind me wordlessly of our heated encounter. Like I needed reminding. My face remained stoic, but my heart was still beating a mile a minute in my chest. I regretted the loss of control, regardless of the current sated feeling in my body. Whatever the dragon inside me wanted, my actions had been reckless. Who am I kidding? If my dragon had its way, we'd already be going for round two. Come on, I said, changing the subject. Your cousin is probably worried sick. Without waiting for a response, I picked up my own coat from where it lay in a crumpled heap on the floor and haphazardly pulled it on. Then I strode toward the mouth of the cave. I needed to put some space between me and Cass. That was all I needed. Time to think, to clear my head. The cold air hit me and my wet clothes hard as we exited the cave, but the snow had thankfully eased off. The sooner we were out of this maze and back under the watchful gaze of Stavrock, the better. At least, for Cass. Chapter 7 Cass the journey back through the maze to the castle, despite my best attempts at conversation, was mostly silent. Damon didn't hesitate in choosing the path out of the maze. He probably had the route memorised. With his longer legs, I had to almost jog to keep pace with him, but I didn't mind that. It helped take my mind off the cold. Occasionally, I felt his eyes on me, but he always dropped his gaze before I could get a read on him. There was worry in his expression, though, and his broad shoulders were stiff with tension. It didn't make sense. Back in the cave, he'd been passionate and intense. Everything I'd ever dreamed a lover could be. Things had been simple between us there, when it was just the two of us. I wanted him, and he wanted me. Now he was evasive. I tried to make the best of the heavy silence and use the time to organise my thoughts. Everything had happened so fast. The last few hours were a jumbled up blur of sensations. It was hard not to let the excitement of the day overwhelm me. I felt like a totally different person to the girl who had woken up that morning. From the second I'd laid eyes on Damon, my dragon had responded, hungry for his touch. We'd gone from room to room, down every hallway and explored every inch of his castle. Nothing slaked the burning fire in my belly. It was all I could do not to launch myself at him and demand he drag me away somewhere to ravish me. Which was so out of character, I couldn't understand what had overtaken me. I'd thought the fresh air might help matters exploring the maze, but I had no such luck. I had been aching for him to take me, 
My only thought by then had been to lure him deeper, somewhere away from prying eyes. Somewhere away from my chaperone, Stavrock. I thought we'd both gotten what we wanted. But Damon's attitude now suggested otherwise. I guess I was wrong. The second we were back inside the castle, he muttered something about needing a change of clothes and hurried off into another room. The door slammed shut behind him with a resounding thud. I lingered in the hallway. My hair was still dripping from melted snow and water from the heated spring pool. The soft sounds of water dripping against the tiles on the floor was the only noise in the empty space. The ecstasy I had experienced in the cave felt like a far-off dream. I'd stepped back into the cold, harsh light of day, and my happiness gave way to doubt. What does this mean? What will happen if he doesn't want me? Ice filled the pit of my stomach. I wasn't sure how long I stood there, turning every detail of our encounter over in my mind. Now that the initial frenzy of lust had been satisfied, I could look at things more objectively. Did I do something wrong? I thought back to the way Damon held me against him, his firm hands on my hips, his hot mouth on my neck. The way he thrust into me, claiming me. I bit my lip, the heat rising in my cheeks once again as lust twisted in my belly, making me ache for more. He had wanted me, that much had been clear. So why can he barely look at me now? Cass. I turned, relief flooding me at the familiar voice. I'd never been so happy to see my cousin. Stavrock! I rushed over to him. We lost you back there. Are you all right? Stavrock's eyes flickered on the word we, but he otherwise ignored my phrasing. He grunted, looking unhappy. The way back to the castle was easy enough from the air, he said. I shifted as soon as the weather turned. I looked for you, Cass, but I couldn't see you. I thought you must have returned to the castle, but... He tilted his head. I could see the cogs turning in his mind, and I fiddled with my fingers, twisting them around each other, uncomfortable under his intense scrutiny. Damon found me. My eyes flickered over to a nearby tapestry. Stavrock's gaze burned a hole in the side of my face, but I ignored him. There were these underground caves and... I trailed off. My cheeks grew hot. I reached up and pressed a hand against one, trying to hide my face behind my still wet hair. I see, Stavrock said. After his earlier attitude, I expected him to explode with anger. In the back of my mind, I feared he would tear apart the castle, kill Damon, and carry me home with him but he didn't sound enraged. Instead, he seemed resigned. I looked up. You're not mad at me? His gaze softened as he looked down at me. Cass, I could never be mad at you. We just... I scrambled for a way to explain. A thousand excuses for my behaviour fell into my head. The weather, the cave, the water. The way Damon looked at me how good his hands had felt. Stavrock definitely wouldn't appreciate hearing all the details. But I had to make him understand. It just happened, I whispered. It's like Marianne said. Like you said. I think it was always going to happen. Stavrock huffed, but he nodded. His hands rested on my shoulders and we stood together in the quiet. When I look at you, I still see that tiny girl who showed up at the castle gates one night with nowhere else to go. In a familiar, comforting gesture, Stavrock tugged gently on a lock of my hair. You've always been more than a cousin to me, Cass. You're like my baby sister. It's hard for me to admit that you've grown up. I know. But I have. He gave a heavy sigh and stepped backwards. It seems that I owe Marianne once again. We smiled at each other. Then Stavrock's face turned serious. Cass, it's probably best if I head home. I only came to introduce you to Damon and to protect you from his dragon if it was needed. 
but you've proven you can handle him well enough on your own, and, well, I need to return. I have my own kingdom to run. A shiver of loss ran through me. All this time, Stavrok had been a necessary endurance. My chaperone, an annoying brother figure standing in the way of my destiny. The thought of him leaving left me cold. He was the one constant in this stark and forbidding place, my only reminder of home. He gave me a regretful smile. You don't need me here, Cass. I know, but... I bit my lip to stop from continuing. I sounded petulant. The truth was, I was afraid, alone in a frozen fortress with a mate who was a stranger to me. That's only if you want to stay. Stavrok lifted an eyebrow. Or have I read you wrong? You can come home with me also if you'd like. The idea of leaving now filled me with an even greater dread. King Damon was my destiny, my fate. I was sure of it. I couldn't leave him now. I looked straight at my cousin and smiled as confidently as I could. I want to stay. Stavrok nodded. I knew you would. I'm so proud of the woman you've become, Cass. I know you'll do me proud as my royal representative here, and if you have any issues with the Winter King, you know you can always come home. I grinned at him. In this weather? He shrugged. You're a royal, Cass. Shift and fly home. We'll be there waiting with open arms, no matter what. Tears filled my eyes as I embraced my cousin, my protector, my king. Thank you, Stavrok. He was right. I was a grown woman now. If I wanted a life of my own, I'd have to take the opportunity on offer and make it my own. Stavrok had taken his leave and night had fallen in the castle. Damon did not reappear. Luckily, I was considered a valued royal guest, so I was not left to wander aimlessly or lament being alone. The servants showed me up the winding staircase to a cosy suite of rooms. I huddled gratefully beside a roaring fire in the grate, watching snow drift past the windows. The fur throws strewn all over the bed were thick and soft to the touch, and I tugged one over my shoulders while I sat and stared into the flames. It was quite obvious. Damon was avoiding me. I rang the bell that had been left for me and called for a maidservant. It was a matter of minutes before the door opened and a woman entered. She was a slip of a thing, scarcely older than I was, and she eyed me with poorly disguised anxiety. Can I help you, your highness? King Damon. I stood, letting the fur blanket slide back onto my chair. Where is he? The maid looked even more nervous at my question. I softened my expression, hearing Stavrok's words echo around my head. You're a stranger to them, remember? They're not used to outsiders. You'll have to win over their trust, little by little. I... I'm not sure, ma'am. We stared at each other. We both knew she was lying. In all likelihood, he slept in another part of the castle altogether. He had tucked me away in one of the guest bedrooms, probably as far from his chambers as he could. Out of sight, out of mind. Very well, I said eventually, defeated. For now. The maid bobbed a curtsy before she turned to leave. A thought struck me, and I put up a hand. Wait. She turned back, her eyebrows drawing together. Can I help you with anything else, your highness? I bit my lip. Win over their trust. I only wanted to ask your name. My name? She sounded surprised. It's Isla, ma'am. Isla. I repeated the unfamiliar name, giving her a genuine smile. Thank you for your help, Isla. Her brows rose and she almost smiled back before her nerves kicked in again. With one final curious glance at me, the maid was gone. I thought longingly of my maids at home. Of Maddie, who scolded me constantly over reading too much, 
leaving my clothes in a mess and failing to follow the formal etiquette of the royal houses, among other things, and she didn't suffer fools lightly. I re-wrapped myself in the blanket and burrowed down into its warmth, staring into the flames. I would give anything to see Maddy again, even if I would most likely receive a lecture on disappearing into hedge mazes with strange men. Hell, I even miss the babies. Coming here had turned my world upside down. Nothing was what I expected. I'd flown farther than I ever had before, lost my virginity, and found the man that Marianne claimed was my fated mate. A fated mate who can barely look at me since our encounter in that cave. And I have no idea why. I gave myself a mental shake. Damn it. I was the Princess Cassandra of the Kingdom of Bravdok, cousin to King Stavrok. I was a dragon shifter, and a powerful one at that. Nothing was going to dampen my spirits. Not even Damon and his strange mood. I wanted to be here. No matter how nervous I was, how alone I felt now that Stavrok was gone. Maybe winning over Damon was impossible. I could be fighting a losing battle, wanting love from a man who had none to give. Something told me not to give up hope. I'd wanted adventure, hadn't I? Well, now I was right in the middle of one. I stared at the carved dragons and wolves over the fireplace. In the flickering orange glow of firelight, they almost seemed alive, twisting and fighting with each other along the wooden panel. The broad reindeer antlers hanging over the mantelpiece cast long shadows against the back wall. Maybe I could belong here. The question was, how could I get Damon to see that? Chapter 8 Cass I woke the next day bright and early, my mind made up. I sat bolt upright, smiling broadly to myself like a madwoman. I had a plan. Damon could be as stoic and silent as he wanted. I wasn't going to let it get to me. I would enjoy myself, just as I'd intended to before all this business of soulmates and the irresistible desire that came with it got in the way. He can like it or lump it. I don't care. I flung off the covers and towed on the fur-lined slippers that lay waiting for me by the fireplace. A glance out of the window told me that the snowfall was lighter today. Yes, I would get a chance to see the countryside I'd been aching to explore for years. My stomach tightened with anticipation as I thought about the day that lay ahead. A sharp knock at the door startled me. Come in, I called out as I bounced over to the huge wardrobe. All my clothes were hung up neatly inside, waiting for me. Your Highness? The door creaked open, and I smiled over my shoulder in the general direction of Isla's voice. I came to ask if you'd like me to bring you some breakfast. I waved her off. I'll eat with Damon, I said happily, then did a double-take as her eyes widened. What's wrong? The king usually doesn't like to be disturbed, ma'am. He takes his meals in his study. I wrinkled my nose. Well, let's surprise him. Isla looked frightened by this prospect, but I grinned at her. You know, Isla, I'm a visiting royal, and I think I deserve at least a little of the king's company, don't you think? I, uh, yes, I believe you do, ma'am. Isla gave me a tentative smile back, and I counted that as a small win. Cass won, Damon yet to score. I grabbed her elbow and steered her toward the open wardrobe. Can you help me pick out some suitable clothing? Um. Isla glanced at the rows of garments, then back at me, seemingly at a total loss. I suppose, yes. I grinned with triumph. Did that count as win number two? Rifling through my dresses, I pulled out a simple blouse with a lacy, open neck. This is one of my favourites. What do you think? Pair it with a long skirt? I think you'll freeze before you take a step outside, Isla muttered, before slapping a hand over her mouth. I intended no disrespect, Your Highness. 
I only meant... I snorted and pushed the offending garment back into place. Don't apologise. I really need your advice. I ducked my head. I'm not exactly used to travelling. In fact, it's kind of a first-time thing for me. I've never been south, Isla admitted. Her voice was quiet but full of curiosity. She rubbed her fingers against the soft lining of a skirt. All your clothes are so pretty. I've never seen fabrics like these before. I stared at the clothes and shrugged. Pretty, but useless for this weather up here in the north. The only exception was Lucy's clothing that had been altered for me, but I didn't see many of those hanging up. Perhaps they were still being transferred here. Isla frowned with concentration as she scanned through the rack holding my dresses. Eventually she made a noise of victory, pulling out a soft pair of trousers and a sweater. She handed me the items before stepping back and looking me up and down, assessing. Wait here, she said, before turning tail and leaving me holding the garments and feeling more confused than ever. I held them up in front of the mirror and smiled. It was hardly my usual style, but maybe I could get used to it. The whole point of the trip was to try new things. I kind of liked the idea of trousers. It offered more freedom than a long and often cumbersome skirt. Winter chic, I whispered to myself. My reflection smiled back at me in the long mirror. In spite of Damon's disappearance, this trip was turning out to be rather fun. Isla returned with a dust-covered box tucked under one arm. I found these stored away in the old Queen's quarters, she said, handing over the box. I took it puzzled. The old Queen? Was that Damon's mother? They look about your size. You'll need them if you want to stand a chance on frozen ground. She stared pointedly at the soft shoes I'd worn yesterday. They hadn't survived the hedge maze. They lay abandoned, still drying out in front of the fireplace. The silk was crumpled and stained with mud. A flush heated my cheeks at the memory of yesterday. To distract myself, I brushed away the dust on the box and opened the lid, pulling the soft tissue paper away to reveal a sturdy pair of boots nestled within. I pulled them out one by one, then plopped down on the armchair and tugged them on over my nightclothes. I felt kind of ridiculous, but wouldn't risk insulting my newfound friend by waiting until later to try them on. Isla had to help with the laces, but pretty soon I had them figured out. The boots were calf length, soft and supple. They fit me perfectly, and they were so comfortable. I turned this way and that in front of the mirror, unable to remember the last time I'd worn clothes built for practicality as well as beauty. It felt surprisingly good. They suit you, your highness, Isla remarked. Will you need any help with the rest? I shook my head. I can manage from here. Thank you, Isla. As she left the room, I grinned. So far, so good. I dressed and threw my hair back into a simple braid before hurrying out of the room. Retracing my steps from the day before turned out to be something of a challenge. After encountering several dead ends and having an embarrassing run-in with a couple of confused guards, I found myself lingering in the doorway of a huge, darkened chamber. The dining hall. I peered inside, frowning around at the gloomy space. All the curtains were pulled shut, and the tapestries hanging from the walls were faded and worn. Guess he doesn't throw many parties in here. I shut the door softly and crept back along the corridor. Unwilling to ask for help, I ended up following my instinct until I came to a standstill outside a room where light spilled out from underneath the closed doors. Bingo! I hesitated and then knocked. Come in. Damon's voice travelled through the door. His tone was muffled, but he sounded weary, like he hadn't had much sleep. Now or never. I turned the handle and slipped over the threshold before I could talk myself out of it. Damon was sitting behind a huge, old desk. There was only candlelight filling the room with a soft light and very little else in the room. 
There were none of the riches I'd come to expect from a kingdom's inner rooms, but apparently this king was like none other. I was beginning to understand that, even though I'd only been here a day or so. He looked up at the sound of the door closing behind me. His eyes widened before the blank, stoic mask resettled on his face. Cassandra. He stood, straight-backed and formal. Okay, so this is how it's going to go. How can I help you? His tone was stiff and formal. The servant said you don't usually have breakfast. I bit my lip, noting the way his eyes tracked the motion of my teeth. So, I thought I'd come ask if you'd join me. He blinked as if shocked. There were shadows under his eyes and thin lines of tension at the corners of his mouth. I ached to know what weighed on him so heavily. He seemed at a loss for words. That's very thoughtful of you. Thank you. I shot him a smile, edging closer. I am a visiting royal, remember? For a moment, it seemed as if I'd won a smile from him. But then his lips resettled into their non-committal expression. I settled for sitting at the edge of his desk, toying at the loose papers strewn over the surface. What are you working on? I asked. Farming ledgers. It's all boring. Paperwork, mostly, he said, shuffling the papers away out of sight. I'm heading out to the tenant farms today. I need to see how much grain the kingdom will yield before next winter. As he spoke, his hands rested on the desk in front of him. They were rough, expressive hands, large and calloused with use. The hands of someone who built things, crafted things, who worked hard alongside his men. Not a spoilt, rich king. Those same hands had only yesterday pressed relentlessly into my soft flesh, touched me everywhere, greedy and possessive. I swallowed at the memory, looking away. I'd like to come with you if that's all right, I said. I'd like to see more of your kingdom and meet the people. Damon ran a hand through his hair, staring at me with a strange look in his eyes. Are you sure that's what you want? I nodded. Yes, very much so. But with respect, your majesty. You need to eat something first. Is that so? He murmured. The look in his eyes told me he had something else in mind. Another kind of hunger altogether. Our eyes met. After what felt like an eternity, my cheeks heated and I ducked my head. To hide my glowing face, I turned and hurried over to the door, peeking out of it. The footman who waited on the other side looked at me with curiosity. His Majesty and I will take breakfast in here this morning, I said, trying to sound confident. Hell, everyone needs to eat, right? Even the King of the Ice Dragons. If the footman was surprised by the request, he didn't show it, merely nodding before turning away. I shut the door and ambled over to a nearby bookshelf. I felt Damon's eyes burning into my back, tracking my every move. I didn't turn around, shifting my focus instead to all the unfamiliar titles. I ran my fingers along the decorated spines, my heart pounding in my chest. Some of the books looked ancient. I burned with curiosity, forgetting myself for a second and sliding free a book with embellished silver wolves on the cover. I leafed through it. You like reading? The sound of his voice in the hushed room made me jump. Although he hadn't moved from his position on the other side of the desk, the low notes raised goosebumps on the back of my neck. The effect was the same as if he was pressed right up against me. I do, Your Majesty. I slanted a glance behind me, only to meet his intense gaze. He stared at me like I was a puzzle he couldn't figure out. I didn't have much else to do growing up. I said nothing of the loneliness that had carved a deep furrow into my upbringing. My life had been full of music and companionship, but also captivity. Other children were allowed to explore the fields and forests of our kingdom. They roamed free, flying and fighting and playing together from sunrise until sunset. They weren't afraid of roadside kidnappers. Raiders. 
bandits who would gladly hold a young princess for ransom or sell her off to the highest bidder. Although I didn't say any of this out loud, something in Damon's eyes told me he understood the isolation that came with growing up in a royal house. I wondered what his own upbringing had been like. Stavrok had told me his father was a tyrant. Was that true? Where did you get those? I followed the line of his gaze down toward my borrowed boots. Oh, a maid found them for me. She said I'd need them if I wanted to go out into the fields today. A shadow crossed over Damon's face. I glanced down at the boots again, feeling awkward. These were likely his mother's boots, I remembered. I tilted my head. The look in his eyes threw me off. I can take them off if you want, sire. No. He rounded the desk and came to a stop halfway across the room with his arms outstretched. Before he could reach me, his arms fell to his sides. I ached for him to come nearer, but he didn't. No, I was just. He frowned. His gaze darted away from mine, settling somewhere on the far wall. Those boots belong to my mother. I'm so sorry, I whispered. I knew that from what the maid said, but I didn't realise it might upset you. I should have asked. Embarrassment sent me spiralling. What was he going to think of me, rifling through his family's possessions like that? He held up a hand. Please, I won't hear you apologise. You're welcome to them. He paused, staring down at the floor. It's been a long time since I've seen them, that's all. His tone was stiff, overly formal, but sincere. I nodded, still not trusting myself to speak. I wanted to ask him questions about his mother, his life growing up here, but now didn't seem to be the time. He still looked distracted. He glanced out the window and picked up a handful of papers, shuffling through them, but his eyes had glazed over. Cassandra. He was still frowning when he finally addressed me again. Are you sure you want to go out into the fields today? Wouldn't you rather stay inside the castle or walk around the rose garden? Inside? Trading one castle prison for another? No, thank you. I opened my mouth, but before I could answer, there was a soft knock at the door. Damon strode over and opened it, and the sweet smell of breakfast drifted in. I smiled, grateful for the distraction. I slid past him and took the tray from the maid, thanking her, before setting it down on the desk between us. I picked up a piece of buttered toast and nibbled on it while I considered my answer. I knew what Damon was trying to do, palm me off on the castle and its grounds, confine me to ladylike pursuits in the hope that I'd be content to wander around exploring every nook and cranny of this place. Stay inside, warm and safe. The thought was tempting, but I knew he had another reason for wanting me out of the way. He wants to put as much distance between us as possible. The thought lanced through my heart. I was determined not to give in to the pain of it. I wanted Damon to take me seriously, to prove to him that I could do this, whatever this turned out to be. Finally, I looked up at him, raising an eyebrow in challenge. I would not rather stay inside the castle, sire. So, when do we leave? Chapter 9 Cass. The wind howled around us, battering the open carriage as it bumped and trundled along over the barren fields. I pressed my face lower into the collar of my coat, trying not to shiver. Seemingly unbothered by the cold, Damon rode up ahead on horseback. He made an indistinct, lone figure against the horizon. Only the bare, skeletal trees marked the landscape. It was a far cry from the lush orchards and grassy meadows I was used to. When I confessed that I'd never ridden before, Damon had looked surprised, but he didn't pass comment on my lack of skill. I guessed it was just another weakness in his eyes, fitting in with his image of the pampered princess flitting around her tower in satin slippers. Which, in many ways, 
was actually the truth. I squinted at the farmstead up ahead as we approached. It was a simple building, with cosy-looking gables overhanging the wraparound porch. The farmer and his wife waited for us outside on the steps. Damon arrived first, and he dismounted, handing off the reins to his footman and striding up to the farmhouse. I was struck by the way he carried himself. Every line of his body spoke of an easy confidence, commanding, yet open and friendly. The couple bowed their heads to him, and the farmer struck up a conversation. From their tone of voice, it was clear that Damon knew them well. All told, it was hard to imagine that this was the same man I'd shared breakfast with. The one who looked at me like a spooked animal and shied away every time I got too close for comfort. One of Damon's men helped me down from the carriage. I nodded to him and picked my way over the uneven ground. A deep permafrost made the earth hard and unyielding, and I would have slipped without my borrowed footwear. The farmer's wife looked at me as I stepped up to join Damon, her eyes widening in astonishment. She sank into a low curtsy, and I smiled at her when she straightened up. Damon's eyes darted to mine before glancing away again. Allow me to present the Princess Cassandra of the Bravdock clan, he said, as if reading from a script. She is currently visiting our kingdom. I inclined my head at the couple, silently noting Damon's phrasing. Visiting. Well, if that's how you want to play it. It's an honour, your highness, the farmer said. Like most of the men in the north, his weather-beaten, heavily-lined face spoke of a harsh life. How long will you be staying with us? As long as I'm welcome here. I smiled back at him. I felt Damon's eyes on me, but didn't look at him. You see, I've wanted to visit these lands my whole life. Well, you're certainly welcome here on our farm. The farmer's wife gave me another warm smile. Her tone was pleasant, but her eyes were burning with curiosity. And, forgive me for saying so, my king, we're so used to you coming out here alone. It's good to see you with company for a change. I heard the implication in her words, the way she lingered on company, and ducked my head, a blush coming on. I could feel the couple still eyeing me curiously. Damon cleared his throat. So, I was glad to receive your letters. I take it you've made progress cultivating the southern fields for livestock. Oh, yes, sire. The farmer rocked back and forth on his heels before waving his hand. Please. Follow me. As the two men strode off over the field, Damon glanced back at me, just once, like he was checking I was okay. I nodded at him. He turned away, apparently satisfied, resuming his conversation with the farmer. The farmer's wife was watching me when I turned to look at her. There was a knowing twinkle in her eyes that only grew as her face lifted into a broad smile. Would you like some tea, your highness? I rubbed my hands together, attempting to chase away the chill, and nodded. She led the way inside, taking me to a comfortable kitchen with a view of the fields out back. It was rustic, simple, and not unlike the cabin Stavrock and I had stopped at on our journey here. A fire burned merrily in the grate, and a small copper kettle hung above it. I relaxed onto a window seat covered with a patchwork quilt. As the woman poured the tea, I traced my finger over the rich patterns, letting myself be comforted by the soft noises of her whistling and the crackle of the fire. There was so little about this land that I understood. Bravdock seemed like a lifetime away. I took the teacup from her before frowning. I didn't catch your name. It's Molly, ma'am. The woman settled in a sturdy armchair and eyed me like she was measuring me up for something. So, you're to be our new queen. I blanched, almost spilling the tea all over myself. I set the cup down on the small table in front of me. What? Oh, don't worry. Molly gave me a conspiratorial smile. I saw the way the two of you looked at each other. I know how it goes. When it's meant to be, it's meant to be. 
I chewed over her words. She wasn't wrong. My dragon had recognised Damon's immediately. I remembered the way it uncoiled in my chest, reaching out to him from the moment we laid eyes on each other. My eyebrows drew together. I picked up my teacup again and looked down into the brew, like the answers I sought were in there somewhere. What if it's not that simple? I said. Maybe it was wrong to spill all my troubles onto the first person to take any interest, but I needed to talk to someone. Hell, I needed advice. Something about this woman told me I could trust her. What could be simpler? Molly cocked her head to the side. Like her husband, she had lines around her eyes, but her gaze was softer, friendlier. Those were laughter lines I could tell. He cares for you. You care for him. Well, when she put it like that, it did sound simple. He doesn't even know me, I whispered. Needing something to do with my hands, I ran my fingers along the floral rim of the cup. But he will. Molly said it with such certainty, I half wondered if she, like Marianne, had the gift of sight in her. I sensed it wasn't polite to ask. I stared blindly out the window. Somewhere out there, Damon was pacing the fields, checking over his ancestral homelands, doing the job he had been born to do. I pressed a hand to the cup, half wishing I was out there with him. I turned back to Molly. You seem very certain about all this. I've lived a long life, she shrugged. And he is my king. Then you must know him, I said, leaning forward again to face her. Better than me, anyway. Tell me, why is he so... Withdrawn? Moody. Unreasonable. Infuriating. Her mouth quirked with amusement. I flushed, feeling that uncomfortable sensation again. She can read me like a book. His Majesty had... A difficult upbringing, she said carefully. In what way? You know of his father, of course. I nodded. Stavrok had told me about the old king. How he'd drained his people of money and driven his kingdom into debt. Stavrok and Eric had joined forces with Damon to put an end to the scavengers and raiders who wanted to pillage the north and settle old scores. Those raiders hadn't cared how many lives were lost, as long as the debt was paid in blood. The sins of Damon's father were legendary all over the realm. But what sort of father had the old king been to his son? Had Damon suffered at his father's hands? His mother died shortly after Damon's sister was born. Molly frowned into the distance, lost in memories. It drove the old king mad with grief. They say he was never the same afterwards. I thought of the look on Damon's face that morning when he'd spoken of his mother. Damon's father took his pain out on the whole kingdom. Molly's face darkened. Crops failed, cattle starved. All the while, he stood by and did nothing. Locked himself away in his castle, growing more paranoid by the day. And he locked away the young prince, too. Damon? Aye. People barely saw him until his father died and he became king. By then the castle was a wreck. There's so much darkness in that place. The woman clicked her tongue. Bad, bad memories. It's a wonder that King Damon has managed at all. I stared into space, processing everything she'd said. I tried not to let the shock I felt show on my face. Despite my overprotective upbringing, I couldn't deny that my life had been full of love. Music and laughter filled my memories when I thought of my childhood. I had a cousin who loved me, and a kingdom that welcomed me with open arms. It sounded like Damon hadn't been so lucky. More tea? she asked, holding the pot in her hand. No, but thank you. Molly smiled at me kindly. Try not to worry so much, my dear. You'll clear out the cobwebs of that old place. I just know it. By the time Damon and the farmer arrived at the door, stamping the snow off their boots, 
I was warmed through. I wandered over to stand by the king. As we turned to leave, Molly dropped into a low curtsy, her eyes twinkling with pleasure. You're welcome to drop by whenever you want to, your highness, she said, looking directly at me. I was hyper aware of Damon's presence at my side. His body had brought the cold in with it. He smelled of fresh air and snow. Snowflakes littered his hair and the collar of his dark coat. I jumped at the shock of coldness as his fingers brushed against mine. Molly's smile grew. Thank you, I told her. For everything. I felt Damon's eyes on me as we walked back to the horses and the carriage. What? I quirked an eyebrow in his direction. Nothing, he replied, a little too hastily. I raised both eyebrows, a smile playing at the corners of my mouth. You're good at that, he said quietly. He opened his mouth like he wanted to say more, then closed it again. Good at what? I wanted to challenge him, ask him why he was so surprised I could hold a conversation with a farming woman. What kind of girl did he take me for? But I didn't push him for anything more. I accepted the compliment for what it was. We came to a standstill by the men, who were holding the carriage horses by the bridles, waiting for me to climb up into the carriage. Both of us were lingering. I wasn't sure about Damon, but I didn't want to be separated just yet. I can only assume he felt the same way. Come on. Damon closed his hand around the reins of his horse. He offered his other hand to me, and I took it, though I was confused. He tugged me closer, his large hand gentle around my own. You ride with me. Before I could say anything in reply, his hands wrapped around my waist. I gasped at their firmness and the warmth I could feel even through the layers of outerwear. He boosted me into the air and I swung my leg over the horse, clutching the mane and panting with shock. Oh my! It was very high up on this horse, and very, um, close to Damon's hard, strong body. His hand clenched around the horse's bridle, and the animal trembled, huffing a little as he climbed up behind me. Damon exhaled, the motion pressing his chest against my back. He leaned forward, and his breath tickled the side of my neck. I shivered and closed my eyes, knowing he couldn't see how I trembled with desire for him. He could likely feel it, though, against him. He clutched the reins, an arm on either side of my waist. Then he spoke into my ear, his voice rumbling straight through me. Comfortable? That's not exactly the word I would use. I nodded to his question. I didn't trust myself to turn around and give him a response with words. That would bring our faces dangerously close to one another. He shouted something to his men and clicked the reins. And then we were off. I swallowed the scream that rose as I clung to the saddle in front of me, the huge arms of Damon surrounding me on each side and his body behind. I had to trust that he could hold me in place, because I sure as heck didn't know how to stay atop a horse without assistance. We thundered over the countryside like the hounds of hell were on our tail. Initially, there was only terror in my heart, but as I relaxed, I began to enjoy the exhilaration of the cold against my face and the horse beneath me. The blood sang through my veins. Riding with Damon was almost like flying, that same exhilaration, except this time I wasn't in control. He was. His body crowded close to me. It was impossible to ignore every flex of his thighs behind my ass, every brush of his arms against my chest as he adjusted our course. I could barely pay attention to the world around me or what was going on outside of the feelings inside me. That need was building up again, the need to claim what was mine. But I knew that wasn't what he wanted. My mind and body screamed at each other, tortured by the mixed signals. I was powerless to do anything in my current position. I could only let Damon ride us to our destination. He grunted behind me, and his hand pressed against my belly, 
pulling me more firmly against his chest. I wanted to arch back into him until I realised that he was merely adjusting my position, making sure I didn't fall. By the time Damon slowed the horse to a trot, we were approaching a shallow slope that led down onto a rocky scree. Several wagons had pulled up at the side of the road around us, and there were people everywhere, hard at work digging and toiling in the earth. When the raiders came, they burned many homes to the ground, Damon said, speaking for the first time since we started this journey. My people needed raw materials to rebuild. Stone, mostly. A team of people manoeuvred a huge machine to the base of the slope. Damon slowed the horse to a standstill. He jumped off with ease and held out a hand for me. I climbed down more gingerly, running a shaky hand over the horse's mane. Thank you, I whispered to the horse. Sorry for being nervous of you before. Just before he turned away, I caught the edge of a smile on Damon's face, and my heart lifted as hope twisted within my chest. Chapter 10 Damon My heart was still pounding heavily beneath my shirt as I approached my men. I regretted my foolish impulse to ride with Cass as soon as I felt her small frame settle in my arms. She'd been so distracting I'd struggled with the simple task of steering the horse in the right direction. The scent of her hair, the softness of her thighs pressed up against mine, it was all far too tantalising. Pull yourself together. The voice inside my head, cold and stoic, sounded remarkably like my father. He was probably right. I couldn't afford distractions, not today. Not any day. I let out a deep sigh and walked on. Cass trotted up alongside me as we drew closer to the stone quarry. Can I walk down there and get a better look? I shook my head, frowning at the very idea that she'd wander off exploring. You need to keep close to me. For safety. Several of the men put down their tools as we approached, giving her a furtive once-over as they did so. My hackles rose as a possessive instinct pulsed through me. I clenched my jaw and forced myself to keep walking. I ached to take her far away from them. I wanted to shift and fly us both back to the castle just to get her out of their sight. There, I would claim her all over again, leaving her gasping my name until she could barely remember her own. I am their king. Nobody will hurt her. Nobody will touch her. She is safe. The mantra did little to calm me down. My dragon was inflamed and the men seemed to notice because they dropped their gazes, mumbling amongst themselves. I drew level with them. Is it ready? Yes, sire. Jace, my well-built foreman, spoke up. We're waiting for your go-ahead. I nodded. Very well, then. Fire away. Cass looked up at me curiously as we strode toward the edge of the rocky slope. I bent closer, letting my mouth almost brush against her ear. The quarry is so noisy, she won't be able to hear me otherwise. It was a flimsy excuse at best. Luckily, if she noticed the way I wasn't breathing normally, she didn't say anything. We drilled down into the side of the rock yesterday. Now we're packing it with explosives, I said. It's the best way to break up the stone. As I drew away, a shiver ran through her slender frame. It was no wonder. A chill wind was buffeting us, and the sky once again threatened snow. Are you cold? I asked. Worry sharpened my tone. When I spoke again, I made sure my voice was softer. Because I'll take you back to the castle if you want. You only have to say the word. Her eyes flashed up to mine. No, I... Before she could continue, a loud whistle broke through the air. I grabbed her by the arm and pulled her into my body for protection. Cover your ears. Quickly. She did so, just as a loud boom shook the ground beneath us. Rubble rained down everywhere. The men cheered and I smiled proudly. 
Where there had been a huge shelf of rock, there was now a slope, leading to a stone-filled crevice. My men descended into the new quarry, carrying their tools with them and setting to work. What now? she asked, lowering her hands from where they'd been pressed against her ears. I scrambled down the slope after them. She followed me, surprisingly nimble, ignoring the hand that I held out for her. My mouth quirked at her stubbornness. Now we break up the larger pieces of rock for transport back to the town. We? Cass tilted her head as I shrugged off my coat and rolled up my shirt sleeves. Of course, I smiled. What sort of king doesn't get into the trenches and dig alongside his men? I'm their leader. I'm hardly going to stand on the sidelines while they do all the work. I watched her absorb my words. In that case, she said, jutting out her chin, neither am I. I could already see that there would be no arguing with her, and since I'd all but given her the lines to use against me, why would I bother fighting her? She at least wore pants, and my mother's boots provided protection for her feet. Very well, then. Let's get to work. For the next few hours we worked in the quarry, picking away at the fragments of rock that lay around us. I showed Cass how to look for the highest quality stone, and she soon began working alongside the men in the processing section, talking with them as if she'd been doing this for years. The now familiar bond between us insisted I keep a close eye on things. I didn't want her to think I was hovering, but I hated to leave her alone amongst all those men. In fact, I couldn't leave her alone, no matter how many times I tried to walk away. It didn't matter that I knew rationally she wasn't in danger. My dragon didn't give a damn. I mostly hung around in the background, trying and mostly failing to concentrate on the task at hand. Jace sidled up to me. The two of us worked well together, and I trusted him implicitly. He nodded toward the group. She's in her element out there. I couldn't help but agree. Watching Cass working with my people stoked a fire inside my chest. It was impossible to keep on task. I could have watched her all day, a small bright butterfly flitting around all those hardened men like she was born to it. If you don't mind me saying so, sire. Jace paused for a long time. He was usually a man of few words, but even so, this pause was longer than usual. I tilted my head, curious to see how he'd finish. It's good to see a smile on your face. Been a long time. I wasn't even aware I was smiling. Oh. Thank you, Jace, I managed, then turned back to look at the little princess I'd assumed would never fit in here. But watching her out here, it began to dawn on me that I may have misjudged her. Clearly, she wasn't afraid to get her hands dirty, literally. I'd given her the option of staying at the castle, cosy and warm by the fireside, and instead she was out here, working on the frozen tundra with me and my men. She turned her head, and my breath caught at the sight she made. A curly strand of hair pulled loose from her braid, floated in the wind and brushed along her cheek, unnoticed by her. She had a smudge of dirt on the tip of her nose that took everything in me not to race over there and wipe it off with my thumb tip. When she caught my eye, I realised I was staring, but she didn't seem to mind. She gave me a small smile, and I couldn't help but smile back, even though I was faintly embarrassed at being caught staring. I inclined my head, giving her a stiff nod, and tried to get back to work. At midday, when a weak sun shone above us in the pale grey sky, I called a halt to the work. Cass and I sat on a rocky outcrop, a little apart from the others, and passed pieces of a sourdough loaf between us in comfortable silence. I'm sure you're used to fancy affair, I mumbled, fingering a scrap of the coarse bread. I was used to this, but Cass had grown up surrounded by beauty and luxury. Through her eyes, I saw the northern way of life in a new light. We must look like barbarians to her. To my surprise, she only shrugged. I've always preferred bread and cheese to huge elaborate dinners. 
A dreamy expression crossed her face. Although, I do miss strawberries. I laughed. Good luck finding those up here. I put out my hand, catching a few drifting snowflakes in the palm of my hand. It was snowing lightly again. I can't recall the last time I ate a strawberry. Her answering laughter was a soothing melody to my ears. I couldn't help but lean in closer to her. My hand came out, unbidden, and I brushed off the snow that had settled on her shoulder. She swayed into my touch, seemingly unconscious of her body's movement. Come on, I found myself saying. I have to show you something. Chapter 11 Cass This time, I was expecting the horse ride, which made it a little bit easier to handle. But only a little. That was a skill that would clearly take a little time to master. My legs were still trembling by the time Damon dismounted. He didn't offer me a hand. Instead, he simply caught me around the waist and lifted me down off the horse. I swayed into him when he set me on the ground, and for a moment, I forgot where we were. He felt so good against me. Solid and warm. I wanted to lean into his strength and stay there forever. He seemed to need a moment to gather himself, too, because he didn't move away very quickly. So, I began, and as I spoke, I was surprised to hear the husky undertones in my voice. Was that what being in close proximity to Damon did to my vocal cords? What did you want to show me? Instead of answering, he merely took my hand. There was a tantalising mystery in his eyes, and I couldn't help but be drawn in by it. We weren't on the open plains anymore. High rocks loomed above us, and a pale, watery sun shone in the sky above. Come with me. He winked at me, apparently determined to remain mysterious. I rolled my eyes but let him lead me down the narrow mountain track we were on. The air felt warmer here. We were probably sheltered from the harsh elements by the hills around us. Odd patches of greenery grew in amongst the rocky terrain. It was the first true sign of nature I'd seen since arriving in the north. The sight warmed my heart. Damon! I squeezed his hand, drawing his attention. Where are we? You'll have to wait and see. I trotted along beside him, trying to match his long strides. Curiosity burned within me, mingling with the ache that had taken up residence in the pit of my stomach. I need him. So much. How does he not feel the same way? I was almost frightened by the strength of my feelings, despite knowing that they were due to the mating bond. I wondered if I'd always feel this burning pull, this desire that coloured every interaction with this man and made it impossible to stay away. It was my dragon who felt it most. But that desire, that need, had grown bigger now. It was more than just pure naked want. I'd never felt this way before. When his eyes met mine, my stomach swooped like I'd missed a step on a staircase. Maybe I should have asked Stavrok more questions. I dismissed the thought. There was no way I was talking to Stavrok about any of this. He'd already seen and deduced more than enough as it was. Damon stopped in the middle of the path. He bent his head, and I shivered as his mouth brushed the edge of my ear. Did he know the effect he had on me? Do you trust me? he whispered. The words took me back to our encounter in the maze. The first words we'd properly spoken to each other. A spark of heat had passed between us then, just as it did now. Yes, I breathed. Sheer instinct spoke for me, but as soon as I said it, I realised it was true. He'll protect me. He won't let any harm come to me. My thoughts were exhilarating. He stepped behind me and his palms came up to cover my eyes. I could barely breathe as he guided me forward. I felt like I was on the edge of a precipice, about to fall. 
It was the best goddamn feeling in the world. Soon enough, we came to a standstill. His hands fell away, and I opened my eyes. I gasped at the sight that lay before me. We stood in the middle of a lush green valley. The rocks underfoot were carpeted in moss, and the hillside around us was scattered with flowers. I could hear running water nearby, and I soon spotted a mountain spring trickling down from the rock face. In the middle of such a barren, frozen land, it was like I'd fallen into a dream. I turned to Damon. The astonishment must have shown on my face, because he huffed out a pleased laugh. The stiffness in his shoulders was gone, and the colour had returned to his face. What is this place? I whispered. A secret hideaway. His mouth flickered with amusement, but his eyes were soft. He put his hands in his pockets, surveying our surroundings. I come here sometimes to get away from... He trailed off, shrugging, but I caught his drift. To get away from the palace. From his father. From his responsibilities. His life. The crown obviously weighed heavily on him. This place was his solace, a temporary respite from the stresses of day-to-day -day life. Who else knows about this place? Nobody, Damon murmured. It's my place. And now yours, Cass. Oh, my. The thought that he'd led me here, allowed me into his private hideaway, overwhelmed me. To cover my rising blush, I turned away from him, drawn by the sound of the water. I sat down beside the small waterfall, feeling the heat of Damon's presence as he came up behind me. My skin tingled at his proximity, yearning for his touch. You can drink from this stream, he said, leaning over me and dipping his fingers into the clear water. I watched, oddly transfixed by the motion. The water comes directly from the mountain. It's totally pure. I scooped up a handful of water and held it to my lips. It tasted sweet and fresh, just as he said. How does this place... I cast around, searching for the right words. How does this exist? Damon sat back and ran a hand through his hair. He'd taken off his jacket, and my eyes were drawn to the flex of his forearms as he relaxed back onto his elbows. I've thought about that a lot. He frowned. I think the rock face must form a kind of natural shelter from the ice and snow. It protects these plants and gives them a chance at life. Outside this area, they would just wither away and die, like everything else that tries to grow in the cold. As he spoke, he plucked a stray daisy beside him and leaned over, threading it through the end of my braid. It was a sad thought that all this tranquil beauty would not exist, if not for the rock face protection. I ran a hand over the daisy, fiddling with it. So it's only here because it's protected? I guess so from the weather and the rest of the world. If everyone knew about this place, it would surely be trashed within a few weeks. I let my hand dangle in the edge of the stream. I watched the flow of water before something else occurred to me. But I've seen fields. People farm in your kingdom, don't they? Damon frowned. Of course. But they farm the tough plants. Root vegetables. Things that can survive the frost, not delicate flowers like these. Our crops are hardly beautiful. They're just tough. Maybe they're beautiful because they're tough. Damon didn't look convinced. Maybe. It seemed like a pointless argument. Anyway, we weren't really talking about the vegetation anymore. I huffed out a sigh. Flopping onto my back. I tilted my head toward him. You're quite stubborn, do you know that? He snorted. I'm stubborn. His playful tone emboldened me. Yes. I reached out and wrapped my fingers around his forearm, tugging gently. I hope I'm playing this right. He came willingly, crawling up over me until his arms were either side of my head. I can't fight this, Cass. 
His eyes burned into mine. No matter what I do, I can't. Then stop trying, I whispered. He lowered his head and pressed his lips against mine. I returned the kiss eagerly, wrapping a hand around the back of his neck to bring him even closer. gentle flow of water lulled my senses. Damon settled down beside me. He folded an arm over my chest and his breathing slowed. I felt so safe in his embrace. I reached out blindly, pressing my hand to his chest to feel the comforting thud of his heartbeat. My eyes fluttered closed and I drifted off to sleep. Chapter 12 Damon. Cass, I whispered. Cass, it's time to go. She curled closer into me, mumbling something in her sleep I didn't catch. I smiled and kissed the top of her head, turning my face upwards to the darkening sky. It was late afternoon now. The days were long here, but the nights were even longer. Soon it would be dark, and we needed to return to the workers and the castle before it became impossible to navigate the path. Cass, I said again, more firmly this time. Finally, her eyelashes fluttered and her eyes fixed hazily on mine. Come on, sleepyhead. We found our clothes, pulling them on. The temperature had dropped considerably since we'd arrived in the clearing, and I moved closer to her, turning up the collar of her coat to keep the chill away. Her fingers paused on the buttons of her coat. She reached out, one finger running down the chain that lay partly exposed under the neck of my shirt. What's this? I glanced down at her wandering fingers, enjoying the sensation on my skin, before stepping away. I tucked the chain away and buttoned up my coat properly. The metal seemed to burn my skin through the fabric, like a beacon. Nothing important, I murmured. Just a family heirloom. She seemed to accept this, although the tilt of her eyebrows told me she'd get the truth out of me sooner or later. Her expression was still questioning. What changed your mind? I was caught off guard by the sudden topic change. About what? She lifted her chin, putting her hands on her hips. About me. I just stood there, racking my brain over what to say. She didn't seem bothered by my pause. She waited, both eyebrows raised. I'd been in a tailspin all day, determined to keep my distance, yet unable to resist her sweet allure. But it was more than that. She doesn't miss a trick, this one. That's for sure. You did well today, I said eventually. My people don't take kindly to outsiders. Today, at the farmhouse and at the quarry, you won them over with what seemed to be effortless ease. You're not what I expected. Cass shook her head like I'd amused her in some way. I'm used to talking to people who find my status intimidating. The guardsmen back home. The servants. I grew up in the palace, so I know non-royals probably find me hard to relate to. But I try my best to make everyone see me as a person, and if not... A distraction, right? She shrugged. Something to lighten the mood. I frowned. That wasn't the case at all. That's not true. I came over to stand in front of her. I reached out and took her hands in mine, forcing her to meet my eye. You want to know what I think? I think they saw a queen. A queen who cares about others. Cass looked up at me. Her eyes were shining, but her face was smooth and calm. I drew up her hand and kissed it. The gesture was overly formal, considering what we'd just done, but it felt right. I was giving her the respect that should have been afforded to her the first time we met. A princess's welcome. Before our shifters got in the way. They were gone for now, sated by the pleasure in which we'd just drowned ourselves. 
my dragon slept lazily inside my chest, content to have his mate close by. We stood there in the twilight. I leaned down to brush a loose strand of hair off her face. When I straightened up, she was still regarding me. Chin up, shoulders back. Anyone in the realm, down to the lowliest kitchen boy, would have been able to see the royal blood flowing through her in that moment. A sharp whistle from somewhere beyond the rocks caught my attention. We had been gone too long. My men had sent out a search party to look for us. Come on, I said. She tucked herself easily into my side, and together we picked our way through the valley, emerging on the other side of the rocks. I strode over to untie my horse, but we didn't have time to get into the saddle. Lanterns bobbed through the dusk, casting long shadows over the rock face around them. Over here, I waved, and the lanterns drew closer. Sire. Jace, who was leading the men, hurried forward, relief plain across his face. We thought the raiders had come. A flicker of regret passed through me as I caught a couple of worried looks from others in the group. My people were fearful for good reason. The mountain dwellers that had ransacked our kingdom two years earlier were still out there somewhere. We had thinned their ranks, but that didn't mean they were gone for good. They were biding their time, likely hungry for revenge. No, nothing like that, I said. Cass and I just wanted to explore. Judging by the expression on Jace's face, I could tell that he knew exactly the kind of exploring I meant, but thankfully he didn't remark on it. He took my horse's bridle and led it toward the search party. They were all waiting in a huddle, their bulky shadows looming over the gravel terrain. After spending all afternoon with Cass, the contrast between her and my kinsman was even more pronounced. She stood at least half a foot below the shortest of them, but she greeted them like old friends, dragging me along with her. They were careful not to get too close to her, obviously fearing my dragon. We set off. The terrain was too unstable in parts to go on horseback, so we had to travel on foot. We climbed down the rocky slope in tandem. I barely thought about where I was putting my feet. I'd spent years walking over these rocks. Cass picked her way over the ground more carefully than me. I pointed out the sturdiest stones for her and guided her around the deadly black ice that lay in wait of unsuspecting travellers. Then Cass spotted Rob, the kind elderly man she had been working with earlier that day, and she was off like a rocket. Before I could stop her, she'd slithered halfway down the slope in front of us in order to catch up with him. I'd only taken my eyes off her for one second just enough time for her to dart ahead of me, out of reach. A sharp cry echoed through the valley. Cass. My stomach plummeted sickeningly. I broke into a run and shouldered aside a couple of concerned bystanders before dropping onto my knees beside Cass. She was curled up against a rock, cradling her ankle in her hands. Gently I pried off her fingers and ran my hands over the skin, pulling away when she grimaced with pain. It's just a sprain. She looked up at me. Damon, come on, I'll be fine. Her words were soothing, but I could tell she was in pain. For some reason, she seemed more concerned with me than the injury. I turned her foot slightly to look at the side of her leg and she winced. There was a rip in her pants and red stained the thick material. Is that? I reached out and touched the wet patch and stared down at my hands. Cass's bright red blood coated my fingers. I swallowed hard, my dragon roaring inside my head. One of the rocks just cut me a bit, she said. I'm a shifter. I'll be fine. You know that. I couldn't concentrate on any of her words or the calm energy she was trying to push toward me. All around me, the noise of the men murmuring amongst themselves buzzed through my head, growing louder and louder. Nobody got too close, but they set my teeth on edge nonetheless. Leave us, I barked. I had never spoken in anger like that before. 
I startled them, but I didn't care. My men obeyed and we were alone. Only the wind whistling against the rocks around us broke the silence. I stroked my hands over Cass's hair until we were both calmer. Eventually, Cass looked up at me. You shouldn't have done that. Her mouth turned down at the edges. I'm okay, really. You're not okay. You're hurt. A voice in the back of my mind pulsed like a drumbeat. This is all my fault. I brought her out here into danger, and now look what's come of it. My rational side insisted I was taking it too far. The injury wasn't bad, she just wasn't used to the terrain, but I didn't listen to it. In that moment, I wasn't King Damon. There was only the dragon inside me, snarling and helpless, confronted with its injured mate, and ready to lash out at any threat, real or imagined, that got too close. I helped her to sit up, but when I put my arms under her to carry her the rest of the way, her body stiffened against mine. I can walk just fine on my own. She glared up at me. You don't need to act like I'm going to break. I sat back on my heels, stung by the force of her words. Cass, you're being unreasonable. No. Her eyes flashed with anger. I'm not. You think I haven't noticed how you treat me? I ducked my head, but I wasn't about to back down now. You can't walk on that ankle, I said, reasonably enough, I thought. You'll only injure it further. I gazed down at her slender legs, sprawled out against the rocks. She was so beautiful, so perfect, so soft. She couldn't survive in this place. In that moment, my mind was made up. I would rather spend the rest of my life knowing that she was safe before I let anything happen to her, even if that meant I could never see her again. Ignoring my warnings, Cass struggled to her feet. She leaned on her side, obviously favouring her uninjured ankle, but I didn't dare touch her. She put her hands on her hips. Why can't you accept that I want to be here, Damon? That I want to stay? I threw out my hands. Why would you want to spend the rest of your life somewhere like this? Because you're here! Petite as she was, Cass had a way of making her presence felt like no other woman I'd ever known. I took a step back, struck by the force of her words. I know how I feel, Damon. And I know how you feel. The bond between us. I don't care about the bond. All I care about is keeping you safe. I ran a hand over my face, suddenly exhausted. And I can't do that by letting you shackle yourself to me. What are you trying to say? Cass's face was inches from mine. Her eyes filled with tears. That you should never have come here. My voice echoed over the empty landscape, reverberating off the barren grey rocks. This place will destroy you, just as it did my mother. As soon as I said the words, I wanted to take them back. But it was too late. You're a coward, she whispered. Her eyes were still dewy with tears, but now they turned hard. Rejecting me. You're ready to give up. On me. On us. Even after what we've shared. I thought you were better than that. I felt the blood drain from my face. It's not like that, I wanted to say. I didn't know how to make her understand. I wasn't rejecting her. Cass, I... I reached out to her. She ducked out of reach, turning her back on me, and limped away. My dragon grumbled inside my chest, but I ignored it. This is all your fault, Damon. The air shimmered around Cass's form, and my heart almost stopped. Cass, no! It was too late. Cass shifted in front of me, and I saw her dragon for the first time. She was slender and smaller than shifters tended to be this far north. As her wings extended, they shimmered pale violet. 
she turned to look at me one last time, and with a flash of her jewel-like eyes, she launched herself into the sky. I could only stare in shock as she flew off into the distance. Each beat of her wings broke something inside my chest. She was flying away from me, leaving me, going home to where she'd be safe. Despair filled me as she climbed higher and higher, edging further toward the forest that lay at the foothills of the mountains. Then, out of nowhere, two dragons swooped out from the thick bank of cloud that wreathed the mountain top. No! I didn't recognize those dragons. They weren't my people. They dive-bombed Cass on either side, releasing twin jets of ice over her as she twisted and thrashed her wings in an attempt to get away from them. My dragon roared up inside me, and I began to shift, keeping my eyes on the sky above. Hang on, Cass. I'm coming. It was no use. The ambush was short and swift. I was only halfway shifted when Cass's now frozen wings collapsed around her, and she dropped out of the sky like a stone. Chapter 13 Cass I hit the earth with a thud that would have broken every bone in my body if I hadn't been in my dragon form. Staring helplessly up at the thick canopy of leaves above me, I could only lie there, winded, as my shifter curled up inside my chest. Damn it. I couldn't sustain my dragon. Soon enough I was human again, naked and shivering in the freezing cold of the north. I curled onto my side and crossed my arms over my chest, closing my eyes and trying to draw in breaths. If I fall asleep, maybe I'll wake up and this will all have been a dream. With a groan, I opened my eyes again. I couldn't fall asleep, not now. But moving hurt. It hurt a whole damn lot. My attackers had damaged my wings somehow. Frozen them, maybe. And the pain of the fall stung through my body, especially my arms and each side of my ribs. They ached, like I'd been repeatedly punched. Before I could consider my next move, the undergrowth rustled and sharp voices pierced through. Saw her fall down here somewhere. We can't return without the girl. My heartbeat picked up as I realised they were talking about me. I squealed as something hot and wet dragged along the side of my face. Terror filled me as I rolled over, only to come face to face with the jaws of a huge wolf. Here! She's over here! A man called out. Footsteps trampled over the ground toward me, and I was surrounded. Hands reached out for my naked body. I tried to bat them away, but they easily caught hold of my wrists. I was totally outnumbered. On all sides of me, tall men with long, shaggy furs loomed over me, holding leashes on the creatures that had haunted my nightmares since I was a little girl, giant wolves. I began to shake and tremble. Blessedly, a fur was thrown over my shoulders, partially covering me from the cold and the gazes of the men. I pulled the fur around me and my lip wobbled. What were they going to do to me? Scream all you want, the leader of the men told me with a broad grin. Nobody will hear you out here. That didn't stop me. I screamed all the way through the forest and beyond. Damon One moment I was staring up at the sky, feet planted firmly on the ground, and the next I was soaring high over the clouds. I let out an earth-shattering roar of rage and despair as I climbed higher and higher, beating my wings against the howling wind. Cass. I could feel my mate slipping away from me, somewhere far below, in the forest at the edge of the horizon. In the distance, a pale shape rose above the trees. My heart skipped, and for a brief second, I thought she'd managed to fight off the attackers and was free. When a second dragon flew up to join the first, my hope vanished. It was them. The monsters who had taken her. Hurt her. She was gone. Muscles straining, I pounded my wings through the air. The wind had turned. While Cass had sped through the air, 
I was forced to fight through a gathering storm. My rage urged me onwards, the anger that pumped through my body so strong I could have broken through any barrier. The gates of hell could have opened beneath me, and I wouldn't have batted an eye. Beneath the sheer fury of the dragon, my mind whirled with panic. What if she's dead? It was my fault. All my fault. I'd put her in harm's way. If she was dead, I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't live. Period. The ground passing beneath me flooded with greenery, and I wheeled in mid-air, realising I'd reached the edge of the forest. I reared up, beating my wings against the sky and letting out a roar. An icy jet of blue fire shot out from my throat. Come and get me, you bastards. I caught a flicker of movement in the forest canopy, the edge of a wing sticking out of the trees below. I dove toward the branches like a hawk spotting a mouse. I caught the dragon in my talons and we tumbled down to the earth together, crashing through branches and bushes. The dragon fell from my clutches and staggered away, but I knew I had injured him. Good. I wanted to kill the bastard for endangering Cass in that way. The forest was cool and dark. The density of the trees dimmed the light and I stumbled backwards, struggling to get my bearings. I was still in dragon form and didn't intend to shift back until my mate was by my side once again. My anger and panic turned me clumsy and my claws raked the ground trying to get a foothold as I tried to locate the other dragon in the shadows. I blinked in the unfamiliar greenish light, panting hard. This wasn't my terrain. I was used to the open tundra, frozen and unforgiving though it was. The trees above pressed down, trapping me in what felt like a cage. A sharp pain lanced across my back as the enemy shifter dropped down on me from above. I roared in fury and lashed out, blasting a patch of foliage nearby and reducing it to ice. My blast managed to catch the edge of the shifter's wing, stunning him long enough for me to roll over, shake him off, and send him flying. The sharp talons at the edges of my wings gave me an advantage, as did my size. Whoever this shifter was, I stood at least two feet taller, not to mention my wingspan, which dwarfed his own. His scales, however, were a pale icy colour, just like mine. Were we kin? I couldn't think about that. Not now. Cass was in danger. Nothing mattered beyond that. The fight was vicious and short. The red haze that swirled through my veins turned me merciless, cold-blooded. I lashed out, sharp talons tearing through scales, and before long, my opponent lay dead at my feet. I stood over him, panting. The bushes trembled. A low, deadly growl sounded. I froze. Another dragon. This one was bigger, and when he emerged, the undergrowth rustled on either side of him. Yellow eyes came forward, followed by huge paws, soundless and far more graceful than mine on the forest floor. Beside the dragon stood a wolf. Huge and powerful, its hackles were up, lips pulled back to expose its long white teeth. The wolf's unblinking gaze fixed on me, waiting for me to make my move. Another wolf appeared, then another. Before I knew it, the clearing was full of them. A circle of wolves. And I was in the centre. This was an ambush. The dragon's gaze flicked to the dead dragon at my feet. I lowered my head, muscles coiled with tension. Logically, I knew there were too many of them to fight. My dragon didn't care. Inside, I was roaring, screaming for my mate. And if my dragon couldn't get to her, well, then I'd have to destroy those who stood in my way. I lunged at the dragon, knocking him to the ground. We tussled in a vicious fight for our lives. There were sharp jabs against my hide as dozens of wolves piled on us. The air was thick with fur and blood and hide and teeth. We twisted over each other, and I snapped at every creature that came at me. The dragon took advantage of my distraction, snapping at my tail, 
raking sharp talons over my wings until I scorched the ground in icy fury. But any shifter, no matter how powerful, was no match for me. I was a dragon king. And I had a mission. To rescue my mate. I drew in a deep breath, threw back my head, and roared. The air filled with white ice flames. The blast knocked back every beast that climbed my flanks, carving a deep crevice through the trees and down into the very ground itself. By the time I was done obliterating the area, the second dragon shifter and many of the wolves were dead. Yet still more wolves kept coming. How many of the creatures were there? There was a long, low whistle through the trees. I staggered to my feet, bleeding, injured, and exhausted. If I stayed, I could die. More shifters would come. I could already hear them heading this way. This wasn't a battle I could win. Not today. And not on my own. I needed my people. I needed my army. Frustration clawed its way up my throat, and I considered throwing caution to the wind and pushing through my fear, slaughtering everyone in my path until I found Cass. But a small voice, a mere echo in the back of my mind, the part that was still human, said, Damon, no. You're smarter than that. If you want to save Cass, then we need reinforcements. I hated that voice, but I couldn't argue with it. If I wanted any chance to get Cass back safe, I had to be smart. Cursing the name of every god I could think of, I launched up through the tree canopy and back into the sky. Cass. I huddled on the ground in some godforsaken corner of a cell-type prison room, curled up beneath the furs they'd thrown into the room with me. At least I wasn't going to freeze to death. Small comfort. I stifled a sob against the crook of my arm. I was scared out of my mind. At least none of them had tried to hurt me. Not yet, anyway. I wish I'd never come here. I wish I was home. Somewhere warm, where everyone knows me, and no one would ever try to hurt me like this. I clenched my jaw, willing the faint dragon spark inside me, the shifter that was currently nothing but a shadow, to warm my chest. Pull yourself together. You are Princess Cassandra of Clan Bravdok, and you are better than this. You wanted adventure, didn't you? Well, things don't get much more adventurous than this. In all those books I'd read about the North, I tried to think what those explorers did when they were in a life-or-death situation. Found their resources, I muttered out loud. It wasn't much, but it was a direction at least, a momentary chance to make myself feel a little less powerless. I lifted my head and took stock of my surroundings, though I couldn't see much. There wasn't any light inside my prison cell, but through the gaps in the walls, the flickering torchlight gave me enough light to make out the dim interior of a hut. The walls were made of rough-hewn wood, and the floor was one step above dirt. Whoever my captors were, they weren't advanced. Or maybe they just don't plan on keeping me here for long. I pushed away the unhelpful thought and uncurled my legs, stretching out. They hadn't bothered to tie me up, which I took as another clue that they didn't expect me to be able to run away. I could try to shift, attack them, or fight my way out of here. But these men were ice dragons and had taken me out of the sky once already today. I didn't want to die, and since they didn't seem to want to kill me, at least right now, I would bide my time and save my strength in case I needed to fight my way out in the end. The door swung open and a shaft of orange light filtered through, startling me. I ducked as something was thrown at me, but when it landed on the floor with a soft thud, I realised what it was. A bundle of clothing. Get dressed, someone ordered, just out of view. Then the person slammed the door and I was alone again. I crawled toward the dark pile, fingers closing around the cloth. It was soft to the touch, but spun out of simple fibres. I didn't care. I would have worn a freshly stripped wolf pelt in that moment. My hands were stiff as I slipped on the tunic and pulled up the supple leggings. 
My final garment, a loosely knitted shrug, was wholly unfamiliar to me, but I slipped it on. Mercifully, the shivering began to ease as I warmed up, and in turn my mind grew clearer. I shuffled around the small cell, the blood pumping through my veins and reaching my arms and legs. Everything hurt from the cold, but thanks to my shift of blood, I was healthy and well. The small ankle injury I'd sustained before I left Damon and the few injuries from my fall had healed. They haven't tied me up and they've given me clothes. What kind of raiders are these? A dark thought occurred to me. If I was being held for ransom, I'd be no use to them dead. I paced faster around the edge of my small enclosure, checking for weak spots on every inch of the walls. My cage was well built, and from the sounds on the other side of the door, I had guards. Finally, I found a gap in the wood big enough to peer through. I caught glimpses of a few people sitting around the fireside, talking amongst themselves. They weren't all men, either. My heart clenched as three women carried children across to sit beside the flames. They looked sleepy, but relaxed and content. This was hardly the stuff of nightmares. My spying was rudely interrupted by the sound of the deadbolt sliding back from the door and light spilling through the gap. I whirled, my fists clenched. I'd never physically fought anyone in my life before, but I wasn't going to cower in the corner like they wanted me to. What's going on? I hissed. Where the hell am I? The man merely stared at me, blank-faced. Your Highness, he said. Come with me. Chapter 14 Damon By the time I found my way back to the castle, the sky had faded into a purplish hue and a canopy of stars glittered overhead. I had no time to stop and appreciate their beauty. The flight had calmed my mind and body, and as I landed, my mind was clear. My rescue plan had formed. All that remained was to set it in motion. I looked around me as I shifted, vaguely aware that I'd landed in the middle of the drawbridge. I was sure the townsfolk didn't appreciate the sudden sight of their naked king, but I didn't care. We had to move fast. A shiver ran up my spine. I had failed to protect Stavrok's beloved cousin. He'll have my head on a spike. If it came to that, I would deserve it. Hell, I'd support it. The realisation flooded over me then and there. I loved Cass. I needed her by my side. And I was going to do whatever it took to bring her back to me. Jace strode up to me, his expression clouded with worry. He held out a robe and I dragged it over my shoulders, falling into step beside him as we entered the castle. Gather the men, I instructed my commander, Eric, who snapped to attention at once. All around me, people whispered to each other, hushed and frantic. There's no time to waste. Sire. Jace put a broad hand on my shoulder. It was a familiar gesture and one I appreciated. Right now, I needed people I could trust, not servants bowing before their king. What happened? Cass, she. The words lodged in my throat and I swallowed hard, jaw tightening. The very mention of her name sent my shifter reeling. They've taken her. Keeping my voice low, I told him about the dragon shifters I'd fought in the woods, plus the hordes of wolves trained like attack dogs to take down anything in their path. Jace's eyes darkened. Raiders. There it was. The word that had haunted our kingdom for years. The dark figures that still filled my people's nightmares crowding their thoughts with smoke, death, and ruin. Yes. I bowed my head. Although we were speaking quietly, I glanced around, making sure no one could overhear us. In the woods, by the mountains. I'm not sure how many. But there were too many for me to fight off on my own. Thought we'd wiped most of them out. Jace frowned, running a hand over his thick beard. I guess scavengers find a way to survive. You sure we have the strength to face them, sire? 
I stared at the ground, gathering the strength to say what needed to be said. In truth, I didn't know if we would survive this, but I wasn't going to stop until Cass was safe again. Eventually I lifted my head and looked him right in the eye. We leave at sunset. Jace simply nodded. He trusted me. I wouldn't send my men into a fight they had no hope of winning. As I watched him walk away, I knew what I had to do. Cass. I had no option but to follow the guy who'd come into my hut. We bypassed the fire pit, circling around it and heading toward the largest hut in the small encampment. For whatever reason, they hadn't blindfolded me. Small faces peered at me as I passed, with people coming and going out of the thick forest around us. They were fetching firewood and mending things. The wolves were nowhere to be seen. My guard came to a standstill at the doorway of the hut. He gestured silently in the direction of the door. I hesitated, terrified to discover what was on the other side. The guard gave me a nudge. It wasn't a harsh one, but it told me I didn't have a choice in the matter. Reluctantly, I walked through the door. The hut was dim inside, although a small fire burned under a bubbling pot. Two men sat on low seats just behind it. They stood when I came in, and the tiny hairs on the back of my neck rose up. Where am I? I asked, trying not to let fear bleed into my voice. Then I remembered something. The guard had called me Your Highness. I definitely wasn't some random girl to them. You know who I am? I crept forward. They regarded me impassively, still mostly in shadow. Why have you done this? Princess Cassandra, the one on the left said. His voice was rough, as if not often put to use. It reminded me of wood smoke or the logs crackling over the fire pit. Welcome to our camp. He moved a fraction closer. As his face caught the light, I froze with shock. His face was strikingly similar to the man who had just broken my heart. He had the same high cheekbones, the same piercing, ice-blue eyes. His face was broader, however, and his hair longer and wilder. He had a fair amount of stubble and a scar at the edge of his jaw. The scars on his bare arms told me he'd seen his share of combat. Who are you? I whispered. I wanted to remain afraid, but some part of me whispered that I wasn't in danger. My dragon settled, slumbering in my chest, unfazed by the unfolding action. He's Dimitri, the man on the right said. He had a smoother voice, a deep, rich baritone, and when the flames fell across his face, he too bore a striking resemblance to Damon. And I'm Lucian. This is your camp? Yes. Dimitri crouched before the fire, drawing out a cup and filling it with something that smelled delicious. Please, eat. You must be hungry. I was, but I took the cup from him without bringing it to my lips. I had no reason to trust these people. Not after what they had done. I pressed my lips together, considering the two of them. You shot me out of the sky and then dragged me here and flung me into a prison room. Dimitri looked downcast. We're deeply sorry. You have to understand. My brother and I wish you no harm, princess. I wrinkled my nose and corrected them. Just Cassandra. Dimitri nodded. Wordlessly, he swept out an arm, indicating a cushion by the fireside. I sank down onto it, curling my hands around my cup, letting the flames from the fire warm me. We seek an audience with the new king. Lucian returned to his seat. Despite the fact that he was the speaker, he seemed less forthcoming than his brother, content to stare into the flames. We needed a bargaining tool. And I just happened to fall out of the sky, I said dryly, mouth twisting. Quite literally. Please. Dimitri glared at Lucian, who merely raised an eyebrow. The former leaned forward, catching my gaze. Our people are desperate. Survival out here is 
perilous, to say the least. Lucian snorted, but didn't comment. Pieces of the puzzle were falling into place in my mind. The raiders who burned and ransacked Damon's kingdom. I stared into the flames, frowning as if the answers lay there. That wasn't you, was it? No. Dimitri pressed a hand against his forearm, thumb tracing over a white, raised scar. We've run into them ourselves on many occasions. When they were defeated, that's when word got back to us that the old king was dead. Lucian smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. We've spent our lives in exile, along with our entire village. Why? As our conversation progressed, the wild men of my imagination transformed, growing less and less fearsome the longer I looked at them. I began to see them as they truly were, two young men who were just as scared as I was. The old king didn't take kindly to remind us that he was less than a perfect husband, a perfect father. Dimitri exchanged a grim look with his brother. We were living proof. You're his sons. As I said it, I knew it was true. I'd known it from the moment I saw them. Damon's brothers. Half-brothers, Lucian corrected. But yes, we want to talk with King Damon. Dimitri folded his hands together, looking at me intently. But we knew we had to be careful. Nobody here knows him, knows what kind of man he is. If he's anything like his father. He isn't, I interjected. He, he cares about his people. He wants to rebuild his kingdom. That's his main priority. I could hardly think of Damon without ice flooding into my heart, but I wouldn't lie about him. He may have rejected me as his mate, but I could say that much for him. He only wanted to recover what his father had lost. Nothing mattered more to him than that. Not even me. Something of my anguish must have shown on my face. If the brothers noticed, they didn't say anything, much to my relief. We have no interest in challenging his rule. Lucian turned to me. We just want to live in peace. They both stared at me for a lengthy moment. I narrowed my eyes at them and then turned my attention to the delicious broth in my cup. I took a big sip, savouring the flavour. Finally, I set down the cup and turned to face them fully. You two, I stared between them are idiots. Their eyes widened in shock, but I wasn't done. I've been blasted with dragon ice fire, dragged through the woods and held hostage. I am going to say my piece, and they're going to listen. You should have come and talked to him, like rational people. Damon is good. He won't turn you away or hurt you, or whatever it is you're so afraid of. He's a good man, and he needs good, strong men to help him rebuild the kingdom. I drew a shuddering breath. And if you take me back with you, I can smooth over this huge misunderstanding, and we can all move on with our lives. I crossed my arms over my chest and glowered at them. Dimitri and Lucian gaped at me. I raised one eyebrow, and then the other crept up to join it. Got it. Dimitri said eventually. I exhaled. Good! I kicked out my legs, stretching them before the fire. I was warmed through now and relaxed. Finally. By the way, Damon won't take kindly to the whole kidnapping thing, so you might want to let me do the talking to start with. By the looks on their faces, it was clear they hadn't considered the ramifications of holding me hostage. I gave them a cheery smile. Can I have some more broth now? An hour later, we were ready to leave. Lucian disappeared outside to tell the others that the camp was on the move. Dimitri and I stayed by the fire, trading stories. He had never been south of the mountains, and he wanted to know everything about what it was like to grow up in green, peaceful valleys, where life wasn't a continuous struggle for survival. In return, 
he told me more about the Kingdom of the North. Damon's father was happy once. He twirled the stick in his hand, which he had been using to poke at the fire, as he considered his words. His mother, she wasn't born here in the North. Did you know that? I shook my head. Curiosity burned in my chest. Damon's father saw her one day when he was visiting the Southern Kingdoms to sign a trade deal. He carried her off. Dimitri glanced at me, and I nodded. I knew how these things typically went, after all. Stavrok was a prime example, except Lucy had been in a human village when he'd carried her off. She was adored by the people and by the king. But when she died, it was whispered that the ice and snow killed her. She wasn't made for the North. She didn't belong here. His head dropped. Forgive me, Cassandra. I don't mean to suggest that you... It's okay, I was quick to reassure him. I know. Well, that definitely explains a lot about Damon's fears for my safety. Come on, Dimitri said eventually, clambering to his feet and offering a hand. We should be on the move shortly. We emerged from the tent. That was fast, I said, startled. The campsite had been completely dismantled. All that remained of the fire pit was a smouldering pile of ash. A huddle of caravans, laden with belongings, waited for us at the edge of the tree line. Dimitri gave a loose shrug. We're used to packing up in a hurry, I guess. A wolf prowled the edge of the forest, and fear trickled down my spine as a small girl rushed up to it and buried her hands deep in its thick pelt. The wolf lowered its head and let the girl pet it. It was strange to see such a large, ferocious beast act so gentle. Maybe I've misjudged this place. In more ways than one. Ready when you are, Cassandra, Lucian shouted. He held the reins of a sturdy-looking horse. Your carriage awaits. I smiled at him. The sky above us went dark. Several people screamed as they stared up into the clouds. I glanced upwards, and my eyes widened as I made out the shadow of wings, so vast they blocked out the sun. A jet of silver fire burst across the sky, and my heart almost stopped. No! I screamed, waving my hands frantically. For a heartbeat, I considered shifting, but by then it would be too late. I could only watch as Damon circled the clearing above us, like a giant killing machine. Chapter 15 Cass Dimitri and Lucian rushed forward, and fresh panic gripped me as their dragons gleamed in their eyes. They were about to shift, and if they did, he'd kill them both. Stop! He wants me! I ran toward them, and they stopped in their tracks. He won't hurt you! He's just looking for me! I had no idea how true that was, but I had to believe Damon wouldn't attack an entire camp just to get to me. The sky lit up again with icy flames. Dimitri wheeled to face me. Are you sure about that? I closed my eyes, reaching out with every ounce of mental strength I had in me. My soul searched for its mate, up into the cloud bank above our heads. A flash of coldness ran through me, a fury unlike anything I'd felt before. Damon. It was his rage I felt. His anger. His terror. Damon. Damon, I'm here. I'm safe. Please. I let out a gasp, and my eyes opened. The huge dragon descended into the clearing, its clawed feet leaving deep gouge marks in the earth. He roared, and the deep, powerful sound shook the earth beneath our feet. Damon's dragon was huge, bigger than I could have imagined, with a wingspan that easily stretched across the whole camp. His hide was pale, shimmering silver in the dim light. His eyes were the same icy blue as they were in his human form. The spikes that covered his head were sharp and deadly. As he lowered his head, they reminded me of a crown. He was magnificent. 
I stepped forward, separating myself from the group. I spared a glance behind me and kept my voice quiet but firm as I instructed a woman nearby. Bring me a robe for the king. She hurried off. I turned and faced him. His eyes were already fixed on me. Even from this distance, I could see his huge chest rise and fall with barely suppressed fury. I'm here, I said. I'm unhurt, look. The woman scuttled up behind me, and I took the robe from her with a nod. I sensed the tension in the clearing. At any moment it could break. It's all up to me. All my life I'd been told what to do. By my courtiers or my own family. None of that mattered anymore. I wasn't about to hide from Damon and let him destroy these innocents in my name. I moved closer, positioning myself between the dragon and the frightened villagers. I knew that Damon wouldn't harm them if there was a chance that he'd hurt me in the process. As I got within range, he moved sharply, as if to grab me. I stepped back and glared at him, shaking my head. He huffed with annoyance and glowered at me, but lowered his head. I tilted up my chin at him, triumphant. I'm not going to be carried back to the castle like a sack of potatoes. I raised an eyebrow at him and watched the fire in his gaze flicker, smouldering into embers. A hazy mist built up as he shifted, and when it cleared, Damon stood in the middle of the clearing. Even unclothed, his human form was imposing. His gaze was fixed directly on me, but his sheer presence was enough to freeze everyone to the spot. I stepped forward with the robe held between my two hands. He looked at me, his burning gaze unreadable. Then he fell to his knees and bowed his head, to my shock and likely the shock of everyone else in the clearing. I knew what I had to do. Gently, I lay the robe over his shoulders. It was a coronation of sorts. The movement felt ceremonial, regal. When he rose to his feet, he drew the robe around to cover himself and took my hand. My king, I murmured. He bent and kissed my fingers. The gesture was formal, more for the benefit of those watching than anything else. Nevertheless, when his mouth brushed against my skin, a tremor ran through my body. He dropped my hand and his gaze moved past me, onto the crowd at the edge of the trees. Who is in charge here? We are. Dimitri's voice rang out across the clearing. Lucian stood by his side, unspeaking and unsmiling. Tension was written into every muscle in their bodies. Damon narrowed his eyes, but the expression mingled with surprise, which morphed into open astonishment. He'd picked up on the likeness between the two men and himself. Good. That will hopefully make this easier. I gripped Damon's arm tight, and his gaze flicked down to meet mine. Come on. I smiled up at him. Let's go meet your brothers. Brothers, he whispered, seemingly to himself. We moved together, crossing the ground at a slow, careful pace. Damon looked like he was in a dream. Finally, we drew level with them. Your Majesty, I said, looping my arm through his so he didn't swing out at them. Allow me to introduce Dimitri and Lucian. Damon regarded the two men, who both inclined their heads at him in an identical fashion. Cass tells me we're brothers. Damon's voice was low and still held an edge of danger. I'll admit that I can see it. That's the only reason I haven't reduced this entire clearing to ash. Lucian's lip curled, and Dimitri flashed him a glare of warning. King Damon, Dimitri said. Our mother was the daughter of our village's blacksmith. The old king sent us into exile after the queen's death, along with half the village, as you can see. As he spoke, Damon sidled closer to me, tucking me in against his side, shielding me. Internally, I sighed. Is stubbornness a genetic trait amongst these ice dragons? Damon, I interjected, pulling away slightly. They were never going to hurt me. 
They needed some way to get your attention, and I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. My attention? Damon's eyes flashed, although thankfully there was now no trace of the dragon behind his gaze. Why? We wish to come back, your majesty, Lucian said. Although his face was as sombre as ever, his tone was sincere. We were banished from the kingdom many years ago, but now that our father is dead, we hoped you might let us return. The old king threatened our lives, Dimitri added. We had no idea what kind of man you were. We thought we needed leverage. Then you got more than you bargained for, Damon said fiercely. Cass is not a bargaining chip. Damon. I placed a soothing hand on his shoulder, and he relaxed beneath my touch. They know. They only want to talk. That's all. Look at them. They want to be safe again. These people deserve protection. Your brothers deserve protection. Damon stared down at me. Then he took my face in his hands and pressed a gentle kiss to my forehead. Of course, he murmured. Thank you, Cass. Our argument earlier felt like a distant dream. I tried to recall my anger, how furious I'd been, but seeing him like this now, I could feel only love. He had listened to me. Actually listened. Relief flooded Dimitri and Lucian's faces, and all those behind them began to relax and chatter amongst themselves in low, excited voices. I couldn't help but feel a spark of pride. Damon straightened up, looking over the entire gathering, although his gaze soon returned to his brothers. You are all welcome to return. The kingdom is your home, and its gates will always be open to you. He lowered his voice, addressing Dimitri and Lucian directly. Come to live with us in the castle. For as long as you want. God knows we've got the space. The use of the word we lifted my heart, but I couldn't question it right now. There was too much going on to worry about whether Damon meant what he said or if I'd gotten the wrong end of the stick from him yet again. Damon. I waited until the last of the caravans trundled out of the clearing before turning to Cass. We stood in the middle of the empty space, surrounded by bare patches of earth where tents had been pitched only a short time ago. Cass refused to meet my gaze. Cass, please. I reached out a hand and then pulled it back, uncertain. Allow me to explain myself. She tucked her arms around her body, biting her lip. The dark fringe of her lashes hid her eyes from me. What is there to explain? When I first saw you, I... Unable to help it, I rushed forward, but I didn't dare touch her yet. You know how I felt. How we felt. It terrified me. I couldn't see anything beyond your youth, your inexperience. In my eyes, you were this delicate, beautiful woman who had stumbled into a harsh wilderness. I knew there was no way you could survive it. Just like my mother. And I had trapped you here. I hated myself for putting you in that position. Thanks. Cass said tonelessly. Her eyes were flat and dull, all traces of their usual spark snuffed out. I was wrong. Cass looked up sharply. What? I drew a deep, shuddering breath and lay a hand on her shoulder. I was wrong, Cass. And you were right. I was so wrapped up in the past, my father's mistakes, that I couldn't see what was right in front of me. When I watched you drop out of the sky, I broke off, shaking my head against the terror of that memory. I've never been so afraid in my life, and I realized I can't keep focusing on the what-ifs anymore. What are you saying? Cass whispered. I've been so caught up with wanting you gone. I leaned forward, forcing her to meet my eye. I wanted what I thought was best for you. For us. I wasn't seeing you for who you are. You're brave, smart, 
Keep talking. The corners of her mouth curled upwards, and some of the light crept back into her eyes. You brought me to life, Cass. There it was. The truth I had been running from all this time. I can't live without you. I know that now. I'd give up my kingdom. I'd give the whole world, just to keep you by my side. I'm stronger than you think, she said, as her hand came up and clutched mine, squeezing my fingers gently. Emboldened by the gesture, I reached up and brushed her hair off her face, running my fingers through her curls. I still want to stay, Damon. My heart swelled, and I pressed a kiss against her mouth. She returned it eagerly, and for a moment we stood there in the clearing, tangled up in each other. Then stay, I breathed, watching her cheeks flush. Stay, and be my queen. Is this a proposal? Despite everything that had passed between us, the nerves still crowded my stomach. It is. I bowed my head before falling to my knees and taking her small hands in mine. All that I have is yours. It's not all you're used to, I know. I looked up at her. She was gazing down at me, her expression soft. Maybe, Cass whispered. But it's all I need. I reached into my shirt and drew out my thin silver chain, fingering the ring on the end. Cass's eyes widened, and she watched in rapt focus as I undid the chain and held the ring up to the light. This belonged to my mother. I turned the ring over in my fingers, memories crowding my mind. My father gave it to her not long after they met. It was small, silver-wrought, and delicate. Roses crept along the band, entwined with thorns. It's beautiful, Cass said. I held it out to her. It's too small for me to wear, I said. So I kept it on a chain, close to my heart. Ever since she... I swallowed, not being able to say the words. But from the look on her face, she caught my meaning. I want you to have it, Cass. She would want you to have it. Cass fiddled with the ring. Gently, I took it back from her and slid it onto her finger. It fit her perfectly. Roses and thorns, she chuckled to herself. Beauty and harshness. I straightened and stood up. As I drew my arms tightly around her waist, she leaned into my body. In this land, you'll have to get used to both, I'm afraid. Well then, I guess I'll need some warmer clothing, she said, and stood on her tiptoes, lifting her face. I tilted my head down and readily gave her the kiss she wordlessly asked for. As I knew I always would. Epilogue Cass A dish was set down in front of us by a servant, and I gasped as the cover was removed with a flourish. Beside me, Damon's eyes danced with amusement. Strawberries, I shouted, loud enough for several of the wedding guests' heads to swivel around. You remembered. Undeterred by the eyes on me, I reached forward and shoved a strawberry into my mouth, groaning as the sweetness burst across my tongue. Damon chuckled, watching me. He accepted the strawberry I pressed into his hand and raised an eyebrow as he bit into it, clearly surprised by the sweet taste. Good, right? I grinned. He nodded. He was humouring me to some degree, but I didn't care. I snuggled in against his side, humming with contentment. I turned my face up to him. I can't believe you remembered what I said about strawberries. Of course, my love. He trailed a finger over the back of my hand. I turned my palm up and let him lace our fingers together. Anything for you. The hall was packed with well-wishers and admirers. It was hard to believe that a few short months ago, this place was so dark and still. Now, the carved wooden panelling gleamed and the high-arched windows framed the snow drifting down outside. Granted, it was a little different to the celebrations I was used to. The decorations around the hall mixed the north and south together 
symbolising our union, delicate sprigs of blossom and pink ribbons were dotted around the tables, and shiny glass icicles hung from the high ceiling, sparkling in the sunlight. It shouldn't work, but it did. I smiled, catching sight of the banner hanging on the far wall. Wolves and dragons interwoven together, and the whole thing entwined with a border of roses. Summer and winter. I wasn't stupid. I knew that life would never be the same again. That there would be challenges thrown our way. But I didn't care. Besides, who didn't have challenges? I'd chosen my destiny. Where others might see danger lurking around every corner of this land, I only saw adventure. Not to mention the man I love. Along the top table, we sat with our friends and fellow rulers. The smaller round tables filled the rest of the space in the Great Hall. I caught sight of Rob, who I'd learnt knew everything there was to know about the history of the kingdom. At another table sat Dimitri and Lucian. They had declined the offer to sit beside us, but seemed content enough to observe the proceedings, if slightly unnerved by the number of people at mine and Damon's wedding. I let my eyes wander, smiling every time I spotted a familiar face. More and more of them were familiar these days. The change in their king had won over most of the townsfolk, and every day it got easier to chat to them. They weren't really as cold and hard as people said. You just needed to get to know them. And I had all the time in the world for that. It's time, Damon murmured, and I straightened up in excitement, squeezing his hand as he got up from the table. As his chair scraped backwards, I locked eyes with Marianne, who sat a couple of seats away. She waggled her fingers at me playfully. Damon headed across the floor, weaving his way through the tables, and as I watched him go, Marianne chuckled. What? Marianne raised her glass of tonic water with one hand and cradled her round belly with the other. Nothing, nothing. A smug smile played around her mouth. I'm pleased you've found your happiness here, Cass. Eric leaned over and draped an arm over her shoulder. My wife is the matchmaker of the various kingdoms. He smirked. I think it's gone to her head. He sounded a little annoyed, but the way he looked at her said otherwise. Pride shone in his eyes. Not at all. Marianne stuck out her tongue at him, and he laughed. It's just nice to use my powers for something good for a change. Eric's eyes softened, and something unspoken passed between them. I turned my head away to give them their privacy, scanning the crowd for Damon. My husband. I still couldn't believe it. I was a married woman now, a queen. A broad hand fell on my shoulder, and I looked up to be confronted with the full force of Stavrok's broad, beaming smile. Cass! He hauled me up out of my seat. I wheezed as he pulled me into a bone-crushing hug. Oof! I pulled away from him a little, laughing. Stavrok! My cousin gazed down at me, misty-eyed. I'm so proud of you, Cass. Looks like I figured things out on my own, huh? I tilted my head, unable to resist teasing him a little. No rescues necessary. Look at you. He glanced around at the bright hallway and the snowy landscape outside. You're the Queen of Winter. I let out a chuckle. Lucy appeared at Stavrock's side, flushed and happy, her long fair hair braided up at the top of her head. It had been some months since I'd seen her, and I gasped at the bump under her dress. He's all smiles now, isn't he? She looped an easy arm around Stavrock's waist. Be glad you didn't have to see me rustle him into his tux this morning. Lucy! She let me pull her into a tight hug giggling as I squealed and hopped up and down with excitement. Oh my God! Why didn't you tell me you were expecting? I drew back. I couldn't punch her in the shoulder, so I punched Stavrok instead, who glared and rubbed his arm. Jeez, Cass, you're lucky it's your wedding day. 
Lucy looked unconcerned with her husband's plight. Her eyes danced with happiness. I wanted it to be a surprise. Hang on. I glanced over at Marianne, who was deep in conversation with Eric, still cradling her own pregnant belly. Did you do this on purpose? Lucy just shrugged, but a smirk appeared at the corner of her mouth. What? They'll all grow up together. It'll be so cute. Stavrock shot me a look that said, don't even ask. Not that I wanted to. The less I knew about their sex life, the better, given some of the things I'd had the misfortune to hear back when I lived with them. Luckily, Damon chose that moment to reappear out of the crowd, his two half-brothers in tow. They were both dressed in suits in honour of the day. They obviously felt as uncomfortable as Stavrock did in their fine garments, judging by the way they kept tugging at their collars. They looked good, strong and regal. A far cry from the rough-hewn shifter men I'd met in the woods all those weeks ago. Although Damon and his newfound brothers had warmed to each other considerably since their first meeting, Dimitri looked apprehensive, his pale eyes narrow and his brow furrowed. Lucian looked downright suspicious as they reached the foot of the table. What is this? Dimitri asked. You'll see, Damon said with a wink. I grinned back at him. I'd been looking forward to this moment. Marianne, would you mind? I turned back to Dimitri. Marianne has a very special gift. She's agreed to use it on the two of you. My wedding present. Marianne stepped up from the table. To Cass and Damon. Dimitri still looked unsure. That's very generous of you, Damon, but it's not necessary. Damon held up a hand. After everything the two of you suffered at the hands of our father, I wanted to give you a gift. Something you'll treasure forever. It's the least I can do. As he slid back into his seat, I turned to him and gave him a big smile. What? Nothing. My smile grew bigger. I'm just happy. He let out a huff, but I could tell he was pleased. My head dropped into the crook of his neck and his arm came up around my shoulder, his fingers tracing lazy patterns against the back of my neck. Have I told you how gorgeous you look right now? He murmured. Yes. I glanced up at him. Many times, actually. Whatever his reply was, I found myself distracted by a sudden purple haze of light that erupted over the floor before us, flowing out from Marianne's outstretched hands. Several onlookers gasped, but the crowd wasn't fearful. Most of our guests knew Marianne and watched, fascinated, as the shimmering smoke continued to spiral outwards. Lucy had told me all about Marianne's courage, how she'd risked her life fighting in the battle. It was clear that she was a heroine in the eyes of these people. I was glad her powers were a source of admiration to them, rather than fear. With a deep, shuddering breath, she collapsed to her knees, utterly spent. In a flash, Eric was by her side, stroking a hand over her back. When she looked up, however, her eyes were wide with excitement. I know where they are. As she spoke, her eyes wandered over to Lucy, of all people. Where? I asked. Why was she looking at Lucy? Not here, that's for sure. Marianne got to her feet, still trembling a little. She was fast regaining her strength, stronger than she had been the last time we met. They're beyond the portal, in the human realm. Who are? Dimitri asked. What are you talking about? What's going on? Lucian said nothing, but he looked equally impatient to know the answer. Marianne blinked, like she'd forgotten about them altogether. She glanced at Damon. You didn't tell them. Tell us what? Dimitri demanded. Damon asked me to find them for you. Like I did for him and Cass. And Stavrock and Lucy. I used my magic to find the women you're fated to be with, Marianne said. 
Her shoulders rose and fell as she shrugged, and the sleeves of her elegant gown fluttered around her. Her eyes were wide. They're in danger. My stomach twisted. What do you mean? Marianne swayed against Eric, who put an arm around her waist and drew her into his side. She pressed a hand to her temple, like the memory pained her. I saw an old house, a farmhouse, a pickup truck, and... She looked up, her long dark hair falling over her face. She'd gone pale. A locked door. The women are together, but they're... they're trapped. Hold on a second, Lucian demanded. Are you saying our soulmates are human? Yes, Marianne snapped. There's no time for the finer details. You have to hurry. Dimitri was already tugging loose his tie, unbuttoning his shirt like he was getting ready to shift then and there. The entire hall was hushed, agog. Dimitri and Lucian's gazes flicked back and forth between Marianne and the others like they were watching a tennis match. Lucian's hand shot out and he grabbed his brother's wrist. Wait, where exactly are these women? Marianne strode forward. Instead of replying, she simply pressed two fingers against Lucian's forehead. His eyes slid shut, and when he opened them, his astonishment chased away the last remaining shreds of doubt and confusion. Thank you, he said, and she nodded, satisfied. Marianne turned toward the table, where the rest of us were still looking on in shock. I've just given them directions. They know how to get there. She paused, looking worried. In theory, anyway. Stavrok stood so fast that the silverware and glasses clattered over the table. I'll go with them. They'll need a guide, someone who understands the human realm. And human women come to that. He glanced down at Lucy, who patted him on the arm. My husband isn't the type to back down from a fight, Lucy added darkly. Promise me you'll come back in one piece. Stavrok bent to kiss the top of her head. Always. You know I'd take you with me, but... His gaze fell pointedly on her belly. I won't be gone long, love. He was already shrugging out of his jacket, the light of his dragon surging in his eyes. Damon sauntered up beside me. I took his hand in mine, and together we watched Stavrok stride out of the hall, Dimitri and Lucian hot on his heels. Well, that was exciting, I said. Damon's mouth quirked. Did you expect anything else? I laughed and shook my head. Soon it would be time to cut the cake, and after that there would be dancing, and the snow-covered grounds would be full of people, music and laughter. And after that? I fiddled with the silver ring around my finger, smiling. It had company now, my wedding band. There were many more adventures to come, and, with Damon at my side, I couldn't wait to get started. Chapter One Dimitri In the blink of an eye, everything had changed. One minute I was sitting awkwardly in the royal hall of my ancestors, hardly able to believe our reversal of fortune. The next, my brother and I were told that our fated mates were human women. That would have been enough of a surprise. My brother and I had always assumed that we didn't have fated mates. Only the luckiest of shifters enjoyed that privilege. But the real shock came when Marianne told us that these women, these strangers, were in danger. She said we had to fly to the human realm immediately and save them before they were lost forever. My brother and I shifted into our dragons and launched off the palace balcony into the air. We followed King Stavrok, who had agreed to accompany us. We'd never been south of our kingdom, let alone to another world. But our mates needed us, so we didn't hesitate, though the fear and trepidation that pulsed through my heart was very real indeed. The cold air nipped at my face as we flew closer to the magical barrier that divided my world from the human realm 
with no idea of what lay waiting on the other side. We were dizzyingly high already, but we kept climbing. The air was thinner up here, there were no birds, nothing around us but thin strands of cloud. Beside me, my brother's wings beat hard, but he managed to keep pace as we followed Stavrock to the portal. Lucian and I had always pushed each other, spurred each other on with every challenge. We'd always competed fiercely. It was what had enabled us to survive all these years of exile out in the wilderness. But we weren't alone any more. Our half-brother, King Damon, had agreed to take us in and allow our people to live within the safety of the kingdom's walls. But even more so, Damon had asked us to live in the castle with him. That had changed our lives in many ways. Especially now. Without his contacts, we would never have met the sorceress who had given us a glimpse into our future. With our mates. Stavrock let out a puff of fire when we reached the barrier as a signal to us. I slowed, flapping my wings hard, and stared at the space before us. It was little more than a ripple in the air. The faint golden colour would have been easy to miss if you weren't looking for it. Lucian pulled up next to me, hovering in mid-air. Stavrock went through first, disappearing into oblivion. I swallowed my fear, and, after a glance at my brother, I followed, slipping through the portal after Stavrock. I inhaled sharply when I emerged. The change in the air was stark. In our world, a cold wind had been blasting over the frozen tundra of the north. But here it was warmer. Even the sky was different, a pale peach colour in the glow of the setting sun. Stavrock circled down to earth below me, but I waited for my brother. When Lucian flew through the portal and appeared at my shoulder, a sense of relief and happiness swept over me. I could tell from Lucian's expression that he felt the same. We'd made it through, unharmed. We fell into a simultaneous dive in perfect sync, wings spiralling outwards. It was a neat trick, impressive according to those who had seen it in the past. We'd been doing it since we were kids. We didn't need a signal. In the air, our shifters could practically read each other's minds. We landed in the middle of a cornfield, and I found myself panting for breath. We were ice dragons. We breathed ice, not fire. And we weren't as used to this warmth as Stavrock. The king was waiting for us, hands on his now human hips. He gestured toward a small farmhouse, to show us where we would be going next. I glanced at my brother, and together we let go of our shifters and became human once more. Naked humans, like Stavrock after his shift. Would this be an issue here in the human world? As if he'd read my mind, Stavrock said, These people are loyal to our kind. They will clothe us and provide some means of transport. All right. I nodded at the king. We had to trust him, but everything in me was tense and on guard. I was ready to shift back and launch into the air at a moment's notice. This was not our world, and nothing about this situation felt natural. I followed Stavrock, together with Lucian, without voicing the questions that were shouting inside my head. Judging by his relaxed body language, Stavrock wasn't worried about the fact that we had all arrived naked in the middle of a field. But I couldn't help the nerves that ran through me. When I looked at Lucian, he seemed equally tense, jaw tightly clenched, hands held in fists at his side. We stepped out of the field and walked toward the farmhouse. Lucian and I hung back while Stavrock rapped on the door. I had no idea what to expect, but a small buxom woman who seemed glad to see us was not on my list. Come in, come in. Out of the cold, she said, and ushered us into a small cloakroom. Help yourself to anything that will fit you. The woman looked at Stavrock with the kind of reverence I wasn't expecting from a human. When we were left alone to dress, I grabbed Stavrock's arm. Do they know about us? About you being one of our dragon kings. 
Her behaviour didn't make sense with any other explanation. Yes, this family guards the entrance to the human world. He pulled on a pair of slacks designed to fit a man with his large frame. These people were obviously accustomed to our size, as I found clothes that fit me perfectly well, even though I'd heard that the men in this realm tended to be smaller in stature than our kind. I have been meaning to return here for some time, Stavrock went on. They did me a great kindness when I came here to find Lucy. I spared a glance at Lucian, who was buttoning his shirt with clumsy fingers. There was a frown on his face, and I knew that look too well. He hadn't spoken since we arrived, which didn't surprise me. He was always the more stoic one of us. I was used to doing the talking. When we stepped back into the main living area of the small house, the woman had returned with a man in tow. He had the look of a farmer. Although he was much shorter than us, he was stocky and strong-looking. His eyes darted between the three of us, and in contrast to the wife, it seemed like he couldn't wait for us to leave. There's a car waiting for you out front. The woman smiled at us as she spoke, digging around in her pocket before pulling out a wad of cash and handing it to Stavrock. This should be enough, sire. Please call us if you need anything else. Stavrock bent his head and kissed the woman's hand, making her giggle. I thank you. I will return when we find what we're looking for. The woman's gaze fell on my brother and me, and her eyes softened. I wasn't sure how much she knew, but I felt warmed by her kindness nonetheless. Good luck, she said, waving as we left her small home and went on our way. Forgive me, Stavrock said, as he jammed the gear stick into position with a crunch. It's been many years since I've driven a car. Don't worry about it, I said between clenched teeth as we rumbled over a pothole. The bump lurched the car down and sideways. My fingers tightened around the edges of the seat. In the rearview mirror, Lucian was looking distinctly green. My brother and I aren't used to them either. That was an understatement. We'd lived our whole lives in the wilds of the North. For the most part, such modes of transport were totally foreign. We were aware that vehicles like this existed, but this was the first time I had actually seen one, let alone dared to ride inside one. My heart hammered in my chest like I was being chased by a wolf. Thankfully, the ride became smoother once we reached a main road that widened out into two carriageways. Stavrock's driving became less frantic, which gave me the chance to absorb our surroundings rather than fearing for my life. I stared in fascination at the strange markings on the surface of the road and the giant metal signs that hung overhead. Which way? Stavrock looked in the rear vision mirror at Lucian when we reached the first intersection. Marianne the sorceress had put the directions inside Lucian's mind back at the castle. Wordlessly, my brother pointed to the right. This happened a few more times, and soon enough we were on the outskirts of a city. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. There were bright, multicoloured lights everywhere, and pavements full of bustling people and glittering storefronts. As the lights faded outside the car, I didn't know which way to look. Stavrock, tapping his fingers impatiently against the steering wheel, was a constant reminder of our mission. The traffic around us was thick, but we snaked through the crowded streets. I'd never given much thought to who my mate could be. My life up until very recently had been one of survival. Harsh winters and brutal raids had left little time for pleasure, and women had been few and far between. Some had come and gone over the years. People drifted through our small clan of outlaws, tagging along for a season before disappearing again. They'd warmed my bed, that was all. No woman had left her mark on my heart, and as far as I knew, I hadn't left mine on any either. I stared grimly out the window at the blur of lights. Night was falling, and fast. I glanced at Lucian out of the corner of my eye. I was accustomed to reading his stoic expression, 
but right now I had no idea what he was thinking. From what the sorceress Marianne had told us, there would be trouble when we reached our destination. We could hold our own in any battle when we knew the terrain, but this was unfamiliar territory on every level. I'd never fought against humans before. But I knew, in my bones, even though the shock of the revelation had yet to wear off, that I would do anything to protect my mate. Even though I hadn't met her yet. My mate. I shook my head. As the bastard son of the Northern King, thrown out of the kingdom a long time ago, the last thing I ever expected to find was a human fated mate. I didn't feel worthy or deserving of such a gift. It was late evening by the time we left the city behind. At Lucian's instructions, Stavrock turned down a dark, winding country lane. Then we were once again bumping over potholes and loose stones, the car rumbling as it crept forward. Stavrock dipped the headlights as we approached, so hopefully they wouldn't see us coming. I couldn't see much outside thanks to the darkness of night. The vague shapes of trees loomed ahead. I stared hard, and through the gaps in the undergrowth, I made out a handful of small outbuildings. Once we cleared the trees, a small yard lay in front of a seemingly empty farmhouse. Are you sure this is the right place? I muttered to Lucian. It looked like no one had lived here in a long time. Lucian nodded, his expression grim. Stavrock shut off the engine and we climbed out of the vehicle. The wind whistled around the seemingly abandoned dwelling as we approached. Our footsteps echoed loudly in the silence. As we grew closer, the sense of foreboding increased. Something didn't feel right about this place. It was so still and quiet, and yet, all the windows were boarded up with planks of wood. Why would they need to do that if it was abandoned? Then I saw it, a thin strip of light beneath the doorway. Stavrock caught the direction of my gaze and nodded before pressing a finger to his lips. I took my place on the other side of the doorway to Lucian. In one blow, Stavrock shouldered open the door. Light spilled out, along with a gust of warmth and a clatter of surprise from the inhabitants inside. Crates bound in packing tape were piled around the edges of the room. In the centre lay a long table under a single bare light bulb around which a small group of women sat, huddled together. Their eyes were wide with fear. They were all thin, and their hollowed cheeks spoke of weeks of untold suffering. Clear plastic bags littered the table, along with powder and cutting tools. Human drugs, then. I couldn't focus on any of it. Like a fish hook in my gut, my attention was yanked elsewhere. I almost fell to my knees with the force of the call coming from somewhere inside the house. My hand clamped around Stavrock's shoulder. In normal circumstances, I would never dare touch a king in such a way. But these weren't normal circumstances. She's here, I said with a pained breath. Somewhere else. Not in this room. Are you sure? Stavrock asked. I closed my eyes briefly, trying to block out the overwhelming force of the siren song that had led us here. It still threatened to bring me to my knees. I forced myself to nod. Yes. My gaze roved the frightened faces. But there was no flicker of recognition among them. There was only terror staring back. She's not in here. I fought to keep the rising panic out of my voice. But she's close. I can feel it. I caught Lucian's eye. I don't know what I expected to find. A reflection of my own feelings, perhaps. If my mate was somewhere close by, then my brother's mate was likely with her. But there was no trace of a reaction on his face, only concern. I dragged my gaze back to the room at large. Who's in charge here? I called, addressing the women. Silence greeted my words. Beside me, Stavrock stepped forward. We do not seek to harm you. We are here to help. Tell us. 
Are there more of you? Are there others being held captive in this place? Slowly, one of the women looked up. Her pale face was fraught with anxiety, but she didn't look as spaced out as the others. She met Stavrok's eye bravely. There's a basement beneath the house. She pointed to the corner of the room. My eyes followed her gesture, and a heated pulse shot through me as my eyes landed on a door. By now, I could hear faint voices coming from another part of the building. They were low and rough. It sounded like a group of men. A door slammed, and the woman who had spoken jerked upright. They're coming! You have to hurry! Stavrok strode toward the source of the male voices. I remained in the centre of the room, paralysed by the flow of hormones that raced through my body. Lucian seemed to sense my altered state because he took charge, rushing to the front door and beckoning the women forward. They drifted uncertainly toward him, heading out into the darkness. There's a car parked in the yard out front. Keys are in the ignition, Lucian told the leader of the women. I eyed her threadbare clothes and frail physique with worry, but she nodded fiercely at his words. Head for the main road. With whispered thanks, the women slipped off into the night. The car's engine started up just as the door on the other side of the room slammed open. Stavrok let out an almighty, inhuman roar and immediately shifted into his dragon form. A pulse of fury sparked through my chest when I laid eyes on the monsters who'd held these women prisoner. The rage on their faces lasted for only a second before terror replaced it. Bright, hot flames reflected in their eyes as Stavrok released a jet of fire that annihilated the nearest packing crate, reducing it to ashes. The men turned tail and fled the scene, leaving Stavrok to obliterate the entire room. I'll check for stragglers, Lucian yelled over the roar of the flames. You get to the basement. As shifters, my brother and I were impervious to the fire that raged around us, but that wouldn't be the case for any humans left behind. Stavrok came to a halt beside me and shifted back into his human form. His chest heaved with anger. Let us finish this, he growled, nodding with narrowed eyes at the door in the corner of the room. Lucian appeared in the empty doorway, the back room still smouldering away behind him. All clear. Before any of us could do anything, a dirty, ragged arm appeared through another doorway, followed by the hulking form of a man. His face was twisted with fury as he pointed a gun at Stavrok. The shot rang out. Stavrok recoiled from the impact. My blood ran cold as I started towards him. I braced the king against my side before he could sink to the floor. No, no! With a swift, merciless movement, Lucian raced forward and snapped the human's neck. He fell to the floor, lifeless, and Lucian turned to us with the same blank, calm expression I'd seen hundreds of times before. It's a mere flesh wound. Stavrok shrugged me off, staggering backwards. Sure enough, the bullet had pierced through his shoulder. Dark blood ran from the hole in his bare skin. He didn't seem bothered, though, merely shocked that such a thing could happen. I'll be fine. We must get to the basement. I didn't need telling twice. Leaving Lucian and Stavrok behind, I hurried to the door in the corner of the room. My mate was on the other side. Chapter 2 Dimitri The door was locked when I tried the knob. As if that would stop me. I took a step back, lifted my leg and kicked it in. The door was flimsy and once partly open, I twisted it off its hinges and tossed it aside. A dark stairwell lay beyond the door. At the bottom of the darkness, a faint light buzzed on the side of the wall, a meagre light bulb illuminating the crooked stairs and peeling walls. With the door out of the way, the call grew even stronger. It was almost deafening, buzzing through every cell in my body. I descended the stairs two at a time, landing at the bottom with a grunt. As I straightened, 
my breath caught in my throat. Two women were chained up against the far wall. One of them sat slumped over. The small movements of her chest were the only sign of life. She was deathly pale, and her hands lay limply by her sides. The other one had gotten to her feet at my arrival. Despite her obvious weakness, along with the heavy shackles that bound her wrists and ankles, she stood half in front of the other woman, as if to protect her, a determined glare on her face. Who are you? Her voice was low and rasping, perhaps from dehydration. Even so, the sound was music to my ears. Her words soothed the ache in my chest. I didn't know how long the pained feeling had been there, but it felt like forever. I took a half step forward. This was the one. This was my human mate. Her hand shot outwards, the handcuff clinking around her thin wrist. Don't come any closer. I froze on the spot. The need for her was inside me, building. It was burning hotter and hotter, and I didn't know what to do to ease it. Stavrock and Lucian came down the stairs more slowly than me and stopped just behind me. The spell was broken, though, their sudden presence forcing me into action. The shift began inside me before I could stop it. I couldn't control what was happening even though I fought it. Now is not the time. But my dragon would not listen. My vision blurred and I stumbled to my knees, the familiar sensation taking over my body. As I straightened, my head now hit the low ceiling. My mate gaped up at me. She was glued to the spot, still hovering over the other woman. I let out a snarl and lashed out with my claws, breaking open the chains that bound her in place. She backed away from me, but I advanced on her, grabbing her around the waist and hauling her toward me. I could feel the tension in her human body as she tried to resist. I realised she was saying something, pleading. Take me, but please, please, don't hurt my sister. I'll do anything you want, I swear, just let her go. Lucian rushed forward and crouched down beside the unconscious girl. He pressed a hand against her forehead, brushing back her hair. He didn't seem affected by her at all, though his actions were possibly gentler than I would normally expect from him. Despite my haze of euphoria, my brain registered his response as strange. But I couldn't focus on that. My only priority was the woman I held in my grasp. When she saw Lucian reach for her sister, her thrashing intensified. Please! Get them back to the castle, Stavrock roared from behind us. Lucian jumped up and shifted, grabbing the other woman up in his claws. I arched my head back and blasted the ceiling above us with a cold jet of ice. The wooden beams broke apart, shattering in a spectacular fashion and raining debris down on us. I bent my head and folded my wings over my mate, feeling bits of wood fall onto my wings as I waited for the collapse to finish. When the area calmed, I looked up once more. The ceiling was gone, leaving the dark, clear night sky beyond open to our flight. The woman sagged against me. I glanced down. Her eyes had closed. The shock of the roof caving in above us must have been too much for her to handle. The need was stirring within me, fierce and uncontrollable. I had to get this woman to safety, to take her far away from this place. Back to my home, where I could protect her. Tell Lucy I will return to our castle. Stavrok's voice rumbled through the wreckage. He was pulling more rubble down from the hole in the ceiling, making sure the gap was large enough for us to fly through. I have to take care of things here first. As if suddenly remembering he was wounded, he pressed a hand against his shoulder. Tell her our doctors will attend me. She'll worry otherwise. Lucian launched himself into the sky. I watched his silhouette against the stars, the dark trees framing his steadily shrinking form as he rose. With one final parting glance at Stavrok, I followed Lucian into the sky.
The journey back to the portal between worlds was brief compared to the long, winding car ride from the farmhouse. Human roads seemed to be full of traffic and pointless diversions. The sky, in comparison, was a vast and mostly empty expanse that we were able to traverse quickly. Our only company was the strange metallic machines covered with blinking lights, the humans' airplanes. Because we were carrying human women, we had to fly far lower than those airplanes, instead of high above them where we would normally choose to travel. At the altitudes Lucian Stavrock and I normally flew, these women would not be able to breathe. It made things slightly trickier on the way back to the portal. We had to fly extra fast to avoid detection from the humans below us and ensure that anyone seeing us would have to rub their eyes and look twice. By the time they did that, we'd have been long gone. My wings beat through the sky until they ached. I pushed on, faster, inhaling deep lungfuls of the cold night air. My blood was burning, my fear for the woman I carried greater than anything I'd ever known. I didn't know any humans. The only one I had met was Stavrock's wife, Queen Lucy, and I'd hardly said two words to her. I'd certainly never spoken with her properly. I had no idea how strong they were or how much trauma their bodies could withstand before they just gave up. What if I hurt the one thing I was destined to protect? What if I accidentally killed her? As the thought passed through my mind, I let out a roar into the night sky. The sound shot through the clouds way above us, the icy flames jetting from my mouth and lighting up the surrounding sky like a bolt of lightning. I couldn't live with myself if anything happened to my mate. It was a wild shock to me how quickly everything had changed. Ever since my brother and I had been welcomed into Damon's castle, our lives had been turned upside down. He had accepted us as his kin, his half-brothers, royalty in our own right. After all these years of scavenging and raids, warfare and the constant, desperate struggle for survival, it was strange to feel as if we had finally been allowed to come home. But as tough as those exile years had been, at least I'd known my purpose in life. The last few weeks had been amazing, but I was adrift. I'd had no idea what I was supposed to do. Now? Now I knew. It had been just as the sorceress Marianne had said. My future was in my grasp. My path lay ahead of me. This woman clutched in my talons was the answer to everything. Now all that was left was to protect her, cherish her, and claim her for myself. When we finally made it to the shimmering air around the portal, I exhaled with relief. We were almost home. How I longed to set foot on our home turf once again. The sky changed when we passed through the gateway between the worlds. The blackness around us was replaced by a pale dawn sky. It was disorientating, and I blinked to clear my vision as we swooped down into the lush green valley that lay beyond the portal. Lucian flew up beside me, dipping his wing in greeting. We must have made a strange sight flying in tandem with our unusual cargo. Beneath us, Stavrock's palace lay glittering in the early morning sunlight, its multitude of windows shining up at us. Hopefully, the king wouldn't stay long in the human world. He needed medical attention, and his wife would not be happy when she found out he'd stayed behind. We flew toward our own home, the weather shifting into our winter wonderland. By the time we flew over the mountain range that divided Damon's kingdom from Stavrock's, even the colder, thinner air couldn't dampen my spirits. I clutched the still unconscious woman close to my chest, hoping the warmth of my dragon body was enough to protect her from the harsh elements of the north. Up ahead, my half-brother's castle loomed on the horizon. I steeled myself and prepared for the descent. There were people already standing on the castle battlements waiting for us as we flew homeward. I circled overhead, eyeing Lucy, Marianne and Eric's upturned faces. As Lucian and I landed on the rough flagstones, they rushed us from every direction. What happened? Lucy asked, her forehead creased with worry. 
she kept looking up at the sky until she must have figured out Stavrok wasn't with us. She reached out to grab hold of the girl in my grasp, and a faint ripple of anger swept through me, demanding that my mate stay close by my side, but I shoved it down. Where's Stavrok? I let go of my dragon and shifted back, standing on two feet once more. Marianne rushed forward, handing Lucy a blanket for my mate and a thick robe for me, which I took gratefully. He's heading back to your castle. He had some things to take care of first. Lucy's gaze narrowed before studying my faintly singed hair. Beside me, Lucian straightened. There was a purpling bruise on his cheekbone. He must have been hit by a piece of falling rubble when we'd been at the house. Dimitri, Lucy said, putting her hands on her hips. What happened? I didn't have the energy to pretend. Stavrok got shot. The Queen's hands flew up to cover her mouth, and I spoke quickly before she had a chance to interrupt. Or panic. He's fine. Injured, but alive. He said he'll get the palace doctors to attend to him, and he'll be waiting for you when you return. He better be, Lucy grumbled. All right. I'll tell the servants to get the carriage ready. On the ground a few feet away, Marianne wrapped my mate in a blanket. Lucian had the other human woman over his shoulder, and he and Eric were already striding toward the doors of a nearby tower. I turned away from Lucy and hurried over to Marianne. I could barely take my eyes off my mate's pale, serene face. Her beautiful blonde hair spread out like a halo. My breath caught in my chest, and I crouched down, unable to resist putting my hand against her neck to check her pulse. Despite her unconscious state, it was still strong, thank goodness. Where are Damon and Cass? I asked. They left for their honeymoon last night, Marianne murmured, watching me carefully. Despite her kindness toward us, I felt uneasy being alone with her. The sorceress's intense violet eyes made me uncomfortable. It was like she could read my mind. For all I know, she can. We need to get her inside. Warm her up properly. I grunted, hefting my mate's dead weight into my arms. Her fair hair spilled over my arms as I marched to the castle entrance. Marianne fell into step beside me. Her apparent calmness was unsettling, considering my urgency. She held the door open for me and I swept through, letting her lead the way down the maze of passageways until finally we were at the door to an unfamiliar chamber. We had this wing of the castle prepared for the two women, Marianne said. My vision showed me the state they would be in when they arrived. I knew they would need urgent care and warmth. Her brow furrowed as her eyes fell on the woman in my arms. Thank you, I said, sincerely grateful for everything she'd done. Marianne nodded at me as I shouldered open the door, finding my brother already in the room. Eric and Lucy were nowhere to be seen. The room was dark, softly lit by a few lamps set into the alcoves. Two beds had been placed side by side under a white canopy. On top of a cupboard opposite the beds, several medications were arranged in neat rows. I ignored the anxiety that twanged in my chest at the sight of the makeshift hospital and made my way over to the empty bed. Gently, I deposited my mate onto it and pulled the sheets up over her small body. Her skin was almost as pale as the bed sheets, and the deep shadows under her eyes were even more pronounced in the low light. How can this delicate-looking woman be a dragon's mate? I stared down at her unmoving face. I couldn't deny the possessive want that surged through my body every time I laid eyes on her. Her proximity was satisfying on some bone-deep, primal level. I couldn't explain it, but I knew it was real. This was it. Somehow, impossibly, she was the one. My hands skimmed over her shoulders as I tucked the sheets around her. She seemed tiny beneath my hands. Most of the women in this realm were sturdily built and as tough as the menfolk, especially in the north. 
They had to be, to survive the harshness of life. But this woman was a slip of a thing. One wrong move, and she would melt away with the morning snow. When I glanced up at Lucian, I saw that he was staring down at the other woman, frowning. I held back a grin. Typical Lucian. Even seeing his mate for the first time can't make the guy crack a smile. I opened my mouth to say as much to my brother, but before I could, Marianne slipped silently into the room. I straightened up again, feeling like a kid caught with his hand in the cookie jar. Marianne swept over to the beds and stood between the women. She reached out and put one hand on each of the women's temples, closing her eyes for a moment. When she opened them, she nodded to herself before turning to us. These girls have been through hell, she said, her face grave. Her eyes sharpened, their purple hue darkening into midnight blue as she pointed a finger at me and then Lucian. They aren't like us. You will have to win them over slowly. Even when they heal physically, their mental suffering has been great. I don't know how long it will take before, or if, they will trust again. She stared down again at the girls, and the expression on her face shifted as she took in the face of the girl Lucian hovered over. She frowned, a small wrinkle appearing between her usually flawless brows. My unease grew, and a shiver ran over my skin. What's wrong? Marianne's eyes snapped up to meet mine. I... nothing. She bit her lip, glancing at the woman again. I'm just confused, is all. I saw two sisters, but this one, she wasn't in my vision. I stared down at the sleeping, peaceful face. The resemblance between the women was clear, long, fair hair, pale skin. The one Lucian had brought back looked a little younger than my mate, perhaps still in her late teens. What are you trying to say? Lucian demanded. I'm sure it's nothing. Marianne's hasty tone didn't match the nervousness in her eyes. My visions are sometimes a little unreliable. Perhaps I misinterpreted something. I found myself nodding. The feelings swirling inside me were so real, so intense. I knew who my mate was, and if the sorceress had seen two sisters in her vision, then there was no doubt this young woman must be the one for Lucian. When they wake up, that's when everything will start to make sense. At least, I hoped so. Too soon, Eric and Marianne took to the battlements to begin their long journey home. I watched with a heavy heart as the sorceress climbed onto the back of her mate. Even though she unnerved me, it was tough that our only source of guidance was leaving. I wanted Marianne to be here when the girls woke up, but I knew this was something my brother and I had to experience for ourselves. Eric lifted into the sky, but before his powerful wings carried them away, Marianne twisted around and shouted down to us. Don't forget what I said! Her voice travelled through the whistling air as her flowing hair twisted in the wind. Take your time with them, please. I nodded to let her know I'd heard, and then Eric's huge, leathery wings soared into the distance. Soon enough, they were nothing but a speck on the horizon. I headed back inside the castle, thrumming with nerves and anger. Who had done this to our mates? And what level of suffering had they endured that Marianne was so nervous about their ability to heal? Would we ever get the revenge my dragon already demanded for their suffering? Chapter 3 Dimitri The court physician was an elderly man who peered at us through half-rimmed spectacles as we ushered him inside the chamber. I've never treated human women before, he said, before reaching out to pick up my mate's limp arm. As he took her pulse, a throb of possessive rage rushed through me. I shoved it down. The physician was only trying to help them. But the basic principles are the same as for our kind, he continued. They are dehydrated and exhausted, chafed from being in restraints, but I can't find anything else physically wrong with them at the moment. 
not without speaking to them and doing a more thorough exam. When they wake up, they will both need bed rest and lots of fluids. I nodded my thanks, and the physician soon took his leave. Like most of the staff in the castle, he was uneasy around my brother and me, not speaking unless necessary, and slow to meet my eye. Many people here thought King Damon had been a fool to let the likes of us into the royal court. The courtiers saw us as thieves and scoundrels, trying to drag the land to ruin. I could only hope that, over time, we would manage to change their minds. But it didn't really matter to me whether or not we achieved that. If we had to leave the castle and return to our rougher lives, I would do it. I had learned the hard way through life that Lucian was the only person I could truly count on. We were used to living in a hostile world. Though now, I had a mate I had to consider. I wasn't yet sure how that might change things for my future. I took a jug off the top of the dresser and filled the empty glass at her bedside with water. I hated being so powerless, but there was nothing to do except wait for my mate and her sister to wake up. Dimitri? My brother's voice dragged me out of my thoughts. Yeah? Those feelings everyone describes getting when you first see your mate. He didn't meet my eyes. Do you feel them? I thought about the intense pull in the pit of my stomach. The desire that raged through me. My shifter burned with passion for this stranger who lay unconscious between us. I do. I swallowed, clenching my fists and then releasing them. What's it like? he whispered. I frowned, taking a closer look at Lucian. He was staring down at the other woman, focused intently on her face, like he was willing her to wake up. A ripple of confusion shot through me. What do you mean, what's it like? I tilted my head, trying to get a read on him. Don't you feel it? Lucian hesitated, then shook his head. I don't feel anything. She's pretty, I suppose, but there's no attraction. I rescued her because she was in trouble, but I would have done the same for anyone in that situation. I thought back to what Marianne had said. Her confusion over her vision. Maybe she's made a mistake. No, surely it wasn't possible. It couldn't be. I wanted my brother to have everything. The fierce joy that burned through me dampened at the possibility that he didn't share in my passion for his mate. When she wakes up, I found myself saying, your shifter's bond will likely activate then. That must be the difference. My mate was awake when we found them. Maybe. Lucian didn't seem convinced, but I was. Surely fate wouldn't be so cruel as to deliver me my mate, and at the same time deny Lucian the mate he'd always craved. Sarah. I woke up warm beneath a deep, soft cloud. At least that was what it felt like as I slowly pulled myself out of the depths of sleep. I was almost drowning under the comfortable weight. I could sleep forever cocooned in its delicious warmth, and my body certainly wanted to. But something at the back of my mind prodded me to wake up. There was something I was meant to do, something I'd forgotten. I opened my eyes a fraction, and my fingers closed around the cloudy substance which turned out to be a thick, plush blanket. Wait, a blanket? My eyes slowly adjusted to the dim light and I took in the room. It was lit with candles and had stone walls like a medieval castle. This must be a dream. My heart hammered inside my chest. Was I in a hospital? It didn't feel like one. There were no nurses, no blinking lights. It didn't smell like a hospital ward either. Instead of antiseptic, the air was scented with wood smoke. The scent was divine, permeating my nostrils and causing me to inhale deeply. What is that beautiful scent? Who does it belong to? We'd been saved. That was certain. Thank God for that.
our nightmare might finally be over. My eyes opened a little wider. In the corner of my field of vision, I made out a fireplace full of bright, flickering flames. What the? My breathing picked up as panic set in. I wanted to speak, but when I opened my mouth, nothing came out. Nadia! Nadia, where are you? Through my half-closed eyelids, a dark shape appeared. A cool glass was pressed to my lips and I swallowed rapidly. The sensation of water passing through my parched lips was pure bliss and I collapsed back on the pillow with a sigh, my eyes closing even though I tried to keep them open. Where am I? And who are you? I wanted to ask my water bringer, but the dark shape receded out of view. I was too weak to open my eyes again or even lift a finger. I slipped away into darkness once more. The next time I woke, daylight cast brightly over my face. This time, my eyes flew open easily. There was a thick canopy woven with strange patterns above my head. It stretched right over the bed and draped down on either side, then tied at the bases of the ornately carved pillars. I squinted in confusion. Why am I in a four-poster bed? I shifted experimentally, pressing down. My fingers met a soft, downy mattress. I rolled my head to one side, feeling the lush pile of pillows beneath me. Is this some kind of hotel? My heart squeezed with elation. Had we been rescued? I must have passed out because I couldn't remember how we got here. The memories leading up to this moment were a dark blur as well. I had a faint memory of the delicious smell of wood smoke and the sound of our captors shouting in panic. And then, I must have dreamed the next part. It was impossible. Nadia! I sat bolt upright with a gasp, instantly taking in the room around me. There were stone walls, huge arched windows, a roaring fireplace, and my sister's small frame, half buried in blankets, asleep in the bed across from mine. Oh, thank God. I scrambled to push my sheets away and stumbled to my feet, my heart thumping wildly in my chest. I took a step forward and the world tilted. My fingers grasped for the bedside table, but before they could make contact, something warm and solid collided with my back and strong fingers wrapped around my hand. Whoa! The deep voice came from behind me, and it made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Easy, little one. I wanted to tell him I wasn't a horse, and despite my size I wasn't helpless, and he didn't need to treat me that way. But my knees were wobbling, practically knocking together like a newborn foal. I tried to move forward, but the stranger held me back. You must rest, woman. You're too weak to move about just yet. I struggled against him. My sister! She's... She's fine, but weak. She's still recovering from her ordeal. The voice was firm, which was oddly reassuring. As are you. I stopped fighting him and allowed myself to be led back to my own bed. The world was spinning again. Damn it. I hated being so weak. As I settled back down onto the pillows, I got a good look at the owner of the deep voice. My heart leapt with a mixture of fear and fascination as I met his eyes for the first time. I know those eyes. You, I blurted out. You're the one who broke into the basement. You're the one who, who... He saved us. I fumbled, lost for words. Fragments of memory slipped through the fingers of my consciousness. I remembered clawed talons and dark, scaly skin, the shadow of wings against a blackened sky. And, most vivid of all, fire. Blazing bright and hot, destroying everything in its path. Reducing the house that had been our prison into a pile of smouldering ash. Large hands wrapped around my wrists, and I realised I was clutching the bedsheets in my fists. You're safe here, he said. I promise. I twisted away from his touch. 
Where am I? What is this place? The room was like something out of a painting. My gaze landed on the plush rug in front of the fire, on the crossed swords and shield that hung above the fireplace. I wanted answers, but everywhere I looked only increased my confusion. Somewhere you can rest, the man said. Trust me, you are safe. I couldn't escape those piercing eyes. They were such a light blue they bordered on grey. The colour reminded me of a frozen river. They were still and guarded at their surface level, but a storm of emotion raged beneath. I wasn't sure how I knew that, but in my heart, it was the truth. The intensity of his gaze made my breath catch in my chest. He appeared to mistake my flushed cheeks for something else, because he pressed the back of his hand against my forehead. Are you feverish? I shook my head. Some instinct made me draw the bedsheets up over my arms, cocooning myself from his touch. I craved his touch, which was the exact opposite of what I wanted or needed at this time. It made my evasion of him even more necessary. Where am I? I forced myself to meet his gaze. Even though my pulse was racing, I tried not to let the fear show on my face. He didn't look like any of the men who had kept my sister and me captive. Truth be told, he didn't look like any man I'd ever met in my life. His dark, shaggy hair curled around his ears, and the dark stubble on his face made me question just how long he'd been keeping watch over me. A scar cut through the stubble on one side of his face, running down to the edge of his jaw. His bare forearms were weathered, and more scars crisscrossed the tanned skin there, faint pale lines that intersected, some old, some new. He looked like a warrior of old, but that was insane. Nothing in my experience had prepared me for someone like this guy. He watched me calmly. You are in my brother's castle. My mouth dropped open. Did he just say, castle? My fingers didn't budge from their death grip on the sheets. I couldn't help but feel like a cornered animal on high alert. A glance downwards confirmed that I was still wearing my clothes, at least, but it was cold comfort. Okay, I snapped, terror and annoyance warring within me. How did I get to this castle? I brought you here. Simple as that. My stomach twisted at his words. And you'll let me go once my sister wakes up, I persisted. We're not prisoners here, are we? As we had been back at the farm. He shook his head. No, of course you're not a prisoner. You're only here to recover from your injuries. I relaxed a little, though I noticed he hadn't totally answered my question. My name is Dimitri, he said, when the silence stretched out between us. I still don't know yours. Despite everything, I almost smiled. He had brought my sister and me to this unknown castle, surrounded by who knew what, totally at his mercy. But he didn't know my name. And clearly, he wanted to. Sarah, I managed eventually. To my relief, my voice didn't tremble, and I managed to keep my head held high. My name is Sarah. I'd never thought my name was anything but plain. But from the way Dimitri's eyes suddenly darkened and my belly did an answering flip-flop, my name suddenly seemed like the most erotic word in the world. Chapter 4 Dimitri I held my breath as I walked to the bedchamber door to let myself out. I had to force my dragon down with every step I took. When I reached the door, I turned the handle, then glanced back at her. I will return shortly. I waited on the threshold, eyeing her until she nodded. She was still looking at me warily, but she was no longer half buried in the blankets, which I took to be a good sign. The sight of her threadbare clothes reminded me that she needed something new to wear. Food, too. Who knew when she last ate? I headed into the corridor, 
only to find Lucian hovering just outside the room. How are they? he asked, barely giving me time to shut the door. The one I rescued, Sarah, she's woken up. I fought to keep my voice even. I wanted to shift, to fly far above the clouds. I could have burned the whole place down with my desire for her. But I had to keep myself in check for now. The other one is still out cold. I caught the attention of a passing servant and waved him over. Some bread and hot soup, please. For two people. Quick as you can. The man gave me a smile which looked more like a sneer, turned on his heel and strode down the hallway. My hands clenched into fists. I knew very well what most of the servants saw when they looked at me, a bastard son of the old king. Rejected. Unwanted. Desperate. The reminder always stung, though King Damon made sure we never felt it in his presence. Cass and Damon treated us like family. I'll go to the kitchens, Lucian said. Just to make sure the cooks know we need food up here. I nodded as he followed the manservant out of sight. I listened to the echo of their footsteps until silence fell once more. I was abruptly aware that I was alone, and Sarah was waiting for me on the other side of the door. My heart hammered in my chest as I pushed it open and peeked in. Maybe she's gone back to sleep. I swallowed hard at the sight of the empty bed. The bed covers were rumpled and Sarah was gone. My blood ran cold. I stepped into the room, ready to bellow out for help, and woe betide anyone who didn't respond. Then I saw a small figure sitting beneath the window. Sarah turned her head as I moved to stand beside her. She was curled up on the narrow window seat, feet tucked underneath her, staring with seeming calm out at the frozen landscape beyond. I thought you were gone. I tried to keep the note of accusation out of my voice. I wouldn't have blamed her if she'd tried to escape. After everything she'd been through, it would have made sense. I just wanted to stretch my legs and see it for myself. She turned back to the window, pointing at the snow that drifted past the glass. I guess you were telling the truth about this being a castle. I hesitated before dropping down onto the other end of the seat, shifting awkwardly to accommodate my large frame. She still seemed calm enough, but from the way her eyes kept darting toward me, I could tell she was on edge. I would never mislead you. I kept my reply soft and as non-threatening as possible. This is an ancient fortress. It's been in my father's family for generations. Her bright blue eyes widened as they met mine. Her lips hovered apart, like she was on the verge of questioning me further. I was transfixed by the soft bow shape of her mouth. God, she's perfect. Then the door opened and Sarah's mouth snapped shut. Her gaze dropped down to her lap and I frowned as she shrunk into herself, shoulders hunching. Lucian approached with a tray and set it down on a nearby table. I smiled when, despite her obvious anxiety, Sarah leaned forward. I inhaled the scent of the fragrant soup and hot bread that my brother had brought, and my stomach tightened in hunger. Please, eat. I gestured toward the tray. When her eyes narrowed, I shrugged, reaching for a hunk of bread and tearing off a piece. Suit yourself, I said, dipping the bread into one of the mugs of soup and then shoving the food into my mouth. I grinned at her. Her mouth curled into a nervous smile. She reached out, took her mug from the table, then took a few careful sips of soup before hunger seemed to get the better of her and she grabbed for the bread and began eating in earnest. Before long, she had demolished half the tray. By the time she was finished, her eyes were brighter and her skin had lost that deathly pallor. You must have been hungry. Lucian raised an eyebrow at her. Sarah's hands were still curled protectively around the mug, but she nodded. The movement made her fair hair shift around her shoulders and catch in a momentary ray of sunlight. I wanted to reach out, to run my fingers through the strands of her hair, 
I struggled to focus back in on the conversation. I haven't had a meal like that in... She trailed off, fingers tapping against the mug. I don't know how long. Those men, I growled, and her eyes snapped up to meet mine. Who were they? Her cheeks paled so much I almost regretted my question. Lucian frowned at me, and I knew what he was thinking. She was too weak right now. Any unnecessary stress might impede her recovery. I needed to find out what those bastards did to her and her sister and punish them for it, but I wanted to see her get better first. That was the only thing standing in the way of me going back through the portal right now and killing every last one of them. At first I thought my anger had scared her into silence. But after a moment she started to speak. Her voice was quiet and hesitant at first, but the more she spoke, the stronger she seemed to become. I was, well, I am, in my final year of college. My little sister Nadia had come up for the weekend just for a visit. Sarah's eyes darted to her sister's still motionless form. She'd always been the one of us to stay at home. She went to a community college close by so she could look after our parents. I was the one who wanted excitement, the adventure of the city. Anyway, on the last night of her stay... I wanted to go out. She didn't want to, but I insisted. Sarah's voice wobbled, and her eyes shone with unshed tears. I wanted to reach out and pull her close, but I resisted, giving her the space to continue in her own time. Anyway, we eventually went out. After hitting a few clubs, I wanted to try this new place on the edge of town. She went along with it, but I knew she wanted to go home. The street was dark and we'd been walking for God knows how long. Anyway, at some point a man stepped out of the shadows. Before I could do anything, something hit me in the back of the head and I woke up in the back of a van with Nadia by my side. What did the men want with you? Lucian asked. My hands were clenched together in my lap and I breathed shallowly through my nose. Sarah wiped a stray tear from her cheek. They told us they'd kidnapped dozens of girls, girls like us, from all over the place. Some of them ended up working for their business. She sniffed. My mind flashed back to the women gathered around the table in that dimly lit room, handling the drugs. But they said we were too valuable for that. A pretty face could fetch a high price. They'd have buyers lined up for both of us soon enough. Sarah's voice trembled, and she collapsed as she burst into tears. The stress of everything had apparently caught up with her. I put my arm around her shoulders, wanting to offer comfort. At first she stiffened up, then relaxed into my touch. My heart ached with happiness to hold her, and my dragon was calm knowing his mate was here and safe at last. When she spoke again, her voice was barely above a whisper. I don't know how long they kept us in there. At first we were held in one of the back rooms, and Nadia thought we could escape. She waited until she thought everyone was asleep and tried to slip out. Sarah closed her eyes and shuddered. When they brought her back, the man in charge got angry. He, he hit her hard, and she fell. She didn't get back up. After that, they put us both down in the basement in those chains. I pulled her closer, feeling her ragged breathing against my chest. I'm sorry you had to go through all that. Rest assured, no harm will come to you here. She pulled back from me and wiped her hands over her face. I just want to go home. I exchanged a glance with Lucian. Minutely, he shook his head at me. He's right. I need to be careful what I say. Don't want to shock her any more than I already have. Instead of answering her directly, I decided to change the subject. Now that you're awake, I'll see about getting you some clothes. I plucked at her threadbare sleeve. You must be half frozen. Why are you doing all this, Dimitri? Her eyes met mine, sharp and suspicious. 
How did you know where to find us in the first place? Why are we here? Whatever I'd expected from this human woman, I could see that things weren't going to be as straightforward as her recognising me as her mate and simply falling into my arms with joy. I reluctantly pulled myself away from her and stood up. Excuse us for a few moments. I'm going to see about some garments for you. Once Lucian and I were out in the hallway, he rounded on me, arms crossed. You can only stall for so long, he said as we fell into step. Sooner or later, you're going to have to tell her the truth. I know. She was beginning to trust me, I could see that. But how long could I keep her in the dark about our bond? About her new life in this land? Would she change her mind and want to stay? Or would she still want to go home, to the human world? Our connection was so new and still so fragile. I stole a glance through a window as we passed, eyeing the stormy sky with trepidation. How long before it all came crashing down? Sarah I don't know how long I sat at the window, watching the snow falling over the frozen landscape. From what I could see from my high vantage point, the castle was expansive. Below us, stone gargoyles scowled from ornately carved cornices, and the spikes of various towers rose into the sky. There were snow-covered hedges in the gardens below, and the occasional staff member hurried along the steps that snaked down toward a heavy iron drawbridge. It was like a castle from a fairy tale or a dream. I kept expecting to wake up in the cold basement. But the longer I sat there, the more I realised that this was real. We had been rescued, and now Nadia and I could begin the road to recovery. I pressed my fingertips against the leaded glass window, watching my breath fog up the surface. I shivered, reminded of Dimitri's promise to find me something to wear. It was warm enough in this room, with the fire roaring in the grate, but some warmer clothing would be welcome. Right on cue, a soft tap sounded on the door. Come in, I called out. I was expecting Dimitri or his solemn-faced brother, but instead a petite woman entered the room. Her arms were piled high with fabric. I was up out of my seat in an instant. Don't trouble yourself, ma'am. She ushered me down again, before dumping the pile onto my bed and giving me a once-over, her hands on her hips. By the looks of you, picking this lot up would finish you off, so to speak. She paused, biting her lip. Sorry to speak out of turn. She didn't look that sorry, but I didn't care. I was just relieved to have some friendly conversation to interrupt my whirling thoughts. I shook my head at her. You're probably right. What have you got there, anyway? New clothes for you, ma'am. Her sharp gaze flickered over me, lingering on my face and hands. I tucked them into my lap, suddenly self-conscious. When was the last time I'd had a bath? As if she'd read my thoughts, the woman said, Perhaps I can show you the facilities first. That would be great. I clambered up relieved at the prospect. Earlier, I'd been half-starved and too traumatised to think of such things. But now... The maid opened the door at the far end of the room. There was a bathroom in here. Amazing! She held the door open, so I rushed over and slipped across the threshold. My mouth dropped in wonder. Instead of cold grey stone... The room was covered from floor to ceiling in a warm, honey-coloured marble. In the centre, a giant sunken bathtub dominated the space. I craned my neck to admire the cascade of multicoloured light filtering through the stained-glass skylight above our heads. Wow! I couldn't help but laugh a little with amazement. How the hell had I ended up here? Maybe I died in that rotten basement and this was my version of heaven. Food, warmth, incredible bathroom facilities, and a huge hulking man who generated strange feelings deep inside me, especially when he looked at me with more desire than I was used to. 
There are towels and robes in that cupboard. The maid pointed to a huge armoire in the corner. Will that be all for now, ma'am? I guess. I gave her an awkward shrug. Uh, there's no need to call me ma'am. Please, I'm Sarah. Of course. The maid gave me a smile. I'll be just outside. Once I was alone, I turned my attention to the giant bathtub. The prospect of soaking in a mountain of bubbles had never been more tempting. After a frustrating fight with the taps, I managed to fill the tub with hot water. The plumbing was unlike anything I'd ever seen. But then, I hadn't exactly visited a castle before. A quick search in the cabinet across from the sink yielded a wide assortment of jars and bottles, full of all kinds of scented products. Some of them smelled familiar and reassuring, lavender, rose, violet, but some of them I couldn't place at all. I sank into the hot, fragrant water with a moan. Whatever my reasons for being here, I might as well enjoy the opportunity to have a good wash. I soaked until I began to get impatient to be really clean. So I grabbed some of the soaps and washed every inch of my body, then finger-combed my hair and scrubbed it the best I could. My hair was matted and disgusting until now, and once I was done, my arms ached from exhaustion. It was all so strange. This castle. The wild weather outside my confusion over how exactly we had been rescued. But the strangest thing of all, by far, was the man who'd been watching over me when I awoke. Dimitri. For some reason, my mind kept turning back to him. I couldn't get his face out of my mind, or the intensity in his ice-blue eyes whenever he stared at me. Which was basically all the time. I shivered as a gust of cold air grazed over my bare, wet shoulders. I stood up quickly and wrapped myself in a soft towel from a nearby pile. My heart rate had picked up again, and my toes curled against the marble floor when I remembered Dimitri's fierce expression. The expression belied the gentle warmth of his hands as they wrapped around my wrists, holding me steady. No harm will come to you here. My mouth twisted into a soft smile. I didn't know why, but when he said it like that, I'd actually believed him. But what of Nadia? Was she safe here too? And what would happen to her when she finally awoke? She was the most important thing to me, and I owed her so much. It was my fault we were in this whole mess, and I had to make sure I never forgot that fact. Chapter 5 Sarah I opened the door and stepped back into the warm bedroom. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. The maid looked up as I re-entered the room, wrapped in a fluffy robe. I was loose-limbed and warm through after my bath, and I smiled when I saw she had laid out some garments for me over the bed. It's Isla, ma'am. I mean, Sarah. Isla. I padded toward her, sparing a glance at the other bed. My sister, did she wake at all while I was gone? My heart sank when Isla shook her head. No, I kept an eye on her, but she didn't stir. She seems peaceful enough, the maid added, clearly catching my look of dismay. And the physician came earlier and checked you both over. He said you will both need food and drink and rest, but that physically you will be all right. Physically? What about mentally? Oh, Nadia, what have I done to you, dear sister? I leaned over Nadia's bedside and put my hand to her forehead. Her face remained perfectly still. Only the soft rise and fall of her chest under the bedsheets reassured me that she was still alive. With a deep sigh, I brushed the hair back off her face and then turned to Isla. I plastered a cheery smile on my face. So, what do people wear to keep warm around here? The answer to that question, apparently, was way more complicated than I expected. Isla handed me stockings, silk dresses, jackets made from soft wool, fur-trimmed hats and coats, lace-up boots, 
and a multitude of other items until the room looked like a hurricane had swept through it. A lot of the stuff was familiar, but some wasn't. There were boots made out of something tougher and thicker than leather, and a gauzy dress that reminded me of dragonfly wings, but somehow it was warm and seemed sturdy. Where did all this stuff come from? I struck a pose in a floor-length fur coat that was much too big for me, making Isla laugh. Did you raid a mall or something? A puzzled expression crossed Isla's face. Some of it belongs to Queen Cassandra. The rest used to belong to the king's mother, rest her soul. My skin prickled with discomfort. These clothes belonged to royalty. I'd never heard of a Queen Cassandra, but still. Are you sure it's okay for me to borrow them? I laid the coat over the back of a nearby chair, smoothing it nervously. Of course. The confusion on Isla's face grew. Why wouldn't it be? Before I could give her an answer, the door opened, and that put an end to our conversation. Dimitri was back. Dimitri. Now that Sarah was in the castle, it was torture to stay away from her. Lucian and I had been sparring in the yard in an attempt to keep my passion in check. It worked well enough. That familiar burst of adrenaline that came from a good fight managed to distract me from the constant itch under my skin. But once the sun began to dip lower in the sky, I didn't have the strength to avoid her any longer. After I took a shower, my feet carried me back to the door of her room. I hesitated before entering. Her scent hit me as soon as I crossed the threshold. I fought to keep my expression neutral, but the shifter inside me rumbled in satisfaction at the mere sight of her. She met my eyes with a nervous expression. The maid had decked her out in clothing from our realm. She wore a simple fur-trimmed dress with a neckline that skimmed just below her collarbones. She looked exquisite. The very sight of her made me want to push her down onto the bed behind us and take her right there and then. Claim her as my own. I managed to meet her eyes, hopefully without telegraphing my lascivious thoughts, and she gave me a small smile. I returned it, clenching my hands into fists so that I wouldn't do anything stupid. What do you think? She gave a small twirl, holding her hands out expectantly. Better, I bit out, my dragon desperate to take over my human body. I shoved it back down. Come on, let me show you around. Sarah's gaze strayed toward her sister's bed. Maybe I should stay. Don't worry, Isla said from the other side of the room. I'll stay here with her and take care of her if she wakes. We'll get her some food and a bath like you had. Thank you, Isla. Sarah smiled at the woman before following me toward the door. Once we were out in the hallway, I glanced down at her, surprised by how quickly she seemed to have found her footing around here. That didn't seem to extend to me, however. Every time we locked eyes, her cheeks reddened. Not that I was doing much better. My shifter stirred restlessly. Every time our hands brushed or I caught a waft of her delicious scent, the dragon inside me leapt up, ready and eager. At the end of the corridor, Lucian appeared. When he saw the two of us together, his eyes narrowed as if with suspicion. He could tell how close my dragon was to the surface. I am just going to give Sarah a tour of the castle. I raised my eyebrows at my brother, trying to project an innocent aura. And the village. While I'm here, I might as well see it, Sarah added. I've never been inside a castle before. My chest twinged with unease. I didn't want to lie to my mate, but I didn't see much of an alternative. It was better this way. Too much too soon might cause her to completely shut down on me. Lucian caught my eye. I could feel his disapproval, but he said nothing. After we had turned the corner, Sarah looked up to me with a questioning expression. Your brother seems... quiet. My mouth twisted into a smile. 
Yeah, always has been. I don't think he likes me very much. Don't take it personally. I moved to touch her arm before thinking better of it. He's like that with everyone. You're not. You're different. Sarah's gaze burned into the side of my face. I stared blankly at the tapestry in front of us, trying to quiet the shifter inside me. Control yourself. As I led her around the castle, the quiet, frightened woman I'd met disappeared, her eyes were brighter, and the way she held herself became more confident. With her long blonde hair and regal clothes, she looked every inch a dragon princess. She paused in front of a giant portrait in the hall. It towered over us, looming from above. The old king stared down at me with foreboding, judgmental eyes. Beside him, his queen sat with a serene expression, with baby Damon on her knee. Who is that? Sarah whispered. I took a long pause before answering her. That's my father. Her eyes widened. I could see the wheels turning in her head, trying to connect the dots. Does that mean... She pointed to Damon. Is that you? I let out a humorless laugh. No, that's not me. That's the current king, Damon. Come on, this way. We wandered over to the doors that led into the main hall, Sarah eyeing me curiously the whole time. I pretended not to notice her regard. I didn't want to talk about my father. Not now. Not ever, in truth. Sarah lingered in front of the huge stained glass window that dominated the front of the hall. The glimmering coloured panes told the story of the Winter Kings. How they had come to this land hundreds of years ago and built the castle where we now stood. See those mountains? I pointed to the images in the bottom of the stained glass window and Sarah nodded. Those lie to the south. Damon's ancestors journeyed over them so they could build this kingdom here in the north. Sarah's upturned face was filled with wonder. The colours of the window shimmered over her skin and tangled in her long hair. A spike of desire pierced through my soul. I looked away, choking on the maelstrom of feelings that surfaced for the human before me. And those creatures? Sarah indicated the top of the window, where several large dragons circled overhead. Their glassy wings shone in a multitude of colours, deep reds, vibrant greens and pale blues that scattered light over the floor down by our feet. I've never seen anything like that in a window this old. I gazed up at the dragons, my heart sinking. I can't keep lying to her forever. But for now, I had to settle for a half-truth. You could say that they're an important emblem in the royal family. Sarah's eyebrows rose, and I could tell that she was on the precipice of another question. This way, I interjected, ushering her over to the door. I want to show you the village. Sarah. Something wasn't adding up. With every hour that passed, I felt stronger. My mind got clearer, and the world around me became real again. How long had I spent in a dreamlike stupor, just trying to make it from one day to the next, while my sister and I had been imprisoned? But now I had food in my belly and warm clothes on my back. I could think again, and every instinct was telling me to hold my cards close to my chest. I glanced over at the man walking beside me. I couldn't understand why, but when he was around I felt better, calmer, safer, even though I was in a strange place, surrounded by strange people. He had shown me great kindness, even if he occasionally seemed unsettled by me. From the way he mentioned his father, I sensed that there was a lot more to the story. I shivered as a blast of cold air hit my face. Dimitri grinned at me. Now you know why all our clothing has a fur lining. He laughed, holding the front door to the castle open for me. I descended the uneven stone steps carefully. My shoes had a good grip to them, 
but a thin layer of ice beneath my feet made the going difficult. I almost took a tumble, but at the last second he grabbed my elbow. You should watch where you're going, Dimitri's deep voice murmured in my ear. I might not always be around to catch you, Sarah. I am not blushing. It's the cold air biting my cheeks, that's all. Easy for you to say, I retorted. Dimitri moved with an enviable confidence and ease, taking my weight against his shoulder like it was nothing. Which, given his size, it probably was. Dimitri laughed, and my stomach flipped over at the sound. I've navigated harsher terrain than this, believe me. Once we crossed over the narrow wooden drawbridge and hit the cobblestones, I could breathe easier. We were in a tiny village, and as we made our way down the narrow, crooked street, I took in all the sights and sounds. Overhead, the sky was a pale grey, and white flakes were still lightly spiralling onto our heads. Where in heaven's name are we? Welcome to the village. Dimitri's voice rose above the hubbub. This is where the castle gets its supplies. People from the outlying farms come to trade, to pay tithes, that kind of thing. Wow. I paused beside an old woman selling bundles of fragrant herbs before glancing up at Dimitri. Tithes? That sounds pretty old-fashioned. Like medieval. I suppose it would, Dimitri said with a shrug. His pale eyes scanned our surroundings like he was half expecting someone to attack us at any moment. A dozen follow-up questions sprung to my lips, but before I could voice any of them, I got distracted by another seller, a cheerful red-cheeked man selling sweet candied apples in the next stall. They smelled mouth-wateringly delicious. Dimitri followed my gaze. Do you want one? Oh, I bit my lip. No, it's okay. One toffee apple, Dimitri said firmly to the man. Thank you. Right away, sire. The apple seller skewered one of the apples for me and handed it over. When Dimitri dug around in his pockets for the cash, the man waved him off. No charge. Your royal custom is payment enough, my prince. Nonsense. Dimitri pulled out a handful of coins and shoved them into the bewildered seller's hand. I always pay my debts. I'm no prince. My deepest apologies. The seller seemed uncertain which form of address to use and trailed off. To spare him any more embarrassment, I gave him our thanks and dragged Dimitri further down the street. Dimitri's eyebrows had drawn down, but I kept my hand on his arm, hoping to distract him a little. When I took a bite of the apple, his eyes tracked the movement of my mouth. For some reason I liked that he did that, and I deliberately licked my lips, chasing the sugar at the edges of my mouth. God, what is happening? So, let me get this straight. I took another bite of the apple, smiling at the explosion of sweetness over my tongue. So good. Your father was the king, but you're not a prince. It doesn't work like that. Dimitri hesitated, eyes searching my face. I waited. I wasn't born here in the castle. My father was king, but my mother wasn't the queen. Oh. I'm sorry. I stared down at the red glazing on my apple, my cheeks burning. I didn't mean to pry. It's nothing. Dimitri's finger nudged against the side of my chin. Gently, he tilted my face upwards, then brushed a strand of my hair away from my lips. That's better. I stood there, transfixed by the look on his face. No man had ever looked at me the way Dimitri did, especially not one that I'd only just met. Despite the fact that I barely knew him, I couldn't deny my racing heart. Nor could I explain the way my body leaned into his, like it wanted to close the space between us and hadn't consulted with my mind about its intentions. Abruptly, Dimitri stepped away from me. His jaw was tight, a hard line against the dark fall of his hair. 
Let's continue. He forced the words out through gritted teeth and turned his back on me entirely. I had to run to catch up with him as we wound our way through the street. I was certain the flush in my cheeks had spread to my neck. In fact, it felt like my whole body burned with heat beneath the thick winter layers of clothing. When he finally slowed his pace, I took a deep breath and exhaled. So, I adopted a casual, bright tone that rang hollow. Where to next? We stopped at half a dozen more stalls. Every time I thought we were done, something new caught my eye. A stall hung with huge, dried mushrooms, a cart laden with different smoked cheeses, a black velvet tablecloth covered in smoky quartz. It was all so beautiful. And different to anything I had ever known in my life. The dank basement and those terrifying rough men felt like a lifetime ago. So long ago, in fact, it now seemed like a distant nightmare, and I'd finally awoken. The relief was enough to send me staggering. Eventually, we reached the edge of the village. I frowned at the narrow dirt track that led out toward what looked like miles of bare, frozen wilderness. I couldn't understand how such a thriving community could exist in the middle of nowhere. How had they even gotten here? A shout pierced the air, and my attention shifted to a small group of men on the other side of the road. Three of them held a wooden frame, and after a second I worked out what it was, the bones of a house. One of the men yelled something to the others. The words got whipped away in the wind before I could understand them, but they caught Dimitri's attention. We watched as the man struggled. One of the support beams at the corner of the structure had shifted out of place. That thing will come crashing down if they're not careful, Dimitri muttered, seemingly to himself. A creaking groan came from the frame. It was bending in the wind, twisting even more out of shape, threatening to snap altogether under the strain. A volley of shouts followed the noise. A small crowd gathered around the men, but no one seemed willing or able to step in and help. It would take inhuman strength to hold the beam in place. Dimitri and I glanced at each other. Without a word, he darted forward, ushering people aside. When the village folk near to us got a good look at him, they stepped aside, murmuring to each other, their eyes wide. Dimitri hardly seemed to notice. I hurried after him. Once we reached the centre of the crowd, he stepped forward and grasped the errant beam with both hands. On my count, Dimitri shouted at the men on either side of him. Lift! Despite a sea of dumbfounded looks, they did what Dimitri told them to do. Dimitri, seemingly stronger than the rest of the men put together, eased the frame into place with no difficulty. Once the structure was secure, a scattered round of applause started up amongst the onlookers. The other men offered their thanks to Dimitri, who waved them away. He didn't seem comfortable with all the attention. In fact, the longer we stood there, the more he started to glower. I was beginning to wonder if his seemingly natural propensity toward anger was actually a mask to hide his awkwardness with others. An elderly woman stopped us as we headed away from the crowd. The deep wrinkles around her eyes grew as she smiled up at Dimitri. Her eyes shone. Blessings to you, sire. Dimitri shifted uncomfortably, and I fought back a smile. I was right. He was uncomfortable, especially, it seemed, when people showed kindness toward him. He must have had a difficult life indeed if he didn't feel worthy of receiving niceties from others. I could see that he wanted to correct her address, but he didn't want to come off as disrespectful. Eventually, he settled for a half nod, lowering his gaze. Thank you. And to you, he mumbled. Once we were out of earshot from the gathering, I put my hand on his arm. He seemed startled by the sudden contact, but he didn't push me away. Our footsteps echoed loudly across the cobblestones. You know, I bit my lip, feeling a little bit cheeky. 
I've never met royalty before, but you aren't what I expected. Dimitri tilted his head down to look at me. I told you. His pale blue eyes were intent. My skin prickled under his scrutiny, but I didn't drop my gaze. My brother and I aren't royals. But you're not one of the villagers, either. What you did back there, it was a true kindness. It also showed exceptional strength. You did a good thing, Dimitri. His expression twisted, and he glanced away from me, rubbing a hand across the back of his neck. I saw a problem and stepped in to fix it. Anyone would have done the same in my position. Unconsciously, my hand had found its way back onto his arm. I squeezed gently to make him look at me again. That's not true. I didn't know if it was the softness in my voice or the way I was holding on to him, but something shifted in his expression. He moved closer to me, and for a dizzying second, I wondered if he might actually lean in and kiss me. I should have been scared and jumped back. But I wasn't, and I didn't. Instead, I waited, my heart beating strangely fast. In the end, he stopped just short. His tone was grave when he finally spoke, and something in his eyes made my heart rate speed up even more. Sarah, there's... He cleared his throat. I have to show you something. Chapter 6 Sarah Where are we going? I didn't know how many times I'd asked that question. It didn't matter. Dimitri gave me the same answer he had all the other times. You'll see. It was maddening, and yet I had no choice but to follow him. If I turned around and left him now, I'd get lost for one thing. For another, I had to admit that he'd piqued my curiosity. He led me all the way back to the castle, then through a network of hallways and corridors, until we reached new doors and went out into the gardens. I thought at first we were heading toward the massive hedge maze lying beyond the rose garden, but instead Dimitri drew me to a halt in the little courtyard at the bottom of the steps. Well? I crossed my arms, waiting. What is it? Dimitri looked nervous. He took a few steps back from me, coming to a halt about ten feet away. I need you to promise me something. I shuffled from foot to foot, beginning to grow uneasy. Okay. Dimitri bowed his head. Promise me you won't be afraid. I would never harm you. Never. Do you understand? I wanted to laugh out loud. After everything I'd just been through, he wanted me to trust he'd never hurt me. I wasn't sure I could promise that. I wasn't sure I would ever trust anyone fully again. But something in his demeanour told me to take this seriously. After a moment I nodded, once, my fingers tightening protectively around my forearms. All right. I'll do my best. It was all I could offer. He looked at me for a long moment. Very well. He crouched to the ground. My eyes narrowed, wondering what he was doing, then widened in disbelief as a thick mist filled the air around us. The cloud rose up, higher and higher, until it blocked out the sky. I inhaled sharply as the impossible happened right before my eyes. The man before me disappeared. His limbs grew larger, his fingers turned into claws, and, most terrifying of all, a huge pair of wings, with curved spikes crowning each wingtip, rose up out of the swirling fog like great dark shadows. The enormous monster before me threw back its head and let out a roar that shook the ground beneath my feet and rippled into the air. Holy shit! He looks like... My blood froze with terror. A dragon? I took a stumbling step backwards, then another, backing up until I was at the bottom of the stairs. I couldn't think as the enormous creature advanced on me. In that moment, everything Dimitri had said vanished into the ether. I was nothing but prey for the monster that was stalking toward me. 
my heart pounded like a war drum in my chest. The roar of my blood in my ears was so loud I couldn't hear anything else. I wanted to run, to hide, but my feet were rooted to the ground. I could do nothing but watch as the mist began to clear and the massive dragon stood before me, head lowered, staring at me expectantly. Dimitri? My breath caught in my throat as my eyes climbed up over the creature's thick, scaly hide. The light glinted wickedly off its claws. In contrast with the pale landscape, the dragon was an inky black colour, aside from its eyes, which were as piercing and intense as the man himself. When I locked eyes with the dragon, something inside my chest eased. My fear began to drain away. That gaze was so familiar. This creature, this man, wasn't going to hurt me. Deep down in my soul, I knew it. I inched forward, reaching up into the air between us, my fingers outstretched. There was nothing but silence around us and the softness of the still-falling snow. My own shallow, uneven breaths came out in little puffs of fog. When my fingers made contact with the creature's chest, I inhaled with shock. I had expected ice-cold scales, but instead my fingertips were met with a smouldering heat like I'd touched glowing coals. I jerked back, but then I realised the warmth wasn't burning me. It was caressing my skin, wrapping me up like a thick, soft blanket. I put my hand to the dragon scales and stroked down them, keeping my touch light and gentle. The creature lowered its head, eyes sliding shut. It let out a deep rumble of satisfaction that resonated through my whole body. This is impossible, but I couldn't deny the evidence of my own eyes. I let out a breathless, slightly hysterical chuckle. My roaming fingers encountered a deep gouge of old scar tissue. I frowned, moving to the side, peering closer to get a better look. The dragon's thick shoulder was covered in a mass of scars, running all the way down from its neck. In a flash, I remembered the scar on Dimitri's jaw. Who could have done this to such a beautiful, majestic creature? I pressed my forehead against the scales, feeling the warmth emanating from within, comforting myself by listening to the slow, steady pulse of the dragon's heartbeat. A wave of sorrow for his suffering threatened to pull me under as tears rose in my eyes. I sniffled and let out a soft sob, squeezing my eyes shut. It was no use, though. A few salty tears leaked out and fell. Under my hands the scales fell away, and bare skin returned in its place. Shh! At the sound of Dimitri's deep, rumbling voice, my breathing slowly evened out, and I relaxed against him. When I opened my eyes, I realised that the warmth surrounding me was his embrace, strong arms holding me steady on my feet. It's all right. I told you, nothing will hurt you here. What happened to you? I whispered. Many things. I sniffed, wiping my face and drawing back enough to look him in the eye. In time, I'll tell you. He reached out and swept a strand of my hair back behind my ear. I'll tell you everything, Sarah. Dimitri. I'd controlled myself long enough for Sarah to drag her hands over my body. In my shifter form, I was even more volatile in relation to the mating call, but somehow I'd managed not to react to her touch in the way I truly wanted to. It was only when her tears wet my skin that I couldn't hold back. The dragon retreated, and I was left standing before her. Just a man, standing in front of the woman he was meant to love. I pressed my body against hers until she got a hold of herself. It broke my heart to see her like this, to feel how vulnerable she truly was. I pressed my lips to her forehead as she looked up at me in wonder. There were still tears in her eyes, but awe as well. How? She bit her lip, shaking her head. How is this even possible? For my people, it's normal. I swept an arm out around us, 
indicating the castle and the vast lands beyond it. Her eyes brightened further in recognition. Wait, so those dragons in the window? I nodded. Almost everyone in this realm is a shifter. I stared down at my feet. I happen to come from one of the royal bloodlines, that's all. If I'm telling her everything, I might as well get it over with. This is insane, Sarah murmured. She glanced toward the horizon, shaking her head. Sarah. I reached up to grip her shoulders before I could stop myself. Search your memories. How do you think we rescued you from that farmhouse back in your world? She frowned. Hang on. What do you mean, my world? Come inside, I said. Let's get warm. I'll explain everything, I promise. Her gaze drifted downwards, and her cheeks flushed as she seemed to realize for the first time that I was completely naked. I watched with amusement as her gaze fluttered around, not knowing where to look. Of course, humans have hang-ups about such things. When we shift our clothing shreds, I murmured. Oh, uh, okay. She still couldn't look at me, and I had to bite my cheek to stop from laughing. Once we were back inside, I found a thick robe and slipped it on. I caught Sarah sneaking glances more than once at my bare chest still exposed, but this only served to further heighten my excitement. It was becoming clearer than ever that our interest in each other was mutual. Remember to take it slow. A voice that sounded suspiciously like Lucian's protested in the back of my mind. This is all new for her. Once we were situated in front of the huge, roaring fireplace in the Great Hall, it was difficult to think about anything else. Sarah stared into the flickering flames, her skin bathed in golden light. Her long hair flowed down her back, brushing against her bare neck as she leaned into the warmth. So? She arched a brow toward me. My mind turned blank. I struggled to remember what we were talking about. All I could think about was how beautiful she looked in the flickering firelight. Oh, right. Worlds. Outside, Sarah said patiently. What did you mean, my world? This place, I said, gesturing to the stone walls, the gargoyles peering down from the rafters, the snow that swirled outside the huge windows, is not part of the human realm. It exists beyond a portal. A small crease of confusion appeared between Sarah's eyebrows. Portals, dragons, those words tell me I'm dreaming. I must have been knocked on the head or something. I smiled softly at her. You're not dreaming. We found you and brought you here. Let's assume that what you're saying is true. She tucked her feet up under her. I mirrored her position, sitting cross-legged on the cushion opposite. How did you even know where to find me? It's not that I'm not grateful, but why am I even here? This was it. The moment of truth. I still wasn't sure she was ready, but her face was open and inviting, and the way she kept biting her full lower lip was driving me to distraction. Our kind. We're not like humans. In life, we're fated to end up with one partner. Some of us never find that one person, but when we're lucky enough, they stay with us forever. Sarah tilted her head, puzzled. Like a soulmate. I didn't know how to describe something I barely understood myself, but I nodded. Yes, a soulmate. Two halves of the same whole, who are only complete when they find each other. Reflecting the firelight, her eyes brightened as she mulled over my words. What does this have to do with Nadia and me? My brother and I, we have a friend. A sorceress. Her name is Marianne. It was her vision that led us to you. Sarah's eyes widened. A sorceress? Hang on, wait a second. Are you saying, do you think I'm this fated person? 
I nodded, my heart thundering. Nadia is Lucian's fated mate. And you, Sarah, are mine. The silence that followed my words lay between us. The unspoken tension that had been building since she woke up had finally reached a breaking point. From the look on her face, we were both feeling it. Is it really so hard to believe? Can you really tell me that since we met, you haven't felt anything? I reached out to hold her wrist loosely in my hand. I can feel your heart rate pick up when I touch your skin. I see the way your pupils widen when you look at me. Sarah just stared at me, dumbfounded. I... I slid my hand over hers, and her fingers automatically turned to slide over the bare skin at my wrist. Even now, you can't deny yourself. This can't be happening, Sarah said in a small voice. I barely know you. But her hands had already moved of their own accord. One of them had come up to rest on my shoulder, and the other dipped down to my chest. The shifter inside me growled in satisfaction under her touch, and I smiled. You will, I whispered, just before I brought my mouth down to meet hers. Sarah Dimitri's kiss surprised me, but not for long. I couldn't stop myself from responding, tentatively at first by lifting my chin and returning his kiss, before eagerly grabbing hold of his hair to tug him closer. I wasn't sure what had come over me. Perhaps I was still in shock from seeing him transform into a dragon and back. A dragon! But I knew it was far deeper and more elemental than shock. I could not resist him, and I did not want to. My enthusiasm only seemed to spur him on. His kiss began softly, with light melting brushes against my lips. Then the connection shifted, deepening further and further. Eventually he groaned and tilted my head backwards, dragging his mouth down my neck and sucking hard at my pulse point. My breath hitched in my throat as he grabbed my waist and tugged me closer. I climbed on top of him and straddled his thick thighs, moaning as his big hands clamped around my hips and held me tight. He plundered my mouth and I wanted more. Desperately. I needed more. I slid my arms around his shoulders and then up to his neck, trying to give as good as I got. I squeezed my arms tight, a slow, lazy warmth coiling in the pit of my stomach at the feel of his hard, muscled form against my body. My reservations melted away, replaced by a haze of desire. Dimitri arched up with a growl, rolling us over. I found myself pinned to the floor as he lavished open-mouthed kisses onto my neck and chest, dragging his teeth lower over my racing heart. I swallowed thickly. My arousal mingled with surprise. Then worry. This was all going so fast. He was on top of me, surrounding me, bending me to his will. Our eyes met and I fought back a gasp. His pupils were blown out, inky black with a thin sliver of ice blue around them. His mouth was red and as he panted down at me, there was a flash of white teeth. I squirmed, my hands grasping for purchase. He groaned and rolled his hips into mine. It felt good, but I couldn't push away my fear. He was so strong, and his passion threatened to drown me. His hips bore down into me again. His hard length pressed down into my belly. It felt so good and so right, but my fear continued to grow. I shuddered, twisting, and he snarled at the sensation of me moving beneath him. When his fingers slid up beneath my skirt, the fright consumed me. I urged us over, and he rolled onto his back, looking up at me. His chest heaved, robe half open. He was so damn sexy, but suddenly I couldn't breathe. What am I doing? I scrambled off him and stumbled away. His hands shot out as if to draw me back, but I darted out of reach. I have to get out of here. He growled again, and for a split second I thought his dragon was going to emerge. 
but when I caught a flash of his expression, I realized he was fighting to keep control of himself. To stay as Dimitri the man and hold the dragon inside. He stretched out his fingers toward me. Sarah, please. He sounded like a dying man on the verge of his last breath. I ached to return to his arms, but my fear had taken hold and threatened to consume me. I'm sorry, I whispered in a broken tone before I turned and ran. Chapter 7 Sarah I tore down the dark hallways, taking random turns until I was totally lost. Behind me, Dimitri's faint voice called for me, but I ignored him and kept running until I was certain I was out of his reach. I came to a trembling halt beside a huge tapestry and slid down the stone wall opposite, collapsing into a heap on the floor and heaving in deep, ragged breaths. I glared at the swirling patterns in front of me. Embroidered dragons flew through a woven landscape, strong and majestic. I dropped my gaze to my lap and hugged my knees in close. I want to go home, but I couldn't leave. Not while my sister was still lying unconscious in another part of the castle. I had to stay and ensure her safety. Plus, there was a huge part of me that ached to return to that warm fireside. To be held in Dimitri's arms again, to listen to him tell me that everything was going to be okay. That I was safe. What is wrong with me? I rested my head on my knees and squeezed my eyes shut. At the faint sound of footsteps coming from the other end of the corridor, I stiffened on high alert. I tried to remain as still as possible, praying that the shadows would conceal me. I'm not ready to talk to him. Not yet. But the voice that called out to me wasn't Dimitri. It was a female. Hello? The pattering footsteps grew closer. Is anyone there? I sniffed and drew my legs in closer. Please leave me alone. My voice was trembling and thready in the echoey space. Instead of retreating, the stranger came right up to me, dropping into a crouch in front of me. Are you okay? Although I'd buried my head in my arms, I could almost make out a mass of curly dark hair and a sweet heart-shaped face. The voice was kind and gentle. Despite my fear, I looked up, meeting the eyes of the young woman. I'm fine, I lied, wiping a hand over my face. I just got lost, that's all. Instead of offering me a hand up, the girl shuffled onto the floor beside me, resting her back against the wall. This place is kind of a maze, huh? She smiled at me, her cheeks dimpling. Not to mention the literal hedge maze outside. Have you explored it yet? After a small pause, I shook my head. You should. It's great. She released a small sigh and stretched out her legs over the floor. I'm Cass, by the way. What's your name? Sarah. Nice to meet you, Sarah. Cass's cheerful voice made me relax a little. What brings you to our castle? Other than a mythical beast, not much. Oh my God. Didn't someone mention the king's wife was named Cassandra? I took a closer look at her. The thick, fur-trimmed collar around her neck, the cuffs at the end of her sleeves, her outfit was almost identical to my own. She wasn't one of the servants who roamed the halls, which meant that... Your Majesty, I stammered. I... I'm so sorry. Hey, stop. Cass put a hand on my arm before I could embarrass myself any further. It's okay, Sarah. Don't worry. We just got back from our trip, that's all. You surprised me. I didn't know where else to go, I said. I just needed some space to clear my head. What happened? Cass folded her arms under her chin, studying me carefully. I let out a deep sigh. Dimitri brought me here. Her eyes widened as realisation set in. Oh my, you're her, aren't you? The human woman that Marianne saw in her vision. Human woman. 
I guess I am, I mumbled. He told me that we're fated to be together or something. And then he changed. I didn't know how else to describe a guy turning into a huge dragon right in front of me, but Cass seemed to get the gist, nodding along. Hell, Dimitri told me that they were all like him. That probably meant she had the same power. So what's the problem? Cass prompted me softly. Don't you like him? It's not that. I struggled to get the words out, my thoughts still tangled together with my knee-jerk desire to escape. He's amazing. Like no guy I've ever known, to be honest. I let out a nervous chuckle, and Cass smiled encouragingly. But the way he looks at me, it's like there's something inside him driving him to take me, claim me. It's so intense. I sighed. I had to get out of there. I looked up, fearful of her response. But her expression was understanding. You're a human, Sarah. This is all new for you. I don't want to hurt him. My voice trembled as the tears threatened. I don't want to hurt anyone. Especially someone who'd shown me nothing but kindness since I woke up. You haven't. Cass laid a hand on my arm. Dimitri knows the score, Sarah. He'll understand. It's difficult for dragon shifters to resist the call to mate. He wouldn't have meant to scare you. I'm sure he was being as gentle as it was possible to be in the circumstances. I thought back to the ferocity with which he'd held me, the inhuman growl he'd let out as I'd run away. I shivered. Cass seemed to sense my wariness. Look, I don't claim to know much about the human world. I'd love to visit it one day, but I know that things are different there. Dimitri would never harm you, Sarah. He'll let you take things at your own pace. How can you be sure? Because I know him. And his brother, Cass replied. A soft smile played on her lips. They captured me once, Dimitri and Lucian. I thought they were going to hurt me, but they gave me food, warmth and shelter. They're loyal men, Sarah. Loyal to my husband and to you and your sister. Your husband. I remembered the painting of the royal family in the hall. King Damon. Cass nodded. We just got back from our honeymoon. Things weren't easy with us at first. I'm from the South, you see. We're from different worlds. I know the feeling. I shared a weak smile with her. But her kindness had calmed my anxiety somewhat. Slowly, I unfurled my legs and sat upright. So, what's the deal with this bond? How does it work? No one is sure. Cass shrugged. Even the sorceress, Marianne. But all dragon shifters have a mate. Some just happen to be human. You probably have shifter ancestry in your bloodline if you go back far enough. I didn't know how to begin unpacking that. The thought that one of my grandparents, my great-grandparents, could be one of those creatures. My alarm must have shown on my face because Cass chuckled. Come on. Why don't we go down to the kitchens and get some hot chocolate? It's so drafty up here. I clambered to my feet alongside her and shook my head. Thanks for the offer, but I think I should go back and find Dimitri. I had no idea what I wanted to say, but talking to Cass had cleared away some of my worries. I was going home anyway. My time here was limited only to the time it took for Nadia to wake up and become well enough to travel. Maybe I could just take this one step at a time and see where the road led me, and the first step was to talk things through with my so-called mate. Cass smirked. Okay, go find him. I turned to walk away, then chuckled. I could use a hand getting back, if you don't mind. Cass laughed and slid her arm into mine. Not at all. Dimitri. I stood with my eyes closed under the jet of scalding water, inhaling the steam that rose around me. I pushed my wet hair back from my face before letting my hands drop to my sides again. 
my fists clenched as another wave of regret swept through me. I've screwed everything up. I've driven her away, forever. Lust still churned inside me, and my shifter thrashed ceaselessly, furious at being ignored. But it was muted due to the pain. I'd made my mate run away, and I couldn't forgive myself for that. I let out a deep sigh. She would want to leave now, I was sure of it. And it was no one's fault but my own. I was in the middle of working out how I would explain myself to Cass and Damon when the door to the room outside opened and closed softly, and light footsteps followed. They paused outside the bathroom door. Whoever was out there was listening to the shower, hesitating. I imagined one of the servants there on the threshold, one hand on the doorknob. I opened my mouth to tell them to leave. Whatever royal business it was could wait. I needed to clear my head and make preparations to take Sarah home. The thought pierced like a knife through my heart. If she won't stay with me, the least I can do is make sure she gets back to her family safely. Before I could say anything, the door opened and the person stepped into the bathroom. I watched their progress as they crossed the room. The shower cubicle was large, but the glass was too fogged up to see clearly who it was. I caught a blur of movement as they came closer. My heart rate picked up. I recognised that small frame, the blonde hair, and that scent. Her beautiful, enticing scent. Sarah stepped out of her garments, one after the other, leaving them on the floor where they lay. By the time she reached the glass door behind me, I was hard and wanting. The door opened. Sarah stood naked before me. My gaze raked over... Chapter 8 Sarah I woke up in a sea of soft sheets, a deep blue canopy above my head. Blinking the sleep out of my eyes, I sat up, confused. This bed was massive, much bigger than the one in the room my sister still slept in. My eyes landed on the man standing opposite the bed. He was staring out the window, lost in thought. My eyes lingered on the broad line of his shoulders, and my stomach curled with satisfaction as I remembered the night before. My limbs dragged under the weight of the heavy blankets, soft and sated with the multiple orgasms Dimitri had given me last night. I stretched my arms above my head, taking a second to luxuriate. Good morning. Dimitri's deep voice provoked a smile across my face. Did you sleep well? I nodded shyly, pulling back the sheets and hopping out of bed. I was still naked from last night's activities, but I found a robe lying over the back of a nearby chair and slipped it on before joining him at the window. I want you to join me today. Dimitri slid his arm around my waist and I leaned into his warmth. Damon and Cass are back from their honeymoon. They're waiting for us down in the Great Hall. I actually bumped into Cass yesterday, I admitted, my face heating. At Dimitri's questioning look, I shook my head. Doesn't matter. Sure, that sounds great. We headed downstairs together, pausing to check on Nadia. She was exactly the way I'd left her yesterday. The maid, Isla, was there watching over her. Any change? I brushed my fingers over Nadia's forehead and squeezed her hand briefly. It's hard to tell, Isla said with a small frown. Her heartbeat seems stronger today, but only time will tell when she wakes up. Thank you for looking after her, I murmured, a wave of guilt crashing over me. I hadn't been here watching her. Isla had. I'd been enjoying myself, making love to Dimitri while my sister lay here unconscious. Of course. Isla bobbed a curtsy to me as we left the room. Dimitri pressed a kiss against the top of my head. She's in good hands, he murmured. His gaze slid back toward the room as we wandered further down the corridor. Strange. I expected to find my brother in there. I looked up at him, confused. What do you mean? Dimitri shrugged. If you were the one in that bed, 
I wouldn't have left your side. I'd be in there night and day until you woke. A flood of warmth filled my chest. I guess he doesn't know her. She's just a stranger to him, and it's not like she's not well looked after. A small crease appeared between Dimitri's brows. I suppose. I stood on tiptoe so I could kiss the frown off his face. Come on. I'm hungry. As soon as we stepped into the great hall, I gasped. A fire roared in the fireplace, and a huge oak dining table was laden with all kinds of delicious-smelling food. Dimitri laughed at the amazed look on my face. It's something, isn't it? My eyes skimmed over the plates heaped with bread, the trays of sweet pastries, the huge silver coffee pot. I... It was like something out of a movie or a long-forgotten dream. It was amazing. At the head of a nearby table, Cass stood up and waved to me, her fork clattering onto her plate in obvious excitement. Sarah! King Damon himself stood up more slowly, subdued and regal in his movements. He nodded toward me and Dimitri. Good to see you again, brother. I glanced at Dimitri, not sure what to do. Do I bow? Curtsy? Oh, God. Before I could worry myself further, Dimitri strode forward and grasped Damon's hand, pulling him into a loose hug. When he stepped back, he was grinning. How was the honeymoon? Damon's face relaxed into a smile. A little warmer than I'm used to. We saw the coral reefs, Cass interjected, sending a dimpled grin her husband's way. It was amazing. She turned to me grabbing my arm and tugging me over to sit beside her. I wish we could build a diving pool here, but it's way too cold. We might as well build an ice rink. She picked up a piece of fruit, nibbling on it thoughtfully. We have the hot springs, love. Damon poured her a cup of something red from a nearby jug. The look they shared as he handed it to her was full of love. Hot springs? I raised an eyebrow at Dimitri. The castle is built on top of a system of them, he said, passing me the plate of pastries. I'll show you later. But right now, please eat. I took a bite of pastry, closing my eyes in pleasure. It was heaven to eat proper food again after all this time. The door opened at the other end of the hall and Lucian appeared, looking as downcast as he had when I saw him previously. Dimitri hurried over to speak to his brother. They stood in front of the fireplace exchanging words in low, hushed voices. Cass nudged my shoulder and I tore my gaze away from the scene. Are they always like that, so private? I asked the Queen. Pretty much. Cass took a bite out of a roll and chewed thoughtfully. They only had each other to depend on for years. And old habits die hard, I guess. A deep frown appeared on Dimitri's face. Whatever Lucian was saying, it looked like Dimitri didn't want to hear it. Seeing the two of them like that, silhouetted against the fireplace, it occurred to me once again just how different Dimitri was to me. He and his brother were so alike, tall and strong, with striking pale eyes. As the firelight flickered across the planes of their faces, they looked formidable. Inhuman. Which, I guessed, was the actual truth. Soon after their discussion ended, Lucian left the hall without even speaking to the rest of us. Dimitri returned to the table, and his unsmiling face filled me with unease. His apprehensive expression was a far cry from the warmth and intimacy we'd shared this morning. Isn't Lucian joining us? Cass leaned forward, sounding concerned. Dimitri shook his head. He is going for a walk. He needs some space. Damon and Cass exchanged worried glances. I couldn't help but feel out of the loop, but the sensation faded away when Dimitri put his hand on mine, drawing my attention. Come on. He pushed a strand of hair behind my ear and tilted my chin upwards with his fingertips. Let's finish eating, then I'll show you around the gardens.
The next few days followed a strange but increasingly familiar pattern. I would wake up with the sunlight hitting my face every morning, cocooned by Dimitri's warmth and solid arms. After an hour or so of mind-blowing sexual pleasure, we usually wandered downstairs to eat breakfast with the others. I always checked on Nadia on the way to the breakfast room, and while she seemed to have a better colour and was breathing more easily now, she still had not woken. The physician assured me my sister was mending and would wake when she was ready. He had added a tube to her arm, via which she was receiving valuable hydration, and she seemed to be cared for very well. At breakfast, Dimitri and I would chat with Cass and Damon, and I would ask as many questions as I could. They were helping me to understand the way things operated within the castle and this kingdom, and I found everything about the Wintry Palace fascinating. Through the three of them, I learned something of the history between the brothers and their father, but only fragments. Whenever I tried to question Dimitri further on the king, he would often clam up or drag me towards some distraction or other. The castle itself was huge and rambling, with hundreds of abandoned rooms. Dimitri often went on scouting trips with Damon or his brother. Their dragons kept an eye out for enemies that might be crossing the vastness to attack us. When they did that, I would check in on Nadia, and then Cass and I busied ourselves with exploring the castle. According to Cass, a couple of years ago the castle had been, in her words, a total wreck. Things were changing now that Damon had taken the throne. But there was still a ton of renovation work to be done, not only here at the castle, but right throughout the kingdom. But before the rest of the healing could happen, all the junk from centuries past had to be organised. That was where we came in. One day, Cass and I were in a small tower room that felt like it hadn't seen daylight for years. She was standing on top of a small pile of broken furniture and old boxes, digging around like a determined hamster. Aha! She stood upright and grinned at me. Victory! I peered at the object she'd unearthed. A cradle! That's what we've been searching for this whole time. I knew I'd seen it somewhere. Cass hopped down from the pile and began to tug on a box almost half her size, trying to shift it over. It doesn't look like anyone's used it for years. With a sigh, I moved forward to help her. What do you need a cradle for? You know, Cass said evasively. Just in case. I stared at her, puzzled. Then it dawned on me. She was newly married, and from what I knew about dragon mates, they were insatiable in the bedroom. My own experience with Dimitri had already taught me that. Are you pregnant? Not that you look it, of course. My cheeks heated, and Cass burst out laughing. No! But it's never a bad idea to look to the future, right? I guess. I still felt confused as to why she'd been so determined to find the cradle, but I figured it was best to go along with her. Cass tugged the carved wooden cradle free from a tangle of old curtains, wiped away the dust on her hands, and turned to me. Sarah, are you happy? I looked up at her, startled. Under the circumstances, surprisingly, yes. I bit my lip, fiddling with the cuff of my sleeve. Other than my sister's condition, of course. I know she's healing, but I do wish she'd wake up. Sometimes I caught myself feeling terrified, right in the middle of a moment of pure bliss. It was a horrible feeling, but my worry for Nadia cast a shadow over the surreal happiness I'd found here. Until she woke up, and I saw for myself that she really was going to be okay, I'd never be truly at peace. Cass seemed satisfied with my answer. We climbed down from the tower to move on to other rooms, and I put the conversation out of my mind. Until a couple of days later, when Dimitri and I were enjoying the hot springs, and he asked a similar question. Do you like it here? His voice came out of the silence, echoing along the damp cave walls. I was floating in the beautifully warm water with closed eyes when he spoke. I opened my eyes and lowered my feet to the floor of the pool, 
lazily regarding him. Condensation dripped all around us, and the steam rising from the surface of the water obscured his expression. I moved closer through the water and took one of his hands loosely in mine beneath the surface. Of course! I leaned backwards, floating on my back and staring up at the arched ceiling above us. Everyone keeps asking me that. What's not to like? Dimitri was silent for a long moment. I reached out and brushed my fingers over his chest, tracing loose patterns across his firm shoulders. By now I knew every scar, every burn. Some of them I'd heard stories about, but the origin of other scars was still a mystery to me. The weather, he said with a smile, trailing his fingertips along my collarbones. We were both naked, and the sensation made me shiver despite the lightness of his touch. I don't know. I slid through the water, and his hands dropped lower, cupping my breasts and thumbing my nipples with his broad, calloused fingers. I arched against him encouragingly. It's growing on me. His face broke into a grin, and he dipped his head to kiss me. I returned the kiss eagerly, groaning when he caught my bottom lip between his teeth. When he pulled back, I whined, wanting more. But his eyes had turned serious. He held me at arm's length, just gazing deep into my eyes. My heart started to patter. What is it? Dimitri's hand slid up to cup my face, his touch achingly gentle. Sarah, I want you to stay here. My heart fluttered and a wash of confusion swept over me. I'm already staying here. Until Nadia wakes up, right? I thought I'd been clear about that. He huffed. I mean, I want you to stay here with me, Sarah. Forever. You're my mate. I don't want us to be apart. My shock must have shown on my face because he slid his fingers under my chin, forcing me to meet his eyes. You said it yourself. You're happy here. And for the first time in my life, I feel. He closed his eyes and drew a deep breath before opening them again. I feel at peace. There's nothing I want more than to share my life with you. Was it my imagination, or did the water temperature suddenly drop several degrees? It felt as if the previous tranquility of the moment shattered, the steam around us pressed against my skin, and a jolt of claustrophobia made me reel back from his touch. Sarah. Dimitri's eyes darkened with confusion. Surely you can't be surprised by this. You're my mate. It's natural I should want you here. I need you. But I was already backing away, swimming over to the edge of the pool and climbing out of the water. I grabbed blindly for the nearest towel and began drying myself. My hands trembled. Come on. The tension in Dimitri's voice made me flinch. At least let's talk about this. I have to check on my sister, I informed him, pulling my overshirt down and drawing the laces on my boots. She needs me. Sarah. The water lapped over the edge of the pool as Dimitri swam across. You're being unreasonable. Anger burned in my chest. I'm being unreasonable. You're the one who wants me to leave everything behind, my family, my home, my own world, to live in a place I don't even know. I'm not part of this world, Dimitri. I never will be. He opened his mouth as if to speak, those pale eyes gleaming like shards of ice. But instead of replying as I expected him to, with more placating tones to try and persuade me to stay, he gritted his teeth and growled at me. Go, then. Fine. I stormed over to the exit and blundered out of the cave, tears blurring my vision. I thought Dimitri might follow me, but he didn't, so I made my way back to the castle alone. By the time I arrived at the oak doors, a light fall of snow dusted the tops of my boots. I stamped them clean and hurried toward the main staircase. He's crazy. I'm crazy. 
I got so caught up with him I forgot why I'm still here in the first place. After all, didn't I have a family and a whole life waiting for me back home? By the time I made it to Nadia's room, my anger had cooled down significantly. I was beginning to feel the first pangs of regret. Dimitri was a wonderful person, and I knew that I'd never find anyone else who made me feel the way he did. I need to talk to him. That could wait, however. First, I needed to check on my sister, because everything hinged on her and her health. Once she awoke, I knew that she'd be desperate to get home. To our family, our friends, our lives. And I'd have to go with her, because, just like I'd said to Dimitri, I didn't belong here in this world. Going home, to my own world and my own life, was the right thing to do. It was strange how that thought didn't feel right at all. Chapter 9 Dimitri I waited in the pool until I was certain Sarah had gone. My head thundered with pain, and regret pushed through me with the strength and heat of dragon fire. I'd been so sure that she felt the same way I did, but the look on her face when I'd asked her to stay here told me otherwise. How could I have gotten it so wrong? With a deep sigh, I heaved up to sit on the stone ledge. I glared down at my darkened reflection in the water as another wave of guilt crashed over me. Ever since Damon had asked Lucian and I to stay in the castle with him, I'd been waiting for the other shoe to drop. For final confirmation, once and for all, that everyone would realise I didn't belong here. That I wasn't worth saving from the life I'd once barely survived. I hadn't expected trouble to come in the form of a small human woman. She'd turned my world upside down in a few short days, and my life would never be the same. My father's face swam up to the surface in my memories, just as foreboding and distant as he looked in that royal portrait in the castle. You're no son of mine. His remembered words reverberated through my brain. You are nothing. And now, my mate had rejected me too. I was nothing to anyone. Even Lucian had grown distant recently. At first, I'd attributed it to his worry over his mate, but whatever it was seemed to run deeper than that. He had always been taciturn, but now his continued silence had started to weigh heavily on me. Whatever it was, he had cut me off, which left me powerless to help him. I had no place in the castle. Not anymore. I swirled the water, breaking my reflection into pieces. Perhaps it was time to give up this life for good. I could head back out into the wilds. I'd survived there my whole life after all. The life of a nomad was a lonely one, little more than hunting, ice fishing and basic survival. But at least I wouldn't hurt anyone else. Everyone I loved, I hurt. I jerked upright, my chest tight with a sudden realisation. I loved Sarah. With everything I had. This wasn't just passion and desire. This was love. She was my mate, and I'd ruined things with her when they'd barely even begun. And now I was sitting here wallowing in self-pity, thinking about giving up on that love. No. I was stronger than that. Better. And she deserved more than that from me. As terrifying as it was to face the thought of more rejection, I knew I couldn't give up on Sarah. On us. Not at the first obstacle thrown in our path. I scrambled up, disregarding the slick, damp stone underfoot as I raced to get dressed. If she was truly my mate, then I would never give up on her. I burst through the castle doors and almost barreled into Lucian, who steadied me with both hands. Dimitri, what's wrong? I gaped at him, unsure where to begin. I felt like I'd just solved the world's greatest puzzle, and he was looking at me like I'd lost my mind. Nothing, I said, shrugging him off. 
I'm fine. Just looking for Sarah. Lucian arched an eyebrow. Funnily enough, she just sent me down here to find you. Is everything okay between you two? My stomach twisted. I don't know, I admitted. Wait, she's trying to find me. Why? Lucian's face was so pale and still, it may as well have been carved from stone. Nadia's waking up. My heart jumped at what that might mean. Without another word, I followed him toward the huge staircase. For once, I didn't pause to glance at the royal portrait that hung above the stairwell landing. Still, I could feel our father's eyes burning into the back of my head with every step. I jogged to catch up with Lucian's retreating back. Your mate is finally waking up. That's a good thing, right? Lucian glanced at me with a blank expression. Of course. His tone didn't fill me with confidence. The distance between us yawned like a vast expanse. He nudged my shoulder. What's the matter with Sarah? Quickly I told him about our argument how she wanted to return to the human realm and considered her time here nothing but a brief, forced holiday. I fought to keep the misery out of my voice, but from the look on my brother's face, I could tell he wasn't buying it. Give her time, he said. She's a human and we're not. I sighed. I understand her reservations, kind of. But I don't know if I can just let her go. Now that I've found her, I can't imagine ever going back to the way things were before. Lucian frowned. Maybe that's the problem. She needs to talk to someone in her position, someone who's been through this before. You should take her south to meet Queen Lucy, a human woman who became a dragon queen. He nudged me again. She's bound to give her some good advice from a perspective that we simply don't have. I mulled his suggestion over in my mind. It wasn't actually a bad idea. I had to fight against my natural instinct to solve the problem on my own, but this wasn't about my ego after all. It was about what was best for Sarah. I hadn't met a happier couple than Lucy and Stavrock. I'd heard of their family too, three healthy babies for the royal bloodline. I suppressed a wave of envy. I'd never given much thought to having a family. Up until recently, my life had been an unpredictable gauntlet of chaos and danger, hardly a fit environment in which to bring up a child. I'd lived the life of a warrior. Things like tenderness and beauty were distant dreams. They belonged to other lives, not mine. Until the day I met Sarah. Maybe. I said with a grunt, eventually. To my relief, Lucian didn't press me further. We reached the door to Nadia's room, and he paused. Hey. I put my hand on his shoulder. You've got this. I waited until he gave me a nod before I pushed open the door. Sarah. I sat at the edge of Nadia's bed, holding my breath. Beside me, Isla hovered, folding blankets and fluffing the pillows on my old bed. The silence stretched out as we both watched the face of the sleeping woman. Nadia sighed and frowned a little in her sleep. She drew a small breath and her eyes opened softly. There, Isla whispered. And just like that, she's back with us. I couldn't contain the smile that broke across my face. Hey, sleeping beauty! My sister waking up was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, even with dark shadows under her eyes and hair that hadn't been washed in weeks. Tears gathered in my eyes. Sarah, Nadia mumbled, then lifted her head a little. A puzzled frown scrunched her forehead. What happened? Where am I? Her expression was so familiar my heart clenched in my chest. I flung my arms around her neck pressing my damp face into her hair. It's a long story, I sobbed. I'm so glad you're okay. Gently, 
Nadia extracted herself from my hug and blinked. How long was I out? Okay, don't freak out. I took her hand gently in both of mine. Just over a week. Not counting the time we were trapped under that house. Nadia's face turned ashen. I picked up a glass of water from the bedside table and helped her take a shaky sip. Sarah, she said once I put down the glass. Where are we? I glanced up at Isla. She gave a small shrug, looking just as lost as I felt. How the hell do I explain this situation? I can barely wrap my head around it myself. Luckily for me, a distraction arrived when the door opened and Lucian and Dimitri slipped through into the room. My eyes locked onto Dimitri. A hundred emotions raced through me when I met those familiar ice-blue eyes. Guilt, regret and confusion were the strongest ones of all. Sarah, Nadia said in a small voice. She swung her legs off the side of the mattress and sat up slowly, gripping my arm for support. Who were they? Right. The drama between Dimitri and me could wait. There were far more pressing matters to hand. Like the fact that Lucian's mate had woken up and he was confronting her for the first time. Would it be instant, like it had been for Dimitri and me? Dimitri took another step into the room, shutting the door behind them. Lucian remained where he was, rooted to the spot. His face looked like a thunderstorm was brewing within him. Dimitri glanced over his shoulder. Brother, she's awake. Aren't you going to talk to her? Lucian still didn't move. He stared intently at Nadia. With every second that passed, the chill in the air grew stronger and stronger until it threatened to drown everything out. Lucian, Dimitri urged his brother again. Then he glanced at me. I was unsettled by the worry in his expression. Something was wrong. I moved closer to Nadia, half shielding her with my body. What's wrong with him? I don't know. Dimitri moved toward his brother and put a hand on his arm. Lucian shook him off. His fists clenched tight. Even from my position beside the bed, I could see his white, strained knuckles. Lucian, Dimitri said. You need to control yourself. Lucian's lips pulled back into an unmistakable snarl, one I had only seen on Dimitri when he was about to change form. Oh no. I shrank back, pressing Nadia against the bed. My sister wriggled out from around me and stood up, her hands on her hips. Can someone please tell me what's going on? That was the last straw for Lucian, it seemed. The air thickened with dark fog and a deafening roar reverberated off the stone walls around us. Sarah, Dimitri shouted. Run! A huge shadow loomed out of the mist. Lucian was in dragon form, his wings outstretched toward the high ceiling. One talon caught the candelabra above us and sent it swinging before it crashed to the floor with a mighty boom. I jumped as a burst of icy fire shot into the air. Nadia screamed. I was afraid too, but beyond the fear, fury rose. How dare he threaten my sister? She's supposed to be his mate. My heart pounded in my chest at the realisation that Lucian had gone insane. Bloody hell. Stay behind me, I yelled at Nadia as the dragon circled around the edge of the room. Before it could reach us, Dimitri dived in front of Nadia's bed to shield us from the monster. I wanted to reach for him, but forced my arms back, trying to protect my terrified sister. It's going to be okay, I gasped to her, not knowing if I believed the words. Dimitri shifted right in front of us. Nadia cried out again, digging her nails into my arms, but I couldn't look away from him. He was magnificent. Dimitri spread out his wings and snarled at his brother. Lucian barely paused at the sound, continuing to advance towards Nadia and me. Once the mist cleared, I could see his eyes, narrow, pale slits above sharp teeth. 
His scales were paler than his brother's, more of a dark grey. Icy flames rose up and burst out of his mouth, burning cold and dangerous. If Dimitri didn't do something to stop him, there would be nothing left of Nadia and me. I turned to my sister and wrapped my arms around her, pulling her close. Close your eyes. Hold on to me. With a rumbling roar, Dimitri launched himself at Lucian. From behind me, I heard the sounds of them fighting. My breath caught in my throat, fear pulsing through my blood. Not just for myself and my sister, but for Dimitri. He was fighting his only family, his brother. The man everyone had said was his best friend. His closest ally. He was fighting his brother, to protect Nadia and me. The room was huge and high-ceilinged, but even the castle's strong architecture was no match for dragon wrath. Wings caught against wall hangings, claws tore into curtains, and tables and chairs were upended as they fought savagely. I screamed and jumped out of reach, pulling my sister with me as a chair clattered against my leg. I hurried her over to the wall, pressing her into the stones and covering her with my body as best as I could. Lucian released a jet of icy flames that blasted a nearby wardrobe. Nadia screamed, and I forced her out of its path just in time to feel the icy chill whiz over our heads. Dimitri snarled in my direction, and for a second, our eyes met. Get out, he seemed to be screaming at me. Take your sister and run. But I couldn't move. I couldn't leave him, useless as I was in this situation. If I left him alone in this fight, he might not walk out of it alive. Lucian seemed to be savage with rage, tearing into everything in his path. I could feel the pain and heartbreak radiating off him, and I knew Dimitri would only be able to hold him off for so long. That much pain, he was inconsolable that Nadia was not his mate. Nadia's hands squeezed tight around my arm. Sarah! she screamed into my ear. We need to leave! Right now! Hurry! My feet were rooted to the floor. I was torn. My brain told me I needed to take my sister and go, but my heart said something else. Nadia grabbed my arm and half dragged me over to the door. She threw it open and yanked us both into the corridor, slamming the door shut behind us. I have to go back in there. The words spilled out of my mouth before I could stop them, and my sister's eyes widened. Go back, she hissed. Are you crazy? It's Dimitri. I twisted in her grasp, trying to break free, but she held me firm. I have to make sure. I need him to be okay. More crashing and howling issued from inside that room, and I had no idea what was happening. Was Dimitri hurt? What could I do to help him? Tears of frustration filled my eyes and spilled down my cheeks. Dimitri! Nadia repeated. You know one of those, those things? Her eyebrows crept to the top of her forehead. No, you're not going back in there. We're getting out of here, Sarah. We're lucky we weren't killed already. Her eyes flickered across my face. There was a desperation in her expression that was new. My heart sank. This was my baby sister. It didn't matter what I wanted, what I needed. I had to make sure that she was safe. And if I went back into that room, I couldn't guarantee that she would be. Another screaming roar echoed from inside the bedchamber, and we both flinched back from the door. All right, I said, admitting defeat. A small part of my heart broke as I added, Let's go. Chapter 10 Sarah Nadia tugged me further and further away from Dimitri, my heart aching in my chest with every step. Come on, come on! We've got to go! she cried, dragging me down the main staircase and toward the front door. It was only when we reached the bottom of the grand staircase that Nadia stumbled to a halt. 
She stared up at the huge windows and elaborate stonework. Whoa! What is this place? Our footsteps echoed loudly as we crossed the marble floor. I glanced down and realised that my sister was barefoot and only wearing the long nightgown that the maids had dressed her in. Damn it. She's going to freeze to death in this place. I pulled off my jacket and wrapped it around her shoulders. A castle, I whispered. Far away from home. Trust me, I'll explain everything. Nadia shivered and pulled my jacket tighter around her. Explain? You don't need to explain anything. We need to find a car and get home. Nadia's voice reached a squealing pitch and I reached out to grab her hand. Please calm down. We need to talk about this. What's there to talk about? Nadia glared at me. I wake up around strangers and one of them suddenly turns into a monster and tries to kill me. Sound familiar? I remembered with a jolt that Nadia had been unconscious since the farmhouse. She knew nothing about this place. All the trauma and fear we'd suffered together was fresh in her memory. It's not like that, I replied, my voice weak. These are good people. I'm leaving, Nadia's voice rang out, clear and certain. And you should come with me. Please, Sarah. Let's go home. Tears welled up in my eyes as I stared at her. I didn't know what to do anymore. Seeing Lucian as an out-of-control beast had horrified me, but I also knew it couldn't have come out of nowhere. Some shifter instinct had made him snap. Something about Nadia. If Nadia wasn't his mate, then who was? Dimitri had shifted when he'd seen me, but he hadn't wanted to kill me, quite the opposite, in fact. He'd been in complete control, desperate to seduce me, but not without my cooperation in that fact. So, what had happened to Lucian for this to occur? I frowned. When Dimitri had described the sorceress's vision, he'd seemed so certain about both of us. When I'd asked Cass about it, she'd agreed that Marianne had never been wrong before. But everything was starting to add up. Lucian's cold demeanour around me, and the way he seemed to have withdrawn from Dimitri since I'd arrived, even though the two of them had always been close. We should wait, I said. For what? Nadia shook her head. Come on, no one's guarding the doors. We have to get out while we still can. I opened my mouth to protest further, but before I could say anything, the sound of glass shattering from an upstairs window made us both scream and dive for the floor. Another crash of broken glass, this time closer, set cold air rushing over our bodies. Oh no. What was that? Did one of them escape the castle? That wasn't good. Nadia! Oh my God! I clutched my sister's hand and we raced each other to the front door. I glanced at the scene unfolding at the top of the stairs. Lucian and Dimitri twisted and rolled over one another, locked in battle on the hallway floor. Dimitri was trying desperately to stop Lucian from continuing his rampage of destruction, though I didn't know if he could do it. Not alone. Where was Damon? Surely he could step in and help Dimitri. These were his brothers, after all. While I debated whether to start searching for Damon, Cass, or in fact anyone who might be able to assist, Nadia pulled open the front doors. A blast of chilly air hit me. I spun around. Nadia! No! But it was too late. My sister was fleeing down the castle stairs and out into the snow. Freezing air swept in. Behind me, the huge window, where the coloured dragons had once danced through a glassy sky, lay in pieces on the floor. Bits of glass crunched under my boots as I headed for the doors, breaking into a run. I didn't have a choice now. I had to follow her. The last time I didn't go after her, she'd almost died. I couldn't have that happen again. Nadia, come back! I chased her over the drawbridge and through the narrow, winding streets of town. 
She was running in a hurried zigzag, like a scared rabbit, not paying attention to where she was going in her terror. She knocked into food carts and market stalls, barreled through astonished onlookers, and carried on without stopping. She ran all the way to the narrow track that led out of the village and across the flat, barren wilderness that stretched as far as the eye could see. Nadia! I almost reached her and tried to grab a hold of her, but she shrugged me off, continuing forward with her jaw set and her eyes narrowed. Her cheeks were streaked with dried tears. Please, I begged. You'll freeze. It's going to be dark soon. We have to go back. I'm not going back there, Nadia sniffed. Her bare toes curled against the snow-covered track, and I winced. I'm going home. I jumped in front of her and pushed my hands out, trying to stop her. She had no idea where we were, or just how far from home we really were. You don't even know where home is from here. We're bound to run into a car eventually she said, wrapping her arms around her chest. The jacket I'd given her covered her hands, making her look even younger than she was. Seriously, you've been here this whole time? I have. I ducked my head as I fell into step beside her. I've been waiting for you to get better, so we could go home. I thought back to the argument Dimitri and I had earlier, and my cheeks burned. The cold wind sliced into my face, and I pulled up the collar of my sweater. Now that I said it out loud, it sounded like a weak excuse. It's not like I've sat by her bedside this whole time, waiting for her to wake up. I shoved away the traitorous thought. We were silent as we continued our trek. The terrain underfoot was getting rockier, and the sky overhead darkened by the minute. I wanted to turn back but I sensed that Nadia wouldn't have any of it. She would have to be freezing. Her poor feet must be numb by now. I shivered, the clothes I wore not suitable for the cold air without my jacket. What were those things? Her small voice broke through the stillness. Inhaling a shaky breath, I answered her honestly. Dragons. I saw her eye roll coming from a million miles away. Very funny. I'm not joking. I waited until she caught my eye and her expression sobered. They're men who turn into dragons and they're from a royal bloodline. Dimitri never really explained it beyond that. I'm not sure they even know how it works. Nadia was quiet and my heart thumped as I watched the cogs turn in her head, putting the pieces together the ancient, lavish castle she'd woken up in, the huge wings, the claws, the wardrobe engulfed in icy flames. When she finally spoke, however, her question surprised me. You said that name before, back in that room. Dimitri. She nudged into my shoulder. Who is he? I bit my lip, taking my time before answering her question. He was there when I woke up. He thinks we're meant to be together. Nadia snorted. Like fate and all that crap. Actually, my mouth twisted into a chagrined smile. It's exactly like that, yeah. That's some crazy Stockholm syndrome you've got there. Nadia shoved her hands into the pockets of my jacket. Seriously, you meet a guy, he tells you he loves you and you don't ask any other questions. The Sarah I know would never have acted like that. That's not... My cheeks burned. I didn't know how to make her understand. My feelings for Dimitri ran deep, but I could barely understand them myself, let alone talk about them out loud. It's not like that, I said eventually. He's a good man. He was trying to protect us earlier, Nadia. I know what I saw back there. Nadia replied. Two out-of-control monsters fighting. I don't care what you think he is. He's no different from the one who tried to kill us. I sighed, with no idea what to say in response. We continued on in silence. But with every step we took, 
the panic in my chest twisted tighter and tighter. The castle was nothing but a dark, murky expanse on the bare horizon behind us now. I can't abandon her, and I can't convince her to come back to the castle with me. We're stuck. What the hell am I going to do? By the time I finally managed to persuade Nadia to stop, a howling wind had picked up in the shallow ravine in which we found ourselves. The snow, which had started off light enough, brushing our shoulders like icing sugar, began to fall faster and thicker. Every direction was a haze of swirling whiteness. It didn't matter which way we turned. Everything looked the same. We had no way of knowing which direction the castle lay. At some point I'd forced Nadia to put on my boots because her feet were cut and bleeding from walking so long without shoes. I cursed loudly as I struggled over the rocky terrain in my socks. Now it was my feet almost numb with cold, and I began to worry about frostbite. Or worse. My heart hammered with terror and disorientation. We are in so much trouble. When Nadia's hand slackened in mine, I tightened my grip in alarm. If I lost her out here, we might never find each other. But she was signalling towards something. Blinking back the driving snow, I made out a shallow crevice in the rocks up ahead, large enough for two people to wriggle into. It was the only chance of shelter that had presented itself. Staying outside in these conditions would get us nowhere. Our only chance was to stay put somewhere sheltered, like this small crevice, and hope that the snow eased up enough that we could get our bearings. Or maybe Dimitri will find us. I tucked the stray thought away. Given he was probably still in battle with his brother, that scenario was unlikely. Nadia curled up around me once we were inside the tiny shelter. Her head dropped onto my shoulder, and within a couple of minutes, she was asleep. Was that a good thing? I had read somewhere about not going to sleep in the snow, but she had literally just woken up from a long illness. Perhaps I should leave her to sleep for a while. I tugged my jacket around the both of us as best I could. How did this happen? It seemed like minutes ago I was in Dimitri's arms in the heat of the hot springs cave, safe, warm and protected. Loved. Now we were miles away from the castle, trapped in what was fast becoming a blizzard of epic proportions. At least in this tiny crevice we were shielded from the worst of it. Nadia snuggled closer to me, letting out a soft breath. I could feel her heart beat against mine and cuddled her close. She wasn't a baby anymore. She was nineteen, but still, I could remember what it was like to hold her when she was really young. She was still weak, and despite how incredibly stupid it had been to walk this far in the snow, tears gathered in my eyes for how grateful I was to have her alive and with me. I'd been so close to losing her forever. I pressed my face against the top of her head. Despite everything, I couldn't blame her for reacting the way she had in her fragile, traumatised state. I could imagine how it had looked to her. How it sounded. If I were in her shoes, I might have fled just as fast. My thoughts drifted back to the castle. What if Lucian has totally lost control? It might take Dimitri all night to calm him down. If he is able to at all. What if Lucian hurt Dimitri? What if he... No. Don't think the worst. My toes curled up in the thick socks. At least I think they did. It was hard to tell, as my whole feet were numb from all the time we'd spent out here in the frozen weather. I don't think we'll last all night out here. I tried to distract myself by wondering what the sorceress had in mind for Lucian. If Nadia wasn't his mate, then who was? Sisters. A thought glowed in the back of my mind. A fragment of conversation, something Dimitri had said. You probably have shifter ancestry in your bloodline if you go back far enough. A realisation began to form in my mind. Something that was so obvious now that I looked at it, I wondered why I hadn't thought of it before. 
If we ever made it through this night alive, and I found my way back to Dimitri, I would let him know. I wonder. I didn't know how much time had passed. All I knew was that it was pitch black. The wind howled over the rocks above us, and the occasional blast of snow made me squeeze my eyes shut tight against the cold. The night seemed endless. The storm raged on around us, huge and unstoppable. Nadia and I were just two tiny specks in the face of such a vast and untamable beast. I'm sorry, sister. I've failed you. I've failed both of us. Weirdly, I didn't feel as cold as I had before. A lazy warmth was burrowing its way through my bones like a thick blanket. My eyelids were heavy. I wanted desperately to close them, to go to sleep for just a second. My eyes snapped open. A single thought struck through my mind, clear and simple. If you go to sleep, you'll die. I pulled my sister closer to share our body heat and forced myself to stay awake. My thoughts immediately went to Dimitri and what had passed between us during this time. I'd fallen in love with him, and that hadn't been in my plans. Not at all. A month ago I'd been a college student, wanting to party and study and have fun while I was young. But then we'd been taken, and every breath had been painful. At times I'd wanted it all to be over, just so I could get away from the tragedy of what had become of us. And then we'd been given a second chance at life. Or at least, I had been. And while I was with Dimitri, all my college plans had seemed stupid. Small in the bigger scheme of things. I'd had a dragon prince rescue me and want to be with me forever. What more could there be in this world than to be with him? If I really was honest with myself, all I wanted to do was love Dimitri and make him feel needed. He'd never had that, and he deserved it. I wanted to give him a baby who would adore him as much as I did. And if I got another chance, I'd tell him all of this. That I was his. And he was mine. And despite everything, family obligation, my plans, nothing else mattered now. The more my thoughts wandered, the more I struggled to remember why that would be such a bad thing. My limbs were stiff and my thoughts were sluggish, weighed down by the snow and cold. I sent a silent prayer out to the world. There was nothing we could do now. Our only hope of rescue came from the man whose love I had turned away mere hours ago. My eyelids drooped as my vision became hazy. With every ounce of strength I had left in me, I repeated one thing in my mind, again and again. Dimitri, please, we're here. Come find us. Chapter 11 Dimitri The wind howled down through the shattered window above us. I stood over my brother, glaring down on him. We had shifted back to human, and our chests heaved with residual anger. Twin furies simmered in the air between us, and for a hot second, I thought he was going to get up and take another swing at me, this time in human form. But he didn't. His head slumped down against his chest, face falling into shadow. She's not my mate, brother. Lucian's voice was broken with despair. When I looked at her, I, I felt nothing. I dropped my gaze, my chest twisting. It had always been the same way between us. Lucian's sorrow was my sorrow. His happiness was my happiness. This was all wrong. We should be celebrating the recovery of his mate right now. Instead, both Sara and Nadia were gone. Vanished. By the time Lucian had calmed down enough to shift back, dusk was gathering and long shadows crept toward us over the marble floor. I cast my eye around at the destruction we'd wrought on our brother's castle. We were surrounded by a mass of broken shards. I know, I whispered. I'm sorry. 
How could the sorceress have been wrong? Lucian met my eyes. Now all the rage and destruction had passed, I saw him for what he was. What he'd always been. My little brother. Grieving for something that had never existed at all. You and Sarah. She's my mate, I said, my voice firm. But she wants to leave. So, it looks like we'll both be alone after all. My bitter voice echoed off the cold stone. Lucian rose to his feet, shaking his head. No. He tilted his chin up. You hear me? No. We're going to get them back. Both of them. You don't have to help me do that. Yes, I do. Lucian wiped a hand over his face before surveying the chaos around us. I owe you that much. They left because of me. I didn't have an answer for that. He wasn't wrong after all. I'm not going to endanger your happiness any more just because I haven't found mine. Lucian's eyes were like shards of ice as they stared past me, out through the open doors where snow had begun to fall. Let's find them and bring them back alive. Lucian and I took to the air. Flying in tandem like this again, it was like things were back where they should be. With Lucian by my side, I soared up toward the cloud banks that scudded high over the uppermost towers, circling around so I could look at the ground spread out far below us. Even with full winter gear, this terrain was dangerous for two human women. On foot, there was only one track that led from the village below the castle. They wouldn't have had any option but to follow it. I turned into a graceful spiral and dived through the air, dropping close to the ground to see if I could pick up their trail. Lucian followed me, right at my shoulder as always. Fighting him had gone against every instinct I had, but in some ways I was glad for it. Now the air between us was clearer and we were on the same page again. Lucian shifted course slightly as the road narrowed. Shallow, rocky outcrops sprouted up below us, snaking toward a dip in the landscape. I had a good mental map of the terrain. Damon had shown us the king's lands from the air and on foot, and we were used to tracking our enemies over both. But this was different. This was Sarah, and she was in danger. I could feel it. I followed Lucian as we flew. The sun had vanished below the horizon, and both the wind and snow had picked up. The weather and the cold got worse and worse, until the storm was raging around us. Sarah! My mind screamed for her. Where are you? All around us, thick snowflakes whirled in icy droves. The wind battered our wings, and darkness threatened to drown everything out. We pushed on through it all, searching through the storm, to no avail. Sarah! We couldn't give up. If we couldn't find them in time, they would both die. Up ahead, the swirling blackness gave way. I spotted a faint light. It was nothing more than a blur at first, and I thought I was seeing things. But it didn't go away. It just hovered there, like a bright beacon. I started toward the light. I met Lucian's eyes in the darkness. His gaze was blank. He hadn't seen anything. But he trusted me, so we headed in that direction. The light was coming from a shallow cave. It was little more than a crevice in the rock face, scarcely big enough for one person, let alone two. But when I ducked my head, my heart almost stopped inside my chest. Nadia and Sarah lay curled up around one another. I landed and nudged Sarah's shoulder, but she was unconscious. At least, that was what I told myself. After everything we'd gone through together, I couldn't contemplate the alternative. I leaned in and clawed my way through the stone, knocking aside a boulder, and pulled the two bodies from the wreckage. They were like rag dolls in my grasp, limp and icy. My heart thudded with fear as I clutched Sarah close to my chest. 
please let her be alive. Oh God, please. I can't lose her. Not like this. If she wants to go home, so be it. But not like this. Lucian took Nadia from me. We both inhaled deeply, letting our chests fill with smouldering warmth before we clutched their limp forms against us. For now, it was the best we could do to keep them warm until we could get them back to the castle. I stared into the black sky while the blizzard continued to howl around us. I pulled Sarah close with my claws and extended my wings out. As one, Lucian and I launched ourselves into the air and flew the women home to our brother's castle. Sarah. My dreams were muddled and hazy. I'd been dipping in and out of them for what seemed to be an eternity, hovering in the space between sleep and wakefulness. In one dream, I was back home and my parents were talking in the next room. In another, I was at college. At one point I had a nightmare. I was back in the basement, Nadia slumped beside me. And this time it was my fault. It was all my fault. When I finally came back to reality, a hand was holding mine, warm and soft. I gripped the fingers like they were a lifeline. Sarah. Hearing Dimitri's whispered voice, I turned my head to peer at him through half-opened eyelids. His other hand came up to cradle my fingers. You're awake. Deja vu. We've been here before. I squeezed his hand again, harder this time. Ouch, he said. He didn't look hurt, though. With my human strength, I probably hadn't affected him at all. Sorry. I scrunched my face at the sound of my own voice. It was so thin and raspy, like I'd been crawling through a desert. The irony. Just checking you're real, that's all. I'm real. His eyes were soft and full of relief. For a little while there, I thought I might lose you. Nadia. I sucked in a quick breath. My sister? Dimitri nodded. She's fine. Recovering, like you, but she'll be okay. I sagged with relief. Then, with his help, I struggled upright. He shoved a couple more pillows behind my head until I was only half reclined. I felt kind of stupid, but I let him fuss over me. It felt nice to have someone who cared that much. I'm not going anywhere, I said. I promise. He looked up sharply, taking in the weight of my words. We stared at each other for a long moment. We were alone. There were no other priorities. No distractions. Just the two of us. Do you mean that? He lowered his gaze. Because if you don't... I do, I told him honestly. When we were in that storm, I thought we were going to die. I had a lot of time to think about life. About what I wanted. I took his face in my hands, tilting his head toward me. Dimitri, it's you. You're what I want. I couldn't stop thinking about you, what I'd be letting go if I just walked away and went back to my old life. I pushed my forehead against his, inhaling softly. That delicious scent, always there to entice me. I'm not sure I can walk away. I felt the familiar rumble of his voice through my body when he answered. I meant what I said, Sarah. I'd never hold you against your will. When you ran, I thought of how you must see me. A vicious beast. A monster. His voice turned fierce. I'm not like those men who kept you in that basement, Sarah. With me, you'll always have a choice. I know. I pressed a kiss to his forehead. And if we're really doing this, I need you to accept me. All of me. The human world will always be part of that. I can live with that. His face broke into a smile. And to think, until recently, 
I'd never been south of the mountains. I thought of all the things I wanted to do with him. Take him to the city, to my college. Introduce him to the rest of my family. Maybe we could have a road trip. My heart soared with the possibilities. You're not the only one caught between two worlds, Sarah. In a gesture that was now familiar to me, Dimitri tucked a loose strand of hair behind my ear. My father never accepted me. For the longest time, I thought King Damon was my enemy. Even now, I walk these hallways wondering if everyone sees me the way I see myself, the bastard son of a tyrant. He glanced toward the window, as if it was difficult for him to meet my gaze. I shifted closer, taking his hand and pulling him properly onto the bed. He came willingly, joining me under the mass of blankets. But you taught me that I was enough, he said. His arms slid down to my waist. I was still warm with sleep, but I shivered under his touch, nevertheless. Everything, the good and the bad. Thanks to you, I can finally see a future for myself here. I surged forward, catching his mouth with mine. He kissed me back passionately, tangling his hands in my hair. Before I could deepen the kiss, however, he pulled back. Wait, he panted, ignoring my frustrated whine. Does this mean you'll stay forever? You'll mate with me? Yes. I pressed kisses everywhere on him I could reach. I burned with want, eager for his touch. Yes. I'm yours, Dimitri. His eyes darkened and he let out an inhuman growl. That's right. His voice dropped even lower than usual. You're mine. Chapter 12 Sarah I must have fallen asleep, because too soon I woke to the sound of Dimitri shutting the door and re-entering the room. I sat up in bed and smiled at him. Hey, where'd you go? I went to check on your sister, and she's awake, which is great. I threw back the blankets and jumped out of bed. I want to see her. Can we go now? Dimitri nodded, his jaw tight. I think we all need to. I frowned, not quite understanding. Who's we? Lucian and I. He wants to apologise to her and sort things out between them. The castle has been very tense since our fight. I bit my lip, then nodded. Okay, but I'll word Nadia up first. She's only nineteen and has always been a little afraid of big men like your brother. I pulled on the fresh clothes laid out for me on the side table, shivering with the coolness in the air. We'd been so cold in that small crevice, it gave me chills just thinking about it now. I'll take you to Nadia, then go and get Lucian. There's a lot to discuss. I didn't ask what he meant. My only concern was getting to Nadia as soon as possible and seeing her alive and well again. I'd really thought we were going to die out in the wilderness. Frozen to death, never to be seen again. When I opened the door to her bedroom, Nadia jumped up from the bed. Sarah! She raced for me, and I swept her up in my arms, holding her tight. I am so sorry. She sobbed against me, her small frame shuddering. We almost died, and it's all my fault. I pulled back from her and grabbed her hands. Nadia, listen to me. You were terrified and had no idea where you were. Then those two brothers turned into dragons. Trust me. I know why you ran. I would have done the same thing the day I met them if it wasn't for the fact that you were still unconscious and I had to wait for you to wake up. Nadia brushed the tears from her cheeks. Well, you did have another reason to stay. I smiled and straightened up. Dimitri. I glanced behind me. He hadn't arrived yet. I took her hand and tugged her to the window sill so we could speak quietly together. 
He's the one I want to be with, Nadia. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to properly explain it all to you. Before. She smiled softly at me. It's okay. I understand. I gripped her hand and squeezed her fingers. You probably can't understand, but please know, he makes me so happy. I am totally in love with him. She laughed. I know. I can see it all over your face. The guys were coming, their footsteps echoing in the hallway. Then please trust me when I say, these men are good people. The door opened and Dimitri stuck his head in. Do you two want to join us for a drink in the dining hall? I jumped to my feet. That's a great idea. We'll be right there. Dimitri shut the door again, and I couldn't help but smile at how thoughtful he was being. What's that about? Nadia asked, already grabbing her coat. Lucian wants to apologise for what happened. Oh. I slid my hand into the crook of her elbow and gently directed her out of the bedroom and into the hallway. He feels terrible about it. So please, just let him apologise, hun. Okay. I led my sister to the dining hall, though I could feel her reticence. As far as she was concerned, these two men were monsters. I just happened to be in love with one of them. The fire was blazing in the grate, and Dimitri sat with his brother at the table, waiting for us. Hot chocolates, he asked, gesturing to the table where hot drinks were waiting, along with platters of sweets. Thank you, I said, sitting down and grabbing for a drink. I'm famished. I took a long sip of my hot chocolate and sighed as the sweetness ran over my tongue. Dimitri cleared his throat. Lucian stared at the table, looking worried and slightly sick. Go on, brother. Lucian looked up, his face hard and his jaw tight. I need to apologise to you both for my abhorrent behaviour. I am ashamed to have scared you in the way that I did. Nadia gulped. Oh, Lucian, I... No, he said fiercely, shaking his head. You both could have died, and that would have been my fault. If I'd only retained control over my dragon, none of this would have happened. I glanced over at Nadia, whose eyes were filling with tears. It's okay. Really, I said. You weren't in your right mind. Lucian shook his head. No, I was not. Nadia stared at him. Isla told me you saved me from those men back at the farm. You brought me here. You saved my life. Lucian looked at her, his eyes wide and fearful. Yes, but then I... Why did you freak out like that? She asked suddenly. Was it something I said? Or did? No. It was. Lucian sighed, running a hand through his long dark hair and pushing it off his face. I was ashamed. And angry. I'd been told you were my fated mate, but I don't feel those things for you that Dimitri obviously feels for Sarah. And when I woke up, I confirmed it was true, didn't I? Nadia asked gently. That I wasn't your soulmate. He nodded his throat working as he swallowed his pain. Yes, and I, we. Dimitri cleared his throat loudly. My brother and I have grown up in the wilderness, together. Only recently have we been welcomed back into the castle, and our feelings of abandonment and pain have not gone away. Nadia wiped at a tear that had fallen on her cheek. I'm so sorry I hurt you. I reached over and touched my sister's arm. It's not your fault. Fated mates are created, born for each other. Neither Lucian nor you chose this. And it's no one's fault. Except Marianne's, Lucian growled. I laughed. I couldn't help it. Yes, let's shoot the messenger. Dimitri frowned at me in disapproval and I waved my hand at him. It's just a human joke. 
Oh, forget about it. I turned to Nadia. They were told by a fortune teller of sorts that we were their mates. By a sorceress called Marianne. She was right about me and Dimitri, but unfortunately, she was wrong about you two. A smile quivered on Nadia's lips. Well, one out of two isn't bad. I glanced across at Dimitri. I'm grateful for it. Nadia stood up and reached for Lucian's arm. Can you stand up? I need to hug you. What for? he asked, though he got to his feet anyway. For saving my life. Nadia pressed herself into the huge dragon's chest. His eyes went wide and worried, then he softened, wrapping his arms around her. A soft sigh filled the air, and I smiled at my mate. I never had a little sister before, Lucian whispered. I grinned as Nadia pulled back and stared up at Lucian. And I never had a brother before. They settled back into their seats, and the atmosphere in the room buzzed with energy. Now that that's settled, Nadia, we have a question for you, Dimitri said, his deep voice booming in the room. We do? I asked him. He smiled at me, then focused on my sister. Would you like to stay here, with us? In the Winter Palace? Damon and Cass have said you can both stay, for as long as you like. My heart dropped in my chest, and I turned to my sister. Nadia stared at me with a similar type of anguish. You're staying, she whispered. Tears welled in my eyes, burning the back of my throat. I have to. I can't leave Dimitri. Nadia nodded. I knew that, but to hear it. She wiped at the tears that dropped onto her cheeks. I'm going to miss you so much. Stay, I whispered. Please. There's no reason for you to leave. Nadia glared at me. No reason? Sarah, I have college and my friends. Mom and Dad. I pressed my lips together, pain ricocheting through my chest. I know. She put out her hand to me. I'll tell them all you met the guy of your dreams and can't possibly leave him. I laughed, choking on the sound. That's pretty close to the truth. I got to my feet and pulled my little sister into my arms for a hug. Dimitri said from behind me, We'll organise a way for you to get home, Nadia. I closed my eyes. I didn't want to think about her leaving me, but it was my turn to focus on my future. And my future was here, with my dragon prince. Chapter 13 Dimitri I finally understood what true bliss felt like, having my mate, holding her safe in my arms, her head resting softly on my shoulder as we drifted in the afterglow of our lovemaking. The morning sunlight shone through our window. Faint noises echoed down distant hallways, and the clatter of plates downstairs told me that breakfast was almost ready. I didn't care. I wanted to stay here forever, just like this. But reality came knocking on the door sooner rather than later. I groaned, throwing a pillow in the direction of the door, but the hammering increased. Dimitri! Cass's muffled, irate voice came through the wood. I know you're in there. Come on! Sarah frowned sleepily and looked up at me. What's that all about? It's time to take your sister back to the human world. Sarah sat upright in bed. A faint look of dismay crossed her beautiful features. It had been three days since we'd had our talk in the dining hall, though I'm sure Sarah had deliberately put it out of her head, hoping this day would never come. You must have known this was coming. I kept my voice soft. I hated to hurt her in any way. She doesn't want to stay here, my love. And we can't keep her if she doesn't wish it. No, I know. Sarah drew up her shoulders before letting out a long sigh. I just, I'll miss her. That's all. 
She's my baby sister. I'll always worry about her. I gathered Sarah up in my arms. I understand. She's much better, though. She can travel now. Okay. Sarah sighed, and we begrudgingly tugged on some clothes and headed downstairs. We were the last ones down to breakfast. A chorus of smiling faces greeted us, ranging from genuinely happy grins from Damon and Cass to knowing smirks from our siblings, Lucian and Nadia. We took our seats, and my stomach lurched with hunger. I was starving. I didn't care what the others thought about our lazy hours in bed. Sarah was mine. I wanted the whole world to know it. Nadia and Sarah sat at one end of the table, speaking in quiet voices, their heads close. Cass sat next to them, with Damon at the head of the table. Lucian was on the other side, sitting a little apart from the others. Lucian's apology to Nadia, along with him saving her life, seemed to have changed her perspective on dragon shifters. Since yesterday, she'd let Cass drag her around on a tour of the castle, and even expressed an interest in some of the rare herbs and mushrooms that the village market had to offer. So far, she'd flat out refused to actually ride on the back of a dragon, however, which might pose something of a problem when the time came to take her home. I nudged my brother in the back of the head and he scowled at me. When Nadia had initially woken up and we realised she wasn't his mate, he'd torn the palace apart in his frustrations but now he seemed to have accepted the fact, and he'd brightened up considerably since realising he wasn't broken. She just wasn't the one for him. He'd even suggested that he could be the one to take her home, but I turned him down. I needed to make sure Sarah's sister got back safely. I wanted to be the one to tell her family she was okay. Is it time? Nadia's voice broke through my thoughts. I realised she and Sarah were both standing up at the table, looking at me. It's time. The morning air was crisp and bright, the perfect conditions for flying, not too windy, and a clear sky for navigation. Cass, Damon and Lucian joined us in the cobblestone courtyard as Sarah and Nadia hugged each other tightly. I love you, Sarah said, face muffled against her sister's shoulder. We'll see each other again soon, okay? Tell Mum and Dad and Katerina that I love them. Nadia sniffled and laughed as she pulled away, wiping her tears with her sleeve. Katerina won't believe a word of this, will she? Probably not. Sarah looked close to tears as well, but she was holding it together for now. Wait. Cass frowned. Who the hell is Katerina? Oh. Nadia raised an eyebrow at Sarah before turning to the rest of us. Right. Sorry. She's our older sister. We don't see her that often, but she'll come back home for this, I'm sure of it. My heart flipped over in my chest. Another sister. The conversation moved on quickly, but I couldn't stop turning it over in my mind and wondering. Sarah. I watched Nadia and Dimitri soar high into the sky, Nadia's shrieks piercing my ears until they were out of earshot. She hadn't wanted to get on the dragon's back, but the other option was being held in Dimitri's claws. To Nadia, riding on his back was the lesser of the two evils. The silhouette of Dimitri's huge wings covered the sun. My heart ached. I knew I'd be returning home soon to see her again, Dimitri had promised that I would be able to traverse between the worlds on occasion, but tears still blurred my vision. I watched them until they were nothing but a pinprick on the horizon. Cass and I returned to breakfast together. My appetite had vanished, and I sank back into my chair with a heavy heart. Do you want to walk through the maze after breakfast? Cass's unusually soft tone broke me out of my thoughts. Or we could get the cooks to make something sweet. I'm fine, I replied automatically. My shoulders hunched inwards and I sighed. I'm... I'm worried about her. I can't help feeling like... 
Cass tilted her head to one side. Like what? Like I'm being selfish. I let my head thud back against the heavy oak chair. All this, it's wonderful. I want to be here with Dimitri, but she's my sister. What if she needs me? Nadia is a grown woman. She can make her own choices. And you, she said, prodding my shoulder, deserve to be happy. Life is short. You need to grab happiness with both hands and live it. Fated mates don't come around every day, trust me. At the head of the table, Damon grinned. He put his hand on Cass's and tangled their fingers together. The gesture was sweet and surprising from the king who wasn't known for being outwardly affectionate to anyone other than his wife. She's right, you know, he told me, eyes twinkling. I tipped my head back and laughed. Thanks, guys. The pep talk hadn't fixed everything, but the knot of guilt in my chest eased slightly. Cass was right. There was no point in worrying about what could have been or what I should have done better in the past. Life would carry on regardless, and Dimitri was part of my life. Now and forever. A soft beam of sunlight hit my face and I basked in the warmth of it. Dimitri would be back soon. I wasn't a shifter, but the love in my heart at that moment could have rivaled that of any dragon. And, if I can't hold on to anything else, I can hold on to that. Epilogue A month later You look amazing! Nadia grinned widely, her gaze running up and down my body. She held a bouquet of trailing holly, ivy and winter roses in her hands, the only plants we could find in the garden to cobble together at this time of year. A true dragon princess! I rolled my eyes, fighting back a blush. It's too much, isn't it? Definitely not! Katerina reached over to rearrange the bouquet a little, pulling out some wilting flowers here and there. This is your wedding, Sarah. You have to look the part. I glanced down at myself, smoothing out the gauzy fabric of my skirt. The dress was simple, but it was topped off by a long fur-lined cloak. I flushed happily and accepted the flowers from Nadia. Oh, I almost forgot. Nadia picked up a delicate circlet that Cass had given to me as an early wedding gift and fitted it over my hair. Now you're ready. You know, Katerina reached down to adjust the back of the coat as I stepped up to the doorway. It's okay if you want to postpone. We can still call it off. She made a muffled sound of pain, like Nadia had stepped on her foot. What? It's kind of soon to be marrying this guy, sis. I'm just saying. They're eloping, Nadia retorted. It's romantic, cat. Shh, I hissed, and they fell silent. Inwardly, I rolled my eyes. Sisters. The guards on either side of the doorway clicked their heels, and the doors opened. I smiled when I saw the tall candles decorated with ivy and roses. Cass had refused to be a bridesmaid with my sisters, and decided instead to decorate the hall for our small ceremony. It didn't bother her that there was no one here to see it except us. In her mind, even a simple ceremony should be beautiful. We hadn't wanted to wait, and with my friends being human and Dimitri being, well, Dimitri, everyone who was important was here anyway. Except my parents. My father was unwell and unable to travel. I hadn't wanted to push him, especially with the truth of who I was marrying a royal dragon shifter from another realm. It had been hard enough to convince Katerina to come, and she didn't even know the extent of everything. I'd taken her to the airport, given her a sleeping tablet for flying, and met Dimitri once Cat fell asleep. He'd been the one to fly us home, and I still hadn't explained everything to my sister yet. That was a problem for another day. Today was my wedding day. Let's go. I said, nodding at my beautiful sisters. 
They both smiled at me, then walked through the doors. I followed them down the aisle. Damon and Cass stood to one side, their faces glowing with happiness. Lucian stood beside Dimitri, who waited for me at the end of the small aisle. My heart lifted as my groom locked eyes with me. His face broke into a smile as I made my way toward him. You look incredible, he murmured when I reached him. I ran my hand over the lapel of his jacket. It was the most dressed up I'd ever seen him. I wondered if Cass was the one who'd gotten him into that suit. You don't look so bad yourself, I whispered with a smile. That was an understatement. His suit fit him perfectly, his broad shoulders tapering down to his waist. I was already thinking about peeling his clothes off him later. My teeth caught on my bottom lip with the thought. Someone gasped behind me, and I turned to see Katerina gaping at Lucian, her mouth open in surprise. I followed her gaze and caught sight of Lucian's expression. He was standing just behind Dimitri's right shoulder, staring past me. My heart jumped. He was staring at Katerina the same way Dimitri stared at me. Lucian's eyes darkened. His pupils were black in an eerie resemblance to his brother's, and I realised immediately what was happening. Katerina is his mate. My sisters and I had been in our own rooms in another part of the castle while we prepared for the wedding. Lucian hadn't had a chance to cross paths with her until now. Marianne wasn't wrong. All this time, my sister was Lucian's mate. But not Nadia. Katerina. I'm sorry, Lucian muttered into Dimitri's ear. I was close enough to hear the pain in his words. His hands clenched into fists at his sides, and I realised that he was barely holding it together. I... I have to go. Dimitri turned, and comprehension dawned on his face. Brother. Before Dimitri could touch him, Lucian stumbled back, knocking over one of Cass's floral arrangements. It clattered to the ground, but he kept running, almost barreling into Cass herself in his rush to get away. It was horrible to see him run from his mate when his dragon wanted her so badly, but he strode out of the hall as fast as his legs would carry him. Katerina gripped my elbow and whispered into my ear, Who was that? I gave her a reassuring smile. My brother-in-law. I'll explain later. I had a wedding to get through first. Dimitri's face was crestfallen as he watched his brother go. I put a hand on his arm, gently drawing his attention back to me. Do you want to go after him? I whispered. Shall I proceed? The minister asked in a low voice, leaning forwards. Dimitri hesitated. It's okay. He caught my eye and took my hand, lacing our fingers together. Once upon a time it was just us, Lucian and I. But it looks like he's not going to be alone any longer. And neither am I. He squeezed my fingers. My chest filled with warmth as I looked into the eyes of the man I loved. Dimitri was right. Our families went beyond blood now. I would always love my sisters, and Dimitri would always love Lucian, but we had our own life to build now. Together. The trauma in our pasts had made it hard for us to trust each other, but we were beyond that now. I wasn't interested in the past any longer. It was time to look to the future. Hand in hand, we turned to the minister, ready to exchange our vows. Chapter One Lucian I staggered out of the hall, away from my brother's wedding and the woman he'd taken as his bride. His fated mate. Sarah and Dimitri had been perfect together from the very start. From the moment they met, I'd been able to sense the intensity of the feelings Dimitri had for her. Desperately, I'd hoped it would be the same for me and my mate. Marianne had said it would be, but that wasn't the case. 
I'd felt nothing except sympathy for Nadia when we found her injured and unconscious. When she woke up, there had been none of the intense feelings I'd been promised. No passion. No quivering desire. No dragon rearing his possessive head. The lack of those feelings had sent me into a rage unlike any other. I'd felt so hurt and betrayed. So disappointed. But I'd gotten through it and hoped to one day find my own mate. Perhaps a servant in the castle or one of the women in town. But no, today I'd met my own fated mate. It was another human woman. Just like my brother and my dragon was bursting to be free. I erupted through the door of the grand ballroom, my gut tightening to the point of having to run bent over. Hold it together, I muttered to myself, not sure that I could. Running for the entrance of the castle, I passed through the foyer that had only recently been patched up. Dimitri and I had done enormous damage to the once grand coloured glass windows when I'd flown into a rage over Nadia not being my mate. Not my finest hour. Nor my dragons. I burst through the front doors, feeling the cold blast of our icy winter breeze on my face. Reveling in the sensation of the crisp chill, I deeply breathed in the air. Calm down. Calm down. My dragon was furious at me for running away, snarling and snapping inside my mind. He wanted to go back and find his mate, but I couldn't. I was teetering on the verge of being out of control, and if I returned to the wedding party, I'd destroy everything in sight. There was no hope of containing my dragon any longer. He needed to be free. My dragon rose up inside of me as I stripped off my suit jacket and threw it on the ground. Wings sprouted from my back, and my skin transformed into the leathery scales of my shifter form. I closed my eyes and let my mind go as mist swirled up around me, and I became my dragon. When I opened my eyes, the world around me looked different. But the feelings inside of me weren't. My mate was here, and Marianne had been right after all. My fated mate was human and a sister to Sarah. But it hadn't been her tiny younger sister Nadia, as we'd all thought. Instead, my mate was her older sister. The gorgeous, generously curvy Katerina, with dark curly hair and a sexy smile that made my skin catch fire. Not to mention her ass. Oh my God. My cock ached just thinking about her curves. I leaped into the air, beating my wings against the sky. Everything that I'd been told about fated mates was true. My dragon was uncontrollable in his need, my human side having no chance of dominance. My heart was thudding against my chest with the power of a steaming locomotive. Lust poured through me, all for a stranger. A woman who would never understand my world or our customs. I'd never been good enough for my father to accept, nor any woman I'd known in the past. Why would this gorgeous human want me now? Memories of my anger and hurt from past traumas poured through me like molten lava, eating away at any hope I had for my future. None of this made any sense to me, and in my growing fury I couldn't see a way around the problem except to gain altitude and fly away. I soared higher and higher, until I couldn't move my wings any longer. Until I was afraid I might fall from the sky if I didn't stop ascending. Soaring back down to a lower altitude, I continued until I was far away from my half-brother's kingdom. Until sunshine heated my wings in place of winter chill, and my skin ached from the rapid change in temperature. There was another kingdom ahead of me, with a huge castle perched high above the surrounding lands and villages. I could only hope it was Stavrok and Lucy's castle. I'd never been to visit them in their home, but had met the royal couple when they'd visited Damon and Cass. I glanced back the way I'd come, weak now from hunger and fatigue. I'd never make it back. 
not tonight, not without a rest. I used the last of my strength to fly down and land on a high balcony attached to the castle, and there I collapsed against a railing. I let my dragon go and shifted back to human, my chest heaving with the strain and my legs trembling in their attempts to hold me up. An older male servant hurried out onto the balcony to greet me, his gaze narrowing as my human body replaced my dragon. Let me get you a robe, sir, he said, with a polite incline of his head, then stepped inside once more. I sighed with relief at the confirmation I was in the right place. That was definitely a royal servant, so this had to be Stavrok's palace. None of the servants in the Winter Palace treated a stranger so well. The man returned with a warm robe that I slipped on gratefully. Thank you. Then he handed me a glass of water, which I downed immediately. The coolness flowed over my aching throat, soothing it, making me moan with gratitude. Can I help you, sir? he inquired. Are you here to see King Stavrok? I nodded, though it wasn't entirely true. I'd ended up here purely by accident. Could you tell Stavrok and Lucy that I'm here? My name is Lucian. He'll know who I am. The servant bowed and walked away. I managed to put down the glass of water and tie up the robe, just as an older man dressed in fine clothes stepped out onto the balcony. Lucian, sir! Please follow me. Thank you. I followed the man, who was likely the steward, into the castle, marvelling at the richness of the carpet underfoot and the beautiful paintings that lined the halls. What a difference it made when the king in charge of his kingdom actually looked after his wealth. Unlike my father, who'd been a tyrant king and let his people and his castle fall to ruin. He'd been the worst of men. You're not him, and you're far away from his memories. Let it go. I gazed about Stavrok's castle and briefly indulged myself in the fantasy of what life might have been like if I'd grown up as the bastard son of this king, raised in this home or within the castle's walls. Perhaps then I wouldn't be such a mess. The steward stopped in front of a large wooden door. King Stavrok is waiting for you in here, sir. He's aware of your arrival. Wonderful. Hopefully, he doesn't kick me straight back out again. It wasn't like he knew me well. The man opened the door and held it open for me to head inside. I took a deep breath and moved forward. Part of me had expected an office or a sitting room, but instead, I was staring down the length of a grand dining hall with an impressively long wooden table. At the head of the table sat King Stavrok, food laid out before him and a glass of red wine in hand. When he saw me, he grinned and waved a hand toward the seat across from him. Lucian, take a seat. What brings you here to my humble home? Isn't your brother getting married today? That's the rumour I heard, at least. King Stavrok was a huge man, and even seated, cast an imposing figure. You heard correctly, I mumbled, as I sat down in my robe, feeling more naked than before. The ceremony took place earlier, and I expect the reception is well underway as we speak, in fact. Please, help yourself. Stavrok gestured to the feast before him. I poured myself a glass of wine and picked up a bread roll, my gut still churning with the accumulation of stress. I wasn't very hungry, but I wasn't going to turn down the king's generosity. So, Lucian, tell me why you aren't at the wedding. The king tilted his head to the side, no doubt curious as to why I would leave such a joyous occasion and travel so far away. I wanted to tell him it was none of his business that he could stick his nose elsewhere and leave me be. But I'd shown up at his home unannounced and owed him an explanation. He had a human mate from the other side of the Vale, his wife Lucy, so perhaps he'd offer me some advice. Certainly, my brother Dimitri would have tried to help me. However, I had no intention of burdening him further. 
not on his wedding day of all days. Just seeing me flee the ceremony had probably left him worried enough. I needed a sounding board. My fated mate is at the ceremony. Stavrog's brows rose. I repeat then, why aren't you there? He chuckled. I saw nothing amusing about the situation, but instead of answering immediately, I took a bite of my roll and a sip of the wine. Then another. I hadn't realised how much I needed sustenance. I inhaled deeply to regain some control, then released my breath slowly. I'd just come to terms with the fact that I wasn't going to have a fated mate. That the sorceress, Marianne, had been wrong about my future. After all, she'd been so sure it was Nadia. She's the... The other woman we rescued from that human hellhole. King Stavrok shuddered. I remember. I thought Marianne's vision had been wrong and prepared myself for never finding my true mate. I'd made peace with that. Stavrok grinned at me as though he knew what I was about to say. Marianne hasn't been wrong about our fated mates. Not yet, anyway. She was the reason I found Lucy. Oh, I didn't know that. And I hadn't. So... Marianne had been a royal matchmaker from the beginning. Somehow, that made this story even more credible now. I didn't mean to interrupt, Stavrok said, pouring us both some more wine. Go on. I blew out a breath. Well, it turns out Sarah has another sister, and the moment I saw her, everything fell into place. I wanted her. I still want her and the only thing I could do to keep myself from taking her on the spot or destroying everything around me was to flee. I paused, the shame of my lack of self-control washing over me. I felt like a monster getting lost in that lust. The king's expression softened. You're a better man than me. I kidnapped Lucy from her home. I had no control. My jaw dropped. You. He kidnapped her. He nodded. Yes, literally picked her up and flew her home. I didn't know Stavrok well, but I knew men. And he was serious. Did she forgive you? I couldn't imagine Katerina letting me pick her up and carry her to my bedroom. Stavrok cackled out a laugh. Of course, eventually. But tell me more about your mate. Why don't you believe she'd forgive you for letting your dragon have his head? After all, it's the most natural instinct we have. I reached for some fruit, picking apart the grapes and orange. Katerina might not want me at all. I'm not exactly the easiest to love. A fact that had gotten drilled into me at an early age. I'd spent so much of my young life being told... I wasn't worthy. Why would that change now? What would she see that everyone else missed? The answer was nothing. Once she got to know me, she'd come to the same conclusion. Having her and then losing her might kill me. Stavrok sighed, then motioned for a butler who had been patiently waiting nearby to come closer. A bottle of whiskey, I think. Yes, my king. The butler bowed and left in a hurry. Here's what you're going to do, King Stavrok said. You're going to calm down and get out of this spiral of doom you've placed yourself in. Then you'll remember this woman is your fated mate. She was created specifically for you. Her soul is the other half of yours. She is what will complete you and she is going to love all sides of you, even the ones that are difficult or not really that lovable. How do you? He gave me a sharp look that shut me up. Because we all go through those thoughts, and we all have difficult pieces to love. No one is perfect, Lucian. I pressed my lips together tightly, wanting to argue. Stavrok didn't know me, and he couldn't imagine what my life had been like. 
but I kept my thoughts to myself. He was a king, and I was a bastard son. Even though he was allowing me to sit at his table and drink his wine, we weren't on the same level. The butler returned with a bottle of golden whiskey. Stavrok poured me a glass and placed it right in front of me. Once you've collected yourself and rested a little, go back to the wedding and be with your mate. Show her the depth of your feelings for her. She's human. What if she doesn't understand? They don't feel the pull the same way we do. Or so I'd heard. Stavrok laughed. I guarantee you, she will. It might not be the exact same sensation as she doesn't have the dragon inside of her. Her heart will know, though. It will beat faster when you're around. Her gut will twist whenever you're near. Her body will have the pull of extreme desire, and her heart will war with her head until she gives in. Sound familiar? Yes. So similar. Perhaps humans weren't as strange as I'd originally thought. She is going to love you. He sounded confident. But it will take a lot longer if you keep running from her every time her presence makes you a bit uncomfortable. A bit uncomfortable is an understatement. The moment I'd laid eyes on her, my cock was at full attention, and every part of me had been eager to explore every inch of her curvy figure. No other woman compared. I'd never been set ablaze in such a way before in my life. If I couldn't do something about that discomfort soon, I might explode. Next time, I'll be more prepared, I said, much calmer than I felt. I couldn't guarantee that, but I'd pretend for the moment. If nothing else, it won't be such a big surprise. I need to go and speak to my wife. Shall I leave you with your thoughts? Stavrok asked. No. My thoughts frightened me. All the same, I said, yes. I picked up my glass of whiskey. I'd intruded on his hospitality long enough. I'm always happy to help, Stavrok said in a soft voice. I'm glad you felt enough trust in me to come here. I appreciated him saying that more than I could express. He was treating me as an equal when I was only King Damon's bastard brother. Thank you for your assistance. Despite the fear creeping through me, I knew what I had to do, and I had a plan of action to take. Stavrok left me, and I took the time to finish my whiskey, letting the warmth soothe my inner dragon. My strength began to return, and a new determination stirred within me. A determination to face my fear and seek out my fated mate. Once I was able, I transformed into my dragon and flew back to Damon's castle. It was indeed a long way, though I did not ascend so high this time, and the air was better for breathing. When I arrived, I found a private place to change back into human form. I'd obviously missed the ceremony, and felt terrible for that. But Dimitri would understand I felt sure, as would Sarah. I'd seen it in my brother's eyes just before I fled the castle, and he would explain what had happened to Sarah. Everyone would understand, except for her, my one true mate. By the end of the night, I would make it up to her. I did not want to be the mate who ran away. I gathered all the courage I had and made my way to the hall where the reception was still underway. My heart was pounding like a battering ram, but after my long flights, I had enough control over my dragon to walk into the room without feeling like I was going to shift. My gaze settled on my mate sitting across the room, and a piece of me I thought long dead sprang to life once more. Chapter 2 Katerina Even though we were in a castle, my sister's wedding was small and simple, which was fitting for her. The fact that she was marrying a guy she'd just met wasn't very typical, but I tried not to judge her too harshly for that. It was easy to understand her falling in love so quickly, especially considering her new husband was one of the men who'd rescued her and Nadia from hell. 
I wouldn't be following that path any time soon, of course. Love at first sight just wasn't my style. But I was glad at least one of us was getting an epic whirlwind romance worthy of a romance novel. As long as he loved her and took good care of her, he'd stay off my shit list. I'd give this Dimitri guy the benefit of the doubt, especially when I saw the way they looked at each other. Dimitri. Even his name sounded like something from a fairy tale. I tried to keep my jealousy at bay, not wanting to be bitter. That wasn't right. Instead, I focused on the joy I felt for my sister as she walked down the aisle. She glowed as she gazed into the eyes of her new husband. As Sarah and Dimitri exchanged their vows, a strong yearning tugged at my heart. That part of me that didn't want to be alone anymore. I knew nothing came easy. As a chubby girl, I understood that I had to work a lot harder to stand out in a crowd full of size zero wannabe supermodels. Easy would be a nice change. I gazed through the small crowd of mostly strangers and noted the original best man still missing from the group. I'd caught one glimpse of him earlier and then he'd disappeared. Strange. And even stranger was how much I'd felt his absence. I tried to shake off the feeling and refocus my attention on Sarah. This was her day. Tears were shed as the bride and groom were officially pronounced husband and wife. Up next was the reception, where I fully intended on hiding behind a drink and pretending I belonged. Something about the party guests seemed unique. Not bad, just different, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. Everything about the wedding was different, in fact. Sarah was being married in a picturesque mountain village over which the castle loomed like a medieval dream. I had so many questions, and yet I didn't want to ask, not wanting the magic of the day destroyed. And then, speaking of magic, he walked back into the room. As soon as the best man stepped through the door, it was like a spell had been cast over my body. My legs quivered. Actually quivered. Something I only thought happened in fiction. I clung to my glass of wine, suddenly fearful I wasn't going to be able to stand much longer. My knees got wobbly, and there was a tingle between my legs I hadn't felt in too long to count. I swallowed hard, unable to drag my eyes away from him. My whole body flushed with heat, and I finally looked down to try and get some control back over my physical reaction to his presence. Holy hell! All that from looking at one of the most majestic men to ever walk the earth. The best man. Now I was sad I'd only caught a glance earlier. Clearly, I'd missed out on quite the specimen. Long, dark hair that gracefully fell to his shoulders. And he was so tall. Even from a distance, he towered over everyone and everything. A broad frame, too. Those arms, that chest... I'd kill to have them wrapped around me. I'd kill to wrap parts of me around him too, for that matter. He was imposing enough I wouldn't feel like I was squishing a bug. A gentle hand on my arm startled me out of my trance. My sister, the happy bride, smiled at me. Let's go say hi, Sarah said, nodding her head toward tall, dark and dangerous. More heat flushed through me, this time primarily in my cheeks. What? To him? Why? He's my husband's brother, and family should meet family, right? She winked suddenly. Besides, I think you two would hit it off. Smashingly well, I hope. I cleared my throat. Good point. Sarah slipped her arm in the crook of my elbow, and we walked across the room together. Each step toward him was like floating on a cloud. No way was my sister about to introduce me to the most gorgeous guy on the planet. No way. Then, the next thing I knew, I was standing in front of him and gazing up into his deep, soulful, dark eyes. Hot damn. Lucian, Sarah said and gestured between us. 
This is my other sister, Katerina. He gazed down at me with such intensity, I lost my footing and stumbled just a tiny bit. Toward him, I should add, much to my embarrassment. Lucian caught me before I face-planted into his rock-hard abs. I didn't know they were rock-hard for sure, but based on what I'd seen, it was easy to assume. His whole body was probably chiselled from stone. Heels, I said, struggling to find an excuse for my clumsiness. They're big, long, tall. Oh God, I was mortified, because immediately my mind went to other things that were big, long and tall. In my four-inch heels, I barely made it to his shoulder. He was just so tall in comparison, and I was all for it. But I doubted a guy like that would be into a woman like me. You should be careful with those, he said, his voice a low rumble that caused my insides to churn with desire. I laughed, awkward and too loud. Just need more practice with this pair. I bought them for the wedding. The conversation was tanking fast. Anyway, it was really nice to meet you. I turned back toward my sister and shot her a warning look that suggested she better not stop me from leaving. Cat, Sarah insisted, clearly not caring or not catching what I was trying to communicate. I walked past her, and she turned her attention to Lucian. We'll be right back. I found an empty table to sit at. The music for the dancing had started, and the loud thumping of the bass was a nice distraction from my thoughts, but also made it impossible to think clearly. No, if I were being honest, Lucian made it impossible to think. Simply having him in the same room turned my brain into a pile of glittery, hopeful mush. Story of my life, I see an attractive guy and let lust cloud my logic, which always resulted in heartbreak. What is wrong with you? Sarah gasped out, standing over me with her hands on her hips. Katerina, you bolted before you even got a chance to actually talk. Clearly, the conversation wasn't too riveting, I snapped, pressing the palm of my hand to my forehead. My shoes, of all things. I had to talk about those. He's going to think I'm some kind of shallow ditz. No, he's not. No, who's not? Our other sister, Nadia, asked, joining us at the table. What did I miss? I groaned. My humiliation with tall, dark and dangerous. Lucian, Nadia asked, looking over at him. We all did and I noticed he was staring intently back at me. He wore a deep frown that seemed almost concerned. For me? I gave him a small wave, and that brought a smile to his face. It was such a beautiful sight to behold that I had a difficult time looking away. Yes, I said at last. Lucian. Sarah thought I should meet him, since he's our new brother-in-law's brother or whatever. Then I lost my footing and almost fell into him, and it spiralled from there. It did not, Sarah insisted. It was not that bad. She didn't understand. At all. For someone like her, it'd be cute. For me. I shook my head. I'll talk to him later when I'm not so. I made a vague gesture around me, hoping that explained everything. No such luck. Nadia reached out and grabbed my hand. I'm with Sarah on this one. Go and say hello to him. Talk. Dance. Oh yes, dancing. That's a great idea. Sarah pulled on my arm to try and get me out of my seat. Then you'll be a little more relaxed. Small talk is always hard to get past, so maybe just skip it. I don't think Lucian is into that anyway. Why were they being so pushy? I looked back toward him, and he gave me a small wave, his eyebrows raised in an inviting fashion. Is there something I don't know that you're not telling me? No, they both said at once, making it even more suspicious. 
After a brief moment of silence and one shared glance, Sarah spoke. Dimitri seemed to think you and Lucian would hit it off well, and I agree. In fact, I heard he's nervous to talk to you. Seriously? I didn't buy it. A guy like that wouldn't get nervous. She nodded. He's not exactly a people person. Kind of rough around the edges. I know you haven't had a lot of luck with guys, but I wouldn't suggest you two talk if I thought it was a bad idea. I feel really good about it too, Nadia added. Neither of us would lie to you or set you up for failure. They'd conspired against me. I couldn't believe it. That being said, Lucian was, wow. And I did trust them. They'd never let me down before. I just wish the setup didn't have to seem so desperate. Guys never found that attractive. But if he truly wanted to talk to me, then maybe I'd judged him too quickly. All right, I'll ask him to dance, I said. For the moment I had my nerve, and I wouldn't let my head talk me out of it. Sarah grinned, and Nadia clapped. I took a few steps forward, and Lucian's eyes seemed to light up. He moved toward me, meeting me halfway in front of the buffet table where the night's feast was spread. You seem to have practiced walking, he teased. I shook the joke off, my legs going weak again. I wouldn't stumble any more. I would show him how confident and sexy I could be. What can I say? I'm a fast learner. I paused. Would you like to? I was just about to get something to eat, he said. I took a long journey unexpectedly, and it'd be nice to replenish that spent energy. Oh. So much for my sisters steering me in the right direction. And I'd like you to join me, he added. Because after. After? I asked, gazing up into his eyes. Immediately, I was lost. He smirked. After, I'm sure I'll have plenty of energy. Doubt tried to creep into my head. This guy was way too hot for me. But I shoved it aside. Trust. I knew I had to trust my instincts about him. I couldn't say how I was so certain of that fact, but it felt right. I'd never get anywhere if I always played it safe. Sounds perfect. I'm pretty hungry too, to be honest. He walked me to the table, and we loaded up our plates. I followed my instinct there too, not going crazy, but not sticking to only the veggies from the salad tray either. The way my heart was continuing to race in his presence, he wasn't the only one who had to stock up on energy. Soon, we sat down at a table together and tucked into our plates. You went on a journey, I said. Everything okay? I saw you missed the ceremony. His gaze never left me, instead wandering over my body more than once. Everything is perfect. Now, I mean. It was a personal problem that needed attending to. Sounds like you found the resolution to your problem then, I said. I'm glad. I noticed you were missing. You did. He seemed surprised. I nodded. I only saw you for a second, but I put two and two together when you rushed out. Something was up. You're observant, he said. And kind-hearted. I felt the heat return to my face. When I want to be. May I always inspire you to keep being so, he murmured. He cleared his throat. Are you enjoying your time in my half-brother's castle? How could I not? It's a castle. I cleared my plate a lot faster than was probably ladylike, but Lucian seemed to be on pace right along with me. Almost like we both wanted to finish our food and get to whatever came next. Ready to dance? I asked. Feel replenished? Very much so. He offered his hand to me, and the second our fingers touched, an electric shock ran through my body. I heard a sharp intake of breath from him, 
and then his arm slid around my waist, and he led me through a waltz as a slow song conveniently started playing. My hips and chest pressed against his. God, I had no resistance in me when it came to this man. Confession, I said softly, just barely loud enough for him to hear over the music. These aren't actually new shoes. You just have a way of making me forget how to function. He leaned his mouth to my ear. I'm relieved. I was worried I'd scared you off, or that you thought I was disgusting. No woman in her right mind would think you're disgusting. I giggled at the preposterous thought. You'd be surprised. He pressed his cheek against mine. But I don't care what other women think. You're the only one whose opinion matters. My heart began to beat even faster, and my whole body grew hot. You're still talking about me, right? I'm not being punked, am I? I don't know what that means, but yes, this is a two-person conversation. No one else is around. It's only us. He took in a heavy breath. I'd love to kiss you. Would that put your mind at ease? It certainly wouldn't hurt, I managed. He wants to kiss me. Someone pinch me, because I have to be dreaming. Then his lips were against mine, firm and sweet, in a kiss that started out chaste and pure, but quickly morphed into more. I opened my mouth and teased his tongue with mine. It was only a small taste of what I wanted to give him. Passion pulsed through me, hot and insistent. I had to have him. Logic be damned. I have a room, he said, his voice rough with need. I nodded, growing wet just thinking about being in private with him. Lead the way. He took me by the hand and led me from the grand ballroom. I glanced around to see if my sisters were still watching, wondering what they'd think if they caught me. Sarah was too busy with her new husband, and Nadia was nowhere nearby. I shook my head. They'd lose their minds once I told them. A one-night stand was the last thing anyone expected from me. I'd always been into feeling secure with a commitment before taking things to such a level of intimacy. But Lucian felt different. I might never get a chance with such a god of a man again. Seriously, it wasn't every day someone so incredibly sexy wanted me. If I declined his invitation, I knew I'd regret it. He led me up the stairs, stopping halfway up to push me against the wall and claim another kiss. I was more than happy to oblige him. His lips were warm, his arms were strong. Tingles flooded my body. We couldn't get to his bedroom fast enough as far as I was concerned. We hit a landing and started running down the hallway. I picked up the hem of my dress so I wouldn't trip on it and laughed at his enthusiasm. We stopped outside a room, he opened the door, then tugged me inside. As soon as the door was closed, I pushed off his suit jacket. His hands moved to slide the straps of my dress down, and in seconds he had the zipper at the back moving as well. This guy was an expert at undressing women, that was for sure. I ripped open his button-down shirt, buttons popping off and rolling onto the floor. Underneath that fabric was a body made for a billboard. His abdomen was so defined it could have been made of stone. It had to be. There was no way a human man could be so chiselled and rock hard. And that wasn't the only thing rock hard. Chapter 4 Lucian I slept long and deep, possibly the most satisfying sleep I'd ever had in my life. Never before had I felt so content, so at peace. For the first time ever, all the missing pieces in my heart seemed to be there, whole and complete. All of it felt like a dream, too surreal to be true. And I would have doubted the whole night had occurred until I rolled over and Katerina's luscious, warm body pressed into mine. 
I didn't want to let her out of my sight for fear she might disappear. She could have snuck away in the middle of the night, but chose to stay. That had to mean something. Gazing down at her beautiful face, and with her dark curls lying across my pillow, my inner dragon stirred. Once I'd returned to the wedding for the reception, I had somehow found the strength to stay in control of the beast lurking within. Stay calm. Soon enough. I'd kept the dragon quiet so Katerina wouldn't see that side of me too soon. When Nadia had witnessed me transform, she'd run away and taken Sarah with her. We'd almost lost both of them that night. Humans weren't used to seeing any sort of magic, let alone mythical creatures. In her world, I was nothing more than a myth. And a monster. Upon waking and seeing her still there in my bed, I relaxed, letting my guard down. Katerina shifted in her sleep, her lush body moving closer to mine, as if by instinct. The fresh touch of her skin against mine ignited a fire in my soul. It's her. She's the one. The other half. I'm complete. My stomach churned with the immediate change within my body. I tensed and recited calming words inside my head. Stay in control. Stay calm. It's okay to be excited, but I have to be careful. I don't want to scare her away. I squeezed my eyes shut, trying to focus on the war raging inside my mind as two sides of me fought for dominance. We're bonded now. We're one now. My dragon's celebration grew as Katerina's eyes opened and her gaze landed on my naked chest. Morning, she said, and an adorable blush spread across her cheeks. Morning, I murmured back, pushing a lock of hair away from her eyes. How did you sleep? Wonderfully. She let out a blissful-sounding sigh. I'll be honest. I don't do this kind of thing. Like, ever. I gazed down at her curiously, unsure how to interpret her statement. Do what kind of thing, exactly? Fall into bed with someone I just met. Her voice got awfully quiet. Totally worth every second. A grin spread across my face. Definitely worth the leap of faith on my part as well. If only she knew how much of a leap it was on my end. My dragon stirred at the memory of becoming one. How much that alone meant. Calm down. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stay all night, she said. But I was so tired and so content. I frowned. Why would you leave? Isn't that how these things work? She asked. These things. Did she mean a one-night stand? I wasn't intending for this to be the only time we... Her beautiful eyes grew wide, though I couldn't tell if it was excitement or surprise that coloured her expression. No? No. That's a relief, because I was kind of hoping for seconds this morning. Or is that selfish and forward of me to presume? She placed a hand on my upper thigh and, at the feel of her exploring fingertips, that's when I lost all control. I groaned as my body started to respond to my shifter's elation. Excuse me, I... I rolled out of the bed and staggered toward the door. I had to leave the room before I shifted in front of her. When she saw my dragon for the first time, I wanted it to be after I'd explained more about the world she was now going to be a part of. Throwing her straight into the thick of it without any pre-warning would be far too overwhelming. My dragon had other plans, though. Lucian, are you okay? She sat up in bed, holding the sheets up to cover her chest. Maybe I should leave. We can talk later, or if this is your way of kicking me out so that my feelings aren't hurt. No. My voice came out in a growl. I want you to stay. I want to talk. I want a whole life with you. That's what I wanted to say. 
but I couldn't get the damn words past my shifting throat. Just a few minutes. I reached the door, but before I could stagger through it, the change began to happen. Fuck. I fought it hard but lost. My body grew bigger, my eyesight shifted, and wings unfurled from my back. In moments, I was in my dragon form. He demanded a celebration for finding our mate, and I'd fought him back for too long. I beat my wings to stabilize myself before setting my clawed feet on the ground. Oh no. Please, Katerina, don't freak out. My dragon form took up the space between the bed and the door. Luckily, there was more than enough room, as all the rooms in the castle were designed with our transformation in mind. I turned to look at my mate, horror curling around my mind. What was she going to say? Katerina sat on the bed, frozen. Her jaw slowly dropped, and her eyes grew wide. Oh, wow! If that was her whole reaction, then perhaps things wouldn't be so bad after all. But it seemed she was in shock, and the initial effect wore off more rapidly than I thought it would. Suddenly, she let out a blood-curdling scream. I automatically roared in response, the pitch of her voice piercing my ears. Not my finest moment. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! She covered her ears, squeezed her eyes shut, and threw the blankets over her head. Don't eat me! I am not food! Oh my god! I needed to speak to her, and there was only one way. I gathered all of my strength and forced my shifter back inside. Slowly, too slowly, I became a man once more. Katerina, no, I'm not going to. A small squeak escaped her lips as she sat bolt upright again and pulled the sheets down once more. Her face was bright red and flustered. You talk? Are you a demon? You have to be some kind of unholy monster from hell to talk. To change shape. You were just a man and then a dragon. Oh my God. She started to breathe heavy and fast. Katerina, I'm still Lucian. I'm a... No, stop. I'm not going to fall for it. I've seen this movie. A million times. It never ends well. She whimpered. Oh God, please tell me this is all a dream. None of this is real. All a dream. All a dream. My heart felt as if it broke in half. Pain tore through my chest as the intensity of her fear amplified. Of course she was frightened. Why wouldn't she be? To her, I was a predator searching for its next meal. The question was, should I run? Yes. In fact, the further I distanced myself from her, the better. She sounded on the verge of hyperventilation, and someone else in the castle must have heard the scream and my roar. They might even be on their way already. I'd distressed her, my presence terrifying her. One of her sisters could provide her with the care and comfort she'd need, and I would be far away, unable to cause her more harm. Yes, that was definitely the best course of action. Then she wouldn't be able to watch me fall apart from her rejection. She didn't even try to listen. I let my dragon loose, allowing him to fly up into my body once more, the panic within my heart settling as my beast took over. I flew out the nearest window, glass crashing to the ground as I took to the sky. I'd already caused plenty of damage to Damon's castle fighting with Dimitri. What was one more window? The wind kissed my scales, and I barreled toward the forest, toward home. Not the castle that Damon insisted was now my home, but my true one. The one in exile. That's where I belonged, in the land of banishment where my asshole father had put me. Why did I think I could ever leave? Why did I think I could make a home in the castle and have a happily ever after? 
I didn't deserve anything like that. How could I have been so stupid? I wanted to rip the world apart. To destroy the trees, the buildings, whatever got in my way. Wanted to, but didn't. Enough of my humanity remained to remind my dragon that setting the world ablaze would do more damage than good. A mournful cry left my lungs as I soared into the clouds. There, I could wallow in my misery as much as I wanted. She was supposed to understand. Her heart was supposed to respond to mine and give her the compassion and grace to accept the dragon inside me. It hadn't probably because I wasn't worthy of her love. At least I'd had one night with her. I'd rewind and replay the night over and over again for the rest of my life. The cool air calmed me some. I felt more human than dragon again. I almost turned back toward the castle so I could transform once more and try to comfort her now that my rational and more logical side had returned. Perhaps we could talk. She might still listen. Then I remembered the large, terrified eyes staring up at me, pleading with me not to eat her. The way she'd nearly gone into shock. Leaving her alone was still the best option. She didn't need my presence complicating things further. One of her sisters might have more success at getting her to understand, then maybe I could take over from there. I just had to wait things out steer clear so I couldn't cause her any more pain or angst. I found the small shack I'd called home through my formative years and landed in the small clearing near the front stoop. There, I changed back into a human and made my way inside. It'll be fine, I said to myself as I walked into the kitchen to splash some water onto my face. I groaned. Who am I kidding? It's not going to be fine. She hates me. My fated mate hates me and thinks I'm a monster. It had been all over her face. Not just fear, but loathing as well. She'd called me a demon. That was how she made sense of my shifting ability, jumping to the worst possible conclusion. Maybe she was right. A monster's blood did course through my veins. My father had been a terrible creature. He'd banished Dimitri and me when we were children, leaving us for dead. He'd preyed on the people who relied on him for their survival. Everything he did was for his own selfish gain, no matter the cost or who got hurt along the way. As much as I wanted to be a better man, as much as my brother told me I could be one, I wasn't a fool. I was doomed to repeat my father's mistakes. There's a reason the phrase, like father, like son, exists. Perhaps Dimitri lucked out and most of his nature came from our mother. I clearly hadn't, though. I'd seen parts of my father in my soul in the past. The fact I couldn't control my dragon as easily as others could was another sign. I desperately wanted to not be like him. But I was his flesh and blood, and it showed. If I didn't mate, then I couldn't have my own children, and that meant I wouldn't keep the cycle of his insanity going. Katerina deserved someone who was able to love her to the fullest and provide the best future possible. I wasn't capable of either of those things. I wasn't worthy to even try. Failing her would kill me far faster than her rejection. No, I would spend the rest of my days alone living on the memory of our one beautiful night together. At least one of us might then have a chance at happiness. Chapter 5 Katerina Oh my God! Oh my God! Did I just see what I thought I saw? One moment, Lucian was his tall, handsome, sexy self, staggering around the room naked like he had a stomach ache. The next, his skin melted into scales, and his long limbs became wings growing from his body. He turned into some kind of dragon right in front of my eyes. I said demon, 
but a dragon felt a lot more accurate somehow. How was that even possible? There was no way dragons could be real. They belonged in fairy tales and movies, not real life. I didn't wait for anyone to come to me. I threw on my dress and underwear from the night before and ran from the room with my shoes in hand. Not the leisurely post-sex morning walk I'd planned on taking, that was for sure. I'd been hoping for a more subtle approach to leaving Lucian's room. One that didn't scream, the bridesmaid just fucked the best man, cliché, to the whole damn castle. Instead, I'd screamed my lungs out and probably woke everyone up. There was a definite lack of commotion in response, which to me seemed odd. A scream and an inhuman roar should have had everyone scrambling to help. At the very least, spark an investigative curiosity. I didn't run into a single soul until I was halfway down the grand stairway and met my youngest sister coming up toward me. I must have looked half crazy because Nadia suddenly picked up her pace and ran to me. Cat! She flung her arms around me. Are you okay? I thought I heard you scream, but wasn't sure you needed help. Why would you think... Oh. She'd thought I was screaming as part of my lovemaking with Lucian. Took you long enough, I said, breathing heavily. Nadia squeezed me harder. I was on the other side of the castle eating breakfast. It's kind of a huge place, if you hadn't noticed. Are you okay? I'm not hurt, I said. Not physically anyway, I figured. Just my pride. Tears pooled in my eyes. I'm not okay, though. She urged me to sit down on the steps. What happened? That was when Sarah arrived. She stood at the top of the stairs with her new husband beside her, took one look at me, and her shoulders sank. Oh, cat. I gazed up at her and shook my head. Go back to your honeymoon. I could see from her dishevelled hair and swollen lips that I'd interrupted something. Dimitri will understand. She gave him a pointed look. He nodded and whispered something into her ear before disappearing back along the hallway. Sarah walked down the stairs and sat on my other side. Both of my sisters held me close and I felt comforted and slightly less disconnected in their presence. Tell us everything. I took your advice and danced with Lucian, I said. That seemed the easiest place to start. Maybe if I put it all together from the beginning, it might make more sense to me as well. Everything about coming to the castle felt like a dream. We hit it off, like you said we would. That's wonderful. Sarah's eyes grew wide with excitement. I bit my lip and shifted uncomfortably. We hit it off really well, and I stayed the night in his room. Ooh la la, Nadia teased. I shot her a glare. Our morning started great. We woke up and were kind of canoodling in bed. Then he started acting funny, like he was sick. I thought maybe he was faking it so he could get rid of me. That he'd gotten what he wanted from me and everything else had just been a line. I want you to stay. I want to talk. I want... What had been that third thing he wanted but never got to say? His eyes had been so sincere, his words so pure. It wasn't a line, Sarah said. Cat, he... I'm not finished, I said stiffly. So, he's pacing madly around the room, trying to get me to understand he's honestly not well. Just as I'm about to believe him, he... he... The memory of his transformation and the way he'd spoken to me in that rough growl sent a shiver down my spine. You're not going to believe this, but he turned into a monster. A dragon, Nadia said. Right, it looked like a... I frowned. Wait a second, you knew! She pressed her lips together tightly, her eyes avoiding mine. We met before the wedding, and he might have done the same thing in front of me, too. 
she hurriedly added. Not after having sex with him. I never touched him, I promise. But he has a tendency to get overly emotional and then... Changes into a dragon, Sarah finished. Lucian is passionate, and he's passionate about you, Cat. I held up my hands. You both knew? Yes, they said together, both quiet after. I took in a slow breath, trying to keep my rage at bay. Why didn't you tell me all of this before I met him? Before we... we... had the most incredible sex of my life. Oh, goodness. I'd never been loved so thoroughly. That one detail changes so much. Would you have believed us? Sarah asked. I certainly didn't believe it until I saw it with my own eyes. Nadia nodded slowly. It's a lot to take in. I had the same reaction you did, Katerina. I ran away. We both did, because it was almost too much to handle, Sarah continued. But then I saw the softer side. The man behind the beast. Lucian is still in there. You have to look past the scales and the rough exterior, and then you'll realise nothing about him has actually changed. That's what I did with Dimitri. He's one of those things too, I gasped. Of course he was. They were brothers, so why not? How many of these dragons are there? A few, Nadia said. This town is their home. It's in another realm. Again, I know this is a lot to take in. Another fucking realm? She had to be joking. So I'm not even on Earth anymore. I'm not in some fancy small European country. I'm in another, what, dimension? Nadia winced. Kind of. There's a magical veil we cross over to get here that separates the world we know from theirs. There are other shifters and witches and... This is impossible! I shook my head and slowly got to my feet. This is insane! But it's true. Sarah put a hand on my arm and urged me to sit with her again. And you know it's true because your heart just knows that it is. We wouldn't lie to you. We didn't lie about Lucian either. He's special and thinks the world of you. You're... She looked down and shook her head as if she wanted to say more but wasn't sure if she should. I'm what, Sarah? I pressed, using my firmest voice. You're his fated mate, she whispered. That's part of why he's losing so much control whenever he's with you. The two of you are meant to be together as one. That was the icing on the cake for me. Fated mate? Like a soul mate? Yes, exactly like that, Sarah exclaimed. He left the ceremony because he saw you for the first time and just the sight of you pulled at his inner dragon. If he hadn't left, he'd have made a huge scene in front of everyone. While the servants in the castle and his family understand, I think it would have been way more than you could have handled at that point in time. You think? I didn't know how to process all this information. It sounded so surreal. The last time he had an emotional explosion like that, he nearly destroyed a whole wing of the castle, Nadia added. That was when he was told I was his fated mate, then realised I wasn't. I glared at her, all of a sudden feeling possessive of Lucian. What do you mean? He was told you were his. A witch told him that one of my sisters belonged to him, Sarah said gently. He didn't realise I had more than one, so when he met Nadia and the mating call didn't pull at him like it should have, he got upset. She gave my arm a squeeze. And then he saw you and freaked out even more because he saw his true love did exist after all. True love? He barely knows me. I certainly didn't know anything about him beyond the fact that he was tall, dreamy, amazing in bed a little rough around the edges, and, apparently, a dragon. 
We'd clicked right away, yes. Our chemistry was incredible. He'd certainly made love to me like he meant it. I just struggled with the fact that he actually did mean it. Guys who looked like Lucian didn't date chubby girls like me. We were fun for a little while, but not the kind of woman most guys wanted hanging on their arm in public, let alone be married to. Sure, our sparkling personalities were hard to match, but there were smart, funny, skinny women out there. How could a woman who looked like me be the soulmate of a guy who might as well have been a god? I didn't believe it. This is ridiculous, I said, shaking my head. You're both full of it. Cat, Nadia huffed. You're the one being ridiculous here. I get the dragon part is a stretch, but you've seen the shifting with your own eyes. You've experienced some of the magic when you crossed over the veil to get here. Haven't you noticed how different this place is from home? Yes, I admitted. This place was vastly different from home. But there is no way I'm the soulmate of Lucian. There's just no way. Whoever told him that was seriously wrong. I stood, and this time neither of my sisters stopped me. Maybe she had it wrong and it really is you, Nadia. Trust me, it's not, Nadia said. I feel absolutely nothing for him. It does go both ways. We might be human, but we also have hearts capable of discerning the truth. Don't you feel it? Deep inside of you? Yes. I felt it. My heart ached for him in a whole new sort of way. I'd never felt anything like it, and that was saying quite a bit, since I had the tendency to fall for the wrong guy all the time. One look, one kind word, and hope ignited within me. Fluffy, cute hope. Lucian did something else to me completely. I didn't merely hope for him. I craved him like a drug. I needed him to survive. We might have been in the beginning stages of getting to know one another, but I knew for certain the places we would be going together were amazing. I didn't dare admit any of those thoughts to my sisters. Instead, I said nothing. They claimed to not lie to me, so I would give them that same courtesy. I'm going home, I somehow managed to get out. In truth, I wanted to break down into deep sobs. And then I wanted Lucian's arms wrapped around me. God, too many emotions had been stirred within me. Lucian was a dragon, for goodness sake. In retrospect, he'd been a beautiful creature to behold, even in such a terrifying form. Magical and terrifying, but beautiful. However, his lack of control scared me. So much raw passion inside of one man could easily lead to my heart snapping in two. Who was I kidding? It already had. I'd bounced from the high of a one-night stand to the hope of starting a relationship with a guy who had fangs and claws and scales to being told he was my soulmate. My one true love. That last one hurt the most. If they were wrong, I'd never bounce back from that level of hurt. Do you need help with your stuff? Nadia asked. No. I want to be alone, I said, and began to walk away, then stopped at the top of the stairs. How can I get back, anyway? You said I'm in another realm. I couldn't believe I was actually saying that out loud and meaning it. Sarah let out a heavy sigh. I'll talk to someone about giving you a ride home. Thanks. I paused. Not just for that, but for not arguing with me about this decision. And for telling me everything. It's not your fault this is difficult. I won't shoot the messengers. Keep an open mind. That's the last thing I'll say about it. Sarah toyed with the gold ring now on her left hand. I don't want you to shut yourself off from something amazing because you're scared. Or uncomfortable. Uncomfortable was an understatement. I didn't want to get into all of that with her. 
for the time being, I'd do as she asked. Thinking about the possibilities stung, but I could leave the door open a crack. I guess. Only because I wanted more of that warmth from last night. No. This is dangerous. Okay, I said. That was me not committing to, nor rejecting, her proposal. I returned to the room that I'd been assigned upon my arrival, the one I'd barely spent any time in. The garment bag for my dress still lay across the bed, my duffel bag with all of my normal clothes next to it. I shut the door, changed into a pair of leggings and a t-shirt, returned my dress to its proper place, then walked back out of the room with all my stuff in tow. We can return that for you, Nadia offered. I gratefully put my bag in her hands. Thanks. A man stepped forward. I'm Damon, the owner of this castle, and Lucian's half-brother. I'm sorry to hear that you want to depart so soon. However, I'm happy to give you a lift back. This was the king. He looked so normal. Thank you. I appreciate that. Your sisters tell me you're aware of our secret, he continued. You should know that the journey back is best made while on the back of a dragon. I wanted to give you a warning, so it didn't startle you too much. I understand this is all very new to you. I looked him over. He had short blonde hair and gorgeous blue eyes. But he didn't look like a dragon either, just a normal, ordinary guy. Like Lucian had. Yes, this is definitely new, I said at last. You will need a warm jacket for travelling. He waved to a servant, who hurried forward with a long, fur-lined coat. I slid it on, even though I'd already layered up for the cold air outside. It gets very chilly when you're flying, Nadia added. I glanced at her, ready to ask how she knew that, but the answer was clear. My sisters had been hiding things from me. Disappointment hit me, but with all the other emotions buffeting my system at the moment, my sister's actions didn't affect me as badly as they would have in the past. Damon waved for me to follow him outside, and I did, my sisters close behind me. A solid lump started forming in my stomach. He walked a few feet away from the castle before transforming. The process was so smooth and elegant, quite different from the abrupt and chaotic way Lucian had done it in the bedroom. Damon stretched out his wings and neck, and while he was still imposing to behold, I didn't feel anywhere near as afraid. Just a dragon, not a demon, my heart told me. Lucian's the same way. I shook the thought away. How could a normal human woman like me be with a beautiful creature like that? Plus, where exactly was Lucian? For someone who claimed to be my soulmate, he sure had run away in a hurry. One would think he'd want to stay and help me make sense of it all. The sooner I got home and tried to forget all of this, the better. Nadia gave me a hug. I'll come see you soon. Me too, Sarah said. After your honeymoon, I insisted. I'm okay, ladies. I just need to return to something familiar, and then I'll be fine. I understand, Sarah said. When Lucian comes back, we'll be sure to tell him. Sure thing. If he came back. I wasn't going to hold my breath, not with the way he'd been so quick to flee. We were not soulmates. We couldn't be. Dragons might be real, but I didn't want to be a part of their strange and unfamiliar world. I gazed over at Damon and sucked in a deep breath, not wanting to climb on his back, but desperate to return home. I'll let you know once I'm settled in. Damon lowered himself to the ground so I could get on his back. For fuck's sake. I held back a half-hysterical need to laugh. My life was seriously upside down right now. I took a step toward him and climbed up on his shiny hard back like I would a horse, swinging my leg over, then lying down flat. Oh my God. Once I was settled, he raised his body up and flapped his powerful wings. I screamed, 
because I couldn't help it. Hold on, Sarah called out. She didn't have to tell me twice. I grabbed onto what bit of him I could and clung for dear life. As we rose in the air, I closed my eyes tightly. However high up we were going, I didn't need to see it, right? I just had to trust he would get me over, or was it through, the magic veil in one piece. We soared through the atmosphere, and there was a strange tingling against my skin. For a second I opened my eyes and saw a shimmer in the sky, a shift in the very fabric of existence, but before I could focus on it properly, we had passed through. That must have been the veil. Immediately, I noticed a difference in the air. It was normal again. Warmer, too. Damon glided through the air for a few more miles before finding a place to land. Once I slid off his back, I stroked his scales in thanks, still weirded out by the dragon body, but not terrified anymore. A step in the right direction. My brother-in-law was a dragon. I didn't have to be part of their world, but I did need to accept it if I had any hope of maintaining a relationship with Sarah. He shifted back to human for a moment, and I averted my eyes to avoid staring at his nakedness. If I was honest, he did nothing for me. Not like Lucian. From here, will you be able to make your way home? He asked. Yes, thank you, I said. It's not far. I'm going to take a moment to rest and make sure you get a ride back. Then I'll be on my way. Such a gentleman. Lucian had been as well. Had I been too quick to judge him? Maybe. But he'd still left me and stayed away. That was the other thing. He hadn't come back. He'd barely tried, and that spoke volumes to me. I used my phone to call for a ride, glad I had that and my purse on me. It didn't take long for a car to get there. By the time I got back to my house, I was absolutely exhausted. Exhausted and heartbroken. I'd taken a leap of faith last night by letting Lucian charm me into his bed. Once again, it was a misplaced hope. Our two worlds did not belong together. Chapter 6 Lucian I stayed at the small house in the woods for two days. During that time, I did everything in my power to regain control over my emotions. I talked myself into returning to the castle to properly woo my mate, only to talk myself out of it again. Since I was already there, I tried to sort through the lingering baggage from my father. Perhaps I should have turned around and returned within a few hours, but I felt like I owed it to Katerina to sort through the toxic emotions brewing inside me. If I didn't, how could I ever love her the way she deserved to be loved? I was proud of myself for coming back at all. Those dark places in my heart still tried to tell me I should stay away, that I wasn't worthy. Katerina should have cooled off a while ago, and her sisters must have told her everything about our world by now. Once she knew we were fated mates, she'd welcome me back with open arms. Or that was my hope, anyway. I landed within the castle grounds, slightly unnerved by how quiet it was. The wedding festivities were obviously well over. Most of the mess had been cleaned up. I walked into the palace, looking for evidence of my mate. Katerina, I called out. My voice echoed through the halls. Katerina, where are you? A soft clearing of the throat startled me. One of the servants was hiding by the doorframe. She's returned to the human realm. What? My hands clenched into fists and I stormed up the stairs. That's not possible. How did she get back there? She isn't scheduled to leave for another week at least. Hadn't that been the original plan? Sarah's out-of-town family were to stay for a while. It's true, sir. We cleaned up her room today, the servant said from below. I stalked to the room that had belonged to Katerina and found it empty and far too pristine. 
Sadness crushed the hope in my chest. Why did you leave? I spoke to the empty walls. I don't understand. The memory of her calling me a demon crept back into my head. Had she left because she truly believed I was evil? She was supposed to stay so we could talk. Why didn't anyone try to stop her? Everyone knew she was my fated mate, and they all understood how important that was. I'd never have stood back and watched Sarah walk away from Dimitri. Is it because they know I'm not good enough for her? That I'm too broken to be a worthy husband? Were they saving both of us the heartache of disappointment? Could they see how our relationship was destined to crash and burn? I didn't even get to say a proper goodbye. Fuck. I'd screwed up royally. If only I'd managed to control myself, then none of this would have happened. We could have languished in our bliss for a while longer, and then I would have gently brought her into my world, the way I'd planned to, originally. But no, I had to act like an animal. No wonder she'd left. If the situation was reversed, I wouldn't stay either. I sighed and walked toward my room. Anger and hurt still pulsed through me, and I needed to be alone to squash it down before I destroyed even more of the castle. Why did I have to be such an idiot? Somehow, I had to work out how to become resigned to a life of solitude. I accepted Katerina's rejection with a heavy heart and tried to think of ways to fill my time. I could at least make things right for my brothers by fixing all the damage I'd caused to the castle. They'd suffered considerably because of my lack of self-control. Then, once I was done, I'd see to it that I never caused harm again. My initial instincts had been right. I knew too little about love to be able to give it to another. Fated mate or not, if I couldn't behave the way a man should, I'd never succeed. I didn't try to find Nadia or Sarah. I just changed into warmer clothes and began repairs on the damage I'd caused, starting with the stonework. Using my body in a physical way kept me distracted from my feelings at least a little. Laying brick and mortar down gave me a different kind of satisfaction. With each slab I placed came a piece of healing to my soul. I might not forgive myself, but I could earn forgiveness from my brothers. They'd said it was all water under the bridge, but I didn't believe them. I could feel the burden I'd placed on them unnecessarily. A week passed, then two, filled with long days of work. My progress on the castle repairs was steady, and when I wasn't fixing what I'd broken, I dove headfirst into training. I'd always kept myself physically active, but the need to exhaust myself so I couldn't think about her was great indeed. If I could lay my head on the pillow at the end of the day and fall straight to sleep from pure exhaustion, that was a good day. Unfortunately, by that definition, most of my days were bad. No matter how hard I pushed myself, I always had a few thoughts left for Katerina. Memories of her smile, her body, her warmth. My inner dragon yearned for her. I yearned for her, the sweet taste of love I didn't deserve. After too many nights without sleep, tortured by my memories, I began to push myself twice as hard. My brothers checked in on me from time to time. They weren't wrong to do so, since I was battling depression like I never had before. I did a fairly good job of hiding it. Or so I thought. Still sulking, Dimitri asked one morning. I glanced up at him and narrowed my eyes. He was leaning against the doorframe and shook his head when I scowled. Damon and I have a bet going on how long this pity party will continue. He seems to think you'll bounce back any day now. I, on the other hand, know you're stubborn enough to continue in this vein forever. I snorted. It's nice to know my misery is amusing to you both. It's far from amusing, actually he said, and walked toward me. I want to lose this wager, 
so prove me wrong, brother. Snap out of this funk and return to the human realm so you can win Katarina back. She left me, I snapped. And she had every reason to. I lost myself in my dragon. I frightened her, just like I did with Nadia. I fucked up, just like I always do. She deserves someone mature. When women say they want a man who would kill for them, they never mean it literally. True. Dimitri nodded, considering my words. That being said, I don't think you give yourself enough credit. I shrugged. My brother was biased. He was the only person in this world who truly loved me. She still left. You rushed off and never came back. Maybe that had something to do with her leaving. I glared at him. She was about to hyperventilate. She thought I was going to eat her. What was I supposed to do? Let her pass out? You stay and you calm her down. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Running away is the perfect way to make a woman feel unwanted. Right. I fucked up, I growled. And that's why I'm staying away, because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to love her, and I'm going to keep hurting her. I'm just like father. No. He grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me hard. You are not. You are kind and caring. Father would have laughed and tormented her. You left because you were worried for her and stayed away because you're afraid of hurting her more. Believe me, brother, I understand those feelings all too well. But every morning, I dedicate myself to proving I can be different. I think you want to do that too. You came back. Maybe not when you should have, but you did. You returned. I swallowed, looking away, unable to take the weight of his gaze any longer. I didn't mean to wait so long. I couldn't return until I was at peace with myself. Then I got here and unraveled all over again. You didn't decimate the building this time, Dimitri pointed out with a smirk. You're making progress. I let out a sour laugh. There's no way I can win her back. She was so frightened. I know it's a lot to take in, but... Damon flew her back, you know. Damon? My heart lurched at the thought of my mate on the king's back. It should have been me carrying her in that way. She might have been afraid, but she accepted him in dragon form, and she will accept you too if you give her the chance. He exhaled heavily. Lucian, there is so much happiness to be had by embracing the mate bond fully. Stop talking yourself out of the possibility. You do know that you deserve that, right? To be happy. We are not our father. We do not have to pay for his sins. Don't you miss her? With every breath, I whispered. Why keep fighting then? He let out an angry huff. Please, go to her. Talk to her. She'll understand so much more than you think. It's been too long. You're fated to be together. It doesn't matter how long it's been. Don't quit before you've even started. He closed his eyes and our foreheads touched. It'll be okay. Hopefully, he was right. I closed my eyes as well and took in a slow breath. Promise. I swear it. He patted my shoulder and pulled away. I'm sure her sisters will help too. I'd struggled with facing them. Every so often I would see Sarah in the distance and when she looked at me, all I saw was pity. So embarrassing. Nadia avoided me equally as much as I avoided her. Given our history, the last thing I needed was to hear her opinion of my latest blunder. Naturally, Dimitri led me to Nadia rather than his wife. Of course he did. It was as if he knew how little I wanted to see her. I let out a groan. Stop that, 
he hissed, then turned to Nadia. You'll be nice, won't you? She nodded. I won't say anything bad. Promise. She stared up at me. I'm sure you already know how the conversation would go. Imagine your worst and just pretend it was all actually said. How's that? My jaw tightened. That isn't nice, Nadia. I instantly regretted my words. Her eyes flashed, and even though she held her tongue, I understood right away just how much she was holding back. I'm sorry, I mumbled. And yes, I have imagined our conversation, and it was pretty rough. Her mouth lifted in a little smile. I bet it was. Can you help me get to Katerina? Of course. She smiled properly then, tears pooling in her eyes. I want you two to have all the happiness in the world. I let out a sigh of relief. Be honest then, please. Do you think it's too late? No. But we shouldn't make her wait any longer, right? She winked, then frowned. Wait, you're not going to wear that, are you? I looked down at my clothes to see what was wrong with them. I'd been wearing old, ripped jeans and a grey sweatshirt because they were easier to work in. The fact that they were currently covered in dust probably made them not the best choice of clothing, I had to admit. An outfit change isn't necessary, Dimitri said. He'll be shifting anyway. That was true. I'd end up naked on the other side of the veil if I wasn't organised. Fine. Nadia said. I suppose you're right. She'll just be happy he's at her door. Hope ignited within me. Do you think so? I know so. Come on. She grabbed a large cloak from the front door hook and we hurried out of the castle. I was so eager to get going I just about took off without Nadia, but then I remembered I couldn't find Katerina without her sister's help. I needed an address and someone to make sure I didn't change my mind and turn around. Want me to carry your clothes? she asked, rather sensibly. Yes, thank you. I stripped off and folded the clothes, handing her the jeans and shirt before letting go of my humanity and shifting into my dragon. The small seeds of doubt planted so deeply by my father had grown for a long time and they still threatened to rear up. Dimitri is right, though. I am not my father, nor should I be punished for his sins. Just because father never loved me doesn't mean a thing. All it proves is how terrible a person he actually was. Nadia climbed onto my back and we flew into the sky. I took her across the veil and into the human realm, praying the whole way that she was right and that I hadn't left it too late to fix things with Katerina. Chapter 7 Katerina Miss Cat! Miss Cat! One of my students ran over, holding up her latest drawing of... a bear? I think that's what it's supposed to be. I made this for you. It's beautiful, I said, taking the drawing and setting it on my desk. I especially love your use of purple and blue. Did you know those were my two favourite colours? The little girl nodded enthusiastically. I hope you feel better soon. I'm very happy, I said, meaning it in that moment. All my kindergartners made life a million times better for me. I loved them so much. Even when they acted out and frustrated me to tears, I wouldn't have traded them for any other job. There was always something to smile about. OK, the girl said, and shrugged almost like she didn't believe me. Kids had a way of being able to read me better than most adults. They were also far more honest and braver than anyone gave them credit for. I'd never tell her just how much happier her noticing my sadness made me feel. I looked at the clock. All right, class, it's time to start cleaning up so we can get ready to go home. The kids all excitedly tidied up their tables. I couldn't help but share their excitement. 
so much so that I opted to bring all my work back home with me to do there, rather than stay at school for my usual extra two hours after class had been dismissed. I loved my job, but was exhausted at the moment. Ever since my adventure across the Vale, I hadn't felt like myself. My body just wasn't as energetic as it used to be, and I'd wondered, several times, if maybe the magic messed me up somehow. Was that possible? I was an ordinary human after all. I didn't belong over there. What if my molecules had scrambled when I crossed over? Was that why I felt like death warmed over every morning? Like I could never get enough sleep? The exhaustion was more than physical. It was mental, too. My mind kept wandering back to the night of the wedding, the night I'd spent with Lucian. Not just the incredible sex we'd had, but all the subtler ways he'd expressed his desire for me. The intense gaze across the room, the hands catching me as I almost fell, the smile. Oh, the smile. All those memories haunted me like a ghost with unfinished business. Then I'd remember the huge dragon and how scared I'd been when he first shifted. And the fact that he'd left me and hadn't so much as tried to contact me since then. It had been more than two weeks. If we were supposed to be together, then where was he? The whole experience was an emotional roller coaster, and it was just too much to deal with. I drove home early from the school, glad it was Friday and the weekend was around the corner. I'd have a couple of days to regroup and eat a pint of ice cream, or three. Maybe. That was how I normally comforted myself after a difficult week, yet even the thought of my beloved chocolate chip cookie dough left me feeling nauseous. How sad was that? In short, I was a hot mess, and the stress was taking its toll. Even my period was late in protest. That only freaked me out a little. Okay, more than a little, but I was determined to not jump to conclusions until more time had passed. Periods could be late for all kinds of reasons, not just because I'd had unprotected sex with a dragon. I shook the idea out of my head. Nope, not going to doom spiral over a what if. And I hated that I'd let myself get so emotionally crazed over a one-night stand. I went into his room with the intention of just enjoying myself. One night of hot passion and then letting him go because he'd want to be set free. With that expectation, I shouldn't have ended up getting hurt. He just had to be a freaking dragon, didn't he? Fated soulmate business aside, just the fact that he was a shifter blew my mind several times over. I'd grown up not believing in much beyond what I could observe. If I could see it, taste it, touch it and so on, then I knew it was real and true. It would make sense. People shifting into dragons. Actual dragons. That was harder to pull into my sphere of logic. Magic was for fairy tales, and fairy tales weren't real. Well, I'd had that belief blown right out of the water, that's for sure. I'd seen it with my own eyes. I'd heard his roar. Felt the scales on Damon's back as he carried me back here to my own world. My five senses were backing up the truth. Dragons were real. I walked into the house and did the first thing I did every day when I got home from work, checked in on my sick father. Part of the reason I lived away from Nadia and Sarah was so that I could take care of him. As the oldest, that duty fell on my shoulders. Okay, it was also something I chose. My sisters did not need to help shoulder the burden. I handled it fine on my own. How are you feeling today? I texted. He usually was awake at this time. Feeling good which didn't mean much, but we celebrated all those small victories. Love you. I'll be in to visit soon, I promised. I set the phone down, knowing he probably wanted to talk more, but I just couldn't do it. My head and heart weren't in the right space for a full conversation. If I started talking to him, 
he'd know something was wrong. That's why I texted instead of called. He couldn't hear the waver in my voice through a text message. Looking forward to it. Love you too. I stared at those words, feeling guilty. My dad meant the world to me. He'd helped hold me together more times than I could count. I almost changed my mind and called him so we could talk about all my life problems. Almost. Telling him I'd had an intense night of sexual relations with the hottest man alive was probably going to be too much information. Telling him that man was also a dragon might have him questioning my sanity. Pretending everything was okay would result in me spilling my guts. No, I had to wait. We'd catch up later. I sighed, at a loss for what to do. If Nadia and Sarah were home, then maybe I'd call them. Sarah was staying in the other realm, apparently. Nadia wasn't planning on coming back just yet, so I'd have to wait to talk to her, too. We hadn't always been super close, but there was comfort in knowing they were around. Having them not be a phone call away left a strange void in my life. They were a part of Lucian's world now. That magical place with the dragons. Sarah had married one, and Nadia sure seemed attached to castle life, despite not having a dragon of her own. And just like that, my mind was back on Lucian and the night we'd spent together. Lucian was my dragon. I had one to love and call my own. Had being the key word there. Past tense. He might have felt drawn to me initially, but that clearly didn't last. I rummaged through my refrigerator, knowing I should eat something, but not really wanting to. Partly because of the exhaustion and nausea constantly lurking under the surface, and partly because maybe if I was a little more mindful of what I ate, then I could be more attractive. Because I'd be, well, smaller. Stupid train of thought, I know. But I kept going back to one fact. I wasn't a size two. I wasn't even a size six. I was a size sixteen. Full-on curves and rolls. I'd always looked this way. Whatever cute, petite genetics my sisters had gotten from our parents completely bypassed me. Most days, I accepted it. Embraced it, even. When I looked in the mirror, I saw beauty staring back at me. I'd had enough long-term boyfriends to know that I was lovable. But all those boyfriends had eventually moved on to a smaller version of me. Seeing them with their new girlfriends always brought on the doubt. Had I been lied to? And lied to myself? Was I really not worthy of being loved after all? And that's where my head went every time I thought of Lucian. We'd had an amazing time together. I let myself give in to his charms because I'd instantly felt safe and desirable. I didn't just feel beautiful when I looked into his eyes, I felt out of this world gorgeous. Like he only had eyes for me, and no one could ever turn his head elsewhere. For once, someone saw my true worth. It was that thought that made me miss him more than I should. Our instant magnetic attraction to one another that continued to attempt to cloud my logic. I'd gone in with no expectations for more and left thinking there would be far more than I ever imagined possible. Even post-Dragon Grand Reveal and return to my human reality, I'd spent a few days hoping he'd knock on my front door. Soulmate. I'm not sure how much of that I bought anyway. It always felt like a line any time I'd heard it. You wouldn't understand. She's my soulmate. You aren't. That's how it usually went. But why did I let myself get so caught up in him? Why was I still letting myself get lost in those dark eyes? Why couldn't I just let him go? Why did I feel like my heart was being ripped in half for a man I barely knew? None of it made sense. I groaned, settling down with the small serving of leftover pasta I'd discovered in the fridge. I didn't put anything on it. Bland sounded soothing to my upset stomach. Once again, 
just thinking of Lucy and had my belly in knots. I'd taken two bites when there was a knock on my door. I scowled toward the sound. Who would be coming to my house? I peeked through the peephole and my mouth dropped open. Was I seeing right? I swung the door open and stood there gaping. Nadia was standing on my front stoop, with Lucian beside her. Chapter 8 Lucian Nadia motioned for me to knock on the door. Go on, you can do it. I can, I whispered, my breath short with nervous tension. I raised my hand and knocked against the wooden surface, waiting, hoping, praying that Katharina didn't slam the door in my face the moment she saw me. The door opened wide and Katharina stood in front of us, her eyes widening as she gazed briefly at her sister, then up at me. You! You came! Yes, I said, my heart beating hard and fast. Damn, she's beautiful. She stood there, staring at me almost as if she expected something more. After a moment, her gaze shifted back to her sister, and she frowned. Okay? Nadia nudged me. May I come in so we can talk, I asked, my heart pounding even louder in my ears with every passing second. I could barely focus. The moment Katerina appeared, my body craved hers, and my heart sang in a way I'd never thought possible. I'd never experienced such a reaction before. I don't know, Katerina said. I'm not sure I have anything to say to you. Please, I stressed. You had your chance to talk to me before, she pointed out. And you didn't take it. It's hard to get a word in when you're screaming your head off, I grumbled. Nadia gave me a sharp elbow in the side. Ow! She glared up at me and didn't need to say more. Control my temper. Message received. I took a slow breath and released it in a measured way. I would very much like to talk to you. May I please come in so I can do so? For a few seconds, Katerina didn't say anything. I wasn't sure if she'd heard me. Eventually, she stepped aside. Uh, yeah, I guess. Not the elated reaction I'd been hoping to receive. I almost turned and left. Being an asshole for self-preservation reasons was better than sitting in her living room so she could reject me all over again. I'd promised myself I'd do right by her, though, and I was determined to stick with it. Nadia pushed me through the door as if she could sense my urge to flee. I staggered inside and sat down on a chair in her living room. Sure, make yourself comfortable, Katerina mumbled. No problem. I scowled. What was I doing wrong now? Before I could say anything, Nadia spoke up. Since you two are getting settled so nicely, I'm going to head out. Cat, call me later, okay? Okay, Katerina said softly. I could tell she didn't want her sister to leave us alone. Nadia hurried away, and the front door closed with a resounding thud. A long silence passed between Katerina and me. How have you been? I asked, wanting to fill the silence. Confused, she said. She stared down at me from where she stood. Why wouldn't she sit? Her arms were folded across her chest in a less than inviting stance. It's a lot, you know. Having you turn into a, a... Dragon, I supplied. She nodded. Yeah, that. It would have been nice to receive a gentle introduction to the idea. I agree. That's what I had planned to give you. It's why I tried to leave before you could see me change. I gazed down at my hands and sighed. For that I apologize. I should have had better control. I was too excited. 
after so long wondering if I had, no hoping I had, a fated mate, I discovered it was true. At long last, you were there. The one thing I'd dreamed of, the other half of my soul. My fated mate. See, that's the part I think is shit, she said. There's no way I'm the girl you'd been dreaming about. I couldn't be. Why did she always doubt me? I'm not lying. Explain it to me better, please. All of it. Nothing about this makes any sense. Sit, I said. Please. I think it'll be easier to listen. She huffed and rolled her eyes, but did what I said. Fine. Without her looming over me, I felt more confident. Where to begin, though? You've seen that I can turn into a dragon. I think that part doesn't need to be talked about in any more detail. Well, maybe, but I do actually have questions about that too, she said. There's a lot about it I don't understand. How? Why? And where were we exactly, for that matter? How different is your home from here? Were you born like that? Was everybody in your realm able to change into a dragon too? Her questions helped guide me with what to answer first. The how and why are the same, I suppose. I'm a shifter. It's what we do. We can change into the creature of our bloodline. In my case, that's a dragon. There are others. Bears, wolves, just about any animal, to be honest. There are some humans and non-shifters who live among us, too. But those of us who can shift, yes, we are born that way. We live with both human instincts and those of our animal form. Dragons are by far the most regal and sentient of the bunch, in my opinion. I can see that, she said. And the why you change is just because that's what you do. Yes, it's just what we do. I ran my hands over my jeans, my nerves slowly starting to fade. Her decreasing hostility gave me hope. As for where, we were staying in my brother's castle on the other side of the Vale. Over there, my kind are normal. I gazed at her as I spoke. Our eyes met, and my heart fluttered in my chest. Over in my realm, our territories are divided by kingdoms, much like the world you live in. Unlike your world, though, there are still kings to rule them. My brother, Damon, is one of those kings. She blinked. So you're a prince? No, I said. We're half-brothers. Same father, different mothers. My mother, who I share with Dimitri, was not the queen. When my father passed on, Damon took over to rule the kingdom. However, I don't have any birthright to the throne. Damon is gracious and has said Dimitri and I are welcome on his lands. A stark change from my father's attitude toward us. Your dad didn't want you around, she gasped. Are you serious? Yes. I shifted in my chair, not caring to dwell on this part of my story. It was the part that had kept me away from her after all. I cleared my throat before she could say more. Anyway, I have slowly learned to accept my brother Damon's hospitality. Actually, I'm still learning, I think. We are dragons of the North. He seems to think all of us should work as a unit to unite the kingdom. My father wasn't the best of rulers, as I'm sure you can imagine. Katerina nodded slowly. My sister mentioned something about soulmates. Fated mates, I clarified. We call them fated mates. Every shifter is born with one. You are the other half of my soul. When we are together, we feel whole, because our souls are bonded as one at last. If that's the case, why did Nadia say you thought she was your fated mate? Her gaze narrowed. I know you said a witch told you, but that feels awfully convenient for an out. How do I know you're not just using that as an excuse? 
I wanted to know who had hurt her so badly to make her distrust me so deeply. Marianne can see things others can't because of her magic. She is a sorceress, and if you would like to meet her, we could organize a trip to her castle. But her magic isn't completely reliable. What she told me was that my fated mate was Sarah's sister. I didn't know about you, and I made the mistake of assuming it was Nadia. However, the moment I laid eyes on your younger sister, I knew she wasn't the one. Everyone else told me to give it time, and the instinct would kick in once she awakened from her injuries. It never did. My gut was right. She wasn't the one. I didn't even try to pursue her. I had to make that last part clear. So you just knew? The moment you saw her? Katerina asked. And when you saw me, you knew I was the one. How does that work? The dragon inside of me recognized the other half of my soul instantly, I explained. That's how I knew Nadia wasn't the one despite everyone's insistence. Initially, I thought Marianne's magic had been wrong. That there was no hope for me. Part of me thought. I swallowed, unsure if I wanted to confess the truth. But to gain more of Katerina's trust, I had to show her all of me. Part of me thought that perhaps I didn't have a fated mate at all. That I was impossible to love. Katerina's frown deepened. Why would your mind ever go there? Remember, I'd been cast out by my father. So? So if he couldn't love me, how could I expect anyone else to do so? It made sense in my head. Katerina shook her head. Right. Your dad who chose to not love you. That is different than couldn't. And I don't know a whole lot about the situation, but of the few things you've just said, I don't know why you'd let this one guy dictate your self-worth. He's clearly an asshole. Yes, yes he was. I chuckled. Rather than try to explain in another way, I let the topic drop for the time being. Regardless of how logical my reasoning is or isn't, I'd come to terms with the idea of being alone. Then you entered the castle, and all of that changed. I wanted to properly woo you. To bring you into my world and show you the possibilities of our future together. And then I messed it all up. Turning into a dragon first thing in the morning is definitely far from a gentle introduction, Katerina said. A small smile lifted her lips as she spoke. My heart jumped. I was making ground. I left because I didn't want you to go into shock. While I was gone, I came up with all the reasons I should stay away. I held up a hand when she opened her mouth, probably to protest. I know it's no excuse. Leaving, and especially not returning, was not the right course of action to take. In the moment, I wanted to protect you. Then, I decided you could do so much better than me. She laughed. Funny, I've been thinking the same thing myself. That you could do better than me. That broke my heart to hear. But your perfection. She gazed at me for a second, then cleared her throat. What now? I want another chance. I want to show you how true our connection is. I gazed down at my hands in my lap. Please, Katerina, will you forgive me for running off? I can't deny there is a connection, she said softly. I felt it that night, and I feel it now. As much as I tell myself there's nothing going on, nothing between us, I know it's a lie. Fighting it is starting to get exhausting. Then we can return to my realm and... She shook her head. No, I'm not going back there. It's cold and bleak and my life is here. I have a class of students who are counting on me, as well as my dad. If Sarah and Nadia stay over there, then who is going to look after him? He's really sick. I'm not sure if Sarah told you. Our relationship with him isn't stellar, but I could never abandon him. 
I nodded, my heart sinking once more. Rejected again. I understand. Then I will take my leave. You're going? She gasped. Just like that? If you don't want me. I said I'm not going back to your realm, she snapped. But you can stay here, with me. If you want to. My heart began to beat faster at the idea, excitement and fear pulsing through me. She wanted me to stay. However, staying in the human realm would be tricky. No other shifters. I'd be forced to live the life of a human man. Was I capable of only being human? What if I couldn't blend in? But when I looked at Katerina, with her big, beautiful eyes and stunning face, I couldn't refuse. This was my chance to prove to her that I wanted her. All of her. I nodded. All right, I'll stay with you. Long enough for us to figure out something more long term. Sure, she mumbled. I'll get some blankets and pillows for you so you're comfortable on the couch. The couch. I looked down at the far too small for my large frame piece of furniture and swallowed uncomfortably. A loud and clear message if there ever was one. She didn't want to share her bed with me. She disappeared down a nearby hallway, then I heard a door open and close again. You got lucky once. I'm not ready to be so intimate with you. I have a lot to think about, and a lot has changed. For the better, I hope. When she returned, she held a small pile of blankets and pillows. She was smiling, so I took that as a good sign. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. Right now, that's all I can promise. You wanted a chance. Yes. More than anything. This is it. She handed me the blankets. Now, I was just eating dinner. Are you hungry? I nodded. My stomach still churned with nerves, but I would do anything for my one true mate. Every second we had to bond, I was going to take even if it meant living in a foreign world, and sleeping on a tiny couch. We ate, and Katerina told me more about her world. The small details about her life, and more about the people she loved. Her students, and how happy they made her. Then we watched a television show she liked, and I sat through the whole thing despite not understanding the storyline. She told me about the music she enjoyed listening to when she needed to relax. I took mental notes about everything. Finally, she yawned. The clock on the wall read midnight. I should get some sleep, she said. Can't believe we stayed up this late. I could, and I didn't want the night to end. Sleep well, I forced myself to say, even though watching her leave me was the last thing I wanted. But she smiled and turned away, and I watched her go. My dragon rumbled inside me, but didn't fight hard against me. He knew we needed to take our time with her as well. She needed to be seduced, so we would just have to be patient. I stood up, my body aching for my mate. Fuck. I ran my hands through my hair, a loud groan filling my throat. Get a grip and get ready for bed. I arranged the pillows and the blankets, stripped out of my dusty clothes, and climbed onto my makeshift bed, folding up my legs to try and fit. I wouldn't get much sleep on the tiny thing, but at least I could rest a little, knowing I was in my mate's house. We might have been separated in body, but in spirit, I felt a whole lot closer. Chapter 9 Katerina. Lucian and I spent the whole weekend in my house, just talking and getting to know each other better. I studied his mannerisms and tried to decipher all the words he wasn't saying. He seemed like a genuine guy, and I could sense he was actually telling the truth when he spoke. But doubt crept in anyway, although that might have had something to do with the fact that my period was still late. Now it was late by five days, almost a full week, 
and I couldn't blame it on stress any longer. I'm going to the grocery store, I announced Sunday evening. We've already eaten, Lucian said, as though that was the only reason to go shopping. I'm out of coffee, I managed. It wasn't a lie, so I didn't feel guilty using that as an excuse. If my suspicions were right, though, I wouldn't be drinking coffee for a while. I went to the nearest store and got myself a pregnancy test. Completely distracted, I'd already paid for it when I realised I was about to go home with no coffee, so I doubled back and grabbed a bag of my favourite roasted beans. Being away from Lucian felt wrong. I missed him even for the few minutes I was in the store. Or rather, I missed the way I felt around him. I thought about telling him what I was doing, I truly did. Having him with me as I bought the test, then took it, would have stopped my body from shaking so much with stress. But until I knew for sure what the result was, I didn't want to say anything. Why ruin the beginning of a possible new relationship with unnecessary drama? When I got home, I put the test in the bathroom so I could take it after he fell asleep. But the joke was on me, and I fell asleep on the couch, my head on his lap, while we watched a movie. Eventually, I did make it back to my room, but I was too tired to worry about the test. First thing in the morning, I couldn't put it off any longer. My alarm clock went off at 5am and I'd run out of excuses. Lucian was still sleeping on the couch, so I had the privacy I needed. As my stomach flipped with anxiety, I summoned the courage to creep to the bathroom and find the box I'd stashed there. I took the test and did my makeup while waiting for the results. That was the only thing I could think of to distract myself so I didn't pace in front of the clock and accidentally wake Lucian. My hands shook the whole time, so it was a miracle I didn't end up looking like a clown. Five minutes passed slowly. I checked the test. Positive. My heart fell. No, I whispered. No, no, no. I blinked back hot tears as I disposed of the evidence in the trash beneath used tissues and other random items. I didn't want Lucian to see the test before I could talk to him, and that wouldn't be happening until after I got home from work. Hopefully, that would give me enough time to figure out what to say and what I was going to do. No, I couldn't make a decision without discussing the situation with him. That wouldn't be fair. But I should at least think about it first. He's going to be so pissed. Thoughts of impending doom raced through my mind while I waited for my coffee to brew. A coffee I couldn't drink because of the caffeine, but made out of habit all the same. It sat in my thermal mug all day, mocking me. For the sake of my students and my ability to teach that day, I pushed any worry about Lucian's reaction out of my brain. The thoughts kept trying to creep in, and I squashed them down until three o'clock. As soon as my kiddos were on the bus, I closed the door to the classroom, sat down at my desk, and cried. Full-on, ugly sobbing. I just got Lucian back, and now he's going to leave again. According to him, finding out I was his true mate had sent him spiralling out of control. A baby was going to push him over the edge. Talk about a life-altering change. We were going to be responsible for raising another human being. Or were we? Horror filled my chest, making the tears dry up. What if the baby came out a dragon? What if it came out with scales and magic? Was I even going to be able to give birth to it? I'd seen the long talons and sharp teeth on Lucian when he was in dragon form. No way was I going to be able to push out a creature like that from my body without suffering some sort of damage. I probably wouldn't even survive. Just the thought of giving birth to a normal baby terrified me. I'd heard it was the most painful experience a woman could go through. But a dragon? And I'm going to get bigger. Even bigger than I already am. There was no way I could avoid that. The baby would be growing inside of me, 
and I, in turn, would get even fatter. I tried to imagine myself pregnant and didn't like what I saw in my imagination. Would people even realise I was pregnant? Or would they assume the worst about me? I knew for a fact I wouldn't be one of those cute girls who looked like they'd shoved a basketball up her T-shirt. I'd look like a hippo. If Lucian and I had been together for longer than a handful of hours, I might have felt less insecure. Even better, if the baby had been planned and not the result of a one-night stand. But circumstances weren't ideal, so my brain was on overdrive and my self-esteem was at a record low. He was never going to stay with me, and he certainly wouldn't look at me with desire once I turned into a pumpkin. This can't be happening, I whispered. I looked up at the clock and knew I had to get back home. Lucian was waiting, and somehow I had to find the words to tell him my news. I drove home and rehearsed a number of approaches. Funny, cute, serious, matter of fact. Hey, guess what? You knocked me up with one try. Pretty good, huh? There were too many options, and I didn't know him well enough to guess which would work best. He's a no-nonsense kind of guy, I think. So maybe I'll just state it point blank. When I walked into the house and saw him cooking dinner, I lost all my nerve. I'm only a few weeks along. Maybe the test is a false positive. Yes. That made perfect sense. Besides, what if something happens and I lose it? That thought scared me just as much as having a baby did. I couldn't lose it. I didn't want to. But I wasn't far along, and a lot could change in a week. Look what had happened in just the last few hours. And there he was, standing in my kitchen cooking dinner for me. His large form Performing such an ordinary domestic chore gave me butterflies in the belly. Even the smile he shot in my direction as I walked in the door was perfection. Why destroy the beginning of something that could be beautiful when everything was still so new and fragile? I'll wait a week or two. That'll give me more time to prepare and us more time to know if what we have is real. And more importantly, if it was going to last. You're home later than I thought, he said. Though, that's for the better, because dinner might be a little delayed. I set my purse down. What brought this on? What? he asked. You cooking dinner, I said, gesturing to the stove. I leaned against the wall near the kitchen counter. You're a guest, remember? He was so beautiful. Way too good for me. I thought the best way to get on your good side would be to make you food. He grinned. I scowled at him, hating the inference. Why? Because I'm fat. What? He frowned. The best way to get on my good side is food because I'm fat, I repeated, crossing my arms over my chest. Fat girls love food, right? We don't like flowers or books or poems. Just lavish dinners and decadent chocolate. He raised a brow. Actually, the hope was to prove that I'm self-sufficient and reliable, he said coolly. I rolled my eyes, wanting to contain my sudden annoyance, but somehow unable to stop. If you want to impress me, do the dishes when you're done and all my laundry. Then keep doing it for a week, then two, then a month and for a whole year. Cooking one dinner doesn't prove anything to me. Right. He turned back to the pot on the stove and stirred vigorously. But this dinner is a start. I thought. It was. I couldn't argue with that, but somehow I did anyway. What had gotten into me? Sure, Lucian. Whatever you say. Why are you being so nasty? He snapped. I was. I couldn't deny it, and I didn't even know why. I shrugged. I'm being realistic, I grumbled, and marched off to go sit on my living room couch. It was easy for him to say all of these things now. 
life was still easy. We were in the honeymoon period of dating. The beginning, where everything felt magical and perfect. A place he was in and I couldn't be, not when I had to plan ahead just in case. And if I lost him for good, I didn't know how I would cope. Chapter 10 Katerina Lucian turned down the pot on the stove and followed me to the couch. He sat next to me, his gaze never leaving my face. Elaborate, please. I'm missing something. How is giving me sass and sarcasm being realistic? It's self-preservation, I exploded. You can say until the cows come home that you're going to stick around and be a perfect partner for me. I'm not going to believe any of that until I see it. Sure, one dinner is a start. I get that, but you're going to ditch me. It's only a matter of time. Why do you doubt me? Because every other guy I've been with has left. I'm not them, he seethed, his eyes flashing with anger. I snorted. Because you're my soulmate. Yes. Soulmate or not, you'll get tired of me eventually. Once you realize you can have a hotter girl, I shook my head. I'm great for conversation, but you know you deserve a girl who matches your looks. He shook his head. I'm looking at the most attractive woman I've ever laid eyes on. Stop! You're just... No, I'm not. He leaned forward and took my hand in his. Do I strike you as a man who just says things to placate another? No woman compares to you, Katerina. When you leave, all I can think about is when you'll be home again. Whatever physical flaws you think you have, I don't see. Even before we met, when I imagined my ideal mate, I saw you. He cupped my face with his hand, the other settling on the curve of my waist. The same figure. Your long hair. Perhaps not every vivid detail, but I craved you. When I finally saw you in the flesh, it was like my every fantasy came true. Tears pooled in my eyes as I listened to him. Could he possibly be telling the truth? But I'm... I'm bigger than... Why do you assume that's ugly? he asked softly. Who told you that lie? Everyone, I croaked out. All my life. Everyone at school, growing up. Comparing me to my perfect younger sisters. Every boyfriend. The media. Magazines. Society. He didn't say a word. He simply drew me into his arms on the sofa, and I broke down into sobs. The pain of past rejection, the pressure to live up to a standard I wasn't genetically designed for, the relief and love he felt for me, it all was too much to hold on to. I released it all while being held in his arms and sobbing against his chest. When I finally stopped sobbing and my face was wet and hot, he lifted my face toward him. Better, he asked. Yeah. I wiped at the tears, needing to blow my nose. I'm sorry I was a bitch. Now I really must look ugly. I need a tissue. Give me a minute. I jumped up and grabbed for the Kleenex box, mopping my face. When I finally felt like I'd gotten control of myself, I sat down beside him once more. Then Lucian leaned in and kissed me. Soft at first, but as his lips touched mine, heat exploded between us. That same hunger and need that I felt the night of Sarah's wedding. It would be so easy to just fall into that same heat and pleasure. But I was scared. Tell me I can trust you, I whispered against his lips. That you aren't going to break my heart. You can trust me, he said softly. I'm not going to hurt you. My word is my bond, and ours is forever. Swoon. I pulled him in for another kiss, pressing my chest against his, ready to have him right then and there. 
he did something that surprised me. He picked me up. Correction, he lifted me up into his arms, and I was being held in a classic damsel on a romance cover pose. Never before in my life had any guy ever attempted such a gesture of affection, let alone achieved it so easily. I wrapped my arms around his neck and gazed lovingly into his dark eyes. My heart was already his, completely open and vulnerable. Lucian could do whatever he wanted to me, and then some, for better or worse. I was smitten, head over heels, and it was dangerous. Lucian carried me to the bedroom, sat on my bed, and stroked a few strands of hair out of my face. You're breathtaking. So beautiful. Would you stand so I can see all of you? I... okay. I crawled off his lap and stood in front of him, awkward and shy. He stood with me and circled around me, studying every part of me. Slowly, he undressed me, piece by piece. First, he slipped my blouse down my arms. Then he kissed my bare shoulders, so tenderly that he sent a shiver of longing down my spine. Next, he helped me out of my pants, letting them drop to the floor. A hand ran along my bare legs, and I could barely hold in the moan. Everything he did with me, and to me, was magical. I'm not sure which part of you is my favourite, he confessed, his voice husky and deep. There are so many wonderful things about your body. Your soft skin, those legs for days. He moved behind me and kissed my neck. You taste delicious. I giggled to break the tension around us. Are you a cannibal now? Ha. Huh. He undid the clasp of my bra and let that fall to the ground next. I struggled not to cover myself with my arms. The light in the room was stark. He'd see every ripple of cellulite, my sagging boobs. Lucian moved in front of me and took my breasts in his hands, plumping them up, then dropping his head to suckle on each of my nipples. My weight forgotten, I threaded my fingers into his beautiful, thick hair and let out a moan of pleasure. He glanced up at me. Oh, I love that noise you make. And the look on your face. I want to see more. This isn't fair! I choked out as he slid my panties down my legs and continued to kiss along my skin. You have way too many clothes on. I can fix that. He stripped quickly, revealing his muscled body to me. Chapter 11 His eagerness was clear when I saw his large cock bounce up, red and swollen. He wants me. And God, I want him. Lucian sat down on the bed and laid back. I want to watch your pleasure. If that's all right, I mean. Your face is beautiful. He wanted me on top of him. Seriously. I swallowed hard, nervous yet excited. No one ever wanted to see me in that position, but the fact that he did made me trust him even more. I slid my leg over his waist and straddled his ridged abdomen. I didn't want to hurry, so I leaned forward and trailed kisses down his sculpted chest, rocking my hips so that I could feel his large cock beneath me. I groaned when he shifted beneath me, found my entrance and entered me. I ached for him, and his length filled me so perfectly it was hard not to sob with relief. That feels so good! Lucian grabbed my hips and guided me into a rocking motion. I put my hands on his chest and stared down at him, the intensity in his face making every moment better. Together we found our rhythm, and we were even more in sync than last time. Waves of pleasure rolled over me with every thrust of his body inside mine. I gave him exactly what he wanted, letting him see my pleasure. I was exposed and free. Insecurity fled, and I relished in the sensation of the depth of his want, his love. 
I closed my eyes and threw my head back, riding him faster and harder. I moaned, I gasped, and told him in every way how much I wanted him. He let me take control, let me set the pace. I glided up and down his cock over and over again, building the pleasure inside my belly. When he groaned and grabbed for my hips, I stared down at him. His face was set, his jaw clenched. He was close. He began to thrust up into me, amplifying my pleasure. I gasped as he pushed me closer to orgasm. Oh! Ah! Lucian fucked me hard and fast, pushing me higher. The sensation was almost too much to bear, yet not anywhere near enough. I moved faster, needing more until we hit the peak together and climaxed. Lucian cried out and buried himself deep inside me, pulsing heat into my belly. His orgasm pushed me into a rolling orgasm, making me scream and shudder. I collapsed onto his chest, shivering in his arms. My orgasm continued to echo inside me, my pussy still pulsing around his cock. Lucian gently rolled us to the side, holding me close. I cuddled into his body for warmth now that the heat of the session began to dissipate. He drew a blanket up and over us, then came back to lay his head against my chest. Dinner will be cold now. That's what microwaves are for, I murmured, wrapping my arms around his shoulders and holding him to me. How about I go use it and bring dinner to you? His eyes lit up as though he was eager to serve. I smiled at him, my post-orgasmic bliss stealing over me and making me drowsy. Yes, please. I'll be right back. I lay back in bed and closed my eyes, the whole night replaying inside my head. Once again, sex with Lucian felt like a dream. I still couldn't believe that he'd picked me up and carried me to the bedroom. The attentive way he'd worshipped my body had been truly beautiful, and the fact that he wanted to bring me dinner in bed afterward was surreal. It all felt too good to be true. But it was all real. My life wasn't just a fantasy playing out in my mind. Finally, I had the chance for a solid relationship that would go the distance. My hand crept down and pressed against my still flat stomach. I also had a chance to have the family I'd always wished for. With my child, I'd have a deep connection. I wouldn't be distant like my parents were with me when I was younger. My child would be close with aunts and siblings who may follow. So much potential for happiness, and all of it within my grasp. At last, life was finally turning around. Chapter 12 Lucian I should have been living my happily ever after. Katerina was mine at last, and she was willing to give me a chance to show her my love and commitment. From there, we should have been planning a wedding and making her home our home. We should have finally been at peace. Unfortunately, that peace didn't last. We spent the first week engrossed in each other. When she left for work during the day, I tidied up the house and repaired any broken items in her home. Her dripping kitchen sink and the toilet that ran incessantly unless the handle was jiggled. All while cooking and tending to her basic needs so that our evenings could be spent in bed. Making love to her was the highlight of my day. She was luscious and generous in bed. So fucking beautiful. Over the two days she called the weekend, we went on a date in town and I got to see more of her neighbourhood. None of it felt like home, and the way the humans lived seemed strange to me. I wasn't sure how they felt purpose in their lives or contentment, but I was willing to learn. The following Monday morning, some of the glow began to fade. Are you sure you want to stay home alone all day? Katerina asked while she was picking up her keys to leave for work. 
I nodded, that tight feeling in my gut returning at the reminder of how out of place I was in this world. And how much I missed her when she was gone. Where else can I go? I can't watch you work. No, I guess not, she mumbled. That'd be a distraction. For me and the kids. She paused. But you can meet them at the school social next Friday. I'd like that. I wanted to watch her with her students and get a taste of what she did at work. Great! Her eyes lit up, and her obvious excitement reduced my despondence at knowing she'd soon be gone for the day. What are you going to do while I'm at work? she asked. I'll find something around here to fix. I gave her a quick grin. She kissed my cheek. Thank you. I'll be back before you know it. And then she was gone, and I was alone again. If I could find an actual purpose, then I might feel less bored and frustrated. Back in my home realm, I'd fly and patrol the lands on a regular basis to make sure it was safe from our enemies. Or I'd train. There, I felt useful and needed. Here in the human realm, I was nothing. I had to look on the bright side, though. I had Katerina. I'd figure something out. This world was new to me. I couldn't judge the place from living here for only one week. Settling in took time. That's what Dimitri would tell me. Just give it time. When her car disappeared from sight, the emptiness hit me like a solid blow to the gut. I looked about the house. How could I help her next? My gaze landed on her front yard. The space had clearly been neglected for some time. The lawn was trimmed just enough to prove someone lived at the house. Her flowers looked awfully thirsty and were obviously struggling to survive. Her yard in back was rather sad to behold in general. She had a few potted flowers and the tiniest of patios. Maybe she'd enjoy her backyard more if there was a beautiful space in which to spend time. That was something I could help with. I found a blank piece of paper and began to sketch out a plan. A better patio. No, I decided. She should have a deck in the back. With a place for a nice fire pit for bonfires in the evening. The thought of cuddling up to her in front of a fire brought a smile to my face. I could make a spot for flowers along the edges. She would like that, and then I'd make her a vegetable garden. My heart lifted as I planned and sketched. When I finished the plans, I nodded in satisfaction. Now, I just had to build the thing. Katerina had tools in her garage. Surprisingly, a lot of them. All I needed was the wood. It seemed the human realm sold wood, cut and ready for use, quite different from my home, where we had to take an axe out into the woods and chop down what we needed. Thanks to some cash Katerina had left for me, I was able to get my order delivered within a few hours. By the time she came home, I had the wood organised in piles, along with all the other supplies needed. She didn't notice. Her backyard was a chaotic disaster, and she didn't once glance out the windows. When I walked inside to greet her, she yawned loudly. Ugh, I'm exhausted. Are you okay with just cuddling on the couch tonight? I don't care what we watch. I'm just so... She yawned again. Whatever you need, I said, meaning every word. I'll make dinner for us. Go ahead and relax. Your day must have been tough. Those kids have too much energy. I can't keep up sometimes, she said with a tiny smile, meandering over to the couch. I frowned, disappointed at the fact she hadn't noticed the beginning stages of my latest project. However, this created a new opportunity. If she was always tired upon coming home, which she seemed to be, then I could reveal the new deck to her once it was finished. It'd be a great surprise. So that's what I worked on every day to pass the time, the only way I felt I could be of use to her, since she always seemed so run down and tired. 
All the while, I pondered how I could find my place in the human world. When Friday rolled around, I was excited for the change of scenery and to see more of Katerina's world. She drove us to her school in her car, something I didn't need at home, obviously, with my inbuilt wings. School turned out to be a small brick building, buzzing with activity as every student played outside on the playground while the parents and teachers chatted. Teachers at a table handed out ice creams. As soon as we got out of the car, lots of young children ran up, shouting for Katerina. Miss Cat! Miss Cat! one girl called out. Her gaze settled on me and her eyes widened. Is he your boyfriend? Katerina gazed up at me and laughed a little self-consciously. Something like that, yeah. Not quite the enthusiastic response I was hoping for, but it was better than her saying no. The realisation that she was finally attaching a level of commitment to our relationship was a good thing, though. She did want me. Otherwise, I reminded myself, she wouldn't have taken me here to meet her students and co-workers. That gave me hope that she wanted the future I did, too. This is going to work. We are going to be okay. He's really tall, a boy said, coming over. And big. I can't see. The sun is in my eyes. I knelt down so I was closer to his height. Is this better? The boy narrowed his eyes, studying me. I guess you're okay. I chuckled and took Katerina's hand as the boy ran off. Her fingers closed tightly around mine, as if she was grateful for the contact. She still wasn't saying much in relation to us, but small gestures like that were becoming more frequent. We moved toward the playground, the kids talking so fast I could barely keep up. Katerina declined the offer of an ice cream when we passed the table. My stomach is still feeling off, she said, putting her hand to her belly. A problem she'd been having a lot more lately. Was she ill? Maybe going out was a bad idea. Are you okay? I asked, squeezing her hand. She nodded. I'm great. Promise. She gave me a reassuring smile, and that was enough. For the moment, I watched my mate in her element. She talked to the students like they were her friends, and she handled all of the parents with grace, including any who talked to her about concerns they had. Her co-workers bombarded me with all kinds of questions. Where had we met? Where was I from? How long had we been together? I tried to keep all my answers simple, as Katerina seemed to value her privacy. My brother's wedding. A small town. You probably haven't heard of it. It's been a few weeks. I hoped I was doing well, but still felt like a fish out of water. I wasn't used to following someone else's lead. Seeing her with her friends and her work family, it made me miss my own. I hadn't spoken to Dimitri since leaving home weeks ago. He was honeymooning, though, so he was probably glad I wasn't there to interrupt. I wanted to actually see him in person, taking to the skies together like we used to. The urge to let out my dragon and fly was becoming more urgent the longer I stayed here. I assumed Dimitri was doing well. Someone would have arrived across the Vale to tell me otherwise if he wasn't. And Damon, I had still been getting to know him when I left. Would our burgeoning relationship take a step backward because I wasn't home? No, he'll understand. This is my true mate, after all. I still missed him, though, and the odd family bond we'd begun to build. My brothers, my home, now felt like a place that only existed in my dreams. It was a feeling that left me anxious. A lot about Katerina's world did that. I was in a foreign land with only one ally. I smiled my way through the event, being polite and keeping my grumpy dragon at bay while he screamed at me internally. For Katerina, I refused to falter. I was determined to never lose control of my shifter again. We only stayed for an hour, 
but it felt an awful lot like five. Thank you for coming with me, she said, as we climbed into the car. But I can tell you weren't exactly comfortable there. If you hated it, you don't have to come next time. I shook my head. I want to be with you. I'll get used to the crowds eventually. I've never been much of a people person. Not surprised by that at all. She laughed, turning on the engine and pulling out of the parking lot. That brooding loner vibe you give off almost scared me away from talking to you at the wedding. It did. I glanced over at her, surprised at the comment. She squeezed the steering wheel a little tighter. Almost, but I can't stay away from you. Even if my head tells me none of this makes sense, I feel... The bond, I finished for her. What you're feeling is our bond. It's definitely something, she admitted quietly. Then louder she said, I like it, though. What we have. It's different from anything I've ever experienced, and it's nice to have it all feel easy. I nodded, showing I was listening, though I didn't necessarily feel the same way. Being with Katerina felt safe, like home. But it was far from easy. I don't think she understood how much of my life was being changed or put on hold for her comfort. I didn't plan on telling her any time soon, though. The least I could do was try and adapt for her. She'd already done the same for me, letting me into her life. Lovers compromised for each other all the time. Didn't they? When we get home, I want to show you what I've been doing all week, I said, feeling a flutter of excitement inside my chest. Besides cleaning my house and cooking, she said, her eyes sparkling with light. You know, I was starting to wonder how you didn't die of boredom. That night I said that, about doing all my cooking and stuff, I didn't mean you really had to. I was feeling pretty cranky and, well, I appreciate all you've been doing, but you don't have to. I want to, I said, glancing out the window as the houses flew by. And it was true. I did enjoy doing things to make Katerina's life easier, if I could. She cleared her throat. I, uh, there's something I want to talk to you about when we get home, too. Her mouth snapped shut then, but her eyes were soft. What did she want to talk about? It didn't seem like anything to be concerned about. Okay, I said, deciding I could be patient. Me first, though. I really want to show you. I broke off, nearly giving away the surprise. You've got me curious now, she said, and we shared a quick grin. When we arrived, I put my hands over her eyes as soon as we were out of the car. Trust me, I won't let you stumble. She giggled and pressed her warm fingers over my hands. I trust you. I loved hearing those three words. I guided her through the garage and to the back door. We entered the backyard and I brought her to the edge of the new deck. Now you can look. I removed my hands from her eyes and walked around her so I could see her reaction. She squinted for a second, then gasped. You, how, what? This is what I made while you were at work this week. How did I not notice? Her voice was full of wonder. She stepped up the small staircase and then sat on one of the built-in bench seats on the deck. There's no way you did this all by yourself, surely? Of course I did. I sat next to her. You didn't notice because you come home exhausted every night and you're early into bed, too. Do not. I gave her a pointed look. I've seen more brain activity from a zombie. She gasped. Zombies are real, too? I snorted. Not as far as I know. It was a joke, Cat. A blush spread across her cheeks. It's been a long week. And yeah, I guess you're right. I have been extra tired lately. I'm not judging you, I clarified. Though I am worried. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly, 
then whispered something almost under her breath. It was only my acute dragon hearing that managed to pick up what she'd said. I'm afraid of losing you. Cat, I said, lifting a hand to stroke her cheek. She leaned into my caress and closed her eyes for a moment. I'm not planning on going anywhere. I... She took another breath in and out. I'm good. It's just... Been a long week. I know. I nodded and grabbed one of her hands with my own. And now you have another place you can rest. Perhaps having some sunshine will help. Maybe, she whispered. She bit her lip, then shook her head. Thank you, Lucian. For everything. Your patience. Everything. I leaned in and kissed her sweetly on the lips. I would do anything for you. Even keep my dragon at bay. I couldn't lose her. For her, I'd find a way to make this strange world full of humans work. I don't know what I'd do without you, she whispered as she stared up at me with her big, beautiful eyes glistening with unshed tears. Those words made the sacrifice feel worthwhile. I wanted to tell her I loved her, to show her how deeply that love ran by taking her upstairs to bed and ravishing her until she screamed in ecstasy. Instead, I put my arm around her, settled her into my embrace, and we gazed across her fresh lawn. If the house felt like home for her, it could feel the same for me as well. Home was a construct created by connections. My dragon family would understand. Chapter 13 Katerina Every time I tried to tell Lucian I was pregnant, the words stuck in my throat. At first, it was simply fear of losing him that stifled my voice. What if telling him ruined everything? We'd reached the month-long milestone in our relationship with hardly any hiccups. Then, as time went on, I was embarrassed that I'd said nothing and it became even harder to broach the subject. How was I going to tell him? The right words just weren't coming to me. We got along so well. Everything felt so good. So right. I desperately wanted to tell him. I really did. But it had been so long now, I felt stuck. Three weeks passed quickly, and I remained silent. I worked with my kids, and Lucian worked on projects around the house. Every day, he updated something. It wouldn't have surprised me if I came home one day and he decided to gut the kitchen and start fresh. I was just glad he had found something that he seemed to enjoy. As the weeks passed, my morning sickness grew stronger and my exhaustion became harder to ignore. I thought for sure Lucian would put two and two together but he didn't. He noticed I often wasn't feeling well, but he wasn't hugely familiar with my life or that of normal humans, so I guess he assumed that tiredness was a normal condition for me. After all, we hadn't spent much time together before he'd moved in. Not to say he ignored my health, quite the opposite. He asked me often if I felt okay and if I was sick. Not once did he ask if I was pregnant and I still hadn't told him. You need to eat, I whispered to myself as I stared down at the lunch I had brought to work with me. Once again, the food was going to go uneaten. I didn't know what to do and wanted to ask my sisters for help. But Sarah was likely busy being a new wife and Nadia hardly answered her phone. The reception in the other realm seemed to be terrible. Though I'd been able to get through once or twice, I could barely hear her voice and vice versa. It became easier not to even try calling in the end. If they knew I was in such inner turmoil, they wouldn't ignore me, of that I was sure. Part of me didn't want to say anything anyway because I knew they'd side with Lucian. It was so easy for them to tell me not to worry. They'd never known rejection like I had. I gazed at my lunch 
wishing I could will myself to eat. So far, I'd dropped three pounds. The internet said that losing weight was normal in the beginning of a pregnancy, so I tried not to worry about the baby too much. If a human baby sucked up a lot of energy from its mom, then I imagined a half-dragon baby might deplete even more. I have to tell him this weekend, I mumbled to myself and rubbed at my forehead with a hand. I've put it off long enough. I needed to stop being a coward. Come what may, Lucian had the right to know, and I didn't want to hide it from him any longer. I wanted him to know why I kept refusing wine with dinner and why I wouldn't eat the sushi he'd bought. It was time, and I'd find a good way to break the news that hopefully put it in a positive light so he wouldn't run away screaming. Again. Tomorrow, I'm treating you for a change, I announced when I walked in the door that night after work. So don't make any plans, OK? That would buy me a night to think and plan. If only he wasn't so distracting. With those lips and the way he touched me, we made love practically every night. I didn't have a ton of energy, but I always managed to find time for that. Being one with him restored my soul in ways I'd never thought possible. Lucian gazed at me, his head tilted slightly to the side. Why? I coughed, startled. What do you mean, why? Can't I do nice things for you too? You've been working so hard around here and doing so much. Because I... He swallowed. All right. I won't argue. Good. I mean, you built me a freaking deck. I was bored. You needed one. He shrugged like it was nothing. It wasn't nothing, and it wasn't just the deck. He'd transformed my old, needing some TLC house into a stunning place. I shook my head. Goof. That's a peculiar term of endearment, he said, as he walked over and grabbed me. Then he kissed me deeply, and I melted into him. My nervousness grew, and I made love to him that night like it might be the last time. Being Friday, I didn't have to work for the next two days. That gave me plenty of time to plan, spill the beans, then deal with the fallout, whatever it might be. I slept restlessly, unsure of what the future would bring, but knowing it was time to step up and be an adult. I was going to become a mom. I needed to let Lucian know, and then we would deal with whatever happened next. The next morning, I rose early and went straight to the store to get everything I needed for my big announcement. A light lunch for myself and something more substantial for him. If things went well, there were cupcakes. If things got awkward first, I had fruit salad and I'd save the cupcakes for myself later if I could bring myself to eat them. I set a blanket across the lovely new deck and some pillows on the blanket to soften the seating. It seemed such a small gesture in comparison to everything he'd done for me. Ready for lunch? I asked, my stomach twisting with anxiety. Sure, he answered, sweeping his long hair back into a low ponytail and fastening it with one of my hair ties. What's going on, cat? Instead of answering, I took his hand in mine and walked him outside. We both got comfortable on the blanket, and I sat with my legs crossed and my hands in my lap. How was I going to even start? He looked at me expectantly, so I just rushed into the conversation. So, your instinct was right. I do have a hidden agenda. Oh my God, that sounds terrible. He frowned. Should I be worried? Maybe, I mumbled. Hopefully not. I took a deep breath and then just blurted out the news I'd been trying and failing to tell him for days. Lucian, I'm pregnant. Not the graceful, fun way I'd wanted to tell him, but nerves had gotten the better of me. I braced myself for the worst, watching him carefully and barely able to breathe as I tried to gauge his reaction. He said nothing. He didn't even look at me. 
He just stared down at one of my pretty pillows, decorated with purple lace, and blinked a few times before reaching out a finger to trace the lacy pattern. Had he heard me? Was he in shock? Horrified. Was he about to jump to his feet, shift into his dragon form, and fly off into the sky? Um, anyway, I said, when the silence continued. I started suspecting right before you decided to knock on my door. That makes me think I'm about eight weeks along now, but I'm not sure. I haven't been to a doctor or anything yet. I, uh, think it happened the night we first... Finally, he spoke up. The wedding? Yes. I took another shuddering breath, trying desperately to keep calm. My insides were churning and my chest was tight. This was it. This was the part where he ran. So, I'm sorry this happened. It's not like I wanted it to be this way. And I'm sorry I didn't say anything sooner, but I wanted to be sure. That's why I've felt so unwell lately, and exhausted. More silence. If this is where you want to bow out, that's fine. I won't take it personally. I know having a kid is probably not high on your to-do list. I'll deal with this alone. I swallowed back my tears as my throat began to tighten. Don't feel like you owe me anything, Lucian. You don't. You really don't. What are you talking about? he asked, finally lifting his head and gazing at me. An enormous smile formed on his lips and his eyes shone. This is amazing. It, it is? I blinked, unsure if I'd heard him right. I was so sure he'd be unhappy. Was he serious? Yes, of course it is. He reached over and tugged me into his arms. We're going to be parents. We've bonded and mated, and now there's going to be a little one as proof of our love. I laughed awkwardly, swallowing hard against the clog in my throat. It's proof of something. That we jumped into bed the minute we met. I know I love you, Lucian said firmly, staring down at me. I struggled to sit up properly, staying close, but not wanting to be in his arms any more. I needed space between us so I could study his expression. Please don't lie to me just because I'm pregnant, I whispered. You barely know me. How can you love me? Because some witch told you I was your soulmate. Because an inner beast insists it's true. Nothing about his dragon soulmate tale made any sense to me. Not any logical sense, anyway. Lucian's eyebrows lowered and he stared at me, hard. We've got our whole lives to discover everything about one another. He grabbed my hand and gave it a squeeze. What I feel is real. I hope you feel it too. That's what matters right now. Everything else will fall into place. Deep in my bones, I agreed with him. It did feel real. And so damn right. But that treacherous voice in the back of my head wouldn't shut up. Things are only going to get harder, you know that, right? Kids complicate life. I'm not going to be one of those graceful, sporty, awesome moms. I feel terrible physically. I hate how I look, and that's only going to get worse as I get bigger. I'm a hot mess, Lucian. Yes, you are indeed hot, he purred. Ha! Huh. I shoved at his chest, not sure whether to laugh or burst into tears. I'm being very serious, he said. Why do you keep talking so poorly of yourself? I thought we'd discussed this already. I looked away, unable to handle the weight of his gaze. Because it'll be easier on me if we do this now rather than further down the road. The longer you wait, the higher my hopes get, and then when you leave, it'll destroy me. And any child we had together. You're planning for a day that is never going to come. He stroked my cheek with his fingers. You have to keep trusting me. 
What if I can't? My biggest fear of all. What if I was too damaged by the past to ever be the woman he needed? Take it day by day. He pulled my face toward his, so I was looking into his eyes again. I'm not like any of those other men. One of his hands clenched into a fist. Just thinking about how you've been taken advantage of, that is never going to happen again. The flash of anger in his eyes made my breath catch in my throat. He meant every word. And that anger had flared on my behalf. He cared. He really did care. He took in a slow breath and his muscles tensed. No one will hurt you or our child. I promise. But what if... No, Lucian growled. There is no what if. I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving our baby. We are bound to each other for life. Not just because of the soulmate bond, but because of that child. I am not going to abandon you or my future son or daughter. My heart fell. The man before me was honourable, and I adored him for that. But I wouldn't take advantage of him because of that amazing trait. I'd never be able to live with myself if he stayed out of a misplaced sense of duty. Don't stay in a relationship with me simply because of the baby either, I whispered. Let's not lie to ourselves like that. Another growl, and I actually saw a scale form on his forearm. I am with you because I want you. I always will. One day, you'll begin to trust me. Trust us, and you'll see. I gazed at the scales developing on his skin and shivered at the growl that came from his mouth and throat. Please, I whispered. If you can't keep control over yourself, I'm going to need you to leave. The dragon, I can accept that it's part of who you are, but it doesn't belong in this world. It's dangerous. For me, the baby, and for you. He'd be locked up, or worse, if anyone from here saw him transform into a dragon. I'm not going anywhere without you. His chest puffed up as he spoke, and he got more animated by the second. Just let a puny human try to take me on. They won't get far. Lucian, I gasped. I'm one of those puny humans. He gazed at me, and the fear I was feeling on the inside must have been written all over my face, because the tension left his body. Yes, I mean everyone else. Like the men who've hurt you in the past. They're not here anymore, I said. And I don't plan on ever talking to them again. Good. Lucian closed his eyes, and the scales disappeared until there was only tanned flesh once again. He opened his eyes, and the man was fully back. Does my dragon scare you? he asked. It can, I said honestly. Mostly when he tries to come out uninvited, which seems to happen a lot according to my sister. What if you get angry and... He shook his head. My dragon would never try to harm you. Or the baby. I knew he believed that, but dragons were so unfamiliar to me. How did I know for sure? How did he know if he'd never had a mate before? Regardless, you can't do that here. You can't change. Yes, I realize that would complicate things, he said. We were both quiet for a long time. Then his dark eyes lit up and he grinned at me. We'll go back to my realm. We can live in the castle with my brothers and your sister. There, I won't have to hide who I am. I can return to a normal life. You'll be safe, and we can raise our child together. He paused. We can be a family. A real family. Then, in a whisper, he added, Everything I've ever wanted. It was everything I'd ever wanted, too. Being with him, raising our child together in a home we built together, it sounded magical. Perfect. Perhaps too perfect.
I remembered the grandness of the castle. I'd been in awe and intimidated all at once. As beautiful as it was, I didn't feel drawn to stay there like my sisters clearly had. Nice to visit, but not a place to make a permanent home. I shook my head. I can't go back there. Your home, it's so cold. It's so far from everything I love here. My students, my father. I can't give them up. That castle didn't feel like home to me. I see, he said, nodding slowly and showing no emotion on his face. Was it the same for him here? Did my home not feel like, well, home to him? How would we reconcile the fact that we were so different and from completely different worlds? I don't want to keep you from your own kind, I said. But you can't keep me from mine either. I love this place, Lucian. Do you not think you could make it your home too? I hope you'll find a way to make this work, because I'm not leaving. I hadn't planned to have any sort of ultimatum in this conversation, but there it was. I'd laid down the gauntlet, whether I'd wanted to or not. Neither one of us said anything for a long time after that. I worried that maybe I'd pissed him off and succeeded at pushing him away. After all, he was a dragon. Clearly, Lucian enjoyed being tough and in charge. At long last, he cleared his throat. Then obviously, the solution is that I stay. I learn self-control, keep my dragon in check, and I learn how to be human. Really? I had to make sure I heard him right, that my ears weren't deceiving me. He nodded. Yes, really. It won't be easy, but the reward will be worth it. Wow, he did love me like he claimed. I thought for sure. Katerina, you need to believe me. I'll do anything for you. He leaned over and kissed my lips softly. For you and our child. For the first time, I really did believe him. He was proving it. Guilt stung my heart as the weight of what I'd just forced onto him hit home. I'd just asked him to deny his instincts for me. To hide half of his very being, his dragon. To give up his family and everything he was familiar with. To move to a foreign world where he knew no one and had nothing else but me. It was so much to ask, too much, really. And yet, Lucian loved me enough to do it. I should have been elated, but instead I felt like a horrible person. I just demanded he do something that I myself had just declared I would never do for him. I'm so sorry, I whispered. I... What are you apologising for? he asked, frowning. If you feel this is the best way for us to be together, I am going to trust that instinct. His confidence in my decision helped, and I moved forward to snuggle into his arms. But the weight of this conversation was going to haunt me. I could already tell. Chapter 14 Katerina Time passed, and we lived together just like any other human couple. I went to work, and Lucian remodelled the bathroom to make it more efficient for me and the baby. He continued to make my backyard gorgeous, installing a swing and building a playground. He drew up plans to fix my kitchen, but hadn't gotten around to actually doing the work just yet. He seemed to enjoy construction, it was how he kept busy while I was out of the house, and when I was at home, he waited on me hand and foot. I had mixed feelings about the latter. I loved how attentive he was to my needs and to those of our coming baby. Lucian was all in in that regard. However, as the weeks passed, our interactions began to feel hollow. Like he was with me in body, but not in spirit. He listened to me talk, but didn't say much in return. I thought maybe he was just being broody, but then I noticed he'd had an entire shift in attitude in general. He was very quiet. Somehow, 
Lucian didn't seem like the man I'd met the night of the wedding, and I wasn't quite sure what to do about it. I was in week 16 of my pregnancy and feeling a lot better. Once I'd gotten out of the first trimester, my appetite had returned and life had gotten a little easier. However, now I was growing a bump and becoming increasingly more uncomfortable. I had no idea how to tend to Lucian's emotional needs or what the problem even was. He wouldn't open up to me. How did I get him to do that? Not that I was any better. I was going to my third doctor's appointment to check in on the baby, and I didn't tell Lucian that's why I was leaving for the day, only that I had errands to run for a few hours. He hadn't gone to any of my appointments, actually. If I told him ahead of time, I knew he'd want to come with me. For the time being, I needed to go on my own. Part of me was still trying to wrap my head around growing a baby that was only half human, and I needed to process what that might mean for the pregnancy itself, and for the birth. I went to the clinic and sat in the lobby to wait. This appointment was the big one, the sonogram. I'd get to see our baby for the first time, and I was scared. What if the baby had wings or talons? The doctor would freak out. I would freak out. It'd be a mess. A mess that I didn't want Lucian to witness. My falling apart would hurt him, I was sure. Hearing the heartbeat for the first time hadn't been the picturesque moment I'd thought either. I remember listening to the rapid whooshing and bursting into tears because I'd assumed that was abnormal, that I was listening to the sounds of an alien. It took the doctor twenty minutes to talk me down and to tell me everything was, in fact, just perfect. Every visit I was told that, actually. The baby was practically perfect. That scared me more for some reason. I didn't want to rob Lucian of these precious moments, but I was so tired of him seeing me crying, upset, sick, or anything potentially negative. No wonder he seemed so miserable all the time. He was stuck with me. Katerina Smythe, a nurse called into the lobby. I stood and we began the process. She checked all my standard stats, then walked me back to the ultrasound room. I lay on the exam chair and got comfortable. Warm goo was spread over my rounded belly and a wand placed on top. To an outsider, I probably didn't look pregnant. I noticed the difference in my stomach structure, though. I liked seeing the evidence. My heart was pounding and I felt like I was going to be sick. What was I going to see on the screen? Wings? Or something more human-like? I focused on the screen, and soon an image appeared. The baby looked like a baby. Those are the feet, the technician explained, pointing to the little white bones. And there's two of them, I asked. She laughed. Yup and two hands and two eyes and a nose. Your baby looks great. Let's take some measurements. Oh, okay. I adjusted a little and stared at the image on the screen. Sure enough, two eyes, a nose, a mouth. So human and normal. Was I wrong? Or had I dreamed that Lucian was a dragon? No, he'd definitely turned into a dragon and I'd been in my sound mind when I witnessed it. The technician measured the baby's length. Seems to be a little bigger than usual at this point. Are you sure the conception date is right? Yeah, I said. Positive. Before that night at the wedding, it had been almost six months since my last sexual encounter. She made a note in my file, and I tried not to worry. Did you want to know the sex? For now, can we keep it a surprise? I asked, though I was dying to know. That decision was definitely something I wanted to include Lucian on, though it was yet another thing he and I hadn't talked about. Did we want to know, or did we want to wait? Would there be a party to reveal the news to everyone? Who would even come? His family and my sisters were all in another realm, and my dad was too unwell to attend a gender reveal event. The technician smiled. 
I'll put it in an envelope for you, and when you're ready, you can look. Or not. Thanks, I managed, though the weight of my guilt was growing by the minute. I should have brought him today. He would have loved to see our baby. We're all done. I'll leave you to get cleaned up. I nodded, grateful there wasn't much more to the appointment, because my mind was running a million miles a minute. The whole drive home, I tried to decipher my feelings from the facts. Sometimes, the two got jumbled together. Fact. I was pregnant, and starting to get excited about becoming a mother. The more time passed, the more connected I felt to the baby. I was coming to terms with the unexpected way the baby had come into existence. Fact. Being with Lucian made me feel wonderful. He was a great man who deserved the world. Fact. Lucian was a dragon shifter. He could change his form, and that was a trait my baby might have as well. Not might. Did. Deep down in their genetic code, Lucian's dragon would live on in my child. A baby. Kids in general. I knew what to do. Dragons? Not so much. I wouldn't be able to teach him or her how to have control over their shifting or flying or about fated mates and the mystery behind how that worked. In fact, there was a lot about their heritage I was still clueless about. Would Lucian be able to teach them safely in our current home? What if the neighbours saw? What if the baby breathed fire and the house burnt down? What if... There were a lot of those questions, and they all had a similar solution. We had to go back to Lucian's realm. Our baby needed to be with its own kind. Not the answer I wanted to face, but I made peace with the hard truth on the ride home from the doctor's surgery. I parked the car, then walked into the house, rehearsing the coming conversation in my mind. Lucian would be disappointed I'd excluded him from so much, but hopefully he'd be relieved to know that we'd be moving back to his icy land and that large and not-so-comforting castle. I shivered just thinking about it. When I walked inside, Lucian was in the kitchen taking measurements. When his gaze fell on me, my heart sank. Despite the smile he wore on his lips, the light didn't reach his eyes. And his face... It had sunken in. When had he gotten so thin? Even his broad shoulders looked like a shell of their former glory. How had I missed such a dramatic transformation? Lucian wasn't just miserable living here with me. He looked like he was dying. The longer he denied his dragon for me, the worse his condition became. I put my hands over my face. My God, Lucian! I'm so sorry. Hmm, he asked. For? Everything, I whispered. I don't know what to do. He walked over and put his arms around me. About what, beautiful? About us. His body stiffened. What do you mean? This isn't working, I blurted out, which was far from the graceful speech I'd planned in the car. Lucian's obvious deterioration had snapped me into a terrible headspace. Seeing him in such a state shook me. Lucian balked. Again, what do you mean? I thought things were going well between us. We're not fighting. We're creating a home. Nothing has been bad. Are you kidding me? I shook my head, only just holding in my tears. Lucian, I can see it all over your face. Your whole demeanour. Staying here is bad for you. You hate it here. No, I don't, he growled. Yes, you do. I threw up my hands and turned away, because if I continued to study his thin face and frame, I'd break into ugly crying. And I hate myself for doing this to you. You deserve so much better than staying here with me. He gasped. Hardly. You are my true mate. You're the perfect one for me. Wherever you are is the place I'm meant to be. 
I'm not the perfect one for you, I snapped. I'm killing you. You've lost weight. You don't look happy. You seem weak. This isn't right. None of this is okay. Stop lying to me to save my feelings and be honest with me for a change. How am I supposed to trust you otherwise? Lucian didn't respond right away. Fine, he said at last. You want honesty. I'll give you honesty. You're right. I'm not happy. I'm miserable. I cringed. Hearing the truth stung, but I also let out a breath I didn't know I'd been holding as relief washed over me. Truth. Finally. Now we were getting somewhere. I spun back around to face him. I'm not happy because I feel like I'm worthless to you, he said. Every day you make it a point to tell me that you don't need me. That this is temporary until you determine if I meet your expectations. I work all day long trying to please you, and now it feels like you're throwing it back in my face. I'm not, I mumbled. All I've asked for is a more realistic pacing. I don't want to run off and marry a guy I just met a week ago. It hasn't been a week. It's been... Sixteen, I interjected. Yes, I know. I patted my growing belly. Believe me, I know. He growled again. Well, I didn't ask you to marry me. The way he said it made it sound as if he never intended to either. No, no you didn't. So I don't understand why you're so mad. Because you just yelled at me for wanting something real with you. Tears fell down my cheeks. That's all I've ever wanted. Something real. You play the part of a dutiful husband well. You take care of me physically, but you don't talk to me. You act more like you're my prisoner than anything else. And you're not. I dared to look at him again and saw the deepest of glares. I shuddered. Where else am I supposed to go? He asked. I need to be with you and the baby to make sure you're both okay. No, you don't. I blinked away more tears. We're doing just fine. The doctor said he or she is in prime health. And big. I still had the closed envelope that had the sex of the baby sealed away. We can even find out what we're having if you'd like to know. I thought the news might soften him. I was wrong. His chest puffed up. You've seen our child. Why didn't you tell me? You're so quick to attack me for being silent, and you're keeping back just as much. You're right, I admitted. Maybe this is a sign we're a bad match. We don't trust each other enough to open up and share. Oh my God. How did this conversation turn so wrong so quickly? You refuse to give me a chance. He shook his head. Never have you said I'm your prisoner but you treat me like one. You hint that I must remain locked away, out of sight of others, and I can't be myself. If I want to shift and let my inner dragon free, then I'm not welcome in your life. You said if I loved you, I would stay. If you loved me, you wouldn't have asked me to change who I am at my very core. I hiccuped, sobbing. Like I said, it's a sign. We're not good together. This was a mistake. My hand instinctively went to my stomach, and the reality hit me that I was about to be a single mother. His eyes honed in on that gesture. I see. He stormed out of the room, making his way to the back door. I followed him, trying to think of anything that could possibly save what remained of our relationship. Lucian, I'm so sorry. I wanted to say that we'd be better in his realm, that I'd move there for him. But for some reason, the words stuck in my throat and wouldn't spill forth. This is my fault, he ground out. I was the one foolish enough to think the fated mate bond was real. 
that I could earn your love. I know now that's not how this works. You're the most incredible woman I've ever met. When you let me see your heart, it's gorgeous. I love you. I don't think you want me to love you, though. And that breaks me in two. So much pain was in his dark eyes, it broke my heart to see it. He stepped fully outside, then his body hunched forward and his skin melted into scales. I stumbled back, both afraid and in awe of what was about to happen. Soon, his whole body had transformed into a huge dragon. He turned his enormous head and stared at me for a few seconds. Then, with a few graceful beats of his wings, he lifted into the sky. I watched him fly into the clouds and disappear from view. I fell to my knees and broke down into sobs. The best thing to ever happen to me had just flown out of my life for good. Chapter 15 Lucian This was a mistake. Katerina's words echoed in my head like a death knell as I flew away from the woman I loved. She'd touched her stomach as she'd said it, and the message was loud and clear. Our baby wasn't wanted. I wasn't wanted. Everything we'd been building together these past few months was a lie. She didn't even think enough of me to invite me to that medical appointment that is one of the highlights of a pregnancy. My anger was divided. Yes, I was mad at her for keeping so much from me. For not giving our relationship the chance it deserved. However, I also knew I could have done so much more to make her feel safe and comfortable. She didn't open up to me for a reason, and it was because I'd let her down and not opened up to her. I'd stupidly believed that if I kept my thoughts and feelings to myself, she'd see me as patient and attentive, selfless, ready to step up and be an amazing father to our unborn child. Obviously, that wasn't the right approach, and I didn't understand what she wanted from me. Why did I continue to get it all wrong? You know why, I chided myself. It's because you've never learned how to love. It's like the blind trying to lead the blind. That's why I'd failed so epically. But I'd tried. I tried so damn hard. She didn't even give me an inch. Why did she still not believe me when I told her I loved her? Leaving again was probably a mistake, but I had to get away. I had to breathe, to fly. I'd spent too much time in that house, trying to make it a perfect home, and the result was destroying me. She was right about one thing, I was miserable, and I did feel trapped. I knew the only way I'd be able to think clearly would be to fly. So I left. And if I was honest, I wasn't sure if I'd be going back. Katerina had made it clear she didn't want me there. She was freeing me from my obligations to her and our child. Would she turn this around on me or accept her part of the responsibility of failing as a couple? Would she ever see that her fear of being loved, her absolute conviction that she was somehow unlovable, was breaking us before we even had a chance to be strong? As I flew through the sky and toward the barrier between her realm and mine, I thought about my next action, which was critical. If I followed my anger, left and never returned, I'd be repeating the cycle started by my father. He abandoned Dimitri and me when we were young, and that created a hole in my heart I wouldn't wish on anyone. But Katerina didn't want me, and continuing to stay and then fight with her would be disrespecting the wishes of my mate. Following my heart could be just as disastrous for us both. What if she hated me for being too pushy and aggressive? She could just as easily hate me for giving up. I was damned either way. On top of the rage, my heart ached in a way I had never experienced before. I'd just lost my mate, possibly forever. Katerina didn't love me. 
She thought everything we'd done together was a waste. She'd kept me from being myself, quite deliberately. No wonder I felt so off in her world. I was depressed and hadn't even realised it. Katerina saw my misery. That has to mean something. She had the wisdom to see that we came from two different worlds that weren't compatible. We were not compatible, and that put me in a state of mourning. I'd been given the chance to bond with my mate, and we'd done our duty. It hadn't worked. Now it seemed that was all we'd get in our life together. Those moments of bliss would forever remain in my memory. I'd remember what could have been and always regret that I couldn't figure out how to make it work. As much as I wanted to blame my father for that, I knew it was my problem. Dimitri made his love and his marriage work. He'd learned how to push past his trauma and pain. Me? Not so much. It took a lot to ruin things with a soulmate. We were supposed to be perfect for one another. But I'd managed to destroy any hope of happiness for both of us. I crossed through to my realm, a shiver of cold passing over my skin. I was home. I considered going straight to Damon's castle to speak with him about my situation. If he had advice or insight that could change my fate, I'd gladly take it. However, there was the possibility that he'd call me an idiot, have no wisdom left to share, and tell me that I was a lost cause. The ridicule could wait. I needed solitude and a place to properly vent my feelings so I didn't destroy the castle I'd spent so much time repairing. Besides, I felt more at home in the quietness of the woods than I did in the grandness of the castle. I wasn't the kind of man who needed luxury. I only stayed to be close to my brother and build my relationship with my family. We were stronger together. Without them, I'm not sure I could hold myself together. I turned in the direction of the rudimentary house I'd spent most of my life living in. Dark, ominous clouds hung over the forest. Lightning streaked the sky. I paused to assess, slowly flapping my tired wings. The weather seemed like some kind of sign from the divine, begging me to turn around and go back to Katerina. Make it work, the rumbles of thunder urged. A request I ignored. There wasn't another settlement to land in nearby. I could cut through the storm to the house with minimal damage, or I could take the long way around and go to the castle after all. The thought of talking to either of my brothers before I felt ready was enough to make me scowl at that option. It was just a thunderstorm. Those were common. I'd flown through plenty of them before. Forward was my choice as I entered the thick, billowing clouds. The wind tossed me and the rain stung as it battered my scales at full force. I welcomed the pain. It gave me plenty of distraction from the torture inside my heart. All I wanted to do was get back to the house and wallow in peace. A sudden gust of wind gripped my wings, causing my whole body to tip and lose balance in the air current. The storm was stronger than I'd realised, but I was confident I could handle things. Then the hail started to pelt my body. Small orbs of ice at first, that rapidly grew in size. They hit me so hard and so fast, they began to rip my skin. One tore through the softer flesh of my right wing, and I screamed with surprise at the searing fire that came with the tear. Lightning flashed in front of me, and I had only a second to try and dodge it. Without the stability of two full wings, I lost control and tumbled backward through the sky with another surge of wind. I rolled end over end through the clouds and toward the ground. The trees quickly came into view. If I didn't do something fast, I was going to crash land. With a grunt and a growl, I managed to right myself again. My wing hurt so badly, the area was starting to go numb from the pain. More hail slammed into my body, the rain falling so hard that it might as well have been knives. This was much harder than it had ever been before. By neglecting my dragon for so long, 
being in that form felt foreign and weak. I didn't have the same instincts or the same strength that I'd had before I left my realm. Lightning flashed, and this time I wasn't quick enough to evade. Flying into the storm had been a mistake, and it was one I would pay for dearly. Electricity coursed through my system as a huge jolt of pain seared my whole body. The smell of burning flesh and smoke mixed in my nostrils. My vision blurred and I spiralled toward the earth. I had just enough strength to flap my wings and push myself over the treetops and onto a nearby open field. The top branches of one of the forest trees grazed my belly as I barely missed crashing into them. I landed hard on the ground, dirt and crops spraying everywhere as I rolled and eventually came to a stop. I closed my eyes, feeling sick. My head, no, my entire body, throbbed with every beat of my heart. Spots of light lit my vision. I was so dizzy. Light-headed almost. Like I was floating. Is this how it ends? Katerina, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have left you and our child. The lights disappeared and the world went dark. We've got to get him to transform, someone said, the voice sounding distant. It's the only way we can get him back to the castle. He's unconscious, another said with an annoyed tone. How do you expect him to do that? Someone stroked my snout. Wake up, your highness. We need you to wake up. I groaned as my body coursed with pain. I told you he was alive, the first person said. It was a man. Your Highness, we need you to turn back into a human. We can't carry you in your dragon form. Nothing he said made sense to me. I roared and tried to push him away, my dragon instincts taking over. The dragon wanted to flee, to lick his wounds alone. Every movement I made only increased the terrible agony. That was a good sign, I supposed. Before, I'd been feeling cold and numb. If I could feel pain and discomfort, then perhaps I'd live to see another day. Live to try and make things right with Katerina. Eventually, what they were saying began to make some sense. They wanted to move me, but as a dragon, I was too large for them. Turning back into a human, however, might be more of a challenge. But I had to try. I did my best to block out the pain and focus on my human shape. The familiar sensation of shifting fell over me, but it didn't last long. I reverted back to my dragon form almost immediately. I was too weak to change. We could try and take him back to the castle on my cart, the second voice said, a woman. They can help him more there than we can. And he might fit. Just. She touched my scales with a gentle hand. Hold on, your highness. They manoeuvred a cart next to me, and somehow, with their guiding hands, I managed to lift up enough that they could roll me onto the vehicle. Though the anguish that ripped through my body at the movements was strong enough to make me pass out once more. When I awoke, I was being transported in the cart. I barely fit, but it would suffice for travel. The storm continued to rumble overhead, though the worst of it had now passed. I must have blacked out again, because the next moment, a sharp jolt woke me. I was still in the cart. When my vision focused, I could see the gates of Damon's castle in front of us. My brothers were at my side, walking beside the cart. Thank God you were there to find him, Dimitri said. Lucian, Damon said. Can you hear me? Do you understand where you are? I groaned in response, wanting them to know I did, but I couldn't shift back to tell them so. Here, this is for your help, Sarah said at the gate, offering the people who'd helped me something. I couldn't see. No, we don't need. I insist, Sarah said, and that was the last I heard of her voice. They brought me inside the castle grounds, and then multiple hands were on my scales, and I was eventually inside the warmth of the palace itself. As soon as the huge front doors closed, 
something that felt like a soft cloud settled over my skin. Some kind of blanket. I was carried into one of the large dens and laid on a rug. Dimitri rubbed my body with his hands, trying to warm me. We need you to turn back into a human, brother. Then we can help you more, Damon said. He put another thick blanket over me. The extra heat helped to wake me up. Being cold always made me sleepy. With the warmth, some of my strength returned. I tried once more to become human, and this time the transformation stuck. I shivered beneath the blankets, still wet and injured from my attempted journey through the storm. What are you doing here? Dimitri asked. Is everything okay? Katerina. Her name was the only word I could manage. My head hurt, and my heart pounded fiercely despite its ache. Why was it so cold? I couldn't stop shivering. Damon put a hand to my forehead. He's burning up. We need to get him into bed. I tried to stand on the rug beneath me, but my legs wouldn't hold my weight. My brothers each put an arm around my shoulders, holding me up between them. We've got you, Dimitri said. You're going to be okay now. Cat, I tried again. Is she in trouble? Is that why you rushed back here? Dimitri asked. I shook my head, wanting to tell him all about how she didn't want me anymore. Perhaps he could see it in my eyes, because his expression changed from worry to grief. He sighed. You need rest, then everything will be better. I wanted to argue with him. Nothing would ever be okay again. Instead, I blacked out once more. The next time I opened my eyes, I was in my own room, wrapped tightly in blankets, a moist cloth resting on my forehead. I'm not sure the fever is breaking, Sarah said, her voice just above a whisper. Dimitri sighed. I'm worried. He shouldn't be this sick. This isn't normal. The farmers said they saw him get struck by lightning. It's a miracle he's even alive. His injuries mixed with the cold, it made him vulnerable. He might have pneumonia. Sarah took in a slow breath. We need to get Katerina here. We don't know why he returned home in the first place, Dimitri said. What if there's a problem? She's not in danger, but something happened. I think it has to do with her. He keeps saying her name, even when he's not conscious. All the more reason to get her here now, Sarah insisted. They need to be together. It's the only way he's going to recover. I wanted to tell them both to leave Katerina alone. She'd been hurt enough because of me. But I was too tired, too cold. I couldn't fight them. Dimitri let out a heavy breath. I'll go get her. Tell Lucian to hang on. Be careful, Sarah said. I heard them kiss. A few seconds later, she moved her hand under the blankets to hold mine. Hear that? Hang on, Lucian. Katerina is coming. Hold on for her. Her and the baby. Yes, I would do that. I think I nodded. And then I drifted away once more. Chapter 16 Katerina I don't know how long I cried after Lucian left. I didn't move from where I'd fallen to my knees. There was a vain hope running through my mind that maybe he'd return to me. And yet, I knew full well he wouldn't. Last time he left, it had been two weeks before he had the courage to come back. This time, he had no reason to return, beyond the baby, of course. But I'd made it pretty clear I didn't want him around, even though that was totally wrong. Of course I wanted him. I loved him. Everything was a huge mess now, and it was all because of me. Had I ever told him how I felt? No. I hadn't, 
and now maybe he would never know that someone loved him in return. My fault, my brain kept taunting, over and over. Why did I do this kind of thing to myself? Something good came my way, and I pushed it aside because I was too scared of being dumped later. He was right. I had pushed away first. Why the hell would anyone stick around when they weren't wanted? The answer was, they wouldn't. Could I truly be upset with him for leaving? How could I possibly fix this? My hands cradled my stomach. I'm so sorry, little one. It's my fault you're not going to know who your dad is. It's my fault you're not going to have a solid home like I'd been hoping. It's all my fault. I sat there on the deck until I felt completely hollow inside. How could I not feel empty? My true love had just left my life. My true love. I still didn't believe in the fated mates concept, but there was no denying that Lucian was my perfect other half. He might have flaws, but so what? I had plenty of my own. The way he complimented my personality was unparalleled, and the way I missed him now that he was gone was devastating. This went beyond him being the father of my baby. Even without the child growing in my stomach, I'd miss Lucian like I'd miss breathing air. I wasn't sure how to live without him. I'd get by if I had to. And I did have to. I was responsible for another life now. There was more at stake than just my own happiness. But my life would never be complete. I'd always feel hollow and like a piece of me had died if Lucian didn't come back to me. I should have been calmer when speaking with him, had more patience and been clear about my intentions. When I'd left the doctor, the plan hadn't been to push him out of my life and go solo. I wanted him to be happy, and it was obvious he wasn't happy with me. We'd both come to the same conclusion. He didn't belong in my world, and denying his true self was making him a husk of the man I'd known. Hot tears blurred my vision as I gulped in air. I'd let my insecurities get the better of me. I'd been so blind. I had to speak to him, somehow. But how did I find him to apologise? I could call Sarah, I said, thinking aloud. She's married to his brother. If I could tell him I was sorry, then maybe we could at least find a way to move forward for the baby's sake. Some sort of connection with Lucian was better than nothing. But the cell phone reception between realms was crap, barely there at all, and when I'd tried to contact Nadia a few weeks ago, I'd gotten the merest hint of a word here or there, and then nothing. Not enough to provide a heartfelt apology to Lucian, that was for sure. Damn it. There was too much about that world I didn't understand. Why did I waste so much of my time with Lucian, ignoring that part of him? I could have quizzed him about his world and learned everything about it. I would have been in a much better position now if I had. I rubbed my stomach, feeling my strength return. I had a plan. Don't be like me, kiddo. I should have asked more questions and gotten to know him better. Magic is real. Dragons exist. You're one of them, and I never want you to feel like that is wrong. I could at least do better with my child. I would. It'd be a small way I could atone for my sins against Lucian. Finally, I got to my feet, opening the back door and walking into the living room. There I swayed, exhausted. I was just about to lay down in bed so I could wallow some more when I heard a male voice shouting my name from outside. Katerina! Lucian? I called back, my heart in my throat. It sounded enough like him. Maybe he was learning from his past too. Maybe he had no plans to stay away after all. Maybe he was ready to talk and... I ran to the front door and yanked it open. Not Lucian, but Dimitri. My sister's husband stood on the porch. 
He was shirtless, but blessedly wore a pair of jeans. God knew where he'd gotten them from, but I was grateful he wasn't naked. He gazed about, frantic. Katerina, thank God you're home. What's wrong? Is Sarah okay? The panic in his eyes said it all. Something bad had happened. He shook his head. It's Lucian. He... He heaved a few heavy breaths. It was clear he'd flown a long way and at speed. I ran inside to get him a glass of water, my heart pounding. What had he meant about Lucian? Come in! Once he stepped inside and closed the door, I handed him the drink. Here. Now tell me. Lucian. He's okay, right? Dimitri gulped it down, shaking his head, and my stomach lurched. Lucian is injured. No, sick. Well, actually, he's both. What do you mean he's injured and sick? I demanded. I'd seen him an hour ago. Or was it more? I couldn't tell now how long I'd sat on the decking. He flew home and some farmers found him. They said they saw him get struck by lightning in a storm and he fell out of the sky. My hand went to my chest. Oh God, is he, is he? No, he couldn't die. Not now. Not after everything I'd said to him. He fell out of the sky. He's alive? He has to be. My voice was a mere whisper. He is, for now. But for how long, I don't know, Dimitri said. Our dragon forms are strong. We can withstand many things. Lucian doesn't seem to be at his full strength, though. His body seemed to recover from most of the injuries, but he has an awful fever. I think he's exerted too much of himself to heal, and it's left him susceptible to illness. I shook my head. He had to be okay. Lucian is strong. He's the toughest guy I've ever met. Normally, I'd agree, but the man lying in his bed is. He closed his eyes. That's not the brother I'm familiar with. It's my fault. My voice cracked on the words. Hmm? I brushed hot tears away from my eyes. It's my fault. He's been living his life here as a human. I've been making him ignore his dragon side. We got into a fight and... and... That fills in a few gaps. Dimitri walked over and put his hands on my shoulders. Dwelling on our mistakes won't fix our future. What matters is what you choose to do next. I nodded, amazed at how gracious and kind he was being, even though I'd basically admitted to killing his brother. I need you to come back to the castle with me, Dimitri said, his voice steady and calm. If you return and show him how sorry you are, then it might give him the courage and the will to keep fighting. That sounded too easy. Could it be? Would Lucian so easily forgive me? I'd only scraped the surface of our problems in my couple of sentences summarizing our issues. I'd done so much more than keep Lucian from turning into a dragon. I'd destroyed him. And his beautiful soul. I didn't want to tell Dimitri about the baby. Not yet. My sister needed to know before him, and she needed to hear about it from my lips. Lucian would want to share the news with his brother, most likely. Who was I to rob him of that experience? Not after I'd already taken so much from him already. Please, Katerina, Dimitri begged. I'll take you back. Things can be made right again. So much hope shone in his eyes. Do you really think my presence will help him get better? I think you're the only one who can save him. His voice was so quiet, so shaky. He was genuinely scared. Lucian might die. My heart thumped madly at the thought. Suddenly, I couldn't wait to get moving. Let me pack some stuff. I'll be quick. But I'm going to need more than just the clothes on my back. If he's sick, 
this might be a long game. Not to mention the fact that it was freaking freezing where he lived. Yes, good thinking. The worry on Dimitri's face shifted to relief. I'll drink some more water while you pack and get myself hydrated for the journey back. Do whatever you need. My house is yours. We're family now, right? I gave him a quavering smile. He nodded and, after a moment, smiled back. I'll be ready in a flash. I hurried to my room and quickly packed a bag with winter-appropriate wear. It was always cold in Lucian's realm, and I hadn't been prepared for that last visit. Extra layers would be good. I also packed my doctor-ordered vitamins and some other medical supplies. While Lucian's realm had witches and magic, I wasn't sure if there was a need for modern medicine. Silly, I suppose, but it made me feel useful and like I could make a difference. That, right there, was part of the problem, I guess. Lucian was a dragon, and from a world of magic, mystery, and things I'd only dreamed of. I was an ordinary woman from an ordinary world. I thought that by making him a part of my world, by making him more ordinary and ignoring the scaly elephant in the room, that we'd fit together better. That I could force it to make sense. But I couldn't. The idea had only made things worse, and now Lucian was paying the ultimate price. I wasn't sure my presence really would make a difference. In fact, I was positive all I would do was take up space and get in the way. But I'd do my best, both to support him and to earn that title of soulmate that he claimed belonged to me. A title I'd never thought I'd hold in anyone's heart, and one I'd certainly never tried to live up to. Until now. So much didn't make sense but I'd made everything a mess. It was on me to clean it up and put things right. Even if we didn't end up together, I didn't want our child not knowing who his father was. If Lucian died because of my selfishness, that was a weight I wouldn't be able to carry. How would I ever explain that to our son or daughter? I hesitated and looked over at the envelope that contained the sex of the baby. Did I bring it along? Did I ruin the surprise? What if Lucian didn't make it? He could at least know what his future child was before he moved on. I hated the thought, but if life had taught me anything, it was to always prepare for the worst. I packed the envelope into the bag, tucking it deep under my clothes for safekeeping, just in case. We're not going to need to open it, though. Not unless you tell me you want to know. A silent prayer, and I hoped whatever greater power existed heard it. With my bag packed and the cloak I'd borrowed from the other realm wrapped around me, I went back to the kitchen to find Dimitri. He'd replenished with more water and whatever he could find in my refrigerator. Together, we cleaned up the small mess, and I locked up the house. Would I ever walk back through these doors? It might be a long time. I hoped I'd return at some stage, and I hoped Lucian would be with me when I did. This place wouldn't feel like home without him. Let's go, I said. I climbed onto Dimitri's back, closed my eyes, held on tight, and flew with him to the other realm. Dimitri flew harder and faster than Damon had. Talk about a rush. As scary as it was, I also enjoyed the ride. I wondered what it would be like to fly on Lucian's back. We landed near the snow-covered castle, and Sarah was waiting for us in the foyer of the castle. She hugged me tightly. I'm so glad you came back, she whispered. I think you're the only one who can help him. I pulled back and nodded. Take me to him. Together, we hurried up the stairs to his room. There, lying on the bed we'd once made love in, was Lucian. His eyes were squeezed shut, like he was looking away from something terrifying. Sweat beaded his face, yet his entire body shivered under the heavy blankets wrapped over his body. My heart thudded in my chest at the sight. I rushed over to him and placed a hand on his forehead. He feels like fire! And he did. 
He was boiling hot to the touch. It's bad, Sarah whispered. I'm not sure what the actual temperature is, but I'm worried. I pulled out the heat-sensing thermometer that I'd brought with me and ran it over his forehead, then gasped at the number. 107.4? Any human would be almost dead with a temp like that. Do you think it's too late for him? Sarah asked. I'm not sure what's normal for his kind, I said. He's still here, and he's still fighting. That's a sign. We're not giving up. I gazed down at Lucian. You hear that? We're not giving up. His body shivered. Katerina, the forest, we... Tell me all about it later, I said. I can't wait to hear it when you're better. Father, he grumbled. I placed a hand on his chest, wanting to comfort him. His body seemed to ease at my touch. A step in the right direction. Lucian, I'm here for you. Please rest now, and we can talk when you're better. You're not going to get well unless you rest. His eyes remained closed, but they weren't so tightly pressed together. The crinkles and creases in his face disappeared, and his breathing became more even, deep and slow. Dimitri was right. My presence was making a difference. I leant over him and pressed a gentle kiss to his hot forehead. I'm not going anywhere, I whispered against his skin. Promise. Hold on so you can meet. I sighed and glanced over at my sister, but she was folding linens in the corner of the room. Just hold on, I said instead. For now, that would have to be good enough. I got comfortable by Lucien's side and settled into the chair beside the bed. I was going to be here for the long haul. Chapter 17 Katerina Over the next two days, I didn't leave Lucien's side unless absolutely necessary. I ate my meals by his bed and I slept on an extra mattress in the room on the floor beside him. I was still pretty tired from being pregnant. Exhausted in body, but with not much else to do beyond being worried, I was also a little bored. The general consensus for Lucian's illness was some kind of mystery virus that had gotten to him in his exhausted state. Everyone agreed he was lucky to be alive. I dressed in loose clothing to hide the small bump growing in my belly. I'm not sure how obvious it was to outsiders, but to me, it felt like the whole world could see what was going on. No one said anything about it, though, so I knew it must all be in my head. They didn't notice I wasn't quite eating as much as usual at breakfast or lunch. While most of my morning sickness was gone, my appetite had definitely been affected by the pregnancy. I hadn't entered the glowing portion of pregnancy, nor that moment where I could eat whatever I wanted. Certain foods still turned me off, certain smells too. Cooking meat especially, and dragons loved their roasted meat. Any ideas on how I can tell your brother to not make his food so rich in flavour? I asked Lucian one afternoon. I often talked to him, even though he didn't answer, so he would know he wasn't alone. I sighed. Some of his cooking doesn't make the baby happy. I haven't told him about our kiddo yet. I thought you'd like that honour, so I need to find a way to tell him that I can't eat the rich food without insulting him. Because it's not bad food. It just isn't sitting right with me. You know? I waited to see if maybe Lucian would answer this time. He didn't even stir, just continued to sleep soundly. At least he looked peaceful when he slept. When I'd first arrived, his face had often contorted into anguish. Now he fought his virus in peace and hopefully some measure of comfort. We'd managed to drop the fever down to a lower 100.3. And there it had stayed. Lucian wouldn't open his eyes, though. I didn't know what to think, but it had only been two and a half days. My mother always said that sleep was the best weapon against sickness. But I did worry. A lot. 
I guess I'll have to get to know him on my own and find a good way to ask him, I mumbled. Though I'm sure Sarah would have plenty of tips. I hate bothering her with anything. You shouldn't, Sarah said quietly from the doorway. She bit her lip and walked further into the room. Sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted, let alone eavesdropped. How much did you hear? I asked. She walked over and put a hand on my shoulder. Not a whole lot. Just that I might have tips on something. Talking to your husband, I said. I can't eat what he's been making. Yeah? Sarah raised an eyebrow. Uh, yeah, it's a little too rich. Hopefully, Sarah would assume it was some kind of diet fad. I prepared myself for her speech on how I was beautiful and didn't need to worry about my weight or figure. I always hated hearing it come from her because I didn't think she'd ever understand. But it was a speech that never came. Because of the baby, right? she asked instead. I tilted my head to the side and my mouth dropped open. You knew? As soon as you came into the castle? She squeezed my shoulder. And I'm so happy for you. How? I asked, still floored. Your bump is not discreet, she said, with a huge grin on her face. And you're absolutely radiant. So I was glowing, and no one was looking at me like I was just getting extra fat. They'd figured it out. I closed my eyes and let out a breath, relief washing over me. My pregnancy is another of the reasons we fought. Sarah pulled another chair from its place against the wall and dragged it over to Lucian's bedside. Tell me everything, Cat. Start from when he showed up on your doorstep, because I want to hear it all. I nodded and readied myself to spill everything. Okay, well, when he first arrived I was surprised but excited. We'd had a, um... Really good night together at your wedding. I coughed, my cheeks growing warm with embarrassment. Don't get me wrong, the dragon thing scared the crap out of me, but we'd connected on so many levels. He lived with me for a few months, and I introduced him to my students. I showed him normal, boring, human life. Sarah's eyebrows flicked up. Did the two of you get along well? Yes. He wanted to come back here with me, and I told him I wouldn't go. I sighed. Because this world, it doesn't feel like home. I gestured at the castle. Not quite my style. I'm not a fairy tale princess. Sarah opened her mouth, then closed it and sighed. I'm not, I repeated. And it has nothing to do with how I look. The way I live doesn't mesh well with it either. Anyway, what I didn't realise was that in telling him I couldn't live in his realm, I forced him into my life, which didn't suit him at all. That's what started the fight. He didn't like it, she asked. I shook my head. He didn't complain or anything. It was me that told him I hated seeing him so miserable. I told him he should leave. I hadn't meant for it to come out the way it did, but we were both heated and I was so tired. Not just physically, but tired of everything. He wasn't talking to me anymore. We weren't bonding. He looked miserable, and he was losing weight. I just knew I was the problem. Cat. Sarah shook her head. I highly doubt that was it. It was. I blinked away a few tears. He fixed my house and did all the dutiful husband things without even having the title perfect on paper. His soul was missing, though. I saw the empty vessel I made him. Shouldn't I be making him feel complete? That's what a soulmate is supposed to do, right? Were you hiding your true self from him, too? She asked. Not the question I was expecting. I had to think about that one for a moment. Kind of. He said I was pushing him away, and I can't argue with that. I was. I'm scared of letting him get to know me properly. When I let the walls down, that's when guys leave. 
Lucian isn't like other guys, though. He's your fated mate, Sarah insisted. And that means nothing to me, I snapped. A magic bond that automatically makes us perfect for each other. Seriously? He loves me because of a mystical force. How is that real? I thought she, of all people, would understand. I want him to love me for me. He does. Sarah gazed over at Lucian's sleeping form. If you asked him right now, he would say so himself. That he doesn't love you because of magic. How are you so sure? Because the fated mate bond, it doesn't. She pressed her lips together. I'm trying to think of how to explain this. It's an attraction, right? Like the moment he first walks into the room, you feel complete, but you don't know why. How you just knew you had to talk to him. It's a force that puts the two of you together, sure. But it doesn't make the love happen. That's you. I nodded, listening, wanting to believe. Yeah, I did feel that way. Sort of. Maybe not so strong. Not at first. That came later when he was at the house. Like when he left after our fight. I felt it the worst then, the disconnect, I mean. Like part of my soul had just been severed. Right. Sarah gave me a warm smile. With the dragons, they feel these sensations at an amplified level. The fated mate bond pulls the two of you together because it knows that you are everything he'd ever want in a mate. Personality, sex appeal, all of it. I scoffed. Right, I'm so sexy. You are. Have you seen him, though? He's gorgeous. I pinched the bridge of my nose. In ways that I don't compare. Why do you assume that? She asked, frowning. Because I think the two of you look hot together. You get him to shine in ways I'd never seen. You. You bring that out of him. He didn't look anywhere near as good with Nadia whenever I saw them together. When Dimitri thought they were a thing, I didn't really see it. Nadia, I mumbled. That makes things weird. Nothing happened, though, Sarah said. I shook my head. But he thought they were supposed to be together. Did he act all smitten with her like he did me? And then when he learned she wasn't the one, he turned it off. She laughed. That's not how it went down. He knew the moment he saw her that she wasn't the one. It made him so upset he destroyed the castle. Didn't he tell you that story? A version of it, I mumbled. So he didn't even try? To make things work, I mean. Nope. Sarah shook her head. He took care of her while she was sick. She motioned to Lucian in the bed. Similar to this, actually. The moment she woke up and looked at him, he got all rough and grumpy. They were like oil and water. Hearing it from Sarah made the doubt fade further. As much as I'd wanted to believe Lucian when he said it, I'd been lied to so much in the past. A few bad apples really did spoil the bunch. But Lucian had never lied or led me astray. I put my head in my hands. What's wrong with me? Why can't I just trust him? Why do you think you're not worthy of love? Sarah countered. And don't say it's because you're fat. Please. I hate hearing that kind of talk. Fat isn't a bad word, I grumbled. It was just true. No, but saying you don't deserve love because of something so petty. That's negative thinking and unjust. Your appearance has nothing to do with your heart. So why? She folded her arms in front of her chest. I had no arguments. Because no one has wanted to before, I guess. Lucian does. And I realise that now, but I've messed things up so badly. You can still fix it, Sarah insisted. He's listening. Tell him what you need him to know. I gazed over at him. I need him to know that I do love him for him. 
even the dragon sighed. It's a beautiful piece of his soul, even if he's rough and grumpy. Sarah giggled. Yes, he's definitely that. I promise he's a great guy, though. She paused. Did I ever tell you about how he saved Nadia and me from kidnappers? No. I blinked. You told me Dimitri rescued you from something bad, but what? When were you kidnapped? A few weeks before I married Dimitri. She looked down at the ground. It's a long story. Dimitri and Lucian saw we were in trouble, and Lucian saved us regardless. His heart is good. Pure. He does what is right and true. That's why I find it so funny you think him capable of lying. I don't think he's capable of it. He'll always be honest and pure like that. Even when you don't want him to be. I soaked in her words. You know, you're right. I don't know why I didn't see it before. You were scared. I was. I sighed. I am. I'm terrified. And pregnant. So I've seen. Does Dimitri know? I asked. She shook her head. He's clueless. I didn't want to say anything before talking to you. Thanks. I thought Lucian might want to tell him. I think that'll be perfect. Lucian groaned in the bed and his body stirred. It looks like this release of negativity has done some good things, Sarah said. I put a hand to his forehead. He feels much cooler. Stay with him, Sarah stood. And I'll let Dimitri know to change up the menu. Thanks. I got up to hug her. I love you. Love you too. She left me alone with Lucian. I gazed over at him and grabbed his hand. You need to wake up soon so you can spill the beans. I'm not sure how much longer Sarah is going to be able to keep it in now that she's got the news confirmed. I kissed his knuckles. More importantly, I need you. I want you. I always have. You've always been enough for me. Get better. We won't be able to be happy without you. I lay my head down on his chest, then I lifted my legs onto the bed and lay down properly beside him. The rise and fall of his breathing lulled me into a slumber. Chapter 18 Lucian I was plagued by the strangest of dreams. Katerina would walk over to me and slap me before telling me she was leaving me for a human. Then she said that the dragon in me scared her, and then I would change into my dragon and lose all control. I decimated the castle and the town, killing everyone I knew and loved, before coming talon to talon with my father. Then the dream would start over again. And again. And again. Constantly on repeat, and showing me the parts of myself I despised the most. I couldn't escape. I was trapped in hell. Until one day, the dream changed. Katerina walked over to me like she always did. She raised her hand, and I prepared myself for the slap. Only this time, she stroked my cheek. I need you, she said. I want you. I always have. You've always been enough for me. Get better. We won't be able to be happy without you. I pulled her in for a kiss, deep and passionate. Then the world faded to black and I drifted off. When I did it this time, it felt more like flying. I was going home. I could feel it. My eyes opened briefly. Katerina lay in my arms, sleeping soundly with her head resting on my chest. I tried to lift a hand to stroke her hair, but I was too weak to move. Despite my frailness, I felt whole again and safe. I drifted off to sleep again, but for the first time I was not plagued by either nightmares or disturbing dreams. I simply slept, and when I opened my eyes next, Katerina wasn't in view. I stretched my arms and legs, and the movement felt refreshing, energizing. 
my muscles rejoiced, ready to do more than just lie in bed. I yawned and let out a contented groan. Katerina's face appeared out of nowhere. It took me a second to realise she had been in the room the whole time and had actually been lying on a mattress on the floor. You're awake! She jumped up and hurried to my side. You're okay! Yes, I said. She grabbed my hands in her own and gave them a squeeze. Such a drastic change from the last time we'd seen each other. I'm more than okay. I'm great. Yeah? You don't feel sick anymore? I frowned. A bit tired, I suppose, but otherwise the same as always. It's like a miracle, she whispered. Louder, she said. We weren't sure if you were going to live or die. When I got here, your fever was so high and you were delusional. Kept saying my name and something about your father and the woods. It didn't make sense to anyone. I was that far gone, I asked. The last thing I remember is being in a storm. I was hit by the elements. Wind, hail, lightning. I crashed. I frowned. From there, things start to get hazy. She stroked my cheek with her fingers. Yeah? Well, what matters now is that you're better. We were able to get your fever down, and now you're awake. It's been about three days total. That long. You were very ill. Apparently. I chuckled, glad to be alive. I was so worried, she said, her eyes filling with tears. Dimitri came to my house and told me what happened. I had to be here. I needed you to wake up so I could, I could. I gazed at her, worried she was about to break up with me all over again. You could. Apologize. Tears fell down her cheeks. I was wrong to push you away. It's not okay for me to dump the baggage of my past on your shoulders to carry. Just because others have hurt me doesn't mean you will too. I should have told you about the appointment to see the baby. You're his or her father. However much involvement you want, that's what you're going to have. That's how it always should be. Her words touched my heart, but I wanted so much more. I want to be a part of it all. Every checkup. Every diaper. The works. I couldn't help but start grinning. Had I really just said I'd be happy to change diapers? What had come over me? There's more, she said. I'm sorry I tried to get you to deny yourself. That I pushed you into a cell and put the chains around your neck. It was so unfair of me. Your dragon is just as much a part of you as the man. I had no right to ask you to deny your own soul. Please forgive me, Lucian. I struggled to sit up, and she hurried to plump the pillows behind me. I do forgive you, I said, finally sitting up. I grabbed her hand. You talk about making me carry your baggage. I've done the same to you. It's why I keep leaving instead of staying to fight. I'm afraid of fighting. I'm afraid of losing control. I don't want to be like my father. I'd like to work on it with you. If you can help me open up, maybe I can help you calm down. She paused. If you'll still have me. I'd understand if you don't want to anymore. Not because of how I look or how I live, but just because I hurt you so badly. The fact you forgive me is huge already. Most people I know would leave forever. I smirked. It's a good thing I'm not most people. However, I do think we need to create some ground rules to prevent this from happening again. Yes, like talking to each other more. Being honest when things aren't right. Naturally. I shifted so I could lean in and kiss her. She smiled against my lips. And I don't want to live here in the castle. I want our own place. I liked having a house. Smaller, sure, but simplicity is much more my style. Was she saying that she'd stay here? 
In my world, a small house would be perfect, I purred. Your wish is my command. I'm still not sure about this realm. I know, my love. I kissed her again. We can iron out all the details later. I mean, there's always the possibility of living part of the year here and part of the year in your world if we need to. But we have plenty of time to sort things out. Right now, I would much rather make up with you properly. She blushed, and it was incredibly sexy. Really? You're feeling that much better? We kissed again, and a wave of lust rushed over me. I shifted more so she could join me on the bed, but then a sharp pain knifed through my abdomen. Ah, it seems I'm still tender. I'm not going anywhere. She settled into my side and kissed me softly before adding, We have plenty of time, my love. We have our whole lives. Katerina stayed true to her word. She didn't leave my side. She tended to my wounds and helped me recover my lost strength. Slowly but surely, the pain and trauma from my time in the storm healed. Even though my body craved her during that week together, I enjoyed the time becoming one with her in a different way. We got to know each other on a deeper, more emotionally intimate level as we both dropped our guard and let the other see the pieces we'd been hiding. Katerina told me in more detail about the boyfriends who'd lied to her and left. I, in turn, shared the full truth about what my father had done to my family. Talking healed the wounds of our souls in a way that I'd never thought possible. I didn't know that sharing my life with someone would be so freeing, I said to Dimitri as we walked slowly around town one day. I'd rather have been with Katerina, but I needed my brother's assistance with a special errand. Dimitri chuckled. Well, tough guy, I hope this inspires you to let yourself soften around the edges more often. I'm ready, I said. For all of it. Including being a father. Dimitri raised an eyebrow. What part of for all of it did you not understand? I growled playfully. He held up his hands, laughing some more. You already have the protective side down. I'm eager to be an uncle and teach your son or daughter all kinds of mischief. Whatever you do, you'll get back tenfold, I said. Just wait until it's your turn. I hope it'll be soon, he said. A shopkeeper returned with my purchase in a small bag. It's perfect and polished. Thank you. I took the bag and peeked inside at the contents, still in disbelief as to what I had actually just purchased. Now to return to Katerina. We made our way back to the castle and found Katerina with Sarah and Nadia in the study. The three sisters sat at a table, hunched forward and talking quietly. My love, I don't suppose you'd like to accompany me someplace, I said, reaching a hand out to her and lifting her to her feet. She smiled up at me. I think I'd love that. I wanted to talk to you anyway about something important. How convenient. Let's go. Slowly, she settled her hand more comfortably in my grip. I couldn't help reaching out to run my other hand over her burgeoning belly. Our baby was growing fast. She waved goodbye to her sisters, and then we left the castle. I led her right to the edge of town and beyond, almost to the edge of my brother's kingdom. We strolled through the outlying streets, where it was quieter than the busy centre of town where the castle was situated, and I made sure to give her ample time to absorb our peaceful surroundings. This is beautiful, she said after a time. Quiet and so cute. I thought you'd enjoy it out here, I said, away from the busiest parts of the kingdom. We have one last place to visit. I brought her to the end of the street we were in, where an iron gate stood blocking the rest of the path. I pulled a large key from my pocket and unlocked the gate. Then I led Katerina down the path. The town faded from view behind a small forest of trees. All day I've been wanting to show you this, I said. We finally came up to an empty plot of land. I haven't made any official decision yet 
because I wanted to make sure you liked this spot. For, she asked, gazing around. I'm not sure I understand. For a house. Her eyes widened as she gazed up at me. A house? You mean? Yes, for us. I want to build a home here for us. I know how much you dislike the idea of living in the castle. This felt like the perfect place to make something of our own. My heart began to pound hard in my chest. I couldn't remember the last time I'd ever felt this nervous. If you'd like to, that is. Katerina continued to gaze up at me. She was smiling, so that had to be a good sign. You want to build a house from scratch? Yes. All by yourself? I might need a little help. I said with a smirk. But you shouldn't doubt my skills after what I did to your home back in the other realm. She laughed. Good point. We can design it together, I continued. Make plans and... I swallowed. I would love to do this as your husband. Yeah, I can see it now. We can... She then stopped and her brow knit together. Wait, what? Did you say? There was no taking it back now. I want you to be my wife. Katerina, will you marry me? I reached into my pocket and pulled out the simple yet elegant ring I'd purchased in town earlier with Dimitri. I slowly got down on one knee in front of her. Her hands rose to her mouth and her eyes were like saucers as she stared at me. You're all I've ever dreamed of and I would be the luckiest man alive to call you my wife. I'm already so fortunate that we're starting a family. Let's make this dream official. She let out a shocked-sounding gasp, and then quickly followed with a chuckle. I, Lucian, of course! Yes, yes, I'll marry you! She suddenly rushed forward and wrapped her arms around my shoulders before leaning down to kiss me. I got to my feet and kissed her back, not holding in any of my passion. I lifted her into my arms and carried her over to a blanket I'd already spread out over the grass when I visited here earlier. The goal had been to recreate the picnic she made for me the day she told me of her pregnancy. Katerina picked up on it right away. You remembered every detail, she gasped. Even the colour of the blanket. I remember everything you do, I admitted. I set her down carefully, then joined her. Especially something so kind. Tears pooled in her eyes, and she kissed me. Never leave me again, okay? Even if I say something stupid, I can't stand the thought of you not being in my life. It would devastate me. As you wish. I crushed my mouth to hers again, hungry and desperate to show her the depth of my love. It was summer in my realm, and although it was still cool, this unusually warm day made my plans to seduce her very possible. Words were not always easy for me, but actions? With those, I could get my message across. The dragon inside of me was burning for his mate, and I couldn't agree more. We'd waited long enough. Chapter 19 out an envelope. What do you think? Should we find out? Or be surprised? I put my hand over hers, and we held the envelope together. This is a tough choice, Cat. It'd be like opening a birthday present early. On the other hand, I'm not known for my patience. So we're going to look, she asked, her eyes lighting up with pleasure. It was obvious what her choice was, so I grinned at her again. We are definitely going to look. Okay. On three? All right. One. I gazed into her eyes, seeing the love she was no longer trying to hide. Two. She smiled the brightest of smiles, and my heart did a funny flip-flop. Three, I half shouted, and together... We ripped the envelope open. Epilogue Twelve months later 
Lucian. I sawed a piece of wood in half and added it to my pile in the backyard. Once again, I was working on building a deck for my beautiful wife. I was using the same design from her old house. She'd loved that one a lot, and I wanted to make our new home feel like one for her just as much as myself. So far, progress seemed to be going well. In nine months, I'd been able to build the actual house. We'd made sure the blueprints included five bedrooms. One for us, at least three future children, and a guest room. There was also space on the land to create a guest house on the property, and that was next on my list once I finished landscaping the yard around the main house. Katerina's dad wasn't well, and we had decided, after talking to Sarah and Nadia as well, that we should bring him here to live with us. He would have the guest house on our property for as long as he wanted it. And Katerina would have the pleasure of her father not too far away. But first, I needed to finish this deck, and then I'd build the best of treehouse playgrounds for our active child. Katerina insisted that could wait until later. Babies couldn't climb trees, after all. I suppose she was right, but I couldn't help it. I wanted whatever children we had to have everything. Spoiling Katerina and our beautiful son gave me the greatest of joys. The sound of crying burst out of the windows from the top floor, my hearing picking up the moment my son was awake. I set down my tools and left the backyard for the nursery. I walked upstairs and quietly entered the room. Victor, you're awake just in time. Mommy will be home soon from work, I said. He stood up on his little chubby legs, gripping the side of the crib I'd made him. One hand reached out to me. Dada, dada. Yes, I'm here. I picked up my beautiful son and held him close. I'd been so worried about becoming a father. I would thought it wouldn't come naturally to me, and I'd struggle with learning how to love Victor properly. Taking care of his basic needs was never the concern. Just loving him and learning how to love him in a way that didn't damage him like my father had done to me and Dimitri. But from the moment he'd been born, it all fell into place. I held him for the first time and knew instantly that loving Victor would never be a problem. Much like loving Katerina had been as easy as breathing, the love for our son Victor came just as naturally. After I'd proposed, and we'd told everyone here at the castle our exciting news, we flew back to Katerina's house in the human realm and began our plans to settle down. Katerina wanted to finish the school year with her students, so we lived in her house until the summer. It was different this time, though, because things were good between my mate and me, and we had made the decision to return to live in my realm. My dragon was sated by that news and remained quiet and content. At least, as quiet and content as it is possible for a dragon to be. During that time, we got the place ready to sell and moved our things to the castle, all while planning a wedding. The ceremony was simple, yet elegant. We married on our property and honeymooned in the new house I built. Katerina spoke to Damon about teaching at the small school in town, for which he gave his grateful permission, and then she gave birth in the middle of summer. Victor was now seven months old, and he'd just started standing with a little help. Watching him hit each milestone in development continued to blow my mind. I couldn't believe how smart he was, or how adorable. Watching him while Katerina worked at the school was not hard at all. For the time being, my job was to keep working on the house, which I primarily did on the weekends and for a few hours after Katerina came home from work. Some small projects I did during Victor's nap time. When our house was finished, the plan was for me to expand my love of construction into a business. There was so much to rebuild still in this kingdom, a legacy of my father's tyranny, but for the first time I felt excited about the opportunities for building rather than angry at the previous destruction he'd caused. We were close to my family and also to hers. I flew her home to visit her father and her old school whenever she wanted, and of course once our guest house was ready, 
he would come to live with us permanently. For now, he was happy with occasional visits. Sarah and Nadia loved to come over and babysit their nephew as well. In our house in the forest, Katerina and I were finally able to be ourselves. In doing so, we saw how truly compatible we were with one another. She liked my quiet, strong, rough exterior, yet also appreciated my softer, hidden side. She didn't mind that I acted grumpy. My personality gave her a calm and safe place to hide when the world sometimes became too overwhelming. In turn, I loved Katerina's boldness and newfound self-confidence. She didn't have any issues stating her opinions, and she wasn't afraid of putting me in my place when needed. There was a tender, nurturing side to her as well that left me never doubting if she loved me. Even when she was mad, I could still sense her love underlying it. A constant reassurance that everything would be all right. For the first time in our lives, we both had balance. Katerina had her dream job and retained access to the world she loved. I had the freedom of letting my dragon fly and performing my duties for the realm. Life might not have been perfect, but we had gotten pretty damn close to it. Even if a situation rocked the boat in the future, I didn't worry about us capsizing in the storm. We'd sail through, stronger in the end. I could feel it in my soul. The knob turned for the front door. Mama, Mama! Victor squealed with delight. Yes, Mommy's home. I made my way to greet her in the foyer. The moment she saw us, she shot me a huge smile and automatically reached for Victor. Hey, baby, she cooed and cuddled him close to her. He squealed and touched her face with his tiny hands. The way she smiled down at him with so much adoration and love, it was my favourite expression of hers. I leaned in and kissed her lips. How was school today? Excellent! All the students are making me feel like a valued part of the community, she said. Which is awesome and kind of a surprise, since I'm pretty new here. They treat me like I've been around for a while. I knew you'd fit in perfectly. A fact that relieved me, because I'd been nervous. Everything about my realm was new and mysterious to Katerina. She'd expressed so much hesitation when we first met. Since she had embraced my dragon, she also seemed to have fully embraced living in my world. I'd thought she might resent me, but I quickly learned Katerina was a woman of her word. If she said she was willing to go all in, she meant it. And she went all in with me. I've been asked to help plan the next family event at the school, she said. I can't wait to show you my classroom and introduce you to my students. A lot of them know of you but not much about you, so they ask me all sorts of questions. I chuckled. They'll be stunned when they see how normal and boring I am compared to my brothers. It'll do great things for the kingdom, though. She smiled up at me, and I appreciated her thinking about that bigger picture aspect of our life. Regardless of whether or not I was a legitimate heir to the throne, my brother Damon had a lot of damage to undo. I'd be a willing part of that. What did you do today? she asked. Worked outside, I said. Victor did a lot of swinging while I got the planks ready for the new deck. It should be finished within a few days. A few days? Wow, you're a machine! She shook her head. I winked. Not only in the bedroom. Are you sure you're human? She teased. I mean, I know you're a dragon, but what about a robot? Are there mechanical dragons? You know I'm all flesh, I growled playfully. Or do I need to remind you later? She pretended to think. Gosh, my memory is awfully foggy. Mama, Victor interrupted. Oh, sorry. Are we traumatizing you with our love? She bopped Victor's nose. And do you help Daddy while he works outside? He does by talking to me. 
I'm not sure what he was saying today, but he had a lot of opinions about it. Dada do, Victor said, lifting up his hands. Yes, Daddy does work hard, she said. I gave her a weak smile. He just woke up from his nap. I know, it's later than usual. I was so sucked into my work. Guess we'll have a later night, she said. He's growing, so he's probably extra tired. She brought him into the kitchen, and I loved how she made him a part of everything she did. Victor couldn't help by any means, but she talked him through her day and the process of whatever task she was completing. Whenever I wondered what I should do, I looked to Katerina as a guide. From the moment I found out we were having a son, I knew it was an opportunity to break the cycle my father had continued. I had a choice, follow in his damaging footsteps or pave my own way and try to do it right. Doing my own thing wasn't as difficult as I thought, with Katerina to help guide me and be by my side through everything. She was a teacher at heart, after all, and excellent at her job. I was going to do far better as a father than I'd ever dreamed of, and Victor was going to grow up to be an amazing young man because of it. Together, Katerina and I would start a new legacy. I watched my wife with my son and couldn't hold in the joy. I released a shout of laughter, and they looked over at me, and both of them began to chuckle. Our life was simple, beautiful. I couldn't ask for anything more. Love had won, and I had my heart's desire right here in front of me, in the smiling faces of my loving wife and happy child.